We bring you Creeps by Night. Tonight, once again, we introduce the man who has agreed to serve as your guide and companion on these sometimes terrifying pilgrimages into the world beyond the realm of human understanding. The man who, for reasons that cannot be presently explained, must keep his identity a secret. Creeps by Night brings you its anonymous master of mystery, Dr. X. <laughs> This is Dr. X, joining with you for further research into the shadowy darkness of the unexplored, the darkness of the human mind. I wish first, however, to thank you for your letters commenting on last week's broadcast, The Walking Dead. Many of you requested that I reveal my identity, and a few of you hazarded a guess as to who I am. In due time, perhaps, I will be able to step out from under my cloak of mystery. But for the present, I ask you to bear with me, since I shall have to be known only as Dr. X. Tonight I have a rare treat in store for you. Mr. Edmund Gwen, the celebrated English actor, is our guest. The story I have chosen is drawn from the casebook of medical science and concerns itself with the often ghastly power of fear. Yes, we are all slaves to fear in one form or another. But the fear that forms the basis for our dramatization tonight is undoubtedly the most horrible of them all. It is the fear of... But wait. Let me draw aside the curtain and bring you Mr. Edmund Gwen as Ramsey in The Strange Burial of Alexander Jordan. For more than a century, the old Jordan house has stood on a gentle slope, mistress of the surrounding 400 acres of birch woods and pasture lands. And now, inevitably, death seems near to the last of the strong men who have always owned it. Aged, irascible Alexander Jordan. In his faded, musty bedroom, the shades are drawn against the hot morning sun. And in the half-darkness, his pale, hollow cheeks blend into the color of the pillowcase. He stirs as the door opens and his doctor enters. That you, Rutledge? Yes. Come in and sit down. Close the door. What's the trouble, Alex? Had one of my cataleptic fits last night. A bad one. I'm going to die pretty soon, Rutledge. But suppose you let me do the guessing. Don't no interrupt. I'm not afraid to die, mind you. I've never told anyone this, but my greatest fear is that it won't be death. And they'll bury me alive. Oh, I think we can be pretty sure if it comes to that. Don't be so positive, Thirty-eight years ago, a young butcher who called himself a doctor pronounced me dead when I had a cataleptic fit. Near got me buried, too, if I hadn't come out of it on time. That was thirty-eight years ago. Could happen again. Rutledge, I don't care if I sound like an old fool. All my life, that scared me. The idea of somebody mistaking one of those fits for death. The only nightmares I ever have, I wake up in a coffin... I put my hands up and I feel the lid there. Sometimes it's wood, sometimes it's cold glass. But there's no room to turn around. I put my hands down and I can feel the silk lining. They have me dressed in a swallowtail. They have a stiff collar on me. I reach up to tear it away. I can't breathe. I have to have air. Panic grips me. I try to shout, but no one can hear me. I... Beat on the coffin lid with my fists. I try to break the glass, but I can't do it. I haven't enough room. And pretty soon I know that I'm dying. Really dying. In the cold horror of the grave. Because somebody mistook one of my cataleptic fits for death. I 
don't want that to happen, Rutledge. And that's why I called you. Oh, you're just getting worked up over nothing, Alex. So listen to me. When the day comes and my nephew Ramsey or his wife Martha calls you, I want nobody but you to come, Rutledge. I don't want any other doctor to pronounce me dead. Is that clear? Don't worry. I want you to go over me very carefully. If you are absolutely satisfied that I'm dead, you can go ahead with the funeral. But I don't want my body embalmed. I don't want anything done to me except to put me in a coffin. I'm getting a lawyer here to write all this down this afternoon, Rutledge. But I wanted you to hear it too. I want my coffin put in the vault down by the Birch Woods. That's why I built the vault right on this property, so that nobody would ever bury me underground. It's all right. It'll be done just as you say. Now, wait a minute. I'm, I'm finished. This is the most important part. I want a large brass bell placed on the wall over the bed where Ramsay and Martha sleep. I want wires connected from that bell to the vault. Electric wires. What for? I want a push button attached to the ends of those wires, and I want the button placed in my hands as I lie in the coffin, so that in case I'm not dead, in case I awaken, I can ring the bell and let them know. Well, I must say, Alex... I don't care what you say. I don't care what anyone says. That's the way I want it. All right, Alex. That's the way you'll get it. Yeah. Make sure I do. Well, I've got to run over to the Pritchards. Nor is having another baby. Taking that digitalis faithfully? Yeah. Foolishness. But I'm taking yes, it. That's good. Goodbye, Alex. Get out and soak up some of that sunshine. I'll see you Thursday. Send Martha in. Lord. All right. Just a minute there, Dr. Rutledge. Oh. Hello, Ramsey. I'd like to know why you came this morning, Doctor. I came because I was sent for. Why doesn't somebody tell me when the doctor's been sent for? Is my uncle all right? He's not dead, if that's what you want to know. Not quite yet. Mm -hmm. You see that he keeps on taking that prescription I left. He wants to see your wife. Alone. Martha? You heard me. Goodbye, Ramsey. I know the way out without your help. Goodbye, Dr. Rutledge. Mother, wipe your hands. He wants to see you. What did you say, dear? I said wipe your hands. He wants to see you. Is the doctor still in there? Is he all right? The doctor's gone. He wants you in there. Alone. Oh, for goodness sake. Now what? Just a minute. Why is he asking to see you? Alone. Why, Ramsey? How should I know? Something's up. Rutledge was in there a long time. Why wasn't I told he was sent for? Why, he... Well, you were in the field this morning when he asked me to call the doctor. Next time you tell me when he sends for people. And listen, when you get in there, watch what you say. Why, Ramsey, I don't know what you mean. You know very well what I mean. Just listen. And don't babble. He mightn't like my ideas about what to do with this place after he's dead. Go on in there now. You've already wiped your hands six times. Yes, Ramsey, dear. You want me, Uncle Alex? Yes, come in and shut the door, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. Was the coffee all right this morning? Yes, fine. Miss Ramsey. He's, uh, he's in the kitchen. Sit down, Martha. Yes, Uncle Alex. I want to talk to you, Martha. Lawyer Gaines will be here sometime this afternoon to fix up my will. Oh, Uncle Alex. I've got a feeling my time is drawing near, Martha. And I just want to make sure that worthless nephew of mine doesn't get his hands on the Jordan place. I never made you marry him, Martha. I, I, I... Ah, never mind. None of my business. But I could have told you he was no good. Never has been. I wouldn't trust him with the farm. He'd sell it before my body turned cold. But I trust you, Martha. Thank you, Uncle Atlas. Yes, I've thought it all over. I'm going to leave the place to you. 
At least you'll have a roof over your head and some land you can call your own. You like it here, don't you? Oh, yes, I do. I'd be perfectly happy to stay here the rest of my life. And that's fine, because it's going to be yours, all of it. Oh, Uncle Al, you make me want to cry. No, no, none of that. I'm sorry. There's one more thing, Martha. One important thing. Yes, Uncle Alec. I've given Dr. Rutledge some very careful instructions about my burial. Oh, please, Uncle Alec. Nothing to be afraid of, Martha. When it comes, it'll come, and that's all. Rutledge knows what to do. He'll tell you. And I want you to promise me that you'll follow the instructions. Yes, of course, Uncle Alex. On my word of honor. As God is my witness. Thank you, Martha. Oh, by Jove, you've made me feel a good deal better knowing I have someone around I can trust. Matter of fact, I think I'll get up for supper tonight. Tell Ramsey to come in and help me dress after Lawyer Gaines leaves. Tell him I don't want him in here before then. Yes, Uncle Alex. And uh, don't breathe a word about this to Ramsey. I won't. If you need anything, Uncle Alex, call me. Yes, I will. Oh, what did the old buzzard want? His lawyer is coming this afternoon. You're to go in and help him dress after the lawyer leaves. He's having supper at the table? Yes. Bring in one of the special hams. I'll bake it with pineapple. Did you take your ten minutes in there to decide on baked ham with pineapple for supper? What we decided is none of your business. What do you mean, what you decided? I said it was none of your business. Better get out and feed the chickens. When did you start giving me orders? Oh, go on out of my kitchen. I've got work to do. What did you talk about in there? Ramsey! You're hurting my arm. I'll hurt more than that before I'm through. What's the lawyer coming for? Would you like me to tell him you haven't fed chickens yet? Something suddenly made you awfully cocky, it seems to me. Tell me what it is. Right now. Ramsey. Tell me, I said. Ramsey. Let go of her, Ramsey. Oh. I was only... uh... Get out of the house before I lose my temper. Go on, get... I'm going. If this ever happens again, Martha, you let me know. Yes, Uncle Alex, but you shouldn't have gotten out of bed this way. Oh, don't worry about me, Martha. I'm all right. Bacon and eggs for his breakfast. And why not? Did you fix the fence post over on the west pasture? Never mind the fence post. Give me that tray. You tend to your own business. I'll take the tray into him. Your breakfast, Uncle Alley. Hmm. That's funny. Uncle Alex. Uncle Alex. Oh, my Lord. Brandy. Oh, Dr. Zuckerberg. Brandy. I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he have everlasting life. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. What's the matter with Martha, Doctor? The funeral was evidently too much for her. Oh, I gave her a sedative and put her to bed upstairs. Where's the undertaker? Down at the vault with the electrician. They're waiting for you so they can close the coffin. Of all the stupid things, he's dead, isn't he? Yes, but we're observing his wishes to the letter. Brass bells and electric push buttons rot. Perhaps it is, but that's how he wanted it. 
And incidentally, as administrator of the estate, let me remind you that according to the terms of the will, either you or Martha must remain within earshot of that bell upstairs for seven days. You understand that? Yes, to my life. I'm beholden to a woman. That. You could do worse, Ramsey. <laughs> this is a nice place. I wish it were mine. If I had my way, you could bite in a minute. Well, that's neither here nor there. You see that Martha gets some rest. I left a bottle of medicine on the small table beside the bed. She's to take it according to directions if she has trouble sleeping. Good Lord, what's that? Her uncle wanted a bell loud enough to be heard. He certainly got it. Doctor. He... He's the undertaker or the electrician at the crypt touched the push button. Dancy! Dancy! Good Lord, I forgot. The bell hung right above the bed where she was asleep. Come on. Oh, Dancy! Dr. Rutledge! The bell. Oh, it doesn't mean anything, Martha. Don't be frightened. Oh, thank goodness. I was asleep. It hit me like a blow when it rang. For a moment, I couldn't even move. I felt paralyzed like in a dream. There, there, that's all right. Go on back to bed. You'll fall asleep again with the stuff I gave you. The bell won't ring anymore. I'll go right on down to the vault and see if the coffin is closed. Get her back into bed, Ramsey, and let her have another teaspoonful of that medicine tonight. You just get over to the vault and stop there, monkey. I'll tend to her. See that you do. And remember, don't leave this place for seven days. been able to get into town and get anything fresh, Ramsey, and you know it. It's just that you're nervous and not sleeping. I'll drive into town. No, Ramsey. We've still got five days to go. with that bell hanging over my head. Oh. Martha, you asleep? It must be that stuff Rutledge gave her. I'll take some. I can't stand it any longer. Now, maybe... Maybe I'll sleep. There's only one thing to do with the place. Sell it. You're wasting your time, Ramsey. I will not sell it. Oh. I'm not getting any younger. I want a roof over my head. That's what Uncle Alex intended. But now's the time to sell farmers. We can get a good price. To begin with, Ramsey, it doesn't even belong to me. Well, it will in two more days, won't it? Yes. If that bell doesn't ring. <laughs> is ours. I'll take some of that medicine that worked before. I won't tell anything. I won't tell. Talking in her sleep. I won't tell. She's dreaming. Having a nightmare. Too much of this dope, maybe. You must wake up. Not there. Uh, uh, oh, oh, oh. She is dead to the world. The stuff Huggins gave her must be powerful. Uh, 
That gives me an idea. No, trust you then. No, dear. You won't have to trust me much longer, you dried up old fool. No. Let's have a look at the little bottle. I guess it's all right to turn the lamp on. She won't wake up. There. Now let's see what the label says. Maximum dose, one teaspoonful every 12 hours. Caution. Overdosing may be fatal. Overdosing may be fatal, eh? So that you're late. No. We'll see about that. <laughs> Maximum dose, one teaspoonful. I could put three in her coffee tomorrow morning. She'd never know the difference. That stale coffee's bitter as gone anywhere, and that it fits everything. Yes, I'm her only relative. If she dies, I get the place. Oh, why didn't I think of this before? Why did I wait six days and nights with that bell hanging over my head? Why did I? Oh, good Lord. Am I dreaming? No, no. It can't be. It can't. Stop. Stop that ringing. Fancy. Fancy. The bell. I can hear it, you fool. Quick. Fancy. Stay where you are. I'll stop it. Fancy. What did you do? What do you think I did? The wires. You brought out the wire. Get back in the bed. Are you out of your mind? The key to the vault. Where is it? What? The key. Uncle Alex must be You're alive. You're crazy. He rang the bell. Didn't he? You were dreaming. Get back to bed. Give me that vault key, Randy. Give it to me. Now take it easy. Don't stand there telling me to take it easy. Uncle Alex may be fighting for breath. Dreaming against the coffin. Get the key. All right. All right. I'll go down now. I'll go with you. Doesn't need two people. Just let me get into my clothes. I don't trust you, Randy. You've got no right to say a thing like that, Martha. What difference does it make to me whether Alex is alive or dead? I don't stand against anything. He left the Jordan place to you. Oh, now where did I put that key? Must be in this drawer. Hurry, Randy. I'm hurrying. There, here it is. You took something else out of that drawer, Randy. I did not. Just the key. What's the matter with you anyway? Where are my shoes? Under the bed. I'll be watching you from the window, Randy. If Uncle Alex is alive, yell to me. And I'll phone Dr. Rutledge. There's a storm coming up. That wind's from the east. Now, let's see if this key fits. Fits all right, but but it won't turn. Ah, there we are. Now where's that light switch? Here it is. Yeah, that's better. Whew. Oh, it's foul in here. It smells dead. There's the coffin. Hope they didn't screw down the lid. No. No, it comes right up. Yeah. He hasn't moved. He's dead. Yes, just the way he was when they put him in there. With his hands folded over the bow button. He didn't ring that bell. Who did? Oh, now I know. The storm. Lightning shorted the wire. Sure, that's what it was. It must have been. Still, I... I think I'd better make sure while I'm down here. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh, Martha almost caught me taking this darning needle out of the drawer. Oh, I'll work it under his shirt and jab it through his heart. You're going to stay dead, Uncle Alex, no matter what happens. Sandy! Martha! You followed me! I told you I didn't trust you. What are you doing with that darning needle in your hand? Nothing. Get out of the way. Let me look at him. Dead. Stone dead. Who rang the bell? Well, how did I know? Maybe his ghost. You were about to do something with that needle. What? You really want to know? All right. I'll tell you. I was going to jab it through his black heart. I was going to make sure he was dead. 
And I'm still going to do it. Let him see your office of mine. Am I? We'll see. Keep away from that coffin. Shut up. I'll scream, Ramsey. The Sebastians will hear me. No, you won't. Yes, I will. Help! Help! Oh, so that's how it is. Wait till I close this door. Now, scream your lungs out. Ramsey, don't do anything you'll regret. Let her. Why waste this needle on old dead Alex? I might do much better using it on you. Get into your heart. Randy. Why not? Then I get to own the place and sell it. Randy, listen to me. I listen to you plenty these last few weeks. Ever since he made you the high and mighty boss. But now, it's my turn. Randy. I'll never find you down here. No. No, you'll dry up and rot. Just like he's rotting in that coffin. Randy. No. <laughs> Fainted before I could touch her. Wait a minute. That gives me an idea. There's a better way of doing it. Carry her up to the house. Pour that medicine down her throat. Give her an overdose. She'll be dead by morning. And no one can put it on me. Oh, oh this is beautiful. Everything's working out fine. You're going to be rich, Ramsey. You're rich. Get the door open first, and then... Lord, the key's on the outside. And it's a snap lock. No! No! What am I going to do? I'm locked in here. I can't get out. The door's solid open. Six inches thick. There are no windows. No air. Yes. Sooner or later, someone will hear it. Yeah. Yeah, this should do it. The Prestons or the MacArthur's, they're bound to hear it and investigate. I'll keep bringing it all night. I'll... I'll... Oh, no wires. Wires in the bedroom. I ripped them out. The bell... won't ring. Look out! A trap! A trap in here! A trap! Trap! That was the strange burial of Alexander Jordan. Starring Mr. Edmund Gwen. For our next exploration into the darkness of the human mind, I have invited the celebrated exponent of the Mysterioso, Peter Laura, to be our guest. So join with us when once again we raise the shadowy curtain of the unknown and look deep into the souls of men. Until then, this is your master of mystery, Dr. X. Leaving you with creeps by night. Creeps by Night is produced by Robert Maxwell. Original music composed by Paul Creston, conducted by Joseph Stopak. Supporting Mr. Gwen in tonight's presentation were Everett Sloan as Alexander Jordan, Abby Lewis as Martha, Gregory Morton as Dr. Rutledge, and Dr. X as himself. Edmund Gwen appeared to the courtesy of Metro Golden Mayor, whose 20 year anniversary picture, The White Cliffs of Dover, is currently being released. George Gunn speaking. This is the Blue Network. This is your host to welcome you into the inner sanctum once again. Come in. Our little place may not be a mansion, but it has its advantages. For one thing, it's thoroughly 
scare condition. The scream pipes are always in good working order, and the rent's quite reasonable. We get a cut rate. <laughs> Had your warning. Whatever happens from now on, you asked for. Just be sure the family is provided for. Mm. And now to our happy little anecdote for tonight. Bird song for a murderer. My name is Carl Warner. I'm not a young man any longer, but I don't mind that. I wasn't very happy when I was young. Now, well, at least I'm not unhappy. And late at night, after Elaine has gone upstairs to bed, uh, she's my wife, and she's very pretty and younger than I am, and perhaps I made a mistake in marrying her, but... Well, anyway, late at night, I go into the room where I keep the birds, and then... Listening to them sing, I get as close to happiness as I can expect. I stay an hour, and then I cover their cages. And then they know it's time to sleep. And they sleep. Even on the stormiest of nights. And this was a stormy night. Someone knocked at the front door. It was late. We know very few people. We kept to ourselves, mostly Elaine and I, so... I was worried a little when I opened the door. Yes? You mind if I come in, Mr. Warner? It's kind of damp out. No, of course not. You... You seem to know me. I do, don't I? But I don't know you. My name is Brule. Chester Brule. Oh, uh, Chester Brule. I, I still don't know. Remember? Hey, it doesn't matter. What? What did you want? Nice place you got here. Much nicer than Cragmount. Cragmount? Cragmount Asylum for the Insane. You... You work there? I used to work there. Oh. This is all very interesting. Funny but... thing happened just before I left. One of the inmates escaped. This baby was a homicidal maniac. Homicidal? Yeah, that's right. I, I don't see what all this has to do with me. I didn't say it had. There was one funny thing about this inmate. What's that? Loved canaries. Loved to listen to him sing. Psychiatrists at Cragmount found it very interesting. Birdsong was the only thing that kept the murderous impulses down. I, I... Uh, Mr. Warner, I'm out of work. That's, that's too bad. You're not doing badly. Nice house, furnishings. Didn't I hear canaries singing before I come into the house? Maybe. Maybe you did. So, uh, 5,000? In the morning? No. I think yes. Otherwise, Cragmount will be happy to hear from me. Eleven Crescent Place. Room 2B. In the morning. You can show me to the door now. Of course. Good night, Mr. Warner. Till we meet again. I watched him go out into the blackness, and the blackness swallow him. The birds were quiet. I thought for a moment of taking the covers off the cages and letting the birds sing, and then... Then I thought that tonight it might be better if I didn't let the birds sing. Couldn't wait till morning, huh? 
I didn't expect it. Wait. Wait, that knife. No. No. Oh. I shouldn't have let you. Surprise. Surprise. I couldn't have slept more than two or three hours. Fortunately, Elaine and I had separate rooms. And at breakfast the next morning, she was fresh and young and beautiful. Carl? Huh? Why are you staring at me in that funny way? Oh, nothing. You, you really shouldn't read at meals. Oh, it's only the paper. So many exciting things happen, I can't wait till I get to them. Still... Oh, isn't that terrible? What is? A man was murdered last night. Not very far from here. Crescent Place. Crescent Place. Such an odd name. Chester Brule. Uh, God, your coffee cup. Sorry, I... I wish you wouldn't read the paper. It says that his canary... He had a canary car. Was singing when the landlady found the body. Oh, that's pathetic. Elaine, I told you not to read that paper. The Give it to me. You're tearing the paper up. What's the matter? I, I, I'm nervous this morning. Don't remember you ever having been like this before. I told you I was nervous. Now look, darling. Why don't you go into the aviary? Listen to the birds for a while. You love them so, and they have such a nice effect on you. I went into the aviary, as she suggested, and I listened to the birds. Quite a little while before I stopped trembling. Carl? Yes, dear? Come into the kitchen. All right. I've been washing the breakfast dishes, darling, and found this among them. Carving knife. This isn't that funny. Besides, look at it. The blade's all covered with brown stain. I, I see. Sure, I washed it after dinner last night. Did you use it for anything? No, darling. Now give it to me and I'll wash it now. Oh, I can do it. I just wondered what... Oh, the door. Will no, you... No, you give me the knife. And you answer the door. Uh, I said you answer the door. All right. There's nothing to shout about. I don't know what's the matter with you this morning. I washed the knife. Quickly, but carefully. Very quickly, but very carefully. Didn't take long. The... The stains hadn't hardened much, the... the brown stains. Carl? Yes? Someone to see you. A man. What does he want? He didn't say, except that it was important. I'll go see him. But he said he's a lieutenant. A lieutenant Greg. From the police. There are 17 steps between the kitchen and our living room. I know, because I counted them while I was walking to see Lieutenant Gregg of the police. Seventeen steps to make my face polite, relaxed, smiling. But would I be able to hide the trembling of my hands? You're Lieutenant Gregg. My wife said you wanted to see me. Yes, that's right. Mr. Warner, did you know a man named Chester Brule... Chester Brule, why, I, I can't say offhand. I've got such a bad memory for names. I may or I may not. Why? He's murdered last night. You see, we found your name and address in Brule's address book. I see. We thought you might be able to help us. Well, the fact that my name is in his address book doesn't mean Prove that... anything? Well, of course not. Uh, would the fact that Brule used to be an attendant in an insane asylum mean anything to you? Why should it mean anything to me? Well, I didn't say it should, Mr. Warner. I just thought... Well, it doesn't. Well, I guess that's that. You know, funny thing. There was a birdcage in Brule's room with a canary in it, singing its head off. Huh? Well, lots of people are fond of canaries. Sure, sure. What was funny about it is that Brule's landlady swears Brule never had a bird. That, that is funny. Why, it looks, the killer knifed Brule and then left the cage and the bird in it behind him. Doesn't make any sense. Unless you figure that the guy who killed Brule was insane. The 
birds have been quiet, but the slam of the door may be started them off. And I knew that somehow I would have to get the cage and the bird in it out of Brule's room. I didn't know how I'd do it, but I'd do it no matter how insane it was. <laughs> dark when I got to Crescent Place. Dark on a lonely street. There was no one in front of the house. Nothing to show that a man had died inside the night before with a knife in his throat. The door was open. There was a dim light in the vestibule, leaving the stairs beyond in, in darkness. I went up them to the second floor. There was no one in the corridor. The door of 2B opened and I went in. There was no light. The moon cast a pale glimmer over the room and someone in a chair near the window. For a moment I thought it was Brule, but... but there was no blood. And then I realized it was a policeman in uniform, asleep. The cage was near the sleeping man. Would his sleep be sound enough? I reached out lifted the cage, reached the door, and closed it. I... I was safe. Carl? Yes? Oh, I'm so glad you're home. That Lieutenant Greg is here again. Greg? Where? In the bird room. Why did you take him to the bird room? He asked me to. All right. Oh, Lieutenant Gregg. Oh, hello, Mr. Warner. Quite a collection of canaries you've got here. Yes, I have. Uh, were you home all last night? Of course. This is still about Chester Bull's murder? Mm-hmm. Say, uh, remember my mentioning I thought that the man who'd killed Brule and left the birdcage behind him must be insane? Well, you, you did say something of the sort. Yeah, yeah. And then there's the fact that Brule used to work with insane people... Begins to mesh, huh? Oh, I know very little about police work. I hope I'm not boring you. Anyway, it occurs to me, maybe I'd better take a trip up to Cragmount. I suppose going to asylums or any place else is just part of your job. Oh, sure. Uh, <clears throat> did uh, I mention Cragmount was an asylum? Why, well, uh, you, uh, well, you must have. I mean, yeah, I yeah, well, I'll run up there and I wouldn't be surprised if I get all the answers. What do you think? I think I'm going to. Carl, uh, I... Uh... What is it, Elaine? Well, it's so late, I thought... Oh, I can take a hint, Mrs. Warner. Don't bother showing me to the door. He seems like a very nice man. He... Carl, stop it. What? That stare. <laughs> I didn't know you so well. I'd, I'd say you were going mad. <laughs> Go to bed, Elaine. All right, darling. Oh, Carl, look. Look at what? Through the window, the garden. Lieutenant Gregg didn't go away. He's down there. Get away from that window. Go to bed. I'm going. But he looks as if he's waiting down there for something. For what, Carl? I knew what he was waiting for. I knew I mustn't go to sleep. Things happen when you sleep. Terrible things. But I hadn't slept well the night before. Not well at all. And there'd been the strain of the day. And it was night now. And 
dark and still. Only it wasn't Gargan. Oh. Such a lovely morning, Carl. Lovely. I looked for Lieutenant Gregg as soon as I got up. He wasn't in the garden anymore. He must have got tired. Gone home. Or back to headquarters. Wherever policemen go. Oh, dear. That's the Swenson's dog. He's gone into our garden again. I'll, I'll have to get him out. Elaine, don't. Don't you dig up all the flowers looking for bones? Elaine. Maybe. Maybe he won't be there tonight. <laughs> Elaine. Where are you? Oh, under the tree. What? Look. What? Look. Lieutenant Gregg. <laughs> His throat. <laughs> Come inside. kitchen. Carl, where are you going? The kitchen. What are you doing? The drawer. Silverware. Yes. It's here. The, the carving knife. That's right. Carl, I thought you washed it last night. I guess you didn't. You'd be wrong. I did wash it last night. But the stains are still there. The brown stains. These... Our fresh ones, Elaine. Get out of my way. But... I've got to go to the bird room. Carl, please don't go away from me. Carl! I was holding the carving knife in my hand. Started to put it down and then I... I held on to it anyway. It would take taking the covers off the cages awkward, but uh, I held on to it anyway. The birds were still. They remained still unless I took the covers off. Elaine. Carl, you must tell me what's wrong. Don't, don't come any closer. But... Elaine, please, not any closer. You, you've got that knife in your hand. Yes. The one with the brown stain. Oh, Carl. Shh, don't say anything. Carl, the night before last... Elaine, don't ask questions. That's dangerous. You were out of the no. house last night when Lieutenant Gregg was I was killed. asleep. You have the knife, Carl. Yes. Give it to me. No. Please, Carl. No. Stay where you are. All right. You may keep the knife. Because, look, Carl. A revolver? Yes. Lieutenant Gregg's revolver. Elaine, give that to me. Oh, no. I took it from Lieutenant Gregg last night. After he stopped crying. They always cry when you... Elaine. Didn't like it the way you've been looking at me, Carl. You were thinking that maybe you'd have to send me back to Craigmont. I wasn't. You were, Carl. I know you were. After Chester Brule died. Elaine. Stop where you are. All right, but... Keep your hands away from the birdcage. Don't pull off the cover. <laughs> Carl, I've hurt you. Never, never mind. But I didn't want to. Are you going to cry like the others? It was my fault. Loved you too well. Oh, I, I really killed those others. Not you, my darling. That's a very silly thing to say. And I'll become quite angry. Ah. I am quite angry. Oh. Carl, you silly. You pulled the covers off the cage. Carl? Carl, I'm speaking to you. Those birds, I don't like them. Carl? Oh. Poor Carl. He's dead. 
dead. I loved him and now he's dead. But anyway, he didn't cry. He didn't cry. The story of a couple of lovebirds who, instead of billing and cooing, went in for killing and shooting. <laughs> of course, it was all little Elaine's idea. All Carl did was cover up. Well, friends, it's time once again to close that creaking door. Until next week at the same time, when we'll be back with a little hunk of horror. <laughs> You'll be sure to listen, won't you? Until next week, then. Good night. Pleasant dreams. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... G. Marshall. It was Oscar Wilde who wrote, in a surprisingly gentle and almost naive tone, Death must be so beautiful to lie and listen to silence, to have no yesterday and no tomorrow, to forget time, to forgive life, to stay at peace. The trouble is, not all the dead will stay quietly asleep. That's why we have ghost stories. Our mystery drama, The Ghostly Private Eye, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Larry Haynes. Whenever the argument about the oldest of professions arises, along with the prostitute, the actor, the moneylender, and others, certainly we must include that of the private eye. Sometimes honorable beyond belief, as in the case of Cain and Abel when Jehovah himself solved the murder. Many more times, not the most prized member of society, still a figure to be reckoned with. Of all the modern ones, no one is more special than the parapsychologist, the man who deals in the explanation of that vast middle world of clairvoyance, extrasensory perception, and psychic phenomena. The explainer of the inexplicable, such a man as the singular Mr. Flaxman Lowe. Hello? Uh, Mr. Flaxman Lowe? Yes, the same. This is George Blackburton. Uh, you, you know, we've seen each other casually at the club. Oh, yes, of course, Sir George. Uh, I, uh, I feel like the devil bothering you like this, but you were pointed out to me as someone who, well, was more or less an expert in the occult and supernatural. Well, I have made a good deal of investigation, yes, but... Uh... I'm in desperate need of help. Could you come right down to my place in Surrey? We, we have something that even my wife can't cope with. Uh, something? Uh, perhaps it's an old curse. I, I don't know. But there is a thing that is trying to crowd us out of the house that you can actually taste and smell. Disgusting and terrifying. I need help. Well, I, uh, I don't know about immediately. I'm expecting a guest from France whom I must pick up shortly. Oh, by all means, bring him with you. Let him be our guest, too, for the weekend. If you don't help us... I'm afraid I'll go stark staring mad. Oh, very well. I think it might be arranged. Miss 
Monsieur Lowe. I recognize you from your photograph. Oh, my dear boy, you must be Professor Jean Thierry. I am. Well, you look young enough to be my son, and with such a formidable academic background. As I come to meet you, I am a child at the feet of the master. Oh, 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 oh now <laughs> you make me feel like the all-wise spirit. Well, are you not the king of ghost killers, the master of the spirit world? Oh, scarcely. I'm a child in the wilderness of the afterworld. And at the moment, an embarrassed host. Oh, why? Well, uh... What would you say if instead of taking you home to my comfortable fire, as I'd planned to, I whisked you off instead into the depths of Kent for a weekend at a haunted house far beyond your belief and which even stretches mine? What would I say? <laughs> what am I here for? Well, so we stay right here in the station and catch the next train for Yand Manor House. We had corresponded for years to Dr. Flexman and I, and the quality of his mind was such that I had been most eager to meet him, to argue vis-à-vis -vis our contrasting belief on the matter of life after death. So what matter that our first conversation was on a train headed for this house with a strange name, Yand Manor House. Uh, this house that you have been asked to investigate, it has a ghost? Oh, most definitely, yes. Is it uh, an especially convincing ghost? Well, I think you'll find that it is. Ah, then you are promising me an exceptional adventure. One not without a great deal of danger. Well, I can't judge that, though, without trying, can I? Well, that's the nature of contact with the world beyond. Ah, but first you must prove it to me. I simply do not believe in ghosts. Or spirit manifestation, occult phenomena, whatever is the rubbish bin into which most people throw any belief they cannot understand. Mm. Well, this rubbish heap is what I spend my life investigating. Mm, chacun a son goût. No, to each his own. <laughs> and yet, are we all so sure and secure about what we think we know? <laughs> I realize that you're aware of I, I've had some considerable success searching through the trash that most people discount. Well, what can I answer? That I rebel against the whole idea? After all, I have no experience in these matters, except vicariously through studying and reading. Very well. And now you're about to have some first-hand direct experience, which I hope you will not come to regret. We went straight to Yand Manor House. Certainly on my part, totally unaware of the terror that was to face us and of a gaping world of swirling doubt, bottomless and as insecure as that dreadful dream of falling from incalculable heights to impossible depths. A dream beyond belief that was to haunt me the rest of my days. We were met at the train by Sir George and quickly transferred to a large and luxurious landau with a magnificent pair of horses. I had been prepared for something quite magnificent when we approached Yand Manor House, but actually it was not so impressive compared to the property that surrounded it. A square brick house, notable only for a strangely out-of-character building at the end of the garden that was unmistakably... A mausoleum. But our hosts, I found quite charming. Your rooms are comfortable, I hope, Mr. Lowe, Professor Thierry. Oh, I find mine even better than that. Cozy. Oh, yes, mine too. I feel quite at home. And you need have no worries. I have swept them myself. Uh, what Cynthia means is that she has, uh, well, not literally swept them for dust, but uh, for any sign or evidence of... Uh, supernatural occupation or presence. I assure you, they're quite clean. In fact, I've combed the whole house and there's not a jot of evidence that any spirit forces or spectral emanations exist. Save for, of course, the den. I'm a psychic, too, you know, Mr. Lowe. Oh, well, you flatter me, Lady Blackburton. I don't consider myself one, only an investigator of psychic phenomena. You do not believe in the spirit world? Ah, that's a different matter. I think you will find, madame, that he is a true believer. I am the, uh, how do you say, the uh, fly in the ointment. Well, monsieur, before you leave Yand House, I can promise we will have made a true believer of you. Well, you sound almost as though you enjoyed this ghost which uh, so concerns your husband. Oh, no. No, this is something malignant. 
destructive. It must be exorcised. I tried to reach it through spiritualism, but without success. I only hope that with your help, perhaps we can. Mm. Uh, may I ask when we're to see the room? Uh, we're waiting only for my nephew who will be joining us for dinner. We will be five, the Pentateuch. The perfect number for a seance. One reason why we were delighted when you asked if you could bring a guest, Dr. Lowe. I only hope, madame, that I will not be a limiting factor. We ask only for your cooperation. I feel quite sure we'll end up by winning your belief. Ah, that'll be Charles now. Uh, don't you think, my dear, it might be a good idea for us all to go straight into dinner? I think perhaps it would. Gentlemen, will you join me? There had been a curious little family byplay between Sir Georges and his wife, which was soon explained to me after I met Charles Volney. He was a large, heavy young man with an athletic build. I can't say I found him an attractive personality, but what was most noticeable about him was that he was already on his way to another evening, which could only lead to a hangover in the morning. Hey, and so on, Cynthia, we are to have another table-tapping session? Charles! I won't have you talk to your aunt that way. Well, good Lord, Uncle George, has she really got you believing in all this twaddle? The strange things that happen in that room can't be taken lightly. He doesn't really take them lightly at all, George. The bravado is just to cover up his own fear. Rubbish, Auntie. Some wind blowing down the chimney, rustling the ivy and swinging something loose against a window, uh, or the creaks and groans of this drafty old house. <laughs> Nonsense. Our... Are you seriously interested in all this balderdash, Dr. Lowe? Well, yes, yes. After all, I have made it my life work. Yes, of course, but to expose frauds and to show up fakers. Uh, in part, yes, that is a byproduct. Now, you're not going to tell me you actually believe in bits of ectoplasm bumbling about groaning and clanking chains. Hmm. May I quote you from Hamlet? There are more things under heaven and earth, Horatio, than are dreamed oh, of. Oh, Lord, I'm in a nest of nuts. <laughs> no, not quite. You have uh, another skeptic at the table. Ah, Professor Thierry, huh? Yes, you see, we're a good balance. Two for, two against, and Sir George somewhere in the middle. Well, I'm not so sure anymore, Flaxman. Not after the last experience. The one that sent me scurrying to you for help. Now, my information about the room, we're about to... Uh, uh, what's the best word? Shall we uh, settle for um, invade? It was uh, still sketchy. <laughs> Naturally, Dr. No. It has to be all the things you can't question. Only interpret. The wind blowing, a shutter clacking. You know, it's so easy if you can't see anything face to face. Yes, look, if you'll excuse me, uh, Charles, I think there have been other manifestations. Am I wrong? Far from it. Hearing and seeing are not the only senses. One can actually feel the presence. Oh, it's all in the mind. It's a lot more than that, damn it. I tell you, one can smell it. Smell it? The fetid odor of death, the grave and decay. It's not only smell, but taste. If it runs two to form, after a certain hour, none of us will be able to remain in the room. Why? Because, my dear nephew, we shall be crowded out. But why would this, uh, this presence, or whatever it is, want to, uh, uh, your strange phrase, uh, crowd anyone out? It's an experience one can't describe that one has to live, Professor Thierry. As if somewhere in one's daily life, one closed one's eyes for a second and suddenly realized he was standing at the verge of a gaping hole that plunged into such terrifying darkness and eternal damnation that a bile of terror rises in the throat and threatens to suffocate you. There's an enemy in that room at such times who presses against you so massively that you feel as if you're being trampled under a multitude, helpless against a torrent. A stifling, a, a force that you must move from or be smothered to death. It, oh, forgive me. This is not exactly after-dinner conversation. But it is a reality in George's and my life that we must face or run from if we can. We've decided to face it. 
Will you chance it with us? have gotten ourselves involved in something this time around, haven't we? I don't know where each of you stands on the power of the spirit world, extension after death, or belief in ghosts, but I do hope you'll stay to do a little more research with me and Mr. Lowe on the nature of it, the possibility of it, and exactly what effects it can have on us. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Five people sit in the shadow of the great carved chimney piece which rises above the mantel to the high ceiling. About a dark table of fumed oak, they hold hands. Four of them watch Cynthia go into trance and wait for the manifestations from beyond. The room is dark and brooding enough to raise Satan himself. The lamps smoke and cloud the atmosphere, as if the air pressure is heavy beyond nature. But nothing happens. Whoever you are, wherever you are, we are trying to reach you. Can you not answer? Answer. No. Not tonight. Tonight I can't do it, George. There are forces against me. I don't know what it is. Break the circle. Bring up the lights. I will, Cynthia, my dear. And uh, rest. Relax. (gasps) Cynthia, you extend yourself too much. I'm all right, George, dear. But I must, uh... I must rest now. Would you excuse me, I... Well, we may not have raised any wandering spirits inside, but we seem to have created some outside. If you'll excuse me, I think I'd best see Cynthia up to bed. Please give my apologies to our guests. Hush, Cynthia. Don't worry about it. I worry about what I must... Did you ride over, Charles? Oh, yes, sir. I don't want you to go back in a storm like this. You must stay. Any one of the rooms in the West Wing, they're all made up. Uh, Don't you worry about me. But I do. Very well, Auntie, I promise. Uh, Come along, Cynthia. Uh, uh, Charles, since I'll not be down again tonight, will you see to our guest needs? I also promise to be an excellent host, Uncle George. Good night. Good night, Lady Blackburn. Good night. Good night. Well, gentlemen, what should it be? Whiskey, gin, brandy? Uh, no, no, no. For me, nothing. Oh, it was a long journey from Paris, and this afternoon's trip has finished the job. I am exhausted. Oh, I don't think I want any either. Why, why don't we all just go up to bed? Ah, yes, bed, sleep. Those I welcome. But, um, I'm not going upstairs. Well, you're not going to ride home in weather like this. No, 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 Mr. Lowe. I'm going to spend the night, uh, right here. You mean in this room? (laughs) That's right. Either I will sleep the sleep of the unrighteous, or if I'm wrong and my aunt's right, I'll have some company. Now, I mean to put an end to all this nonsense about ghosts and ghouls. Then I shall uh, sit up with you. Oh, perish the thought, Mr. Lowe. With your reputation, I'm sure any self-respecting member of the other world would give you a wide berth. (laughs) Well, are you still sure you won't join me in a brandy? Mm -hmm. Very well. Mr. Paulet, may I ask you to be serious for a moment? You may ask me. I don't think you should take your aunt's warning lightly. Even though there's been no physical evidence tonight, apparently some malignant and dangerous force considers this room its province. Then if it does, I intend to disabuse it of the idea. More than that, I'd want it off my turf. You see, this house will be mine one day, very soon, if my aunt and uncle decide to return to traveling. And I want uh, it, whoever or whatever it might be, and I'll mark you, I don't believe it exists. I want it to know that when I take over, there'll only be room for one of us. And no amount of discussion would persuade this headstrong young man to change his mind. 
Personally, I couldn't help agreeing with his point of view. The idea of anything supernatural daring to intrude in this temple of the normal and the everyday seemed ludicrous. So, Flaxman and I went upstairs. Charm? Yes. I am concerned. <laughs> About me? Actually, I must admit my concern was more for that young man downstairs. <laughs> I should not worry about him. One more drink and the wine will put him straight to sleep. Well, I'm not worried about anything that may threaten him uh, in this world. I left my practical French friend and went to my own room. The storm was still whistling and moaning about the yeah, manor house, but it was a perfectly natural phenomenon, and it was certainly no cause for alarm. I must have been sleeping lightly for a grandfather clock striking the three-quarter hour somewhere in the house woke me up. I glanced at my watch and saw that it was a quarter to midnight. I shrugged into my robe and slippers and stole downstairs. The house was silent, save for the moan of the wind and the steady drum of the rain outside. The door to the den was closed and I opened it, filled with a nameless apprehension. I could have saved myself my uneasiness. Stretched out comfortably on the couch, a still unemptied glass in his hand lay Charles Volney, snoring contentedly and looking to my middle-aged envy, the picture of health in spite of all his drinking. I removed the glass and set it aside. For a moment I considered getting him out of there. But he was so soundly in his cups and such a heavy young man, the effort was beyond me. Besides, I was getting cold. So I stoked up the fire and left him. To my eternal regret, as it turned out. Dr. Lowe. Uh, Dr. Lowe. Yes, yes, yes. Just a moment. Be right there. Oh, come in. The door is open. I'm... Sorry to disturb you so early in the morning. No, 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 it's quite all right. What time is it? The sun isn't even up, I'm afraid. Oh. 5.30. But something dreadful's occurred. Oh, forgive my almost whispering, but I don't want Cynthia to know yet. All right, what is it? It's... it's Charles... I... Uh, hello, forgive me. I thought I heard an urgent knocking. Do I intrude? Quite all right, Professor. Everyone must know sooner or later. My nephew Charles is... Is dead. What? Oh, can't move it. What? How? How? That's the terrifying thing. I want you to come and see for yourself and answer me that question. I followed Dr. Lowe and Sir George downstairs to that terrible room. Except that the fire had burned out. It looked much as it did when we all had left the night before. Except for Charles Volney. If I can refer to the caricature of him that we saw. He was braced in the corner between the window recess and where the chimney jutted out as if he had tried to escape and been glued there by some giant force that literally crushed him. His face was suffused with blood, his eyes starting from his head. He was quite dead. He must have been dead for several hours. What do you think, Dr. Lowe? Frightened to death? No, no. No, more than that. He was uh, smothered, asphyxiated. I don't quite know how to describe it. Uh, pressed. Pressed to death almost. Yes, once during the war I had a friend in, in a building that was bombed. He was not injured directly. Only the force of the blast within a confined space drove him against the wall and somehow flattened him. Uh, he was spread wide. Good Lord. It's not natural. No. No, my friend Sir George, it is, uh, I'm afraid, supernatural. Yes, he should have listened to your wife, and I should have listened to my own misgivings. Uh, alas, I feel at fault no, there. No, 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 Jean. I came down last night again, just before midnight. He'd passed out on the couch, and I couldn't move him. It's no one's fault but mine. I should never have come back to this accursed house. And I'll call Mr. Bunbury. He's our local superintendent of police. Oh, I... 
I saved you for the last, Mr. Lowe, knowing your reputation and all. Well, I don't know whether that's a plus or a minus. Oh, now, sir, plus, of course. And not that I understand some of your investigations, but you stand very high at Scotland Yard, very high. Thank you. Now, I've checked out the servants, and they can all alibi each other for one reason or another. On the other hand, I can't seriously imagine a suspect among all of you in the main house here, even admitting that Sir George, and particularly his lady, are a bit of a rum go, both of them, oh, but particularly her. Are you, uh, are you referring to her belief in spiritualism, Superintendent? Eh, hey, that'd be it, sir. And then, uh, a couple of things Sir George told me. Oh, may I ask what? Oh, my intention is to tell you. That's why I brought it up. First off, he said he came down here by candlelight and found the deceased. Mm. But the, before he did, passing the mantel place, the candle went out. Just as something like, well, in his own words, something spectral brushed across my cheek and I saw in front of my face two barred eyes looking at me. Uh. Barred eyes. Now, what does that mean? Oh, that's exactly what I asked, sir. And, and he replied, eyes that looked at me as though through the bars of a cage. And then I was conscious of a strange flat taste in my mouth and the odor of damp and decay. And I lit the candle and saw poor Charles. Now, what do you make of that, sir? Well... You've seen the corpse. What do you make of it, Superintendent? Oh, I don't, sir. That's why I'm asking you. Uh -huh. uh, you don't believe in ghosts, I take it. Well, I haven't. <laughs> uh, oh, I know you've been in on many investigations, however, where it seemed to be something like that, only, you know, wasn't. Well, can you think of any other explanation for this death? Meaning that you think it was something, uh... Supernatural? Well, I don't see any other explanation for the moment. Oh, I wouldn't think that would quite satisfy my superiors. I mean, it's quite clear the chap couldn't have killed himself, you see. So someone else has to be guilty. And I hope for everyone's sake we can find out just who. It was sheer inadvertence that I happened to be in the solarium right off the porch where this interview took place. Or was it? Because as soon as it was over and the sergeant had left, um, Flaxman came out to join me. John, you heard that? Yes, I'm beginning to wonder if I was meant to. I uh, wasn't quite deliberate on my part, but since I knew you were here, I thought you might just as well because of tonight. Tonight? What is tonight? I, uh, I don't know how much it'll help with the police, but it might lead to ultimate proof for me. To win an argument with you that has stretched out over many years of correspondence. I am still in the dark. Well, as I or we may very well find ourselves tonight. Aha, uh -huh. where? In the room where Charles died. I intend to spend a night there as he did. Um, do you want to share my vigil against the total powers of darkness? <laughs> And as Professor Thierry regards his brilliant but strange friend and intellectual enemy, remembering the horrible death he has seen one man suffer, but pondering the challenge of ultimate proof on a basic principle, I must leave them, and you, till I return with Act Three. difficult day at Yand Manor House. The comings and goings, police, photographers, inevitably the newspapers. Finally, the undertaker and the removal of what is left of Charles Volney's terrestrial presence. Sir George and his wife have naturally been totally involved in this, and it is not until evening that their guests, who have tactfully tried to stay out from underfoot, have been able to exchange more than a few words with either of them. Now, Mrs. Blackburton has at last been able to find a moment alone with Flaxman Lowe, walking in the garden. 
It's all my fault, you see. No, no, I don't see. I was the one who talked George into coming back to Yan Manor after all these years. Oh, Lady Blackburn, there's a bench right here. Would you like to sit down? Oh, beside the mausoleum? Why not? It's strangely appropriate. Why? What is this building? Well, that's part of it all. Yen Manor has been in George's family since a sort of granduncle willed it to his grandfather with a specific reservation. And that was? That in perpetuity, till the last of the Blackburton heirs, Yen House must remain in the family's hands. And that if the family didn't occupy it, it couldn't be rented. Well, now, I doubt if that would hold up in any legal court. Possibly not, but beyond that, there was the curse. The curse? That anyone who broke the promise or the letter of it would die a horrible death. Oh, I see. And, uh, Sir George believed this. George is such a decent man, Dr. Lowe. It wouldn't have had to go that far. He would have just lived up to a family promise as his father and he had in their own way and kept Gand House without living in it. But you see, I was the one who forced the issue. You decided that as long as you were back in England, it was silly not to live in a house you already owned. Yes. Plus, by now, my... My dedication to spiritualism, my new venture into the occult. Mm -hmm. So I'm the author and the instrument of this tragedy. I feel as if I'd actually murdered my nephew, Charles. Oh, well, Lady Blackbird, and I don't understand that. Because having forced George to return here against his will, he'd rebelled. He didn't like all these supernatural manifestations. And it was only at my insistence, at my plea, that he brought you down here. If they couldn't be stopped, or explained, he determined to sell the property and destroy this mausoleum as soon as it was legally possible. And uh, may I ask who rests here? That uncle of George's grandfather who started this whole thing. His body is actually in that tomb? Yes. Locked in a strange lead casket. A lead casket? This uncle was a strange man with an inordinate fear of death. Oh. It said that he predicted his own death and arranged to have a doctor in attendance. And he died very suddenly and unexpectedly. I see. Uh, Lady Blackburton, you're asking for my help, aren't you? I have no right to, but... Yes. I feel that my hobbies have inadvertently led my husband and his family into a terrible peril. The only one I know who might save them is you. I see. Then may I have your husband's and your permission to spend tonight in the den as your nephew did last night? Well, I don't want to risk your life. Well, I won't deny it may be risk, but... Uh, first of all, I know what I'm doing, which your nephew did not. And second, I shall not be alone. And so it was we came to that fateful night. My friend Flaxman Lowe and I entered that fearful room, closed the door behind us, and settled down to challenge whatever malevolent spirit he thought still occupied it. I was still skeptical and remaining to be convinced. This is the account of that evening. It was very different from the night before. No wind was stirring. It had been a beautiful sunset. There was no need for a fire. And for some time, after long discussion, Jean, Thierry, and I were sitting quietly. All of a sudden, he rose. Uh, I'm thirsty. Would you like a drink? Uh, no, no. Thank you, Jean. I want to have all my senses alert. I meant only plain water. No, thank you. Oh, what an abominable... Taste. What, the water? No, I haven't touched it yet. It, it is as if some horrible fly has flown into my mouth. It is mm. disgusting. Yes, yes, like, like a fungus growth. Yes, repulsive like that. Yeah, I ask only because I feel the same. Well, I think you're about to be convinced. Uh, you don't mean that. Why did you put out the lamp? I didn't. Uh, light the candle beside you on the table. Very well. 
Tonnerre. Uh, give me your matches, Dr. Lowe. Mine are damp. Uh, where are you? I'm here. Oh, it is as dark as Egypt. Uh, I am coming. I'm coming. Uh, it is so hard to get along. Hard to get along? Yes, I, I am unable to move. I am suffocating. Where are you? I, I am here by the door. I... of smothering cold human flesh. I fought against it, gasping for breath, the clammy flesh crowding over me, smothering me like some fat, nauseating humanoid jellyfish. And then, across my cheek, there was a stinging, reeking pain. With my last strength, I fled the terror. There was a crash of glass, a wild rush of air, and I knew no more. When I came to, I saw the dawn was breaking to the east, and I was lying on the lawn of Yand Manor House. Above me was a shattered lattice window swinging in the wind, and clutched in my hand was something dark in color, slender and twisted. It might have been the skin of an adder, a piece of bark rolling itself up like a parchment scroll or the desiccated claw of some unimaginable beast from hell. I hurried into the house, barely conscious of the smarting pain in my left cheek, fearful only for my friend Jean. I found him unconscious just outside the door to that baleful room, but thank God, alive. Uh, uh, oh, yes, just take it easy, Jean. Excellent. All right, now, can you stand? Are you all right? Yes, huh? I think so. All right. You have a bruise on your forehead. Are you dizzy? No, no, not, not anymore. What happened to you? I, I don't know. I, I was literally crowded out of the room by that infernal thing. What was it? With its damp, swelling flesh, I was buried in that stifling pulp it pushed and swelled against me, driving me away from you in the dark to the door. I, I called out, but I could hear no answer. What was that ghastly presence? Well, I think I can answer that now. It was what killed the young man, no? Yes, the very same. And I hope I can convince the inspector of that. Well, you have made a convert of me. Why not him? Well, we shall see. Now, first of all, Sir George, the uh, spectral hand that seemed to brush across your face as you told Superintendent Bumbry. Yes? Uh, you, were, you were by the uh, fireplace at the time, passing the ornamental foremantle that rises above it. Yes. Uh, you see all those figures carved there, in particular the griffin, and the, uh, hanging from the sharp point of its beak, these... Human hairs. Yes, human hairs, black. Now, uh, whose would you say they were? Both Professor Thierry and myself are gray, you're light-haired, and your nephew was fair. Sir George is sandy. Now, who else frequents this room? No one, except the maid, who is also graying. But these are a woman's hair. Why? Why? Because they're long? Well, yes. Uh huh. And this? Uh, what is that? Uh, could I see? Sure. Hmm. A long, thin object, half brown, half yellow, and twisted like the blade of a corkscrew. Well, I have no idea. Well, suppose I suggest it's a human nail, which time and neglect is allowed to grow to superhuman proportions. Mon Dieu, it would have to be 12 inches long. Nobody but an ancient Chinese Mandarin could grow such a monstrosity. Or a corpse who refused to die. I don't quite get that last. Uh, Mr. Superintendent, let me project something. This uh, uncle who left Yant Manor House to your grandfather, Sir George. Was he dark and her suit? Was he a recluse? Did he build a mausoleum in the garden? And did he have an inordinate fear of death? Yes. To all counts. And is it not true that both you and the nephew who might have been your heir were ready to take all steps to get rid of this mausoleum and or Yand Manor House, particularly your nephew? I suppose so. Then, Superintendent, I can categorically tell you that your murderer lies in the casket in that mausoleum and the murderer of anyone who tries to oust him from this property as long as he shall live. Are you suggesting that a man dead over a century is still in some sense... Alive? Unless 
it sustains injury itself. The brain is the last to die. In fact, it's the only measure of finite death. Now open the coffin and you'll see what I mean. It was complicated, of course, with all the necessary red tape. But on a certain day, the coffin, which took ten men to move out into the sunlight and sealed as tight as a drum, was opened. Perhaps, perhaps, Lady Blackburton. But you see, the urge, the dream, the thirst for immortality persists. His own special coffin sealed airtight. So confining that when his soul stirred beyond his finite body, he must have had an illimitable desire to expand and choke out anyone who stood in his way. But after a hundred years, the flesh, the form, still... Skin undisturbed. Except for the hair and the nails and the eyelashes. Look at the length of them. All of them must have kept growing since he was locked in the coffin. Are you suggesting this man was... or is still alive? In a sense, yes, Superintendent. You see, he seems to have mastered some ancient formula whereby the body is saved from complete disintegration. And you can see that evidence before you. So that closes your case for you, Mr. Superintendent. Now you know how young Mr. Volney met his death. And what about us, Dr. Lowe? Oh, I think you'll have little reason for fear being haunted anymore. You see, in the sunlight, the body already is beginning to disintegrate. By the end of the day, there'll be nothing left but a fleshless skeleton. How can I thank you for what you've accomplished? I don't thank me. It's fate. And the proper relationship of things. God and the world have a way of reestablishing those. And have I convinced you, Professor, that at least there is something beyond your pragmatic values? My dear Dr. Lowe, you have convinced me that you will add another branch to our sciences. But I must admit, you establish your facts too well for my total peace of mind. The remarkable Flaxman Lowe, parapsychic private eye, has been and continues to be a dominating figure in the field of parapsychology and in unraveling its mysteries, or at least illuminating them. If this is a field which interests you, perhaps I shall bring you other cases in the future. of that ominous and ancient ancestor have long been transferred to a normal burying place and the mausoleum torn down. Sir George and his wife stay on at Yand Manor House. Cynthia Blackburton has long since given up spiritualism and assorted interests in favor of feminism. Of course, since she is still in the 19th century, you might not recognize it for what it is today. But her spirit lingers on through the women's suffragette movement, through memories of Emma Goldman and her sister standard bearers, who were the progenitors of women's lib. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Paul Hecht, Betty Winkler, Guy Sorrell, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.
have another story to tell you today. This one is about a crime in which a murderer is trapped by one of the most powerful forces of nature. Do you want to hear it? Now starring Paul Fries as your teller of tales, another story from The Black Book. Yes, from the world's most fabulous collection of strange and unusual stories, The Black Book, I have selected a story called The Vagabond Murder. Eric Patterson was growing desperate. He'd been there for over two hours, waiting. Waiting with less and less patience for the door in front of him to open. He listened intently for the warning sound of the key in the door. Eric needed to be warned because when the man he was waiting for entered the room, Eric was going to kill him. As the seconds ticked past in the darkness, Eric thought back to the beginning of all this. It was in New York. He had taken his wife, Karen, along on a business trip. It had been quite successful, and one of the best contacts he'd made was Henry Drucker. Drucker, the richest, most influential man in the whole investment business. And he seemed to like Eric from the start. And with Karen, they made a gay trio the last few days. Rounds of cocktail parties, the theater, endless nightclubs. And then on the last evening of all, Drucker had said, Look, Eric, why not join me on the Bermuda trip? The best thing in the world for you and Karen. My yacht sails tomorrow. What do you say? At first, Eric thought it was just talk. But he was wrong. And the next day, they sailed for Bermuda on Drucker's yacht, the Vagabond. It wasn't until the return trip that Eric began to suspect that it wasn't him Drucker was really interested in. But Karen... And then the night before they were to dock in New York, it happened. The three of them were sitting at the small bar after dinner when Karen got up, said she wanted some fresh air, and went out on deck. A few minutes later, Drucker excused himself. I think I'll go to my cabin, Eric. But I won't be long. Uh, Wait here for me, will you? Well, yes, if you like. Good. Then we'll have a nightcap together. And so Eric was left alone. As he sat there, disturbing images began to form in Eric's mind. Pictures of Drucker, handsome, virile, wealthy, and of Karen, young, beautiful, and oh, so impressionable. With a suddenness that overturned the bar stool, Eric was on his feet, and half running, he crossed the room and went down the corridor to Drucker's stateroom. Drucker! Drucker, open the door! Drucker, do you hear me? Open this door, I'll break it down! Just a minute, Eric. I'll be right there. Just take it easy. I'll take it easy till I count to five, then I'm coming in. One, two... Three. All right, Eric. Where's she? Where's my wife? Well, you must be drunk, Eric. Karen isn't in here. Was she in here, Drucker? Tell me the truth. Don't be a fool, Eric. Of course she wasn't. And why was your door... Oh. Oh, I... I guess I have made a fool of myself. I'm sorry, Drucker. Mm, forget it. I'll tell you why I locked the door. You see, Eric, I'm diabetic and have to give myself an insulin shot about this time every night. Naturally, I don't talk about it, nor do I like anyone barging in while I'm at it. Eric stood there feeling like a fool while Drucker washed the hypodermic needle and put it away in a box. Eric watched him place the box next to a packet of insulin capsules in the drawer of the night table by his bunk. I can understand your jealousy, old man, with a wife as lovely as Karen... But I know women, Eric, and Karen is in love with you. She always will be. Look, I, I'm terribly sorry about this, drug. Oh, now, let's just forget all about it. Matter of fact, I've been wanting to talk to you about something. I've already told Karen. And it should prove how I feel about you, Eric. Here, pour yourself a drink. Thanks, I need it. Um, you know anything about uranium? Well, it's expensive. Know anything about Peru? What are you driving at? Uranium in Peru, Eric. Big. Really big. 
And the payoff is so big that I was going to put in $750,000 on my own. But I'll let you have 250000 of it if you want it. Hmm. That's a lot of money. Mm. So is a return of 23%. Yeah. But I haven't got that much. I'd have to borrow on everything. 180 days should see the first dividends. You'll have a certified check within two weeks. Back in New York, Eric and Drucker spent hours poring over graphs, reports, charts, surveys to make certain their investment was sound and they could find no flaw. But six months later, Eric learned that even the most guilt-edged promotion can fail. Uranium in Peru didn't make him a millionaire. It ruined him. It took his entire personal fortune. And because he'd borrowed so heavily, his business and his credit were ruined. Eric suddenly found himself without a single capital asset. In desperation, he went to see Drucker. So that's the picture, Eric. There isn't a thing I can do. Yes, of of course, I understand your position. All my cash assets went to, and everything else of mine's tied up. You can't touch it for years. Well, we took a chance, and we both lost. Thanks again, Drucker. Um, Eric, do you have any plans? Well, I've had an offer from the coast. Oh. A small investment house in Oakland. Well, I'm sure it'll work out fine. Uh, tell me about Karen. How is she taking all this? Karen? Oh, she's... She's really great, Drucker. Now she decided to go back to modeling in New York for six months or so. Just while I'm getting started, you understand. She's a fine girl, Eric. You're very lucky. Yes, I know I am. Well, goodbye and thanks again. Out in California, Eric thought often of Drucker. After all, it was part of the game. They'd miss this time, but maybe the next. More often, however, he thought about Karen in New York. He'd heard from her regularly at first, and then the letters stopped. For six weeks, he heard nothing. He phoned long distance again and again, but nothing was able to find her. And he was beginning to be beside himself with worry and fear. Then one night, his phone rang. Yes, hello. Uh, Mr. Patterson? Yes? Uh, this is Oliver Fay. I do a little gossip column here for the Herald. I hope you read me. No, I don't. Uh, well, anyway, perhaps you'd like to make a statement. Statement? What are you talking about? Well, it's about the marriage of Karen, your perfectly lovely ex-wife, and Henry Drucker. Where'd you hear this? <laughs> I never reveal my sources, Mr. Patterson, but they're driving Mr. Drucker's Nash Healy out from Reno tomorrow. They'll be married aboard the Vagabond. Oh, it'll be terribly romantic, sailing off to the Seven Seas in search of happiness, nursing their newfound love under the Southern Cross. Oh. And... At first, Eric thought it was all a lie, that perhaps he was the victim of a cruel prank. But he had to find out. And an hour later, he was standing on a fog-wet pier, looking at the sleek white outline of the vagabond. And suddenly, as waves of nausea swept through him, he understood everything. Drucker had deliberately ruined him, and undoubtedly with Karen's knowledge. These last six weeks, Karen had been in Reno, divorcing him by default. Everything had been taken from him. His money, his wife, his pride, and he hated them for it. Derek stood there raging, his eyes fixed on the porthole he knew to be that of Drucker's own cabin. And suddenly he realized that he was going to kill Drucker. And a second later he knew how he was going to kill him. He returned to his rooms and dialed the number of the Herald, asking for Oliver Fay. Fay speaking. Mr. Fay, uh, this is Eric Patterson. Oh, yes. Uh... Look, I, I want to apologize for my rudeness earlier this evening. Oh, that's all right, Mr. Patterson. People are often harsh. Yes, well, I'm sorry. I would like to give you a statement now. It's simply that Henry Drucker and I are close friends, and, well, there's no ill feeling between any of us. You understand. I certainly wish them the best of everything. Well, good. I'll print that, and I'll show it to them tomorrow night. And, you know, there's a pre-wedding party aboard the Vagabond. Oh? What time are they sailing? I 
Might want to send them a wire. Well, I have my little notes right here. Let me see now. Cocktails at 5.30, then dinner at about 8, and finally the sailing uh, around 2 a.m., I think. You know, it's going to be such fun. I'm the only one of the literary crowd they've included. Oliver Fay gushed on, but Eric wasn't listening now. He had all the information he needed. Henry Drucker was as good as dead right now. About 6.30 next evening, Eric stood in the shadows of the pier and watched the last of the guests arrive and board the vagabond. Then he walked quickly across the open area directly to the porthole of Drucker's cabin. He was unobserved. The porthole was on a level with the pier, and Eric had to lie on his stomach in order to crawl through it. A moment later, he was safely inside. He closed the porthole and waited for his eyes to become accustomed to the darkness. Then he found the night table by Drucker's bunk and removed the hypodermic needle and insulin. Quickly, he filled the syringe with more than enough insulin to kill a man and placed it carefully on top of the table. Next, he found a towel and rolled it lengthwise. With it, he could choke Drucker into unconsciousness without leaving a mark. Now he was ready. An hour passed. Then two. And a third, more slowly than ever. And for the first time, Eric grew nervous. Another hour and the towel in his hands was wet with perspiration. What had happened? Had Drucker, in the excitement of the evening, forgotten his injection? Panic began to rise in Eric, and he fought it back desperately. And then suddenly, he heard a key in the door. He stood back and waited. The door opened, and Drucker, a black figure against the light of the corridor, entered the cabin. Eric waited until he'd locked the door behind him. Then he moved. The towel went around Drucker's neck and Eric twisted it with a frenzied strength. After a moment or two, Drucker ceased to struggle and Eric finally released him. He might have been dead already, but to be sure and to make it look like suicide or an accident, he injected the overdose of insulin. Then it was over. Perfect. Eric sighed deeply with relief and satisfaction. Mr. Drucker? Uh, Mr. Drucker? Oh, come now, I know you're in there. You promised me an interview, you know. Terror-stricken Eric moved to the portal. His hands trembled as he opened it and prepared to climb through. But something was wrong. The portal was open, but he couldn't get out. Blocking it six inches from his hands was a solid wall of pilings, great timbers side by side. The floor of the pier was now two feet above him. For a moment he was dazed. And then he knew. The tide. The tide was going out, and the ship had dropped a few feet with it. The tide had cut off Eric's only escape. He was hopelessly trapped. He sat down heavily, almost ready to cry. I'm still here, Mr. Drucker. And I'll wait right here all night if necessary. (laughs) Uh, Do you hear me? Black Book stars Paul Frees as your teller of tales, assisted today by the noted Hollywood actor John Daner. The Vagabond Murder was written by Norman MacDonnell and John Meston and directed by Mr. MacDonald. The special music is composed and conducted by Leith Stevens. Every Monday night, a top Hollywood star plays the leading role in a thrill-packed story on suspense on most of these same CBS radio stations. Clarence Cassell speaking. Remember, Broadway Playhouse brings you top stars and top stories Sunday nights on the CBS Radio Network. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here in the grim stone structure on the Thames, which houses Scotland Yard, is a warehouse of homicide, where everyday objects, a picture frame, a coat hanger, a file folder, 
baby buggy, all are touched by murder. Now here's a hammerhead made of cast steel, well shaped, extremely familiar. The front end blunt, solid. Designed for driving nails, the clawed prongs at the rear for pulling nails. Very practical, very, very, very familiar. And so very, very, very lethal. Good one, this, wasn't it, Inspector? Just a little extra patience, a little extra routine work, Cross? That's one way to look at it, sir. I prefer to remember it as the case which began with almost two dozen disappearances and wound up with one killer who used a hammer with purpose. Well, today that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. From the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. In just a moment, you will hear the Black Museum... Starring Orson Welles. Now, the Black Museum, starring Orson Welles. Well, here we are in the Black Museum, Scotland Yard's Museum of Murder. Beyond these walls, the Thames seethes with a commerce which is life to London. Within these walls, where some of the river's dampness exudes from vaulted stone, there is quiet, very sinister quiet, a kind of silence which inevitably surrounds objects touched by horror and fear. Yes, here lies death. Behind glass doors, peaceful, inanimate objects on deal tables... The authorities have provided suitable identification in labels and neatly lettered cards. The motives, actions, and the reasons why these objects rest here now were all provided by murderers. Here's a calendar. The usual 12-page printed piece with a picture of a pretty girl to decorate it. The holidays are marked as usual in red. One other day is marked as well. The day and date of a murder. Strangely, that red circle led to capture and conviction of course to execution. Ah, here we are. Here's, here's the hammerhead I told you about. It's an efficient tool. It's hammerhead. Type used by generations of carpenters, by millions everywhere for work around the house. Hardly a home is without one. And one would expect that a story involving such a tool would begin in somebody's home. But on the contrary, this tale begins in the direct antithesis to a home. It begins in a London railroad station. Let me have my bag, will you? Yes, sir. Uh, your check, please. Right you are. Thank you, sir. Here it is, sir. Hey, that's not my bag. Mine's a Gladstone. I'm oh, sorry, sir. Uh, just let me see the checks. Oh. What's wrong? Are you sick? No, no sir. It's just my hand. You cut yourself? That's blood. Yes, I, I know. But it's not a cut, sir. It's from the bag. Well, open it, man. Don't stand there. Yes, sir. It doesn't seem like much of a lock on it, sir. Oh. What, is, what does one do now, sir? When you find part of a body in a police, you call the police, of course. What else? Yes. Uh, please wait, yes. I'll call Yes, call the police. Start the wheels moving, the wheels of police routine, which grind slowly but inevitably toward discovery. In this particular situation, the call led eventually to the office of Inspector Church at the Here's yard. Information, Cross. The contents of that valise at Charing Cross belong to a torso found in Brighton. Another one in Brighton, sir? Number 23... Twenty-three girls missing. Just unreported. Photos available, sir? In most cases. Here's the assembled composite of the latest. Hmm. Pretty little thing. To wind up so widely separated as London and Brighton. Here's the setup for now. I'm assigning a man individually to each case. Identify any found bodies, trace the known missing. I'm taking Daisy Baker myself. You'll take over here and all the information will channel through you. Very well, sir. Now, why the Baker girl for yourself, sir? Oh, she is, or was, the common-law wife of Jamie Marsden. That one! Remember him? Oh, picked him up in his first conviction myself. 
Rather a long record, hasn't he, sir? All petty crimes, short sentences. In any case, the Baker woman's been reported missing by her sister. It might be worth a trip to see the sister. Her name is Crandall, Ruth Crandall. Before I drop in in Marsden, I think I'll visit the lady. A routine call to inquire the reasons for a woman's worry about her missing sister. Inspector Church found Ruth Crandall at home. So, when I planned to go down to stay with Daisy, well, to see her anyway, and the wire came... Well, you see how it is, Inspector. May I see the wire, Mrs. Crandall? Uh, yes, I have it just here, in the desk. Yes. Yes, here it is. I see. Going abroad. Good job. Sail Sunday. Will write. Well, it doesn't tell us very much, does it? Well, I tried to call. Her husband, well, he wasn't very cooperative. He said she'd upped and packed her things and told him she was bound for Paris for a dancing job. Oh, Miss Baker is a dancer? That's how it was. She was living in Brighton. She was in some show down there. And you feel something is wrong? Definitely. I don't know exactly why, but... Well, you see, the wire doesn't even say love. And that makes it seem strange too, doesn't it, Inspector? Perhaps, Mrs. Crandall. And you've no other information, nothing you can put your finger on? Hmm? No. Except, of course, that I haven't heard from Daisy since the wire came. The inspector was puzzled. None of it felt right. None of it conformed at all to the usual pattern. Ruth Crandall had nothing factual to go on, and a woman's instinct is never evidence on which to base an arrest or a conviction. Still, the inspector took the train to Brighton and called on Jamie Marsden at 35 Park Row. Yes. You remember me, Marsden? Uh, copper, ain't you? Yes, Chief Inspector Church, CID. Well, come in, Inspector. I don't suppose this is a social visit. No, I'm a bit busy for that sort of thing. Oh, well, sit down anyway, Inspector. Just a few questions. Well, go ahead. I hear you married since we last met. Yes, I did. Nice girl. She home? Well, um... No, as a matter of fact, she's, uh, she's gone off to Paris. Her job as a dancer over there. So her sister told me. Yeah, well, she wired her sister. Nothing much my sister-in-law would want to see me about, so, uh, well, there wasn't much sense in her coming all the way down to Brighton when Daisy wasn't here. I assume you have your wife's address. Uh, well, uh, no, Inspector. Oh? We had a bit of a dust-up before Daisy left. She, uh, flounced out of here all kind of mad, as you might say. Mrs. Crandall know this? No. Mrs. Crandall don't take to the likes of me, so I saw no reason to tell anything she didn't have to know. If Daisy wants to reach her, she knows where. Well, that's it, I suppose. You'll be here if I want to see you again, Marsden? I'm moving. Uh, three rooms is a bit large for me, seeing as I was on my own these days. The uh, new place is at uh, Maitland Street, uh, uh, number 26. It's a good bit cheaper. More suited to my me. A check of the habitual haunts and acquaintances of Daisy Baker drew another blank. Some had heard she'd gone off to Paris. No one knew where. Meanwhile, the reports on other missing girls were equally discouraging. That's the lot, eh, Cross? That's the lot, sir. But when uh, another missing one reported, makes an even two dozen, sir. Have they tried the picture of the girl we found in Charing Cross on this new report? Uh, not the same girl, sir. No, too bad. No luck with Marsden, I presume? No luck at all. Edge is on a fellow, that one. Yes, he ought to be. He's much too familiar with us and he knows it. Well, there's no help for it. It'll have to be a house-to-house -house search. The usual district, Inspector? All of Brighton. Rather a large order, Inspector. Finding 14 missing girls and identifying six of ten bodies is quite an order cross. There's no help for it. It'll have to be done. Chances are we'll have to lend Brighton... The hard, dull down. slogging of police routine. Divide a city into sections. Assign groups of detectives in pairs to each section, then... Walk from house to house, from cellar to attic, pausing for the questions, questions, questions. Try to locate someone who has seen something, who may know one of the missing persons by sight. Try. Keep trying. Well, <clears throat> there was nothing there. It's jobs like this, Inspector, that make me wonder why I wanted to be a policeman. It's jobs like this, Shaw, that make good policemen out of ambitious young men. Well, next address. 26 Maitland. I expect Jimmy Marsden won't be looking for me this quickly. Marsden? Who's that? Oh, petty criminal. His wife was reported missing by a sister. Turned out she'd gone off to a job in Paris and her half. Knock on the door, Shaw, will you? Yes. Sordid kind of story. Even a touch of the dope rack in it. Yes? My credentials. CID. Also a search warrant. Well, you, you meant it suddenly didn't waste any time. Please come in. Waste any time? 
Yeah, I, I called the police about five minutes ago. They said they'd send someone over. Are you the landlord? I am, Inspector. Well, we're here on a matter of our own. However, what's the trouble? Notice anything, sir? I do. How about you, Shaw? Yes, sir, I do. It's from this room. The tenant is out just now. Left his door locked. Name of Marsden. Well, is that so? Just as well we have the search warrant. Try your shoulder in that door, Shaw. Yes, sir. Oh. We've never had anything like this before, sir. Well, there's nothing much here unless it's on the walls. There's a trunk in the closet, sir. Drag it out. Cut those cords. Yes, sir. Good. Good Lord. Uh, may I stay outside, Inspector? Yes, of course. I wonder Marsden isn't home. Well, Daisy Baker didn't go to Paris after all. Took quite a beating, didn't she? Looks like a blunt instrument did the job. Call headquarters, Shaw. Pick up order for Jamie Marsden. Well, today, that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. And now we continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. The wires were alive with the search for Jamie Marsden, somewhere in England. The little petty thief was hiding. And sometime he would be found. According to Chief Inspector Church, the man almost undoubtedly killed Daisy Baker. And there's no question that he had her body in that trunk moving it with him. An inquiry into the whereabouts of missing girls had blossomed into a full hunt for a murderer. The premises at 26 Maitland Street, Brighton, were given a thorough going over. Detective Shaw reported Nothing, sir. Not a trace of anything except that trunk in the body. To which Inspector Church replied, Very well. Now give the same treatment to 35 Park Row. There, the young detective reported, In the backyard, sir, in a pile of junk, we found a hammerhead. It's been given to pathology, Inspector. There are stains on it. They might be blood, sir. And, as Inspector Church said to his deputy, Inspector Cross, some 48 hours later... Pathology report, Cross. That hammerhead did the job. The stains of blood and the type conform. Good enough, sir. Not quite. Good enough. The handle is gone. There's no proof who used the hammer. And pathology also reports that the autopsy shows enough morphine in the Baker woman's body to establish unconsciousness before death, if not death itself. Any record of dope handing in Marston dossier, sir? Nope. We haven't been able to tie him into that yet. Well, we'll see after we find the gentleman in question. Meanwhile, have them get me Brighton on the wire. I have a routine job for Detective Shaw. Too many loose ends in this one. The call was made to Detective Shaw in Brighton. Armed with a postcard, a file number, and a hand-lettered menu, Detective Shaw invaded a certain telegraph office in Brighton. Yes, sir. Always glad to cooperate with the police, sir. Can you find me the original of this wire? I think so, sir. Just a moment, please. Uh, this is it, I assume, sir. It has the same file number. Mm, yeah, yes, that's it. Going abroad, good job. Thank you very much. Now, if you'll just let me compare the writing on the blank with these samples I have with me. Detective Shaw noted his comparisons and went to the telephone. A few moments later, he put a call through to Inspector Church at the yard. Go ahead, Shaw. What have you got? They had the original, sir. I compared it with the postcard with the Baker woman's writing on it. I'm no expert, sir, but it's obvious the two writings are absolutely different. That's that, then. I had a specimen of Marsden's writing, too, sir. Where did you get that? From a restaurant, where the man worked for a while as a waiter. The menus there are handwritten. It was part of his job to write them out. Good man. There's no question about it, sir. Marsden wrote that wire and signed the Baker woman's name to it. <laughs> Another link in the chain rapidly forging itself around Jamie Marsden. But still, no Jamie Marsden. Every policeman in England's carrying the man's picture and descriptions up. How long is it going to take to bring the picture and the man together? Not too long, Inspector. In fact, within 24 hours. Here, you. Just a minute. 
You want me, Constable? Stand over there, in the street light. Very well. No weapons? Now, why should I be carrying a weapon, Constable? I'm just an ordinary citizen. Let's have a close look at you. Yes, I'm sure of it. You'll have to come along to the station house. You're being taken in charge. What for? You're Jamie Marsden, unless I miss my guess by a mile. Don't you know there's an all-stations broadcast out for you? You're the most wanted man in England this minute. That was in Manchester. Very shortly thereafter, Jamie Marsden faced Inspector Church and Deputy Inspector Cross in their office at the yard. All right, Marsden, let's hear it. All of it. I didn't kill her, Inspector. I didn't kill her. But you knew she was dead. Well, if you mean... Did I put her in the trunk? I did. But you didn't kill her. No, sir. You've got to believe that. Apparently you seem to understand that it's somewhat difficult to believe. Well, that was the whole thing from the beginning. All right. Let's go back to the beginning. Well, me and Daisy got together down in Brighton about a year ago. Oh. Oh, she was dancing in a coot show and I was barking a booth a little way up the sidewalk. Well, sort of got into the habit of meeting her after closing time. Then, well, we reckon that two can live as cheaply as one, so, well... We put in together and started housekeeping. Were you pushing any of the stuff her way? I didn't know she was on the stuff. No, not, 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 not for months. Inspector, you've got to believe it. Yes, it seems that a lot of things we've got to believe. You heard, Cross Marsden. <clears throat> I'm, shall I say, sceptical too. Keep talking. I'm honest with you, sir, I am. Uh, keep talking. Well, Daisy's sister came to visit. We didn't get along. If I'd have killed anyone, it'd have been that sister. What she came for except to be nasty and snoop, I don't know. Back to the story, Marsden. Yeah, 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 all right, sir. Well, like I was saying, we, we got together and everything was fine. <laughs> oh, we had a couple of fights, but, uh, oh, nothing much. Then Daisy said as our sister was coming down again. I got real mad. I slammed the door. You didn't slam, Daisy. I may have cuffed her a bit, sir. Nothing, nothing serious. Anyways, I went out and I stayed out for a couple of hours. I come back and... The place was awful quiet, and I thought, well, maybe Daisy had gone out or taken a shot or two or something. I walked into the bedroom. That was at 35, where we had the three rooms. You walked into the bedroom and let her have it, right, Marsden? No, so wrong. She had it. Oh, it was awful, Inspector. She was real bashed up, she was. Well, why didn't you call the police? Me? With my record? Uh, who'd have believed I didn't do it? You don't believe me now. I never killed nobody, just been put away for small things, but I got a record. Nobody had listened, I reckon, so... I got real scared. I, I, I did the first thing that entered my head. Which was, Marsden? I, I got an old trunk and, and I stuffed her in it and then I, I took the sheets and all down to the cellar and I stuffed them in the furnace. Well, the rest you know, Inspector, and that's the truth, so help me. What did you do with the hammer, Marsden? Hammer? Oh, what hammer, Inspector? The one you bashed her with, Marsden, the hammer that killed her. I don't know about no hammer. I didn't kill her nor nobody. I didn't kill her, Inspector, and that's the truth. They worked on Jamie Marsden for three days. They tried every trick, every question they could think of, but no one could shake his denial. Jamie Marsden insisted he had not killed Daisy Baker, and that was that. Weary and exhausted, Chief Inspector Church faced his deputy. You know, Cross, I am almost beginning to believe Marsden myself. If he did kill her, it's completely out of the pattern. His kind of criminal almost never kills. I know, but somebody killed her. Even granting Marsden's story, somebody killed her. Well, then, where do we go from here, sir? Where would you doubt there were? There had been other men in this woman's life. Have you any doubt about it, sir? Do you suppose the sister would have any ideas? Well, it's a place to start in any case. Check. Then let's get on with it, Cross, and ask the Brighton police to work in that angle. The sister, Ruth Crandall, place to start on a new angle at any rate. The two CID men paid their second visit to Mrs. Crandall. I suppose, Inspector... You've come to ask me to testify at Marsden's trial. Nasty little man. As a matter of fact, we haven't. We don't have enough evidence yet to send Marsden to trial. We're booked on suspicion, that's all. Not enough evidence? Oh, hardly seems possible. The papers were full of it. The newspapers aren't the police, ma'am. Of course not, Mr. Cross. But after all, he did keep my sister's body with him. He did run away. I know, Mrs. Crandall. But there's been no weapon that relates to Marsden. No weapon? The hammer's head... Well, after all, that's a weapon. Did you say a Mrs. hammer man? Candle, we came here to ask you about another man in your sister's life. Have you any ideas? I know this much, Inspector. But my sister was no better than a reputation. Heaven knows I tried. All my life I tried. When my husband died, I offered her a home even. 
though she persisted in the disgraceful kind of life she was leading. She even boasted to me once that she liked it. As for knowing the kind of men she went around with... Really, Inspector, you see how I live. How would I know anything about things like that? I see. Well, Mrs. Crandall, if you think of anything which may be of help, we'll appreciate your letting us know. Two men with a purpose left the neat suburban residence of Daisy Baker's sister... Shortly after their return to Scotland Yard, the teletypes, the telephones were all busy. Reports were swift and coming in. Here's word from the hardware store, sir. A hammer was bought. The janitor at 35 Park Road did see someone that day. They found a taxi driver in Brighton who remembers. One of the neighbors places the date exactly. So she remembers the house was empty because a little boy was ill and she wanted to borrow something. Here's the final touch. Local bus driver remembers the trip from out there to the railroad station. The final touch. And once again, two men from the CID went visiting. We've traced your movements all that day, Mrs. Crandall. Your neighbor remembers your house was shut up. The bus driver remembers how you asked if you'd reached the station on time. A taxi driver in Brighton remembers taking you to 35 Park Row. The janitor saw you there. And the hardware dealer right round the corner from here has a record of his sale of a hammer to you. You shouldn't have mentioned that hammer, Mrs. Crandall. We never told the newspapers about finding it in the backyard at Brighton. I was right. She wasn't fit to live. Everyone pitied me on account of my sister. They looked down on me. I never felt better in my life than when I hit her and hit her and then broke the handle off the hammer and burned it in that furnace at that awful house. <laughs> If only I'd been a little more careful. Then you'd have to have tried that Marsden fellow. <laughs> you'd have to have hung him. Perhaps. <laughs> now then, Mrs. Crandall, are you ready to come quietly? <laughs> and today, that hammerhead can be seen here in the Black Museum. Orson Welles will be back with you in just a moment. Now here in person is Orson Welles. In due course, Henrietta Crandall paid the usual penalty for premeditated homicide. The purchase of the hammer was sufficient evidence of the intent to kill. As for Jamie Marsden, product of the London slums of bad company and evil ways, Jamie went free. But not for long. Six months had barely passed before Marsden was picked up for possession of a deadly weapon and sentenced to serve 90 days for simple theft. And as for the hammerhead, well, here it is, in its usual place, in the Black Museum. So until next time, till another story about this same place, I remain, as always, obediently yours. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. This time, a mystery... A puzzle, if you will, which I challenge you to solve. As with all mysteries worthy of the name, each clue will be honestly and plainly presented to you. And yet, unless I miss my guess, the answer to the puzzle will elude you till the very end. We'll play a game of wits, you and I, just for the fun of it, and see who wins. Unhappily, one of the characters you'll meet, Lost. Our mystery drama, Sting of Death, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by George Lothar and stars William Prince. My first move is to describe the huge barn-like living room of the country home of Trevor Costain, 
explorer, adventurer, author. And the living room reflects the trophies of his travels. On the north wall, headdresses of native tribal chiefs from all over the world. The south wall is covered with awards, trophies. The west wall is hung with native spears, shields, primitive weapons. And on the east wall, above the huge fireplace, hangs a clock. A most bizarre clock. The face is made of a Tugari war shield. Headhunters, you know, the Tugari. The hands of the clock are made of, uh, well, human thigh bones. And the hours from 1 to 12, are marked by shrunken human heads. Well, don't look so horrified. I told you the Tugari were headhunters. And when I told you that, I gave you your first important clue. See what you can do with it. Liz, give me another drink. Trevor, the doctor... I know, I know, but if I'm going to die, I'm going to die happy. Dad, the disease. You know what alcohol does to you because of it? I'm in enough pain, Furry. Stop calling me Dad. He is your son-in-law, Father. Don't remind me, Jackie. Liz, that drink, please. Some son-in-law. Some husband. An alcoholic who's put you through purgatory since the day you married him. That's ended now. I haven't had a drink since I joined AA five weeks ago. I wish I could believe that. You can't. Oh, Fari, here's your drink, Trevor. Thanks. Oh, Father, you're not going to smoke, too. Did I say I was going to smoke? Well, every time you pick up one of your pipes... Oh, don't I'm... worry, Jackie. Whatever disease hit me in Borneo years ago, just a whiff of tobacco sickens me. Give my right arm to be able to smoke these pipes again, but all I can do is polish them, clean them, puff on them, never light them. <sighs> It's a terrible way to live. I'll be glad when I'm dead. Oh, don't say that, Trevor. You sound as if you'll be sorry when I'm gone, Liz. I will be. Why lie to me, Liz? Our marriage has been anything but a happy one. We put each other through the ringer the way our long-haired son-in-law put Jackie through one. Different kind of ringer, that's all. Oh, that's over now. Everything's over. For me. <clears throat> oh, Father, please don't get up if you want anything. Got to get up and ease the pain. Just want to get those pipe cleaners on the mantle and... <clears throat> oh, blast. You dropped your drink. All over me, I'm afraid. Sorry. Spasm of pain. I'll make you another. Uh, I'll have to change these pants. Father, sit down. I'll get the pipe cleaners. <clears throat> Oh, I can't do a thing for myself anymore. I a thing. <sighs> Jackie, what about the divorce? Well, I've given Fari... Here. Here are the pipe cleaners. Mm -hmm. I've given Fari another chance. Wasted time. You know that? It's probably hopeless, but in common decency, I can't let him down. He depends on me, Father. A weakling. He's a weakling. Well, some men are. Not Rod Champion. He was a man for you. I told you that. Your drink. Thanks. Roger will be here tomorrow, Jackie. Gonna spend a few days helping me straighten out my affairs. Why don't you and he try to get together? See if you can still oh, hit it off. Father. He's the... What the devil? What? The clock. That headhunter clock over the fireplace. Look at it. That's strange. One of those awful shrunken heads is missing. The one that marked the hour of seven. Oh, Father, what happened to I it? I don't know. I just noticed it was missing this minute. Look around. See if it's on the floor. Oh, if it is, I'd just as soon... Look around, I said. I can't. All right, dear. All right. Jackie, you look and see if... Oh, oh that was Fari. Something's happened. Good heavens, what could... I don't know. I do... look, look at this. Look at this. Look. The head off the clock. Oh, oh. What are you doing with it? It was on the pillow of my bed. Your pillow? It was just lying there, smack in the middle of a pillow. For is this some kind of gag? Did you take it off the clock? Oh, why would I do a thing like that? I don't know. But then I don't know why you've done a lot of things you've done. Dad, I tell you, I... All right, all right. We'll put it back on the clock. 
The hour of seven. Yeah. Sure. Somebody's playing games. Somebody with a sick sense of humor. And I... Oh. Oh! Sorry, what? Uh, Father! Catch him, he's falling! Uh, oh, oh, sorry! Get away, Jackie! L let me see. Is he... Is he... Dead? Yes. Drum clock in the hall. It's seven o'clock. The shrunken head. The hour of seven. Forey found it in his room, on his pillow. And now he's dead. What does it mean? What? Yes? Well, this is Trevor Castain. Uh, I see. Ah, uh, yes. Well, I want to be informed the minute you find out. Fine. Goodbye. Who was that? At the coroner's office. I've been bugging them all through the night to tell me what killed that husband of yours. And? We just wanted to let me know they're starting the autopsy now. Oh. Jackie? Yes, Father? We've never pulled any punches with each other, you and me, so don't let's pull any now. You really sorry for he's dead? What a thing to ask. What's the answer? I... I don't know. <laughs> Marriage to Fari was purgatory, as you said last night, but he... He was starting a new life, joining AA, and... Oh, it isn't fair somehow. Not to him, maybe. But it's very fair to you. What do you mean? You can do what you should have done in the first place. You can marry Roger. Oh, Father. You're taking an awful lot for granted. You love him, don't you? Yes, I... I guess I do, but... No buts about it. When Roger gets here... Hey. Sounds like he's here. Come on. Let's meet him at the door. Are you strong enough to walk? Sure, sure. Having a good day. Come on. Can't wait to see him. Best safari manager I ever had. <laughs> Never took any guff from me either. <laughs> Didn't have to. He's a fine man, Jackie. Fine man. <clears throat> hey, Trevor. Jackie. Good to see you. Rod, you old son of a gun. I can't tell you how good it is to see Who's this? Trevor? Jackie? Meet Virginia. My wife. <laughs> You've no idea. No idea at all what killed for it? Well, they're doing the autopsy now, Raj. Uh, coroner, uh, Dr. Dodd is a friend of mine. You'll let me know what they come up with as soon as they know. Help yourself to a drink, Raj. Oh, thanks. You? No, no, almost lunchtime. I have to limit myself. Can't even smoke. And with three months or less to live. Hell of a way to go out. Oh, hand me those pipe cleaners, will you? Yeah, here you are. At least you get some satisfaction from fooling around with these old pipes of yours. Yes. Kind of makes that smoking a little easier. You know, Raj, you shocked me when you arrived with a wife. How come? I had plans for you and Jackie. I was in love with Jackie, yes, but when she married Forey, well, that was that. Ginny's a, a wonderful girl, and she'll be a wonderful wife. Oh, I'm sure. Speaking of Jackie and Virginia, they ought to be back from their walk soon. It's almost... Now, what in blazes? What is it? The clock. Look at the clock. A head's missing. From 12. Now, what does this mean? Well, probably nothing at all. It probably just fell off. It didn't just fall off. And don't bother looking for it on the floor. Someone took that head off the clock, Raj. And unless I miss my guess, it means... Someone else is going to die. 
Oh, I can't believe that there's any significance. Oh, Father, Roger, is something wrong? Jackie, your mother's still asleep in her room, worn out after last night. Better get her down here. Well, why? What, what's happened? The head is missing from the clock again, this time from the hour of twelve. Oh, no. If oh. it means another death... Well, never mind. Wake your mother up and tell her to come down here. What? Liz, stay here. All of you, I'll handle this. Father, when did you discover this head missing? Just now. Seconds before you and Virginia came back from your walk. But, Father, you don't think it means... You, it can't mean another... I'm afraid it could. Uh, easy, easy, Elizabeth. Oh. Trev, oh. she woke up a minute ago to find this oh. beside her on the pillow. The shrunken head. Oh, Mother. Oh, am I... Going to die? Is that what it means? That I, I, I'm going to die the way Paul did? Oh, of course not. Twelve o'clock. My head is missing from twelve o'clock. I'm going to die at twelve. I know I'm going to die at twelve. question is, twelve noon or twelve midnight. Oh, I didn't think of that. Well, you'd better. Oh, how can you be so callous at that head? That shrunken head. You put it on my pillow. What? It would be just like you to do something crazy like this. Because you're... You're sick, Trevor. Mother, sick. Mother, he is please. sick. I don't know how he killed Fari. Before our eyes, yours and mine, killed him. But he did. And he's going to do it again. This time to me. Well, take it, take it easy, Elizabeth. You. Uh... When? When is he going to do it? That's the only question now. The only question that interests me. When, Trevor? Twelve noon. Twelve midnight. I don't mind dying, but I can't bear not knowing when. Tell me, Trevor. Tell me. A dramatic scene. And an intriguing one, don't you think? If I were you, I wouldn't at this moment be asking, was Forey murdered? And will Elizabeth meet the same fate? But if Forey was, and she does, how? I'll return in a minute for Act Two. this moment, you have all the clues you need. In fact, all the clues you're going to get, because that's all there are to answer the riddle of how Forey Prescott died. And, oh, let's face it, it is murder, and who killed him? If it comes to that, who will murder Elizabeth, and how? For surely, she too is going to die. Nine. Ten. Eleven. Twelve. Oh, catch her. She's falling. I've got her. Elizabeth? Oh, oh I, I, I... I'm all right. Oh, Mother, thank heaven. You're alive. So you see, oh. my dear Elizabeth, I didn't murder you after all. Oh. <sighs> Only because you mean to prolong the agony, Trevor. Now I must wait till midnight. Why? What do you mean, why? You can simply leave. Get out of here. Now. Yes, Mother, you can do that. I'll drive you to town. You could stay at the motel. Or if you want, I'll take you to New York. You could... No. But, Elizabeth, if you're afraid of being murdered at midnight... Then let it be at midnight. And get it over with. This... This, it's, it's crazy. You know, all this talk about murder. You, all of you. You're assuming Forey was murdered when you don't even know what he died of. For all you know, he could simply have dropped dead. A heart attack. Cerebral hemorrhage. Why have you assumed, the three of you, you, Jackie, you, Trev, you, Elizabeth, 
Why have you assumed from the start that Florrie was murdered? But if he wasn't, Raj, what's the meaning behind the shrunken head? We discovered the head was missing from the hour of seven on that... that awful clock above the fireplace. And then Florrie found it on the pillow of his bed, and Florrie died at exactly seven o'clock. This time a head is missing from twelve, and it's on the pillow of my bed. Where I found it when I woke up from my nap. Hello? Oh, hello, Ed. Dr. Dodd, the coroner. I see. Mm hmm. Well, how long will that take? Will you let me know? Thanks, Ed. Thanks very much. What, what did Dr. Dodd say, Father? Flory was murdered. <gasps> no! The autopsy revealed poison in the body tissues. What oh. kind of poison? Well, they uh, don't know yet. Ed's sending a tissue sample to the New York police lab to find out. No doubt uh, about it now, though. Flory was murdered. As you will murder me at midnight. <laughs> Darling, let's sit down a few minutes before we go back. Oh, Raj, I just had to get away from that awful atmosphere in that house. Oh, look, sweetheart, I'll be more than happy to take you back to New York. And then come back by yourself? Oh, no. Oh, I'd be safe enough, I think. From whom? What? I'm not thinking of the murderer, sweetheart. I, I'm thinking of the danger you'd be in. And, and I'd be in from a very attractive and decidedly sexy Jacqueline. Mm, I owe it to Trevor to help him all I can with his records, papers, Lord knows what. Help him get them in order before he dies. Raj, what do you make of all this? I, who do you think murdered Trevor's son-in-law? I don't know. Could be Trevor. He hated Fari, but then it... It could be Jackie. She hated him, too. What about Mrs. Costain? Elizabeth? Hmm. I know what you mean. And that shrunken head on her pillow, she could have put it there. Yeah. A red herring, a blind. Hmm. Something to throw the police off the scent when they get here. The police will come again, you think? Well, sure. I'd say all they're waiting for is a toxicology report on whatever poison killed Fari, and that can come any minute, any hour. It's, it's almost five. I guess we, we've been gone at least a couple of hours. I guess we'd better think of getting back. Jenny, you sure I am? You don't want me to take you back to New York? Uh-uh. You're a brave little girl who deserves a kiss. I'm a scared little girl. But, but don't let that stop you. Don't tell me what to do, Jackie. If I want to change my will, I'll change it. In fact, my attorneys are changing it right now. Well, damn it, don't look at me as if I'd done some terrible thing to you. Or maybe you misunderstood me. No, I, I didn't misunderstand. You're cutting Mother off and leaving your fortune to me. Why? Plain enough. I want to be sure you're financially safe and secure. Oh, no, Father. There's more behind it than that. You know as well as I do, Mother would take good care of me. Share what she has with me. <laughs> you don't know her like I know her. Oh, I know her better than you. I've spent my life with her. You've spent yours elsewhere. Well, I'm an explorer, or I was. Oh, you could have spent more time with her. I don't tolerate fools easily. Well, we've got off the subject. What's your real reason for changing the will? All right. Let me tell you. You're still hoping I'll marry Roger Campion. You're hoping that if I'm an heiress, the money will help induce him to divorce Virginia and marry me. You said it, not me. Well, you think it. You must. I can't think of any other reason for changing your will. Oh, Father, Roger and I are through with each other. If only you hadn't married Fari... Damn. Well, if you'd put a break on your temper, you wouldn't break so many of those pipe stems. One of my best pipes, too. Well, I have to send it for repair. I wish I could repair the mess you've made of your life as easily. All right, I made a mess of my life, but that's over now. Barry's dead, and that's over. I mean to keep you from making another. Now, you listen to me. Roger's the man for you. He always has been. 
And why you didn't marry him oh, years no, ago. No, why? I wanted a husband I could live with, be with. Not a wanderer like you. I saw what happened to Mother because of you. The emptiness, the loneliness, and I made up my mind it would never happen to me. <laughs> Farley was no bargain, as it turned out, but he stayed at home. So does Roger now. He runs his safaris from an office in New York. <laughs> that, that disease you picked up in Borneo... It's just making you see things in a warped way, a distorted way. You're not yourself. You think it's crazy of me to change my will? It's crazy of me to hope that you'll persuade Roger to get a divorce and marry you. That what I want so much, the two people I love most in this world, should make it together. If I haven't got a prayer, it'll happen. Well, it won't. I'm sorry, but it won't. It will. I want... You can't always have what you want. You're wrong. I always have and always will. Till the day I die. Midnight. It's nearly midnight. Jackie, where's your mother? I told you. She's locked herself in her room. And I told you I want her here in this living room at midnight. Go get her. She won't unlock the door. She feels safer, locked in her room. If you won't go and get her, I will. Weak as I am, I'll go up there and break the door down. I want her here. Give it another try, Jackie. All right. And tell her I'll come up and break the door down. And you go get that piece of fluff you married. I want her here, too. That little piece of fluff I married is probably fast asleep. And Trev, I'm not waking her. You will do as I She's say. She's had a rough time since we got here this morning. If I'd known what we were heading into, I wouldn't have come, let alone bring Ginny. She went to bed after dinner, and that's where she's going to stay. All right. Now, that's the one thing I always liked about you, Raj. You never fail to stand up to me. You take a lot of standing up, too. Not anymore. Hand me that rack of pipes, will you? The, the one with church wardens. Church wardens? Oh, the ones with the long stem. Yes. They're beautiful, Trev. They really are. Any practical reason for the extra long stems? Well, sure, they cool and filter the smoke. The longer the stem, the better... The Oh, you finally decided to join us. You decided, Trevor. Why are you so determined to have me here in this room at midnight? Elizabeth, why were you so determined to stay in yours? To put it plainly, so you couldn't kill me. You've eaten no dinner? You've had nothing to drink all to cut day? cut down the chances of your poisoning me the way you poisoned Fari. I locked myself in my room to cut the chances down even further. But, well, here I am. You wanted me here, in this room, so you could murder me. And I'm sure that when the drum clock strikes at midnight, you will. Oh, I don't know, but you will. It's never occurred to you, I suppose, that I want you here so I can protect you. Protect me? <laughs> Is that so hard to believe? Oh, very hard. In fact, impossible. Well, less than a minute now to midnight. Roger. Yes, Elizabeth? Goodbye. I, I want you to know that, like Trevor, I too have always been very fond of you. Respected you. Hoped you and Jackie would marry. But I also want you to know that you, you couldn't have done better when you married Virginia. She's a fine girl, Roger. Just the kind of wife you need. Goodbye, Roger. Elizabeth, you're sounding as if you were going to your execution. In a way, that's what would be. Nonsense. You're not going to die. You're standing here in this room as healthy a woman as I've ever seen. You and we... 
We've let Fari's death overshadow everything, warp our thinking, make us expect death. But look around you, Elizabeth. Where could you possibly find a more a more home-like scene? A scene that ought to reflect contentment rather than anything else. Content? I mean, look around. The fire blazing in the fireplace, Trev polishing his pipe. The friendly warmth of an old house where... Midnight. Jackie. Mother. Let me hold you. Mother, you're not going to die. You can't. I am, I know it. I... Elizabeth, this is nonsense. It's ridiculous. Trevor. I'm waiting. What do you mean? Waiting. Poor you to kill me. Learn from me. If I murder you, Elizabeth... It'll be the neatest trick of the week. I couldn't agree with you more. Oh, Mother. Oh, Mother. I tried to catch her, but... No, no. Jackie, stand back. Let me... She's dead. But how? How? One moment she was alive and the next... Have you figured it all out? As I told you, you have all the clues I have, and I've figured it out. Well, uh, I think I have. I'll be back shortly for Act Three. Now Elizabeth Costain is dead. Mysteriously struck down, instantly killed as her son-in-law Forrest Prescott was, only the day before. Now, the following morning in the guest room, occupied by Roger and Virginia Campion... No, no, Virginia, I've made up my mind. We're leaving. Not if you plan to take me to New York and then return here. I won't be coming back. I never expected anything like this when I agreed to help Trevor straighten out his affairs. Oh, but Roger, you're such old friends. I'm not so sure of that, Jenny. To be Trevor Costain's friend, you have to be friends on his terms. Oh, he likes me, sure. He values my friendship up to a point. But that's because I always did the job he wanted done, and I never crossed him. He must have been a hard man to live with. He hasn't changed any, even with a... Well, even with his death only a few weeks, months away. He's still demanding and getting what he wants. He's still riding roughshod over everyone in his path. I have got a strong suspicion that that's why Fari and Elizabeth were murdered. They got in Trevor's way. Then you really think... That... I'm almost sure of it. Now, there are only four of us left in this house now. There's you and me and Jackie and Trevor. Now, you and I certainly aren't murderers, and Jackie wouldn't kill a gnat if she could avoid it. No, no. It's got to be Trevor. What I can't figure out is how he killed them. What's that? Oh, I, I thought all the police had left. Oh, it's the last car heading out of the driveway now. Come on, Ginny, let's get these bags packed. I want to be heading out of that driveway, too. And just as soon as possible. Father. Father, will you please stop polishing that? Damn pipe and listen to me. What do you want, Jackie? The police have just left. I I wondered if you'd like a cup of coffee. Give me a drink. No, you're not supposed to drink. I know what I'm not supposed to do. All right. Whatever you say. And hand me those pipe cleaners. Here you are. Here's your drink. Thanks. It's good, good. I'll miss this fine old Scots when I'm gone. <laughs> One consolation, though. Roger always enjoyed it, too. And it'll all be his when I've kicked the bucket. You... You willed it to him? Your supply of scotch? No, no, of course not. I meant all of this will be his. I don't, I, I don't understand. You said you willed everything to me. Well, I did. Maybe I 
shouldn't have said this will all be Rogers. I should have said yours and Rogers. Naturally, after you're married... Married? Father, I took... I told you yesterday I'm not marrying Roger. For one thing, I don't love him anymore, and he doesn't love me. And for another, he's happily married to Virginia. For as long as she lives. As long as she lives? As long as... Oh, come in, Raj. Come in. Trav? Jackie? Did you and Jenny get any sleep? Not much. Dozed an hour or so. How about some coffee? It's a good idea. And what would you like for breakfast? Just uh, coffee. You'll be okay. And what about Jenny? Coffee will be enough for her, too. We, uh, we want to get an early start back to New York. Back to New York? We haven't even started on my paper, my record. I know, old Trev, but, uh... But? but what? Trev, uh, if I'd known what I was walking into when I came here, and uh, known what I was walking Ginny into, I'd never have come. Oh, yes, you would. You never disobeyed me. Stood up to me, yes. But when the chips were down, you did what you were told. I was your second in command then, and that was years ago. Oh, not so many. Uh, Two, three. But busy, busy years, Trev. I've got my own business now, my own life to live, and to be plain, I don't take orders from anybody anymore. Why, you ungrateful... Now, just a minute, Trev. I was more than willing to come here and spend as much time as it took to straighten out your affairs. I felt I owed you that. The least you owed me, the least. Maybe. But what I don't owe you is putting my life, or Ginny's, on the line for you. You mean, Fari's death. Mother's. Yeah, and who's and... next? I've got a feeling that no one is safe in this house. A feeling? Or a suspicion? Same thing, Trev. Not exactly. Feeling there may be another death is one thing. Suspecting who might be behind the deaths is another you suspect me, don't you? Yes, Trev, I do. Well, I guess the time has come to tell you that your suspicion is correct. One hundred percent correct. You. You did kill me. Oh, you suspected me too, but did you? But it's impossible. You hardly have strength enough left to stand on your feet. To walk a few steps. Wrong. Uh, oh, I'm weak, all right, but not as weak as I pretended. See? Then you... You were able to take the shrunken heads from that clock. And put one on Forey's pillow. And the other on Elizabeth's. But even so, I, I still don't see how... You, how you killed them exactly on the hour. Forey at seven... Mother at midnight. How did you manage that, Trev? My little secret. Some sort of slow-acting poison? A, a poison that you were able to time to the minute? No, but oh, a small matter. All that matters to me now is that you and Roger marry. You're out of your head. Father, father. You're sick. Right now you're overly tired. You're exhausted. You're a, a little mi mixed up. Crazy. You Say it. You said it yesterday. Say it again. Crazy. But sane or crazy, the two of you will do as I wish. Obey my final order. No way, Trevor. I love Virginia. I'm married to Virginia. I'll stay married to Virginia. You can't very well stay married to a corpse, Raj. Now, what do you mean by that? Why, no more than what is stated in the marriage vows. Uh, Till death do us part. And death is going to do just that in a few short minutes. When I kill Virginia, as I kill Forey and Elizabeth. Trev, you've gone crazy. Ginny and I are getting out of here and fast. Don't move. What? I said don't move. Try... And I'll kill you where you stand. And be warned, Raj. I can do it. Jackie? Yes? Get Virginia. Bring her here. 
Father, I... Do as I order you. But I... Do you want him to die now, before your eyes? Jackie, no. I'd better do what he wants, or he will kill you, Raj. Get her in here, Jackie. No need. I'm here. Ginny. I heard every word he said. He will kill you, Raj. Unless you let him kill me. Let me kill you? He can't prevent me. What I mean is it's my death you want. Not his. I don't know how you do it. But go ahead. And do it. Kill me. Ginny, you're out of your mind. I love you, Raj. Too much to see you die. Answer that, Jackie. Hello? Yes, Dr. Dodd. It's for you, Father. You talk to him. I, uh, can't at the moment. Oh, if Father can't come to the phone, Dr. Dodd, could you give me... Oh, I see. Yes. Yes, I'll tell him. Well? The poison that killed Forey. And Mother, too. I guess. The New York police identified it. Karare. Karare? So, that's how you did it. Huh? What is Karare? It's a poison used by New Guinea headhunters to kill their victims. Kill them instantly. How? With darts. Thorns. Dipped in the stuff. Shot through blowguns. Yes, but how could father... Oh, good Lord. Oh, Lord. The pipes. The pipes. You've sat there polishing and cleaning. Blowing through the stems to clear them, you said. But blowing a poison dart through them when you wanted to. <laughs> <laughs> the stem of a pipe makes an excellent blowgun. Especially the very long stem of a church warden like this one. And the thorn inside this stem, a thorn dipped in curare, kills instantly. Virginia? Yes, sir. Doesn't hurt, Virginia. Uh, All you feel is a little sting uh, when the thorn pricks the skin. Second later, you'll be dead. Roger. I warned you. Drop it, Trev. Drop that pipe stem or blow gun or whatever you call it. <laughs> I don't see anything funny. You standing there holding that mess I wore spear over your head, ready to throw it. You look a little silly, Raj. You're not exactly the nice high warrior type. I know how to throw one of these things, and you know I do. You've seen me do it in Africa, yes. Those Maasai spears fascinated you. Oh, you practiced every day. Got quite good, too. But not good enough to put that spear through me before I blow this dart into your wife. Not you. I'm not going to throw it into you. I'm going to throw it into her. Me? Kill Jackie? You leave me no choice, Trev. You love your daughter. You love her more than anything, anyone on this earth. Kill Jenny and I'll kill her. You haven't the guts. Yeah, try me. Jackie. Take that pipe stem away from him. Give it to me, Father. Take it. Oh. I know when I'm licked. What are you doing? I'm calling the police. All things considered, Trev, the quicker you're taken into custody, the better. If you want to move really fast, call the morgue. The morgue? I gave Jackie the pipe stem. But I kept the thorn. Father, no! <laughs> Police headquarters, this is Roger Campion. I'm calling from the home of Trevor Costain. You better send someone out here. What? No, it's not another murder. It's suicide. You'll admit I did play fair with you. From the very beginning of this mystery, you had all the clues, all of them including the shrunken heads, the New Guinea headhunters, who you might have known use Curare, and a clue that gave everything away. 
Trevor Costain's absorbing interest in his pipes. When E.G. Marshall plays fair, he plays fair. I'll be back shortly. Hope you enjoyed our mystery. I certainly enjoyed playing a little game with you. Because that's what all mysteries are, you know. A game of wits. Oh, sure. I have the advantage. I know the answer before I start. But in fairness to you, whenever I bring you a mystery, I'll make sure you have all the clues from the start. After that, it's up to you. Entirely. Our cast included William Prince, Tony Roberts, Marion Seldes, and Martha Greenhouse. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Temperature normal. How long have you had these symptoms, Mr. Wentworth? About two weeks. Have you been walking with a limp as long as two weeks? Yes, I have. When did you first notice the injury? Oh, it must have been six months ago. Yes, at least that long ago. There was a slight swelling in the black and blue mark. Then it disappeared. I thought nothing more of it until my leg began paining me two weeks ago. I see. Is there much pain now? No, none. The uh, leg feels numb. Hmm. Let me see the x-rays, nurse. Here they are, doctor. It got so I couldn't stand on the leg more than an hour at a time, and I began walking with a cane. After that, about three weeks ago, I couldn't put weight on it at all, and I had to buy the crutches. Who suggested the crutches? Why, no one. You should have seen a doctor two months ago. I didn't suspect that anything was wrong two months ago. You... You might have saved your leg. Saved my leg? Yes. I'm sorry, Mr. Wentworth. It will have to be amputated at once. Oh. No. Lose my leg. Lose my leg. Lose my leg. No, doctor. No, you can't. You can't. I'm afraid, Mr. Wentworth, it isn't a matter of can or can't. None of us have any choice in the matter now. Oh, but... But, doctor... Naturally, I can't compel you to undergo the operation. The choice is up to you. But if you refuse, I cannot take your case or be responsible for your life. My life? Yes. Unless that limb is removed instantly, I'm afraid, Mr. Wentworth, the poison in your body will never stop until it has reached your brain. It's that bad, then? It's more serious than I can tell you. Yes. Very well, Doctor. Do what you think is best. Oh, no. What was that, nurse? 
Nothing, Dr. Mason. Nothing. Prepare this man for surgery? Yes, Doctor. Have you any... any people you wish to notify, Mr. Wentworth? No. No one. No one who... would care. You have no living relative, do you? I know. What makes you ask? I... I didn't think so. I mean... We want to be sure relatives are notified in cases such as this. No, there's no one. We'll perform the operation at once. There, um... There's just one thing I don't understand. Yes, what's that? I... I don't know how I got here. You fainted. You were found unconscious by... By one of my assistants. He saw that you needed medical attention, so he hurried you here. Your name, Doctor... Mason. Dr. Clarence Mason. I see. And the hospital? This isn't a hospital. But... Well, then, where am I? You are at my private sanitarium. Sanitarium? Yes. Now, just lie quietly, please. But which sanitarium? You might as well know now. You will sooner or later... This is Fairchild Sanitarium. Fairchild? The sanitarium on the island? Yes. But Fairchild has been closed for ten years. Has it? Why? Why, yes. I I used to work there just before it closed. Yes, I know. You do? Don't you remember me, Wentworth? No. No, I've never seen you before. Certainly you have. Look at me closely. Look into my eyes. Imagine me without this beard. Picture me as you think I might have looked ten years ago. Holtz. Abraham Holtz. (laughs) You see? You hadn't forgotten me. But don't you wish you had? Holmes. No. It can't possibly be. Do you remember, Wentworth, that I once told you nothing is impossible for Abraham Holtz? It is you, Holtz. Yes. I finally caught up with you. Caught up with me? Yes. I warned you ten years ago that you would suffer for what you did to me. What I did to you? Of course. You thought your testimony against me would give you a good position at the sanitarium, didn't you? My testimony against you was given regretfully, but in good faith. (laughs) Good faith, you say. (laughs) Good faith, indeed. You thought by ridding the sanitarium of me, you would win your way into the good graces of Dr. Van Sickle. Dr. Van Sickle died about a week after your trial. Yes. Pity. And strange, wasn't it? What do you mean? That the man who swore out the charges against me didn't live 200 hours afterward. You. They said there was something strange about Van Sickle's death, but whatever it was, it completely baffled the experts. Yes, they're so easily baffled. Poor, stupid, and nincompoops. You killed Van Sickle. Do you think you could prove that, Wentworth? You were supposed to be in the penitentiary at the time. Yes, and so I was. What? I was in the penitentiary. I am now. Now? Now, you say? Yes. Yes, indeed. Did you forget? My sentence was for life. I could hardly serve a sentence like that in ten years. You escaped. In a sense. What do you mean? I haven't the inclination to explain it to you now. Suffice it to say it has been impossible from the first... to imprison the one whom you first knew as Dr. Abraham Hulse. How could you be in prison and here at the same time... (laughs) Mad. Yo, 
mad. <laughs> Completely. Well, that is probably what the doctors would say, yes. But I repeat, their plain out-and-out -out stupidity is as amazing as it is alarming. I'm getting out of here. Out of here? Well, yes, of course. Go right ahead. You bet I will. I'm going to get out of here so fast I... Well, something delaying you, Wentworth? My leg. I, I, I can't move it. What have you done to me? I have merely made it a little inconvenient for you to leave. You. You devil. <laughs> I think that's what you said, Wentworth, in the courtroom when you testified against me ten years ago. Remember? Remember what you said, Wentworth? I do. I remember quite distinctly what you said. You've asked me to testify in this court just what my reaction has been to the practices of Dr. Abraham Holtz. Well, gentlemen, when I first came to Fairchild Sanitarium, Dr. Holtz was apparently a normal, capable, practicing surgeon with a very extraordinary ability. But then he began to change. Yes, change. He ceased to be human. Yes, he... He became more like a devil. That's it. He became more like a devil. You remember that, don't you, Wentworth? Oh, I only said what I thought was true. You did cease to be human. You treated me and the rest of the interns like we were beasts. You were like beasts to me. Suddenly everyone became beast-like. Because suddenly I found myself in a position that put me far above every other human on earth. Made all mankind to me like beasts are to man. What do you mean? Found yourself in a position? Some time, Wentworth. Sometime soon, perhaps. You'll know. The electric warning. Someone has just entered the front door of the sanitarium. I must leave you now, but first... What are you doing? While I am gone, you must rest. Get away. Get away. Get away. An injection of this Wentworth to quiet you. No. No. Keep away from me or I'll... Persist in calling me that, do you? Very well, Wentworth. At first, I was going to take only one of your legs in exchange for what you did to me with your testimony. Now, I shall take them both. No. 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 You can't do a thing like that to me. Dr. Mason here. Miss Young? Yes. I have an appointment with the doctor. Go away, miss. Go away. Quickly. What? Oh, please. Please, I beg you. I beg you to go away before it's too late. Too late? Yes. There's nothing but trouble for you here. Trouble? What do you mean? No, I can't tell you. I, I can't. Just, just go away, Miss Young, while there's still time. Perhaps, nurse. Miss Young doesn't wish to go away. Dr. Holtz. Oh, please. Quiet. You will go take care of the patient in surgery, nurse. Yes, doctor. I must apologize, Miss Young. You see, my nurse is quite upset... 
of our surgeons operated this morning under most adverse conditions. Oh, a death resulted. The nurse has been quite upset about it all day because, well, to be quite frank, the surgeon was her brother. I'd warned him an operation would be fatal to the patient, but he went ahead anyway while I was away from the sanitarium. When I came back, I did everything I could to resuscitate the patient, but I was just minutes too late. I was compelled to discharge the surgeon from my staff. His sister is merely upset about the whole thing. She called you Dr. Holt. What? Yes, I heard her. She called you Dr. Holt. Did she? Well, that's her brother's name. She's so confused about everything. No. What? No, I said no. That isn't her brother's name. It's your name, Doctor. Miss Young. Yes. When you telephoned me yesterday, I knew there was something about your voice I vaguely recognized. Now I know. You're Dr. Abraham Holtz. You always were a very keen and intelligent woman, Miss Young. Dr. Holtz. It's nice to see you again, Linda. You escaped from prison. In a way. You lured me here. Pretended you needed a supervisor for your sanitarium. I should have known better. <laughs> yes, Linda, perhaps you should have. What do you want? I thought perhaps we could have a good laugh together. Over my court trial. Laugh? Yes, just so. You remember, don't you, that it was partially your testimony that sent me to prison? You had a fair trial. Are you so very certain I did? Of course. You had every opportunity to explain your devilish actions, but you refused. Devilish actions? Yes. You were a devil. That's what he said. Just a few moments ago. Who? Wentworth. Paul? Yes. And both of you called me a devil when you testified at my trial. Where is Paul now? You will see him, my dear. Much sooner than you expect. What do you mean? I have great plans for you, Linda. Yes, for you and Wentworth. You were supposed to serve life in prison. Life. Life, you say. Theater 5 presents Panic. Mad? Oh, Cora, you think you're insane just because you thought you parked your car on one side of the street and found you'd parked it on the other? But I was so terribly sure. A lapse of memory happens to everybody. But why go to pieces over something like that? Look, Cora, it's late. How about giving your future husband a nightcap and, and then I'll be on my way? Oh, all right, darling. You want whiskey or brandy or... Oh, no! What is it? No! What is it? Hey, why are you staring at that picture? There were three children playing. What? In the picture, there were three children playing. Laura, you can see for yourself there were only two. But there were three. I know there were. When I bought that painting a few days ago, I remember thinking how nicely balanced the scene was because of the third figure. Didn't you notice it when I showed it to you? <laughs> I'm afraid I didn't pay much attention, but I'm not much of an art lover. There were three, Bill. There were three. Easy now. Now, this is silly. I... I know how we can settle this. Steve has seen the painting, hasn't he? Well, I... Let me just call him and then... No, he's playing cards at his club. He won't be home until one or two in the morning. Anyhow, I don't care what Steve says or what you say. There were all three. All right, all right. There were three. There were 30. No. Oh, it doesn't matter, Cora. All that matters to me, sweetheart, is you. And you can't let yourself go to pieces like this. Oh, Bill... Bill? Look, you're just emotionally upset. It's nothing serious. My mother... That has nothing to do with you. 
Oh, sure, you're emotionally high-strung the way your mother was, but, Cora, believe me, there's nothing wrong with you. Then, then how? How do you account for... Nerves. What else? Just nerves. After what you've been through this past month, you're exhausted physically, emotionally, every way. Look, what you need right now is a good night's sleep. I couldn't sleep. You must. Now, go on. Take a sedative and tuck yourself in for the night, huh? <laughs> Things will look a lot different in the morning. Oh, Bill, what would I do without you? You're always so calm and steady. <laughs> like a rock I can cling to. Well, what's a husband for? Well, a uh, fiancé, anyhow. Husband? We are going to be married, I trust. You haven't changed your mind? <laughs> you still love me and, and want to marry me in spite of... Oh, you of... are tired, Cora. Look, I'll never love anyone else, and you know it. Now off with you. I'll let myself out. All right. Good night, darling. Why, Bill? Hello, Steve. What are you doing here at this hour? Not so loud. I sent Cora off to bed. But I stayed to talk with you. Oh, well... Look, if it's anything to do with Father's will, couldn't it wait till tomorrow? I mean, it's two in the morning. It's Cora I want to talk about, Steve. I'm worried about her. Why? Steve, that picture on the wall, did Cora show it to you when she brought it home the other day? Why, yes, yes. How many kids were in that picture, playing? Two, of course. <laughs> Cora swears there were three. Well, she's mistaken. Steve, this is more than just a casual mistake. This and a lot of other things that have been happening. That's why I'm worried. Well, you don't have to be. I know what makes my sister tick, and I can assure you she's going to be all right. Going to be? She's had a rough time emotionally since Dad's death. She isn't exactly herself, but it's nothing serious. I think it is. Or maybe if something isn't done... Cora ought to see a psychiatrist. <laughs> Look, you're attaching far too much importance. I don't think so. Naturally, I haven't told Cora how I feel. I, I didn't want to worry her. Or if it comes to that, let her know how worried I am. And you were the rock that I clung to. Cora! I put my trust in you, my faith in you, and all the time you were lying. Laura, you're all wound up. And the you, bill you kept assuring me that I'm all right, and all the time you think I'm heading for, for an asylum, that I need a psychiatrist. Cora, I couldn't tell you that... The truth! How you really feel about me. So you told me lies. Is that what you're saying? Cora, darling, you don't know what you're saying. I didn't lie to get you. Get out. Cora, hold on to yourself. Get out! Get out! Get out and never come back! Maybe you better go, Bill. Yeah. Maybe you're right. You shouldn't have talked to Bill like that, Cora. He's got your best interests at heart. And the way you're acting these days, well, I understand, but he doesn't. I know this, this thing with you is temporary. Another thing he's got to think about is your lawyer. For your good is your inheritance. You're worth over a hundred thousand dollars, honey. And if Bill feels you're incapable... Cora, what... What are you going to do with that letter opener? There were three. I know there were three. Laura, no, the painting. Now, don't. Three. There were three. 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 Nice to have you with us again, Mr. Chalmers. <laughs> Thanks, Gino. You're expecting Miss Bannister? No, no, my brother. And speak of the devil. Oh. Uh, hope I haven't kept you waiting, Bill. Gino? Mr. Bannister? Uh, the usual. Martini, Bill? Well, all right, yes. Yeah. Two martinis. Steve, about the other night... Cora's miserable about what happened. Yeah, so am I. Well, then why don't you two just kiss and make up, hmm? I love Cora, always will. That's why I'm so worried about her, Steve. Why I feel very strongly that she ought to... Well, she ought to consult a psychiatrist. Now, listen to me, Bill. This thing Cora's going through, nothing serious... My mother used to have the same attacks of well, depression, loss of memory, the temper. But what you've got to understand is that Cora's a lot more stable than mother was. She didn't act any too stable the other night. Look, you knew my father. Mm -hmm. 
think for one minute he'd have divided his estate evenly between Cora and me, given her a cool thousand to handle by herself, if he had thought she wasn't stable. As a lawyer and Cora's fiancé, Steve, I don't think she ought to be allowed to handle the money so long as... Pardon, Mr. Chalmers. Telephone call for you. Let me just plug the phone in. Who's calling me, do you know? No, but it seems urgent. Here you are. Oh, thanks. Hello? Yes, Cora? But what? Cora, please, look. Uh, uh, pull yourself together. Bill, what, what's going on? Yes, of course. Uh, yeah, I'll be there in five minutes. Come on, Steve. Uh, let me just find my key here, Bill. Mm -hmm. Cora. Cora, are you all right? Well, this is a pleasant surprise. <laughs> surprise? Cora, what's happened here? What's wrong? Wrong? Well, you just telephoned me at Gino's, didn't you? Steve, what's he talking about? Well, you did phone him, didn't you? You must have. I was sitting right beside Bill when... Cora? Cora, do you mean you don't remember? I didn't telephone Bill. I didn't telephone anyone. Cora, you... I tell you, I didn't. I have been sitting here reading ever since, ever since Steve left to have lunch with you. But there was a phone call. Well, it wasn't me. It wasn't! Now, look, sis. We're going to try and keep calm and, and talk this thing over sensibly. Bill and I were sitting there in Geno's, and Bill was saying how worried he is over you being allowed to handle your inheritance and your present condition. Oh, so that's it, Mr. Chalmers. That's, that's why you're so anxious to make me think that I am mentally unstable. What? That's why you telling me to see a psychiatrist. It's the money. Cora, you don't mean that. You want to establish the fact that I need psychiatric help. Cora, in heaven's don't name. Don't you see? Later, after we're married... He could have me declared incompetent. He's trying to establish the grounds for it Cora, now. Cora, stop it. And what put such a thought in your well, head? Well, it's in Father's will, isn't it? If, if, if anything should happen to me, my share goes to you unless I'm married. In this case, it goes to my husband. And you think that I would... Mr. Chalmers, I told you once to get out of here. Now I'm telling you again. All right. Sure, Cora. Anything you say. <sighs> Cora, you had no right to do that. I was there, sitting beside Bill when your call came. I in. didn't call. Well, someone did. Well, it wasn't me. Steve, Bill arranged it. What? Yes, that's it. He arranged for someone to He'd call. He'd never and... do a thing like that. Yes. Look, now just a minute. Gino knows you. He knows your voice. Call him. Ask him. Ask him if Bill received a call from you. I'll just do that. Is, uh, is Gino... Oh. Oh, Gino, this is Cora Bannister. Um, Gino, Mr. Chalmers received a telephone call at your place a little while ago. Did you happen to recognize the voice of the person calling him? Oh, I see. But if it had been me, do you think you would have recognized my voice? Why couldn't it have been me? Thank you, Gino. Thank you very much. It couldn't have been you? Gino says the voice on the other end was a man's. Oh, come in, Bill. Cora and I just, just finished dinner. She went out to mail a letter. Cup of coffee? No, no, thanks, Steve. Hey, look, we could have met at my office. <laughs> I know. Well, maybe I'm a matchmaker at heart. Huh? I asked you to come because I want to see you and Cora get together again. It won't work. She's miserable without you, Bill. I can tell you that. No more miserable than I am, but uh, what's the sense in us meeting again? 
Feeling the way she does? Well, she's had a week to calm down and get a grip on herself. She's a different person, Bill. And you'll see I was right when I said her condition was just temporary. Just one of those things. Oh. Hello, Cora. No, I... I don't want to see you, Bill. Cora, that isn't true. You love Bill. You told me so. I didn't say that. Look, sis, you sat right there at dinner tonight and told me that... What? What did you say? I said you sat right at that table tonight and told... We didn't have dinner here tonight. Did we? Well, now, what... But we didn't. We dined at Gino's. I'd just come from there. Cora, you went out to mail some letters only ten minutes ago. You finished dinner and... Oh, no, not here. It wasn't here. Sis, there's the table with the remains of dinner on it. And if we had dinner at Gino's, what am I doing here? Because after dinner at, at Gino's, I went to the powder room, and when I came back, you, you'd you gone. Without you? Why would I have left without you? Well, I, I thought it was strange. I, I couldn't understand why you... Why, I... But it... It's so clear in my mind being at Gino's and having dinner there and... No. Cora. Oh, please. I Don't please. push me away, darling. I love you. You know that. I don't. I don't know. I don't know. I'm, I'm not going to let you send me away again, Cora. You must realize after what's just happened that you do need psychiatric help. Oh. Yes. Yes. All right, then. I'll arrange for it tomorrow. I'll, I'll call and let you know what time I'm picking you up. <laughs> and you'd better be wearing more than just one earring, especially if it's a pair that I gave you. Earring? Mm-hmm. Oh, Bill, I'm sorry. I must have lost one. I'll uh, buy you another pair as a wedding gift. <laughs> Mr. Chalmers. Afraid we're closing. I see. Well, in that case, Gino, I... You okay? You look a little tired. Uh, I am. Very. That's why I dropped in late as it is. I could use a drink. Well, why didn't you say so? I don't mind taking care of my regulars. What would you like? Mm, something strong. Brandy? A double brandy and soda. You sit at the bar? Yeah. Sure. Gino, hmm? this uh, box with all this junk in it, what is it? Oh, <laughs> lost and found department. Stuff the customers drop or forgettables. <laughs> Boy, quite a collection. Mm-hmm. One night. Tonight's. Hard to believe. <laughs> yeah, you wouldn't believe how careless people can be until they lose something. Here, here's your drink. Mm, thanks. You don't mind if I go on checking the day's receipts? No, no, go right ahead. Funny, people being so careless. Some of this stuff in this box looks expensive. Hmm? This earring, for instance. What? This earring uh, must have cost a mint. Oh, yeah, yeah. Any idea who dropped it? No, no. One of tonight's customers, though. Ah. Uh. Oh, speaking of customers, uh, seen much of the banisters lately? No, not in a week or so. They uh, weren't here tonight for dinner? Uh-uh. Well, uh, I'll head on home. What do I owe you, Gino? Oh, forget it. On the house. Oh, thanks. Night, Gino. Good night, Mr. Chalmers. Andre. Uh, yes, Gino? You closed the place up tonight. I've got something to take care of. Fast. Did your sister lose an earring tonight? Yes, yes, she did. Then we've got trouble. She lost it at my place. So what? It was in a box on the bar with some other lost stuff. I thought it was your sister's. It was found under your table after you left. Yeah? Chalmers came by later for a drink, and he noticed it. I'm sure he spotted it as your sister's. Then he knows Cora and I did have dinner at your place tonight. Why do you think I'm here? We've got to do something. But what? I don't know yet. All I know, I'm holding your IOUs for all of 38 grand. And my backers are getting a little nasty oh, about what it. What an idiot I've been. 
If only I'd never stepped into that back room of yours. No, you're not the only one that feels that way. They put the heat on me, too. You should have cut me off. <sighs> That's water over the dam. Right now, we've got to do something. You've got to do something. Now, wait. You're in this as deep as I am. Oh, no. All I did was give you a plan. Show you how to get your hands on your sister's money. Yeah, by making a nervous wreck of her. Pulling all that stuff on her, parking her car somewhere else, hiring a man to duplicate that painting with two kids instead of three, setting up the dinner tonight. Now, get hold of yourself. You could have had her committed. We'd both be in the clear. Now, thanks to Chalmers, we're in a tight spot. What am I going to do? I can tell you what I'm going to do, what? brother what? mine. How much have you heard, Miss Bannister? Enough to call the police. Well, don't. I'm not afraid of you. Or that gun. You know, I didn't know the way out of this mess a minute ago. But I know it now. Bannister? What? Open the window. What for? You... Miss Bannister, I'm sorry. You're a nice girl. No. Your brother's okay, too, only he never could walk away from a crap table. So now we're both in a spot. Gino? Now, there's only one good way to get rid of a spot, Miss Bannister. Rub it out. I told you, Bannister, open that window. If you think I'm going to let you it's do it. It's the only way. And it makes sense, too. You see, she's been acting strangely, on the verge of emotional collapse. So in a fit of depression, she jumps out the window. No! Oh, she'll never feel a thing. No! Let her go! Steve, help me! Let her alone, Gino. Take your hands off her. I warned you, Bannister. <clears throat> now you come here. You... Drop the mister. Drop it. Up against that wall. Now oh. face it. Put your hands on it. Cora. Cora, darling, are you all right? Oh, Bill. I found your earring at Gino's. I know. I heard. I began to put things together, so I went back to the restaurant. They told me Gino left in a hurry. I figured I knew why and where, so I called the cops. Oh, Bill. I knew I couldn't live without you. <laughs> without me, you wouldn't have lived very long, darling. But now, well, just don't try living without me from now on. Theater 5 has presented Panic, written by George Lowther, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Augusta Dabney, Jim Dukas, Matt Poland, and Owen Jordan. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Blostopsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. the stillness of this moment, for this is a time of mystery, a time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is The Haunting Hour.
People in the House. All houses have their secrets. And the house on East 67th Street in New York was no exception. Its rooms had seen the births and deaths of seven generations of Thatchers. And now they looked down with despair upon the three people living within its walls. Evans Thatcher III, his son Kendall, Kendall's lovely wife Margaret. For evil and hatred stalked the rooms and took you by the throat when you entered the house. It was polite and hidden, but sinister. And present so strongly that you felt you could reach out and touch it. Margaret, come in, my dear. I've been waiting for you. Oh, I... I didn't know you were home. Aren't you forgetting something, my dear? I didn't know you were home, father. That's much better, Margaret. I only ask that you behave as any daughter should to a father-in-law. Where's Kendall, father? My dear, Kendall is only my son, but he's your husband. I'm surprised you should ask me his whereabouts. Most wives of my things are... All right, Kendall isn't home. Let's stop acting. My dear child, I've never acted with you. It is you who pretends to like me. I take little pains to conceal my dislike of you. I hate you. I hate you more than I believed I could ever hate another human being. And if it weren't for Kendall, Why don't you divorce Kendall, my dear? I'd gladly pay for it. Kendall isn't the proper husband for you. You should have married a strong young detective. There was a suitable match for you. By the way, what was his name? Walters. Larry Walters. Oh, yeah. I remember the name perfectly. Father. And I didn't marry him because I was in love with Kendall. Oh, come now, my dear. We both know the truth. You could hardly marry a representative of law and order if you told him the truth about yourself. But after tonight, why, I imagine that difficulty should be solved. Oh, you are completely vile. But there's one thing you've never understood. A mind like yours can't understand it. I love Kendall more than I hate you. And I'm not going to leave him alone with you so that you can ruin him completely. Too bad that you can't afford to move out of my house into an apartment of your own, isn't it? I'm sure that if Kendall could get a job and support you, you'd be deliriously happy. Yes, I would. But you've taken good care to see that Kendall is too weak to go out in the world, haven't you? Now, my dear Margaret... Don't think I... I don't know what you're doing. You've hated Kendall since the day he was born and deliberately set out to ruin him by, by giving him everything he wanted. You've made Kendall so completely dependent upon you that he's afraid to leave. You've pampered him so that he's fit for nothing. You're insane. No, I'm not. I'm perfectly sane. I'm willing to stay here and fight you till I've made a man out of Kendall. And we both walk out of this house together with our heads up. And I'll see you both dead and rotting first. Oh, good evening, Kendall. Did you take my message to the club? Yes, Father. Uh, Mr. Ainsley said there was no reply. Oh? Uh-huh. Hello, Margaret. Hello, darling. Well... Aren't you even going to kiss me? I haven't seen you since this morning. You bet I am. Nonsense, Kendall. Stop acting as if you were a newlywed instead of behaving like a man who's been married a whole year. Well, my mother and father were married 22 years, and he kissed her every night when he came home. There. You see, father, kissing your wife Kendall, and... come along upstairs. I want to talk to you. My dear Margaret, you'd better change. We're dining with some friends of mine. But Kendall and I had planned to eat home tonight, father. Did you? I didn't... I don't very well see how you can. I left instructions that there was to be no marketing today and gave the servants the night off. Are you coming, Kendall? I, uh, yes, Father. I'll, I'll see you later, Margaret. I hate you, Evans Thatcher. I hate you. I wish you were dead. <laughs> Larry, is that you? Margaret, what is it? What's the matter? Larry, I've got to see you. you. Foolish, foolish child. I, oh, I, I must have a wrong number. No, you haven't, Margaret. 
You're in trouble. I'll, I'll be right over. No. No, you mustn't. You mustn't. Goodbye. Well, are we all ready? Margaret. You look beautiful in that dress. I'm afraid that the dress will have to go back, Kendall. But, Father, why? You said yourself... I've changed my mind. I will not pay for it. I don't want you to pay for it. I didn't ask you to buy it. Oh, Kendall. Kendall, can't you see what he's doing to us? I don't want him to pay for anything of mine ever. Kendall, please. Please, let's get out of this house now. Margaret is hysterical, Kendall. She doesn't know what she's saying. She's just done something very stupid and childish, for which I'm afraid I must punish you, Kendall. No. No, I'm not going to stand by and see this again. You're not Come going here, to... Kendall. I'm sorry, Father, really. I'm sorry. I mean it. I'll never do it's it again. It's a little late for that, my dear. Come here, Kendall. You can have the telephone taken out, I promise. Please don't hit Kendall. <laughs> 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 Mr. Thatcher? Oh, come in, Mr. Walters. It was thoughtful of you to telephone, let me know you were coming. It enabled me to open the door myself. I don't like to let the servants know that I have detectives calling on me. Oh, you don't like detectives, Mr. Thatcher? Not in my house. As a matter of fact, though, I've been expecting a call from you for a few days now. Ever since Margaret was so foolish as to telephone you the other night. As a matter of fact, Mr. Thatcher, that's just the reason for my visit. Margaret didn't sound at all well to me. Very observant of you, Mr. Walters. Margaret isn't well. She's a neurotic. That's funny. When I knew her, she was a perfectly healthy young lady. Perhaps. But now she's definitely neurotic. Then, of course, you've put her under the care of a physician. I dislike your attitude very much. Are you implying that my son and I aren't treating Margaret properly? Because if you are, you can get out now. Actually, you have no right in this house. I received you because I wanted to show you that there was no reason for Margaret's call to you the other night. Now I shall let you see Margaret. You can hear from her own lips what I've been telling you. Yeah, I'd like to see her. If you'll excuse me, I'll go up and bring her down myself. Thanks. I, uh, won't offer you a drink. However, the radio is over there if you wish to turn it on. It may help you pass the time. program of dance music to bring you a special bulletin. Dandy Jim Carrey broke out of the death house a little over four hours ago. Holy mackerel. With only two days before his execution, Dandy Jim became the first prisoner ever to escape from the death house. The police have thrown a dragnet all over the country and promise a speedy arrest. Keep tuned to this station for further details. <laughs> Margaret, uh, please tell him how you feel. Hello, Margaret. Hello, Larry. I, <laughs> I don't know what was the matter with me. I, I was just upset and nervous. That, that, that's why I called you, Larry. Yeah, that's what Mr. Thatcher told me. Now, look here, Walters. I've stood for a lot from you because you were a friend of Margaret's. But I'm telling you I'm not going to stand for any more insinuation. It won't do either Margaret or Kendall any good at all. Remember that, Margaret. I'm not insinuating anything, Mr. Thatcher, but I'm not a fool. I know darn well that Margaret called me for some reason, and I don't believe a word of what you're saying. All right. You've succeeded in making me do something that's very painful both to me and Margaret. Please go, Larry. Please. I I don't need your help. I I don't want it. Don't worry, Margaret. I promise you that this won't affect Kendall at all. Now, Mr. Walters, here are the facts. Margaret's made a very good marriage. Yeah, I know. Exactly. I... Exactly. A girl in Margaret's position has no right to expect to marry my son. You see, Mr. Walters, my son was brought up with everything in the world he wanted. His for the asking. Margaret, on the other hand, had a much different life. Much different. You mean that she wasn't spoiled? That and other things. If I did spoil Kendall, Mr. Walters, it's only natural. When a child's mother dies at the birth of a child, and a man has to be both father and mother, his son is apt to be indulged. Or hated. Have you ever heard of Dandy Jim Carey, Mr. Walters? Oh, of course. He's in the death house now, awaiting execution. You didn't know that he was Margaret's brother, did you? Oh. You see what your insinuations have made me do, Mr. Walters. Uh-huh. I see. But it may interest you to know that Dandy Jim escaped from the death house four hours ago. What? Thank heaven. 
I think that's your phone. I, I'll answer it. I uh, wouldn't dream of it, my dear. I'll go. Margaret, Margaret, why didn't you tell me? I can see you're in a jam. Let me help. I can't, Larry. Just leave me alone. It's, it's best that way. Hello? Believe me. Hello. Hello, answer there. But, Margaret, I only want to help. Believe me. Oh. Evidently, wrong number. Yeah. You seem to have a lot of them around this house. And now, Mr. Walters, I think there's nothing more for us to say to each other, so... Good uh, night. If you want me, Margaret. She'll know where to reach you. Good night, Mr. Walters. And now, my dear, we'll wait for the telephone to ring again. Only this time, when Mr. Walters isn't here, you will answer. No. No, I won't. I think you will. Won't you, my dear? I think you will. Won't you, my dear? It's Kendall. I want Kendall. Kendall won't help you. He never will. Stop it. Stop. Certainly. All you have to do is to pick up the telephone and say what I tell you. Well, you wouldn't want to disappoint your brother, would you? He desperately wants to get in touch with you. All right. And so the drama that was touching the lives of the people in the house on East 67th Street came swiftly to its violent conclusion. Evan Thatcher III was determined to dominate and rule his son, Kendall, at all costs. Hating his son from the day he was born, bringing him up a weakling by pampering him, he resented Kendall's marriage to Margaret Carey, a beautiful and strong-willed girl who is determined to break Evan Thatcher's hold over his son. Only Margaret had a brother, Dandy Jim Carey, who had escaped from the death house and is even now trying to get in touch with her while she sits on a bench in Central Park waiting anxiously for Kendall. Oh, Margaret... I'm sorry, I'm late. I tried to get away, but Father... I know, darling. Sit down here, right next to me on the bench. Oh, the park's beautiful at night, isn't it, Kendall? Mm. Yeah, I look forward so much to sitting here quietly with you. It's the only time in the whole day that I'm happy. Do you think that's right, Kendall, darling? Huh? What do you mean? Well, that two people, so much in love and in marriage, should, should live... Be only happy when they can sneak away from the house they live in to, to sit in the park and hold hands. Oh, Margaret. I know, I know. I'm, I'm no good. Why don't you leave me? Oh, stop saying that, Kendall. Don't you realize that's just what your father wants? I know, I know, but there is just nothing I can do about it. But there is. You're going to have to make a decision, my darling. You're going to have to come away with me. I, I want to. So, so much. But I'm, I'm scared. We'll, we'll starve, Margaret. Well, we won't. I tell you, we won't. It's hopeless. Do, do you think that I could stand watching you work and support me? You wouldn't have to. You could go to work. I, I want to. But you know what happened when we tried it once before. Father saw to it that no one would hire me. And if I did get a job, he had me fired. Well, we, we made a mistake. We'll have to leave New York. Where will we go? What difference does it make? We'll be together and... And we'll be happy. But you won't have anything. I, I don't care so much for myself, but I couldn't stand it for you. That's not true, Kendall. Do you mean I'm lying? Do you mean that I really don't want to go with you? I mean that you're afraid to face the facts. You have no reason to be afraid for me. I, I wasn't wealthy before I married you, and, and I wasn't unhappy. I am now. I won't be because I love you very much if we go away together. I don't care how little we have as long as we're people living together, supporting ourselves and and away from your father. Margaret, I will. We'll go away. 
We'll never see my father again. Oh, Kendall. Kendall, darling. Oh, when will we go, Kendall? Tomorrow? No, we... We'll have to make plans. Why? Your mind is made up, isn't it? Of course it is, but we can't just pack up and go like that. Why not? Well, there are... Well, there are things to do. We have to find a place to go, get the tickets. And... We'll go down to the station and get on a train. What difference does it make where we go? But we can't rush. We... Maybe... Oh. Oh. All right, Kendall. I... I, uh... I have an appointment now. With whom? Your father and my brother. I, uh, I don't suppose you want to come with me. No. No, uh, no, no, I, I, uh, I think it's better if I stay out of this. Yes, Kendall. I guess I have to face it. I, uh, think it's better if I stay out of your life, too. Permanently. Margaret! Yes, Kendall. I love you very much, but... You'll never break away from your father. As he told me, he's done too good a job. Well, you talk as if father were deliberately You don't see to... it. You'll never see it. Goodbye, Kendall. No, Margaret, wait. Wait. Come in, Margaret, my dear. It's cozy in here. Why did you make me tell Jim to meet us here? It's an ideal place, my dear. Who would ever think of looking for an escaped murderer in the Castle Chess Club? Are you going to help him get away? question is premature, my dear. This reunion between beautiful sister and doomed brother appeals to my sense of the dramatic. That is why I brought you to the Castle Club tonight. Oh. I hope you realize the honor I've conferred upon you. The first woman ever to set foot in the Castle Chess Club. That was your idea, wasn't it? You're the president of the club, and you made them put that rule into effect. Why, yes, my dear. Now that you mention it, it was. You see, I I don't believe that a chess club is any place for a woman. That isn't the real reason. You hate women. You've hated us all ever since your wife died. And that's why you hate the son you think caused her death. Shut up. Silence. Shouting doesn't change anything. I'm right. That's the explanation for you and everything you've done. You're impudent. And... And you shall pay for it. I don't care. I... I'll do anything you want if you'll only help Jim get away. Do you realize, Margaret, that you're asking me to break the law? Aiding an escaped criminal? Stop it. I know all about you. How do you think I met Kendall? It was through Jim, of course. I knew that you were the leader in all the crooked business that Jim was doing. I begged him to stop, but he wouldn't. Thank you for being so frank. I often wondered how much you knew about me. And I know that it was your fault Jim killed Mr. Merritt. Hmm. Rather a bold knock for a man who's hiding. Open the door. Your brother will be glad to see you. Kendall! What do you mean by coming in here? I thought that you should know that... Well, I... I followed you. You followed me? For what reason? I specifically told you... I noticed Larry Walters following you, too, and I thought... I thought maybe there was some trouble. Well, it was very thoughtful of you, Kendall. Very thoughtful indeed. But as you see, there's nothing wrong. Margaret and I were just having a little, little chat. You can go now. Did you hear me, Kendall? I said you can go. I heard you, Father. Kendall, I want you to stay. You'll regret this, my dear Margaret. Go home, Kendall. If you won't do as I ask... Then I want Kendall to stay. I hope you heard what Margaret just said, Kendall. A deliberate attempt to blackmail your father and to do something unlawful. Well, I don't... I'm, I'm not... It's time I'm... you knew the truth, Kendall. We've been married a whole year, and if, if you're ever going to become a worthwhile person, now is the time. Margaret. You can't stop me now. I'm going to tell him. Kendall, you can prepare yourself for some vicious lies. Kendall, you're going to have to be strong enough to face the truth. Your father is a blackmailer. I don't believe it. No, no, Margaret, it's you're... It's true. After your mother died, when you were born, Evans Thatcher became a bitter, rotten old man. He used his position and his reputation to find out things about people, and and then he blackmailed them. Ridiculous. But Margaret's father didn't need money. He He liked to hurt people, to see them squirm. He wanted to hurt the world because he'd been hurt. Kendrick, she hates me so much, she's trying to poison your mind against me. She hasn't one iota of proof. 
You covered your tracks well, didn't you? You had my brother Jim do all the dirty work for you. Didn't you ever wonder, Kendall, what business affairs your father and Jim could possibly have had together? Well, it did seem kind of peculiar. Kendall, go home. Let me handle this. I'll explain everything to you in the morning. My word of honor. But, Father... You have my word. Go home. Hello, everybody. Well, this is a nice little family gathering. Jim... Stay where you are, Jim. Stay right where you are, or this gun might go off. Go on, Kendall. Get out. No. No, I'm staying. I want to hear all of this. Yeah. Tell your son how you double-crossed me with Merritt. Shut up. Why? What have I got to lose? If you don't kill me, the cops will. Why don't you tell your son how you made me pack a gun when I went to Merritt's and how you knew he'd have one, too? So it's true. Margaret wasn't lying. You are an evil old man. One more step, Jimmy, you'll be dead. Jim, wait. Mr. Thatcher will help you to get away. Wait now, sis. But he could have helped me, he folded. And I kept my mouth shut in court for him. Now we'll have the truth. You didn't accuse me because no one would have believed you. I was too careful. What's the difference? First, I'm going to kill you, and then I'm going to die happy. I'll get out of my way, Kendall. Stand back, Kendall. He's not going to hurt me. I'm going to kill him. I won't be blamed for it. He's an escaped convict. I'll tell. I swear I'll tell. I'll tell the police just how it happened. You're not going to be alive to tell anyone anything. Kendall, stand back. You're not going to shoot, Father, or you'll have to shoot me first. Get out of my way! Are you crazy? No, Father. Just seeing you as you really are. I'm growing up, Father. You idiot! These fools can ruin me. I'm going to say that Jim killed Margaret. Then we took the gun away from you. But I had to shoot him in self-defense. All right. Hold it. Everybody reach. Oh, thank heavens you come, Walters. You can arrest this convict. And you, Mr. Thatcher. Now I know why you dislike detectives. Drop that gun. Come along, Jim. <laughs> Give me that gun, Thatcher. No, Give it to me, or I'll break, break it up. Not break it up, you two. All right. Here. Take this. Oh. Oh. oh, Jim. Jim, darling. Say, it's, it's better this way. Are you all right, Jim? I'm okay. I'll be dead a little quicker than you thought. And, well, thanks for getting Thatcher for me. I didn't get him for anybody. He took a shot at Margaret. Thanks, anyway. Now, now Margaret will be all right. Won't you, sis? You mean, we'll be all right, Jim. Kendall and me. Yes, that's right, Jim. Don't you worry about Margaret. We'll be really together now. Shadows and stillness. Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination. Charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion. A living memory in the haunting hour. and Lipton Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, gentle friends of the Inner Sanctum. Welcome through the creaking door for another soothing half hour of sweetness and light. <laughs> oh, I've learned a new trick. Would one of you like to step up here and be sawed in half? What? No volunteer? Well, maybe you're right. The first part, the sawing in half, that's easy. But the second part, the uh, putting together again, I'm still not very good at that. 
Mr. Host, how can you joke about such things? Are you trying to get our listeners in a mood for enjoying themselves? That's it, Mary. Well, jokes like that certainly won't put people in a good mood. Here's a much better way to do it. Just serve folks a piping hot cup of Lipton tea, and they'll be in a good mood in a minute. For Lipton's is the password to pleasure. It's tea at its delicious best. Thanks to Lipton's brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, lively, full-bodied flavor of Lipton tea. Unlike ordinary dull-tasting teas, Lipton's is never flat. It's always spirited and satisfying. Try it real soon and get the extra enjoyment of Lipton's wonderful brisk flavor. What does a man think of when there's murder in the air? The close presence of death. Does it have matter and substance? Does it generate unseen light waves that touch a man's subconscious? Or unheard sound waves that speak to him when he sleeps? Well, let's listen to I Walk in the Night, written by Emil Tepperman. With Larry Haynes in the role of Peter Lang to tell you this story himself. I don't know if it was the ringing of the doorbell that awoke me. Dragged me back to consciousness out of a deep, heavy sleep. I felt groggy. As if I'd been drugged. My eyes were so heavy. So hard to keep open. That infernal ringing. I stumbled out into the hall. Myrna's room. My wife. There opposite mine. I knew the door would be locked. We'd quarreled last night while the Judsons were visiting from the house next door. Myrna had made a scene. She went to her room and locked herself in. Please! Please, wake up in there! As I stumbled down the hall of the front door, I recognized Phil Judson's voice. Phil and Henrietta lived in the house next door, just across the lawn. Please! Please! All right. All right, I'm coming. Just a minute. Okay. I got this open. There. Oh, thank heaven you woke up, Pete. I thought you'd never hear me. What's wrong, Phil? What's that poker for? Henrietta saw a prowler come out of this house. A prowler? What's the matter with you, Pete? You look groggy. Wake up. I don't, I don't know. I feel as if I'd been doped. Uh, what's this about Prowler? Henrietta saw him climbing out of Myrna's window. She yelled to me, and I grabbed the poker and came running out. The poker? What, what, what's what? the matter with you? Didn't you hear me? A man was in Myrna's room just now. But, great Scott. Myrna's alone in there. Come on. Myrna. Myrna, you all right? Open the door. She doesn't answer. Phil, are you sure the prowler came out of this room? Yes, they ran around the house and got away. Uh, look, Pete, uh, have you got a key to this door? No, it's bolted on the inside. We've got to break it down. Come on, put your shoulder to it. <laughs> Once more now. <laughs> well, where's the light switch? Oh, here. Here, I've got it. Better not come in, Pete. Oh, let me in. I've got to see. <laughs> Take it easy, Pete. Oh, burn it. Strangled. Strangled to death. Oh, burn it. Look at the black and blue marks on his throat. This chain on her neck. It's broken. It was her locket. The one I gave her last Christmas. Killer must have taken it with him. And see here, her fingernails. There's bits of skin under them. She must have struggled and scratched the killer's face or hands. Why, Phil? Why should anyone want to kill her? Then began the long torture of the investigation. Detectives swarming over the house. Men in derby hats examining the body of my wife. Measuring the room, searching for fingerprints. And finally, more men who came and carried her away forever. Through it all, Phil and Henrietta sat with me, trying to give what comfort they could. 
Oh, Peter, dear, please talk to us. I can't stand seeing you sit there with your head in your hands. I know, but... I can't stop thinking about it. Those marks on the throat. The torn chain, the locket torn. Look here, Pete, there's something we have to talk about. Now, get that dazed look off your face and listen to me for a minute. Yes, yes, Phil. There's a police inspector in Myrna's room right now. O'Brien is his name. He'll be coming in soon to question you. Now, you'd better not tell him about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. I don't get you. It would look bad for you. For me? Oh, what, what do you mean? Phil, you, you don't think that I... Suddenly I caught my breath. My right hand in my bathrobe pocket had touched something cold. Phil and Henrietta both stared at me. Peter, what's wrong? Phil. Phil, look what I found in my pocket. What is it? Look. A locket. It, it's Myrna's locket. The one that was torn from her throat. Phil. Phil, how could this get in my pocket? Here, give me that, quick. But Phil... Give it to me. Percy, it's Myrna's locket, all right. You recognize it, Henrietta? Yes. What are you going to do with it, Phil? Get rid of it, quick. Out this open window. Well, if the police find it out there, they'll think the killer dropped it. But Phil, it was in my pocket. What, what are you looking at, Phil? Your hand, Pete. What? Your left hand. <laughs> I looked down at my left hand. There on my wrist were three long gashes where the skin had been scraped. As if by the fingernails of a woman fighting for her life. Phil. Do you, do you think I could have killed her? Nonsense. I don't believe it. You could never do a thing like that, Pete. But I... How can you be sure? How can I be sure? Peter, please... Don't talk like that. You're, you're making yourself out some terrible monster, but you aren't. Phil and I know you... You can't be like that. I don't know. Maybe I got up in my sleep and, and killed Myrna without ever knowing it consciously. After all, I, I did have that quarrel with her last night. Cut it, Pete. Here comes O'Brien, the detective. I hope I'm not intruding. Oh, no, no. It's, it's all right, Inspector. Come in, O'Brien. Mr. Lang is very upset. The shock. Yes, I understand. Believe me, Mr. Lang, you have my deepest sympathy. I wouldn't bother you at all at a time like this, but there's... Something... Inspector O'Brien was a pink-cheeked, cherub-faced, chubby little man. But his eyes were cold and blue and restless. They kept jumping from Phil to Henrietta to me as he fired his questions at us. Mr. Lang, uh, one more thing. Uh, I understand you had a small party here last night? Oh, no. No, it, it wasn't a party. Just Phil and Henrietta and, and, and Ted Hale. Ted Hale? Yes, Myrna's cousin. Oh, I see. Uh, this Ted Hale, a cousin of your wife, she said. Pardon me, Inspector. Uh, yes, Mr. Johnson. Peter's too easygoing and good-natured to tell you about Ted Hale. But as Peter's attorney, it's my duty to give you certain information. Oh, go ahead. Myrna, Mrs. Lang, owned considerable property in her own right. Recently, I drew a will at her request. In it, she leaves a sizable sum to... Ted Hale. Oh? Uh -huh. Oh, I, I... I just thought of something. What is it, Henry? Well, Peter was so groggy when he woke up. That's right. He looked as if he'd been drugged. Well, don't you remember last night? Ted Hale went in the kitchen to mix the last round of drinks. Oh, Henrietta, that's ridiculous. On the contrary, it's quite important. Now, uh, tell me, this Ted Hale, what does he do for a living? Why, well, he, he works for me in my brokerage office. Uh -huh. To please Myrna, I gave him a job as my confidential secretary. Hmm. Uh, I suppose you tell me where Mr. Ted Hale lives. I think I'll have a talk with him. Now, all you have to do, Pete, is sit tight. Let O'Brien follow up his lead. But Phil, I can't let him arrest Ted Hale. He didn't kill Myrna. I did. I must have. The locket. He scratches. It, it's not fair to Ted. As your attorney, I won't let you strap yourself in the electric chair. You go back to your room and get some sleep. Uh, Henrietta, do you mind going back to our house by yourself? Of course not. I'm going to sleep right here in the living room on this couch in case Peter needs me tonight. A 
on my bed in the dark, I kept seeing a thousand pictures. Myrna, her face mottled with strangulation. Phil, always so sure of himself. Henrietta, worried and frightened. And O'Brien, his face grim and his blue eyes cold, going off to question Ted Hale. I must have been close to dozing off when I heard the doorbell faintly, as if in a dream. I tossed about in bed for a moment or two. And then I heard the voices in the living room. Phil's, cold and harsh. And someone else's, loud and angry and frightened. I got out of bed and opened the door. I went down the hall to the living room. I had to know who was in there arguing with Phil. It was Ted Hale. Ted, what are you doing here? Phil phoned me. He told me about Myrna. I called him up, told him O'Brien would be coming for him. I suggested he come over here and talk it over with me. Pete, don't let them arrest me. you got to help me. Me? Help you? You know I didn't kill Myrna. Well, I'm not sure. Pete. What? I was here last night, you know, when you had that fight with Myrna. What do you mean? If I'm arrested... Says I had a motive, but what about you, Pete? You were always quarreling with Myrna. Now, look here, Ted. If you're threatening me... I only want you to help me, Pete. Don't let them arrest me. Hide me. Hide me out till this blows over or till they get the real killer. I think Ted is right, Pete. We should help him. But where? I'll handle it. You have a dark room fixed up in the cellar, haven't you? Yes. We'll stick a cot in there and let Ted hole up for a day or two. Nobody will think of looking for him in this house. <laughs> Poor Peter. Seems to be in a daze half the time. Yes, his trouble is that when he's awake, he's half asleep, and when he's asleep, he's half awake. <laughs> it's no wonder he can't sleep well. He seems to be such an honest person, he can't lie easy. Hmm? You know, it's too bad he doesn't go over and stay at Phil's house, Mr. Host. Phil and Henrietta seem the kind of people who do everything to make him comfortable. Well, I just hope they know something about hospitality, Mary. Oh, I'm sure they do. Why, everybody knows that the proper way to treat guests is to serve them something delicious. For example, when guests drop in at my house, the first thing I do is put on the tea kettle. And almost before they have their wraps off, I have my best tea service out, and I'm serving them some of my fragrant, fresh-made cake and a cup of heartwarming Lipton tea. For no matter what time of day or night guests arrive, there's nothing like wonderful Lipton tea to make them relax and feel at home. Yes, Lipton's brisk flavor is so lively and, and full-bodied and satisfying, it just naturally hits the spot with everybody. In fact, I always say, whenever you want to serve your friends or your family a grand, refreshing drink, make it tea. And make it tea at its delicious best. Lipton tea. Now, let's get back to our sleepwalker. There's no telling what he might have done while we were talking about tea. Now, let's see, where were we? Peter and Phil were going to hide Ted Hale in the cellar. Now, listen to me carefully, Peter. If Ted Hale is arrested and talks, O'Brien will learn about the quarrel you had with Myrna last night. He'll start digging into things. That won't look so good for you. No, Phil, wait. And I know you're trying to help me, but if I did it... If, if I did kill Myrna, then there's no use trying to protect me. It isn't right. I'm a dangerous man. Fiddlesticks. But you can't brush it off like that. Do... Do you know... What it means to lie awake in the night, wondering whether you've killed your own wife, wondering whom I'll kill next. Cut that out. We've got business to attend to. Now, here's my plan. We'll let Ted stay here tomorrow. And then tomorrow night, I'll smuggle him out of the country. Get him passage on a freighter to South America, maybe. You think he'll go? Sure, he'll go. He's scared stiff. But we'll need money. Lots of money. Now, how much have you got in the safe at the office? Oh, about 10000 in cash, but there's a batch of negotiable bonds. They'll do. I'll go down to the office the first thing in the morning and get them out of the safe. Uh, you had the combination? Yes, you gave it to me when you gave me your power of attorney, remember? Oh, yes. Now, don't you worry about a thing. Oh, um, here. 
Take this powder. Hmm? It's just one of the bromides that Henrietta uses. It'll help you get to sleep. By tomorrow morning, everything will be fixed up. Fine. <laughs> It was almost dawn when Phil left. And it must have been hours later, close to noontime, when I felt myself being roughly shaken out of a heavy, troubled sleep. Pete, Pete, wake up. Uh, what? Hey, wake up. Come on, snap out of it. What? Oh. Phil. Gosh, I, I feel groggy. What was in that powder you gave me? Never mind the powder. Get your eyes open. I've got something to tell you. Phil, what's wrong? What happened? Listen to me carefully, Pete. I went down to the office before business hours this morning and opened the safe to get the money out. Yes? The safe is empty. Empty? The securities are gone. Well, it can't be. Who else had the combination besides you and me? Only Ted Hale. Oh? Do you, do you think that... I'll bet you a dollar to a donut he's gone. Come on, let's check. <laughs> hey, look, Pete. There's a light in the dark room. He must have got up early and beat me to it, to the safe. Ted... Ted, you in there? <laughs> Always the optimist, huh? Come on, open it up. Ted! Good heavens. Ted Hale hadn't gone anywhere. He was lying there on a cot. His head was a bloody pulp. It had been bashed in while he slept. With a long-handled coal shovel which lay there alongside the cot. Great Scott. He's been murdered. We stood there in a narrow, dark room, Phil and I, and we looked at each other. There was a strange gleam in Phil's eyes. I tried to read the meaning of that gleam, but he averted his eyes too quickly. He dropped his gaze to my hands. I saw what he was looking at. My hands were black and grimy with coal dust. And on the briny, coal-blackened handle of the shovel... It was a fresh set of fingerprints. Phil, did I kill him? Did I kill him in my sleep? The same as Myrna? Phil, I can't stand it being a murderer. I'm going to give myself up. You'll do nothing of the kind. If you did it, Pete, you're not responsible. But you do think I did it? And Myrna, too? I, I don't know. I don't know what to say. <laughs> Just think, Phil. Maybe, maybe tonight I might kill you or Henrietta. There's no telling what I might do. Robbers. No, no, Phil. It's hard to believe, but there's the proof. I'm a murderer. I'm dangerous. There's only one thing to do. I won't let you do it. What else is left? Come on. I'm going to help you hide Ted's body. <laughs> How much further, Phil? Oh, there it is. There's the bridge up ahead. Okay. Here, help me with it. We had the body of Ted Hale in a sack with a pair of hundred-pound dumbbells to weight it down. Myrna's funeral took place the next morning And I had to endure the condolences of friends and business associates But Phil and Henrietta stood by me all through it It'll be over soon, Peter Then you can rest Keep your chin up I'll get rid of the stragglers Look Look who just came in Where? Inspector O'Brien, what does he want, Phil? Take it easy, take it easy. Let me do the talking. I uh, came to pay my respects, Mr. Lang. Oh, well, thank you, Inspector. No trace of Ted Hale, is there, Inspector? I'm afraid not, Mr. Judson. We're combing the city for him, but I'm afraid he's got clean away. You see, uh... It was marvelous to see how calmly Phil could talk to O'Brien about Ted Hale. Knowing all the time just where the body was. Under that bridge. I glanced at Henrietta. She was watching Phil, too. Yeah, you know, uh, know what I think, Mr. Judson? I think Ted Hale will never be caught. 
I have a very funny feeling that he's dead. Later that afternoon, I took a taxi cab and I went down to police headquarters and asked to see Inspector O'Brien. Oh, glad to see you, Mr. Lang. You're looking a little better this afternoon. I feel better, Inspector. I, I feel better because I've come to an important decision. Oh, yeah? Inspector, I've decided to tell you something that'll startle you. <laughs> That's pretty hard to startle an old hand in my business. Go ahead, I'm listening. All right. Inspector, Ted Hale didn't kill Myrna. I killed her. That is, I think I killed her. You think you killed her, don't you know? It sounds crazy, doesn't it? But I assure you, I'm perfectly safe. Uh, just a second now. You either killed her or you didn't kill her. If you kill somebody, you know it. No, not in this case, Inspector. You see, I, I think I did it in my sleep. Both times. Verna and Ted Hale, too. Uh, hold on now. I'll get someone to take notes. I suppose you start from the beginning. I told him the whole story. I feel it awakened me. We found Myrna strangled. The groggy drug feeling I'd had. How Ted Hale had tried to blackmail me. And how Phil had awakened me once more and we'd gone down to the cellar. And found Ted with his head bashed in. I talked for a solid hour. I'm glad you came to see me, Mr. Lang. Glad you've told me all this. You must have had a hard time reaching a decision to come here. Yes. Yes, it was hard, Inspector. Mm -hmm. Phil wanted me to go away. It would have been so easy to go away and let him take care of things. But I, I'd never be able to sleep for fear I'd kill someone else. Well, you needn't worry, Miss Lang. There won't be any more killings. Not if I'm safely in jail. You're not going to jail. You're going home. What? In those notes the stenographer has taken, Mr. Lang, I have almost enough material to convict the real murder. I need just one more thing. Now, I, you go home and wait. Don't worry. You, you mean I, I, did, I didn't kill Myrna and Ted? Now you just go along home and take it easy. I'm back at home now. It's two hours since I left O'Brien's office and I've taken the time to write down this full account. Just as I gave it to the stenographer. As I write now, I can look across the lawn to Phil Judson's house. Five minutes ago, I saw Inspector O'Brien and two detectives go in there. The front door is opening now. I can see them coming out. O'Brien first, then the two detectives. With Phil between them. They've got handcuffs on Phil. And here comes Henrietta. She's running across the lawn. Coming here. Peter! Peter! Coming, Henrietta. Peter, they've taken Phil away. Yes, I saw it off from the window. Oh, darling. Everything went right. Exactly as we planned oh, it. Oh, baby, baby. Hold me tight, Peter. Hold <laughs> tight. We can be together now. Forever and ever. I'd have killed a dozen learners for you, baby. I know. And you were clever, Peter. So clever. And the hardest part was getting Phil to cooperate. <laughs> but I knew he'd do anything for a friend. What a fool he is. He stepped right in and took over. <laughs> you should have seen O'Brien when I told him the story. I could tell exactly what he was thinking. Here's a poor innocent sap whose best friend is framing him. Giving him drugs and then making him think he commits murder. <laughs> oh, Peter. As soon as he's convicted, I'll be free. And we can go away together. All right. Huh? But you'll have to cancel that trip. Both of you. O'Brien. You... You heard what we said? Sure did, every word. <laughs> Remember at my office, Mr. Lang, when I told you I only needed one more thing to clinch the case against the murderer? Well, this was it. I faked the arrest of Mr. Judson, and then I sneaked back to see what you'd do about it. <laughs> you did plenty. Well, P. 
Pete certainly ruined a perfect crime by talking too much. Which all goes to show that it's not wise to kill and tell. Mercy. <laughs> People do go out of their way to get themselves into trouble, don't they, Mr. Host? I'm really surprised at Henrietta, though. For being a partner in crime, Mary. No. For not being a partner to her husband. Oh. Most women, you know, take great pride in looking out for their husband's happiness. Mm -hmm. You mean like mending the bullet holes in their shirts? Oh, Mr. Host, <laughs> there are lots of better ways than that to keep a husband happy. For example, when your husband comes home from work, give him the refreshment of a brimming cup of piping hot Lipton tea. Lipton tea makes a wonderfully pleasing drink at mealtime or any time, because Lipton's is such a grand tea, so deliciously different, more flavorful and full-bodied. If you've been forgetting to get it, why not jot down Lipton's on tomorrow's grocery list now? Remember, Lipton tea always meets with favor, because Lipton tea gives you brisk flavor. And now, friends, a parting word of advice. If you ever wake up and think that you've murdered someone in your sleep, don't go to the police. Now, just take another powder, brother, and go back to sleep. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is The Innocent Mrs. Duff by Elizabeth Sanksy Holding. And next week, the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup will bring you another Inner Sanctum mystery directed by Hyman Brown and called Accident. Does the wind whistling in your ears frighten you folks? Oh, now don't be scared. Because when you're pushed down an empty elevator shaft and you hit the bottom, nothing ever can frighten you again. It's just an accident. And you'll learn all the mystery of it if you're listening to Inner Sanctum next week. <laughs> Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> For a wonderful soup, be sure to try Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. presents The Mysterious Traveler. This is The Mysterious Traveler, inviting you to join me on another journey into the realm of the strange and the terrifying. I hope you will enjoy the trip, that it will thrill you a little and chill you a little. So settle back, get a good grip on your nerves, and be comfortable, if you can, for in a few moments... You're going to meet a ghost, the strangest phantom that you ever heard of. But first, I want you to be my guest on a little train ride. We're running at 60 miles an hour on open track in the dead of night. Now we thunder through a sleeping village. Then beyond it, we plunge into the waiting mouth of a tunnel. We race through the tunnel and into the open again. Over a trestle and on into the night. A little world of our own, rushing forward resistlessly, a symbol of power and speed and life. Yes, trains do have a life of their own, as you'll see in the unusual ghost story that I call... The Locomotive Ghost. My story starts some years ago in a hilly region of western Pennsylvania. It's almost midnight, and two men laden down with several handbags 
are moving cautiously over the rough ground beneath a railroad trestle. They come to a spot beneath one end of it, and there in the darkness, they stop and turn on a flashlight. All right, we can sit down and rest now. Are you sure this is the right spot? Of course I'm sure. This is the loading spot. It branches off at a mine entrance. Main line's over there, about 100 yards away. How, uh, how long do you think we'll have to wait? Five or ten minutes. These mine trains don't run in a minute the way they do out in the main line. Suppose uh, the money isn't on the mine train. They might have changed their plans. It'll be on it. Those miners are waiting for their pay, and the treasurer's bringing it himself. Plus bonus money and cash for operating the expenses. Big haul, my friend. Two hundred thousand dollars. Two hundred thousand dollars? That's a lot of dough, but... But what? You getting cold feet? No, no, of course not, but... Well, they'll be killed, won't they? The crew on the train? Forget it. I thought you were turning soft on me now after I spilled the whole plan to you. No, Joe, I'm not turning soft. Joe. What is it? Thought I heard a noise then. Over there. It's just your imagination. Oh, you're right. Somebody's coming. Keep the light steady. I got my gun handy. Who could it be? It's probably just a bum. They often sleep under this trestle. All right, you step where you are. It's only me, boys. Just old Boomer. Who? Old Boomer, that's all. Looking for a place to bunk. Howdy, boys. It's okay, Tom. I heard of this guy. So you're old Boomer, huh? The one they call the king of the bums? Uh, not the king, son. Just the traveling is one of them all. Fifty years I've been riding the rods, and I guess I've covered a million miles of track. Mind if I sit down here? Got a kind of ache in my bones. Sit down if you want to. Uh, thanks, son. <clears throat> Say, uh, you fellas ain't bums. You're dressed too good. Never mind about us. Curiosity ain't healthy. <laughs> Old Boomer never fights with anybody. Live and let live's his motto. Listen, here comes number 25. It's mighty fine train, 25. Got a 16-wheel Mikado engine, can pull 20 cars at 80 on a level track. He's uh, 50 seconds late tonight. Do you know every train on the tracks? Uh, pretty near, son, pretty near. I ain't rode them all. I rode them all, I mean, from the Lackawanna to the Santa Fe. There ain't much about trains I don't know. Say, uh, you fellas wouldn't have a little nip handy to take the chill out of an old man's bones. No, we ain't got a little nip handy. Oh, sure, son. There's no harm in asking. <laughs> yeah. There's the 25 passing Minesville now. Ain't that whistle far off in the night a sweet, mournful sound, though? Yeah, it is kind of mournful. Sounds are far off and ghostly, don't it? Well, sometimes it is a ghost you hear, not a real train at all. What are you talking about? I'm just saying that sometimes when you hear a train whistling far off and mournful in the night, it ain't a real train at all. It's a ghost train. Ghost train? It's a lot of hooey. Uh, you just think so because you're young and don't know better. But old Boomer can tell you there's ghost trains and plenty of them. They're the ghosts of trains that died in wrecks. Anything as live as a train... It's bound to have a ghost live on after All right, can the chatter? You're hurting my ears. Ah, let him talk, Joe. It helps pass the time. All right, but if you ask me, he's spotting a lot of bush you are. Go on, Boomer. What were you saying about trains having ghosts? Well, yeah, I've seen them many a time. They're running the tracks with all the lights out, gone faster than the wind. Not a sound coming from them. I've seen the Heavenly Express, too, a couple times. What's the Heavenly Express? It's a special train, son. It's on the earth to heaven run. Travels a million miles a minute when it gets up speed. Takes the souls of railroad men from this world to the next. It always passes by when a wreck's gonna happen. That's enough talk. I'm sick of listening to you. All right, son. You don't believe me, but I know what I know. I can... Glory be. I hear it coming. I hear it coming now. Hear what coming? The Heavenly Express. It's coming down this track. Listen. I don't hear anything. There's nothing to hear. It's passing right by overhead. Now it's slow. It's going to stop. It's never stopped before. That, that means Rex's going to be here. Joe, he knows. That's it. That's what you're here for. You're going to wreck that mine train. Hear that, old man? That's a mine train turning into this spur. You're right. We're going to wreck it. No, you can't. You mustn't. But before we do, we got to take care of you. And this is how we're going to do it. <coughs> you shot him. I guess the Heavenly Express stopped for me, too. I sure hope so. 
But you fellas, it'll punish you. It'll follow you. Sure as I'm laying here. Hello, follow us. What are you talking about? The judgment special. It punishes fellas that wreck trains on purpose. It runs any place has tracks. And it follows them until it gets them. One way or another. Because murdering a train is like murdering a man. You gotta pay for it. And you'll pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. You'll see. Yeah, that shut him up. Crazy old coot. I wish I hadn't killed him, Joe. Don't be a sap. Couldn't let him live to tell what he knew, could I? No, no, of course not. Listen. I hear the mine train coming. We just got time to get ready now. Put the suitcase with the dynamite against the trestle here. That's it. Now, come on, help me unroll a wire. Yeah, yeah, sure, Joe. Anything you say. That's it. Keep coming. Uh, you gotta get plenty far away. Hit a train now? Yeah, I hear it. I can see the headlight, too. Look how bright it is. Okay, this is far enough. Take me just a second to hit you up the detonator. There it is. Now, we're all ready. It's on the trestle now. Almost halfway across. What's the matter? You sound shaky. Listen, Tom, you're in this now, and it's too late to back out, you hear? Yeah, I know. It's it's almost across. All right, then I'll close the detonator. Now. And there she goes. Three hours later, the two men, Joe Malone and Tom Henderson were driving eastward through the night, far from the scene of the train wreck. Between them on the seat was a large handbag, and Joe Malone at the wheel patted it lovingly. Two hundred thousand bucks. Ha! You realize that, Tom? We got two hundred thousand bucks riding here between us. Yeah. Yeah, I know. What's the matter? You don't sound very happy about it. Sure I am. It's just... Just what? Well, I can't help remembering the crash when the mine train went to the ravine. The way the whistle kept screaming, just like the locomotive was something alive that was being killed. For Pete's sake, the whistle valve got stuck when the engine crashed, that's all. Sure, I know that, only... Well, I just can't help remembering it. Joe, the crew were all killed, weren't they? Suppose they were. What do you care? You're as nervous as an old woman. I should never rung you in on this job. I'm all right, really, I am, Joe. Listen, uh... What are you going to do with your hundred thousand? I'm heading for the big town. Going to have one swell time. Going to buy new clothes, stay at the best hotel in town, and really cut loose. Meet me in New York, I'll show you a real time. Where are you going to stay? This is Miller's boarding house. It's over on the west side. You can find it in the phone book. Mm -hmm. I'm just staying there till I can buy some real classy duds. And I'm moving to Park Avenue. Always had a yen to live in Park Avenue. Now I'm going to see what it's like. Yeah, sounds all right. Maybe, uh... Joe, look out that train! What'd you do that for? Why'd you grab the brake? You stall us right here in the middle of a railroad crossing. I had to, Joe. The train on the track there in front of us, we almost ran into it. What are you talking about? There wasn't any train on that track? But there was, running without lights and not making a sound. You're crazy. I tell you, there wasn't anything in sight, not even a handcar. But I saw it, Joe. Never heard of a train running without lights. That proves you're crazy. Well, maybe it was an empty... But if I hadn't stopped the car, would have smashed into the side of it. Yeah. Uh, I good mind to suck you one. Now we're stalling a railroad track, and the car won't start. I'll get out and push. Joe, look! A headlight! Real train this time, coming around the bend. It's about 200 yards off. Joe, it's going to hit us. we got to jump. Yeah, but this door won't open. It's stuck. Come on, out this side. Come on, I got the bag. Ah, oh, my coat's caught in the car door. I'm stuck. Help me! I can't, Joe! Jump! Jump! Help me, Tom! Help! Help me! Help! Mister? Mister, you all right? Yeah. Yeah, I'm all right. But my uh, friend, he must have been killed. Yes, he sure was. It's a wonder you get away. Look at your car. Yeah. There's pieces of it spread a quarter mile up the track. Whatever made you stop right there on the crossing? Car stall. Who are you? I, I'm the crossing watchman. Watchman? Why weren't you on duty? Why didn't you signal there was a train coming? Because I didn't know it, mister. That was the wrecking train taking doctors down to Mineville. 
it, it was unscheduled. Oh, I see. What about the other train, the one that went past going east just before the wrecking train hit us? Other train? Yeah. Well, no other train due through here till 6 a.m. this morning. But I saw it, I tell you, traveling without lights. No train ever travels without lights. It's again the law. Say, are you drunk? No, no, I'm not. Where are you going? Listen, I got a, a report to make on this. You got to fill out a form. I get it, I'm not interested. Get away from here. I'm going to New York. Late the next afternoon, Tom Henderson reached New York. Not knowing where else to go, he hunted in the phone book for Mrs. Miller's boarding house that Joe Malone had mentioned and went there. Mrs. Miller gave him a room on the top floor, and there he carefully locked in the closet the precious handbag that held $200,000. All of it his since Joe's unfortunate death. After that, Tom went out to see New York's nightclubs. But he got back after midnight, feeling considerably more cheerful. As he was about to unlock his door, Mrs. Miller appeared in the hall. Oh, Mr. Henderson. Oh, oh yeah, Mrs. Miller. I was waiting for you, Mr. Henderson. Huh? It's turned so cool that I lit the gas heater in your room. Well, thanks a lot. I just wanted to warn you that you... What was that? What was what, Mr. Henderson? That, that whistle just now, what was it? A boat out in the river? Oh, that was a freight train, Mr. Henderson. A freight train? Here in the heart of New York? Well, yes. They come down the west side elevated tracks to the freight yard downtown. They run past just a few yards down the street. I didn't know that. I wouldn't have come here if I had. Oh, I'm sure they won't bother you, Mr. Henderson. Really, they won't. Well, good night. Good night. Oh, bad Lex. She's sure they won't bother me. And it's too late to find someplace else where I leave here right now. I'll close the window. I'll keep the sound out. Anyway, suppose I can hear a train or two. But I'm going to hear them do me. I'm going to go to sleep and forget it. Yeah, forget it. I've got 200,000 bucks in my whole life ahead of me. <laughs> Should let an old coot like that boomer worry me. Joe's getting killed by a train was just an accident. Could happen to anybody. Me? I'm alive. Tomorrow, I'm going to start enjoying it plenty. All aboard, son. We're leaving in one millionth of a second, and we got to be on time. Boomer, it's you. That's right, son. You got to wake up and get aboard. We're pulling out. Well, I'm at a railroad station someplace, but everything's so misty, I can't see much. No time for talking, son. Got to get aboard. Yeah, but I'm the only passenger, except for you and me, there isn't another soul in sight. And you're wearing a conductor's uniform. They promoted me. Now, come on, get aboard. I don't want to. I don't like trains. I don't want to go any place. Can't help it. This is a special trip just for you. And you got to be aboard. Had it. Come on now, up those steps. I... That's it. Now we're off right on time to the millionth of a second. Where, where are we going? What train is this? Well, it's completely empty except for me and you. That's right, son. It's a thousand car train pulled by 30 engines. And you and me are the only ones aboard. Well, where are we going? What, what train is this, anyway? It's the judgment special, son. And we're bound from this world to the next. No. No. Yeah, or any place there's tracks to judge up right outside your wind and took you aboard. I don't want to die. I don't want to. If you haven't any choice, son. You're on the judgment special and we're hitting a million miles a minute now. What? Look out the window. There's the earth way down below us. See it? Yeah. But well, I don't want to leave it. I don't want to go. Look at the stars flash by. We're gone a million miles a minute. 
And it'll take us all eternity to get there. Yep. Here, I'll put the wind up so you can see better. Oh. There you are, son. There's the earth we left. That tiny little dot of light way up in the sky. Oh, I won't go with it. I won't. Hey, I won't. what are you doing? Get down. I you can't jump out that window. We're going a million miles a minute. I won't jump. I'm not going with you. Come back. Come back. Wake up. Wake up. Hey, Anderson, wake hey. up. Wake up. Hey. What is it? Oh, what is it? Oh, Mr. Henderson, thank heaven you're still alive. I, I thought you were dead for sure. What? What happened? Well, you closed your window. I meant to warn you that with the gas heater on, you must leave it open. Well, you almost suffocated in your sleep. I... I almost suffocated? Yes. If I hadn't heard you trying to get your breath and hurried in and opened your window, you'd have been dead now, for sure. The rest of the night, Tom Henderson spent sitting on a bench in the nearest park, shivering at the nearness of his escape. The next day, he bought himself an expensive wardrobe... Then he checked into the biggest hotel on Park Avenue. There, just before he retired, he he took a sleeping tablet. Yeah, that'll fix it. No dreams for me tonight. Ah, some layout. So this is what you can enjoy when you have money. And I'm going to enjoy it. I've been letting my nerves get the better of me. Not anymore. Feel better already. So it goes the light. I sleep like a millionaire. Yes, just like a millionaire. And so Tom fell asleep. But unfortunately, he did dream. And he knew he was dreaming, but he couldn't wake up. It was a very curious dream indeed. He dreamed that he got up and dressed, rode down in the elevator that he walked out into Park Avenue, and there, down the street, he found a tiny door which he entered. It led down a flight of steep iron stairs to a dark tunnel far beneath the ground. There in the tunnel, a man was waiting for him. The man turned, and he saw it was his former pal, Joe Malone. Hello, Tom. Joe. Joe, it's you. Yeah. I've been waiting for you, Tom. But... But you're dead. I saw you killed. Maybe I'm dead. Maybe I'm not. You're dead. I know it. It's just a dream. I gotta wake up. Can't wake up. Don't you understand? You're never gonna wake up. I will. I will. Oh, Tom. Now, come along with me. I'm here to guide you. Where? Where are you taking me? Down this tunnel. See how it stretches out? On and on. Now it keeps going down and down. No. Where do you think it goes to? I don't know. I don't I don't want to know. Come on now, Tom. I can't wait all night. No, I won't go. I'm going to wake up. You can't, Tom. The night I was killed, you saw the judgment special. Now you can never get away from it. It's not true. This is... It's the dream. I'm safe in my own bed in the hotel. And you refuse to come with me? Yes, I do. I refuse. Listen, Tom. Listen to what? I don't hear anything. Listen. It's closer now. No. You hear that? That's the judgment special, Tom. Coming through this tunnel. Train. It's a train coming. Where are you going to go? You're in a tunnel, Tom. And no way out. It's, it's just a dream. It can't hurt me. It's coming closer, Tom. It's coming closer. No, it's only a dream. i got to wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up. Wake up, mister. Oh. Oh, thank heavens I'm awake. I'd say not any too soon either. But, I, who are you? It's so dark and carrying a lantern. Who am I, mister? I'm a track walker. Track walker? What do you mean? I mean that I inspect the track here under Park Avenue. What? How did I get here? Why, mister, a minute ago I found you walking in your sleep, your eyes tight closed down this tunnel right under Park Avenue. Park Avenue? If I hadn't met you, you never would open your eyes again, because number ten is due along here in three minutes. Then... Then it wasn't a dream. I... I really am in a railroad tunnel. Yes, I am. I'll say you are. How you got here, I don't know, unless you came down one of the inspection doors from the street, but... Brother, if this walking in your sleep is something you do often, take my advice and see a doctor. 
But Tom didn't go to a doctor, for he knew what a doctor would say. That it was his nerves, his guilty conscience. Now Tom felt he had to get away, far away to a place where there were no trains to haunt him. At dawn, he bought a ticket on the first plane leaving for Canada. That afternoon, he found himself in a tiny town deep in the heart of Canada. There he hired a French-Canadian guide to take him by canoe far into the woods, away from any trace of civilization. Late that night, they arrived at the cabin where the guide lived with his wife. Tom unpacked his suitcase and joined the guide and his wife on the porch. For the first time since the wrecking of the mine train, Tom felt at peace. Oh, this is something like it. It is peaceful, is it not, monsieur? Yeah. Ah, monsieur's nerves are better already. Yes, this is what I need. Uh, how far is it to the nearest railroad? It is 80 miles, monsieur. 80 miles. Old Boomer said it traveled anywhere there were tracks. 80 miles ought to be enough. Pardon? I do not understand. Oh, never mind. Uh, I've got to get some sleep now. Of course. Good night, monsieur. Good night, monsieur. What was that? Uh, what was what, monsieur? That, that whistle, then. It sounded like a train whistle. Impossible. It must have been an owl. Yeah, yeah, sure. Uh, sorry I bothered you. Good night. Tom entered his room and went to bed, but he could not sleep. He tossed and turned and at last got up and dressed. Oh, the moon is bright. I'll take a little walk. i got to calm myself down. There's nothing to worry about now, not a thing. Out here in the wilds, I'm safe. Perfectly safe. Tom left the cabin and entered the woods. They pressed thick around him, but an open passageway through the trees attracted Tom. He started down it, the moonlight illuminating his way. He paused and made a startling discovery. Why, I'm walking on old railroad ties. And there are tracks here, all rusted and loose. But the guide said there wasn't a railroad closer than 80 miles. He lied to me. He tricked me. A train. There's a train coming. It's coming toward me. There's a headlight. I gotta run. 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 Marie. Marie. Qu'est-ce que c'est que ça, Pierre? The nervous one. He's not in the cabin. He has wandered off into the woods. Oh, that is strange. We must go after him. Hurry before he does himself an injury. Still behind me. Still following me. I I can't. I can't run anymore. I can't. I can't go any further. I gotta stop. I gotta stop. The judgment special, son. It runs any place there's tracks. And it follows you till it gets you. Because murder in a train... It's like murdering a man. You got to pay for it. You think I'm crazy, but you'll see. Here it comes, son. No! No! He cannot be far now, Marie. See his footprints. Ah, he was running for half a mile. He would do himself harm running so hard in his darkness. <gasps> Look, Pierre. Voila. Yes, it is the nervous one. We have found him. He's lying face down. Wait, I will turn him over. <sighs> Pierre, he lies so still. Has he done himself an injury? No, Marie. There is not a mark on him. Yet his face, it is twisted with fear. Pierre. Is he... Is he dead? Yes, Marie. He is dead. His heart. He killed himself by running, no doubt. But what was it he ran away from? There is nothing dangerous in these woods. The 
misses the mysterious traveler again. Poor Tom. The tracks he found himself on led to an abandoned logging camp. They hadn't been used in 20 years, and no train could possibly have run on them. Uh, except a ghost train. But of course, none of us believes in ghosts, so we just have to accept the coroner's verdict, which was heart failure induced by overexertion. Just the same, if you ever see a train running without lights and going faster than the wind, don't be too sure it's only your imagination. And next time you hear a distant, mournful whistle in the night, you... Oh, all this talk about trains is making you nervous, and you have to get off here. I'm sorry. But I'm sure we'll meet again. Shall we say next week? At the same time. You have just heard The Mysterious Traveler, a series of dramas of the strange and terrifying. In today's cast were Maurice Tarplin, James McCallion, Joe Julian, Bryna Rayburn, and Cameron Andrews. Original music was played by Charles Paul. Mysterious Traveler is written, produced, and directed by Bob Arthur and David Cogan. Listen next week to a tale titled The Man the Insects Hated. Another strange and shivery tale of the Mysterious Traveler. The Mysterious Traveler has come to you from our New York studios. Carl Caruso speaking. This is the Mutual Broadcasting System. From Hollywood, the Screen Director's Playhouse. Screen Director's Playhouse... Star, Ray Milland. Production, The Uninvited. Director, Louis Allen. The Hollywood Screen Directors present a tale for troubled midnights. The motion picture drama, The Uninvited. Starring Ray Milland in his original role of Rick Fitzgerald. surge of the ocean at the foot of the Devonshire Cliffs, not far from my window. Only five o'clock. And then... I was sure now. I hadn't dreamed of appalling crying. Could it be my sister Pamela in the next bedroom? There was no electricity in this old house. I, I lit a candle. I went to the door leading into the upstairs hallway. What? Oh. Oh, Pamela... You heard it too, then. What in heaven's name is it? I don't know. It comes from downstairs. It comes from everywhere and nowhere. I'm going down and search the place. It's no use, Rick. There's never anything there. You mean this has happened before? All the time you were still in London while I was getting the house ready for us to live in. But why didn't you call me or write me about it? It's our home now. It's all we've got to live in. Sounds so terribly heartbroken. But there, there must be some logical explanation. It'll stop soon now. It always dies away at dawn. No wonder we got the old place for such a low price. They tell me it stood empty for ten years before. Oh. 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 The shutter blew open. It's the dawn breeze. I must have forgotten to latch up. Listen. I know. The sobbing is gone. Oh. Is that 
Oh, for tonight? Is that all? It's every night, Rick. And if I don't get some sleep, I'll die. No, no, no. Don't do that. It'll be different tomorrow night. You'll see. Oh, hello. Aren't you the gentleman who bought this house for my grandfather? Why, yes. Good evening. Uh, good evening. I'm Stella Meredith. It was my mother's house. Well, come in, Stella Meredith. Thank you. I haven't been in this house since I was three. And I've wanted to come so many times. Then why didn't you? Oh, my my grandfather forbids it. He has some silly idea that I'm in danger. Nonsense. You shall see the house, Stella Meredith, and I shall be your guide. my old nursery. Like it? Oh, how pretty your sister has made it. That's very pretty perfume you're wearing. It's mimosa. Do you like it? Oh, very much. My mother always used mimosa. She died when I was three years old. Oh. May I see the studio now where my father painted? Only it's the studio where I play the piano now. You may even persuade me to play something for you. Don't stop playing, please. Very flattering, thank you. Father painted my mother's picture in this very room. You don't remember that. No. But mother would sit on this platform wearing her soft white dress. Sometimes, of course, he'd paint the other one. Other one? He had a model, you know, a Spanish girl... People seem to get awfully hush-hush when I try to ask about her, though. You play beautifully. It's a serenade to Stella by Starlight. You mean this Stella? Me? And this candlelight. Oh, it's the most exciting thing that has ever happened to me. Is it? Y yes. What's the matter? All at once, a, a cold wind. Yes, suddenly it is cold in this room. And your music's gone so terribly sad. Why? I don't know. It just came out that way. And the candles grew dim. There's a draft. Oh, Mother was so young and beautiful and she died so cruelly. Mother! Stella! Mother! Mother! Stella, Stella come back! I gathered my scattered senses and jumped up and ran after her. I passed Pamela, standing amazed at the foot of the stairs. Rick, what's the matter? What's happened? There's something evil in her. But she was out the front door, her dark hair flying, running wildly in the darkness, heading for the cliffs. Stella! I shouted after her. Stella, come back! Shouted again, pleading with her. No, Stella, no! The cliffs, I thought. Stella, the cliffs! The cliffs and the boiling sea beneath. Stella! Whatever sinister force had driven her out of the house was now driving her to destruction on those killing rocks. The brink was only yards away, a few steps. I reached for her and my fingers caught in her belt and I pulled her back. Back from the very edge of that awful precipice. Stella. What's the matter? Matter? You were going over the edge. Was I? Why did you do it, Stella? What drove you toward death? Death? Why, nothing. I, I didn't feel I was in any danger. Look below you. Oh, the sea. Yes. This is where my mother fell. Your mother fell here? By this dead tree. She, she... Are you all right? Help me. Stella. Will she be all right, Dr. Scott? She's resting nicely upstairs, Miss Pamela. Well, is Stella entirely safe up there alone? Why not? Well, in the light of what just happened. You're the one who sneers when I say this house is haunted. Well, everybody in the village knows the house is peculiar. Well, can you tell us anything about it, Doctor? Do you know about Carmel? 
Carmel? The Spanish model Stella's father painted. Oh, yes. Stella's father was in love with Carmel. It was an open scandal. But didn't Mrs. Meredith know about it? Oh, I suppose she just accepted the situation. Where's this Carmel now? She died in this very house a week after Mary Meredith fell to her death from the cliff out there. Oh, she did fall then. Ironically, she fell trying to save her rival from committing suicide. Or so they say. Rick, Dr. Scott, don't you notice a scent in the room? No. Yes, I do. Yes. It's heliotrope. No, it's mimosa. Stella's mother was fond of it. Stella tells me that Pam has come back. What, Rick? Upstairs. Stella's not alone anymore. I know it. Come on. Stella. Stella, are you all right? She's gone. I'm here. Stella, darling. At the window. Now, don't be frightened. I'm not frightened. Don't you know who it is in your house? It's my mother. Your mother? Did you see her? No. But when I woke up, I... I felt her in the room. Her scent, the mimosa, it was all around. I could feel her warm presence everywhere. And I felt something else. Something I've never known in my whole life. The knowledge that someone loved me very dearly. You'd better take her home, Rick. No. No, Mother is here. She wants me with her. Your mother is dead, Stella. I know. But your grandfather will miss you. He'll be furious if he finds you here. I know, but... I love it here. I'll always come back. Another time, Stella. Another time. father was right. There was danger in this house for Stella. In the studio, when we'd first felt its presence, I'd not smelled Mimosa. But in that moment before dawn, with that awful sorrow in the house, I suddenly knew. I knew that there was a cold, cruel spirit which hated Stella, and a warm, scented spirit that loved her. There was not one ghost... You are listening to the Screen Director's Playhouse presentation of The Uninvited, starring Ray Milland in his original role of Rick Fitzgerald. Pamela, I know this. Stella Meredith is in danger in this house. She mustn't come here anymore. But she loves it, Rick. How can we possibly keep her away? By holding a seance. A seance? Only this seance will be rigged. We've got to fix it so that the ghost of Mary Meredith appears to say in effect, Stella, I'm your mother. Forget Windward House and I shall find peace and happiness. P.S. There is a tall, excruciatingly handsome man named Rick Fitzgerald who wants to marry you. It's wrong, Rick. I won't agree to deceiving Stella. We've got to break Stella this attachment to the dead. We'll rig the sails. That very night, we held the sails. We all sat around a table. Stella, Pam, Dr. Scott, and I. A single candle was burning. On the table, I chalked the alphabet in a big circle. And the words, yes and no, opposite each other. An inverted wine glass stood in the center of the table... My stage was set. I think the room is dark enough to begin. The important thing is that we should all believe. Uh, yes, yes, so I understand. So, what now? Everybody puts a finger on the glass. Now, ask a question, Stella. Is there anybody here? Is anybody... The glass is moving. Yes. The glass is on, yes. Go on, Stella. Are you my mother? Yes. You don't want me to go away from Winwood House, do you, Mother? They want me to stay away. Do you? Rick, are 
Quick, let go. You're keeping the glass from moving. I'm not. Let go, I say. Better let matters take their course, Fitzgerald. All right. No. You... She said no. She doesn't want me to stay away. Look, look. The glass is moving. I... G... U... A... God. I God. God me from what, Father? What? C... A... R... M... Carmel. That's enough. Who smashed the glass against the wall? You, Pamela? No one, Rick. No one was touching it. Stella. Stella. Stella's in a trance. Stella! Don't touch her. It may be dangerous. May I ask a question? No. It might help to try to reach her mind. Yes, try it. Whoever you are, are you Mary Meredith, Stella's mother? Oh, this is awful. I won't ask her anything else. Is that Spanish, Scott? I, uh, I don't know. Stella. Stella. She's fainted. I'm afraid this has all been a dreadful mistake. It was wrong. But she'll never be cured until this house is cured. Until then, Stella must never come here again. I won't answer it. I'll answer it. I'll go. It was Stella's grandfather in a cold, bitter fury over her presence there and her condition. An outrage, you hear? An outrage. I'm very sorry, sir. It won't happen again. I warrant you it won't. My granddaughter will never enter this house again if I have to lock her up somewhere. Come, Stella. Stella was gone. But my work had just begun. I had to avert a tragedy. I had to solve the mystery of Windward House. But, but where to start? I went to see Dr. Scott. Any luck, Fitzgerald? You find anyone with a clue to what really happened here 17 years ago? Mm. No. Everyone who was here with the Meredith then seems to be dead. The trained nurse isn't. Trained nurse? I've been looking through the old case book of my predecessor, Dr. Rudd. No? At the time of the tragedy, the Merediths employed a nurse for their child, a certain Miss Holloway. Holloway? Very, very much attached to Mary Meredith. Well, is she alive? How can we find her? She runs a place on Bodwin Moor called the Mary Meredith Retreat in honor of her long dead mistress. Hospital? And a mental institution. <laughs> strange woman, strange place. Bodwin Moor. I think I'd better have a serious talk with Miss Holloway. <laughs> I shall be happy, Mr. Fitzgerald, to assist in any way I can concerning these manifestations at Windward House. Well, to begin with, Miss Holloway, I know about the Meredith, uh, Mary Meredith Carmel Triangle 17 years ago. Yes, it was the delight of the local gossips. What were Mary and Carmel like? Extraordinary women, both of them. But Mary Meredith, she was a goddess. Even her talk was lovely and sparkling. Oh, the night we sat before her fireplace, planning our lives. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She met her humiliation and her fate magnificently. Uh, about Carmel. A Spanish gypsy. Beautiful and crafty and cruel. Why did Mrs. Meredith stand for the situation? She felt the decision to end it must come from her husband. Did it? Finally. To make it easier for Carmel, they took her to Paris. Found a position for her and left her there. Then they came back here with their infant daughter. For a while, they were almost happy together. Then? Carmel came back. She still wanted Mary's husband. Then, one stormy night, Carmel had been told that she must leave. This time for good. 
Oh, there was a ghastly scene, and finally Carmel, in a rage for revenge, ran to the child's room and snatched her up and ran toward the cliff. Mary raced after her. In the struggle, Mary fell to the rocks below. The baby was unharmed. What happened to Carmel? She escaped in the storm. Next morning, she crawled back in the early stages of pneumonia. I had to nurse her. I see. And now, please. I must be alone. Please. What you tell me about Miss Holloway is very interesting, Fitzgerald. A fanatical and dedicated woman, Doctor. Uh, Dr. Rudd, before me, disliked her intensely. Professionally? Personally? How? Listen to this entry from Dr. Rudd's casebook for December 10th, 1932. Called to Windward House, Meredith's model, Carmel Quesada, double pneumonia. That tell is what Miss Holloway told me. December 12th, Carmel Quesada, much worse. No attempt to warm her room. Found traces of snow in her bedroom. Snow? Spoke severely to Nurse Holloway. Absolutely criminal negligence. Well, isn't that a pretty serious charge, Doctor? When a man of Dr. Rudd's generation used it, it was very apt to mean murder. Miss Holloway murdered Carmel? She was very fond of Mary Meredith. Perhaps that's why Stella's grandfather sent her to Miss Holloway's for safekeeping this afternoon. You mean... You mean Stella's there now? In that genteel madhouse? Well, I venture she's safe with her mother's dearest friend. Who was also guilty of criminal negligence? Oh, no. Dr. Scott, I must hurry. Be good enough to call my sister Pamela at Windward House. Say I'll pick her up in 15 minutes and call Miss Holloway, will you? Tell her to expect us. I'm on my way. Miss Holloway, when I was here before, why didn't you tell me that Stella was here too? The presence of our guests is confidential. Please take us to her at once. She's no longer here. I but, sent her away when Dr. Scott called to say you'd be here. But why? She was the happiest person in the world when I told her she might return to Windward House. Windward House? But her grandfather sent her here to keep her away from Windward House. She loves it so. You knew we'd be away and you sent her there? Mary will be there. Oh, you hate Stella. You sent her to her death. Mary is waiting for Stella. You're insane. Hurry, Pam. It may be too late even now. <laughs> drove headlong through the rain, racing the train to Windward House. We arrived in the early hours of the morning. The house was dark. We were on time. Stella hadn't arrived yet. And then, from the inside of the house... It's Stella! The front door flew open and Stella ran out, screaming fearfully, running for the cliffs. Stella! Come back! Something she'd seen or heard or felt in that horribly sick house of ours was sending her screaming in the darkness toward the windy cliffs. I ran after her, but she was very young and lithe and driven by fear and drawn by demons, and I overtook her slowly, oh, so very slowly, as in a terrible nightmare. And at the very brink of the cliffs, I dove for her and flung her to the ground, the very brink of death, the very edge of darkness. Nothing but a few bruises, Stella. You'll be fine. Dr. Scott, Rick, why would my own mother want to drive me to my death? Darling, whatever drove you from this house couldn't have been your mother. But it was. I, I saw her. It was a kind of a mist that glowed softly in the dark, coming toward me, just as my father painted her. Then why did you run away? I, I don't know. Something terrified me, drew me to the cliff. Um... Uh, could the company endure one more excerpt from the case book of Dr. Rudd? It's rather worthwhile. You've the air of a man with knowledge, Scott. <laughs> this entry is dated a little more than three years before the final tragedy on the cliff. Meredith consultation, my office. Mrs. Meredith afraid she is going to have a child. Assured her she was not. A strange, cold, loveless woman refusing motherhood. But... Meredith... Poor man, wanting a child so desperately. But they're still... Now, now, listen. An extraordinary household. Carmel, this Spanish girl, worships Meredith. A lovely, pitiful creature, all love and womanhood. Pitiful? What does it all mean? I, I don't understand. Stella, where were you born? In Paris. Where they took Carmel. They came back with their baby, or... 
or at any rate someone's baby. Rick. The merit of the state in Paris for a baby to be born, yes. But I think to Carmel, not Mary. They took the baby as their own to avoid a scandal. That's why Carmel came back, to be near her baby, near Stella. Then it was Mary Meredith who hated Stella, her rival's child. Mary Meredith, who tried to throw the baby from the cliff and fell to her death. And that's what Carmel waited here to tell me all these years. That she was my mother, not Mary Meredith. I'm Carmel's daughter. Rick, the mimosa. She's here. Oh, Mother, Mother, never weep again, because now I know. Never cry again in this house where, where Father loved you. Carmel, Mother. She's happy. Mother's happy. She's at peace at last. Rick, Rick, look, that's the mist I saw. Mary Meredith, Dr. Scott, Pamela, get Stella out of here. I was alone. Alone with the thing that drifted and floated in menacing, gesturing filaments in the open French doors. A luminous mist becoming a face that undulated horribly. A face filled with hatred and malevolence. And I lifted the candelabrum with its flickering, guttering candles... Come on, you icy fraud. If it's Stella you want, you're too late, Mary Meredith. You've tried enough to destroy Carmel's child. So much for the legend of your saintliness. And you can go along with it. Rick. Here, darling. Oh. Are you all right? All right. I am magnificent. It's so dark, darling. Never brighter. Mary Meredith. Gone forever. Oh, and I always thought she was my mother. What? Good saints preserve me from ghosties and ghoulies and long-legged beasties and a future mother-in-law like me. Raymond will return in just a moment. Next week, as always, another great star recreates one of her most memorable roles on Screen Director's Playhouse. Our story is The Spiral Staircase. And our star, Dorothy McGuire, with Screen Director Robert Siodmak. Now, here again is tonight's star, Ray Milland. Thank you. The film version of The Uninvited was distinguished by ghosts, gasps, moans, groans, and a very brilliant gent named Lewis Allen. Lou directed the picture, furnishing the assorted horrors out of his bag of tricks. Since then, we've done three other films together, and his amazing know-how still has me fascinated. Now, ladies and gentlemen, I'd like you to meet him. My director, Lewis Allen. But I hardly think I deserve those compliments. Why not? Well, The Uninvited was the first picture I ever directed. But, Lou, you'd been directing stage plays for years. But when I sat behind those cameras for the first time, I was as scared as the audiences who saw the picture. <laughs> <laughs> well, how do you feel about cameras after all the pictures you've made since then? They still scare me. You know what? What? They scare me, too. <laughs> well, at least we weren't scared of the ghosts and The Uninvited. Well, you know, Lou, you made everything so real for a while, I almost believed in them myself. But why, there's no such thing as ghosts. <laughs> Lou. Yes, Ray? What did you just say about ghosts? I'd rather not talk about it. Good night, Ray. Good night, Lou. Good night, everyone. And good night to you, Ray Milland and Lewis Allen. Remember next week, Dorothy McGuire and Robert Siodmak. The 
Uninvited was presented through the courtesy of Paramount Pictures, whose current release is the William Wyler production, The Heiress, starring Olivia de Havilland, Montgomery Clift, and Ralph Richardson. Ray Milland will soon be seen in the Paramount picture, Copper Canyon. Lewis Allen's current production for Paramount is Chicago Deadline. Included in tonight's cast were Alma Lawton as Stella, Norman Field, Mary Shipp, John Daner, Georgia Backus, June Foray, and Dan Ritz. The Uninvited was adapted for radio by Milton Geiger, and original music was composed and conducted by Henry Russell. Screen Director's Playhouse is produced by Howard Wiley, with dramatic direction by Bill Karn. Portions of the program were transcribed. This is Jimmy Wallington speaking, inviting you to listen again at the same time next week when we present Screen Director's Playhouse, star Dorothy McGuire, production Spiral Staircase, director Robert Ziobmack. Sunday on Hollywood Calling, you may be called by motion picture stars Maureen O'Hara and Dan Daly to win a wonderful prize and crack the film of Fortune Jackpot. Make a note to stick close to your radio and your telephone Sunday for Hollywood Calling. It might be your lucky day. Listen to Hollywood Calling Sunday on NBC. Stay tuned for Bill Stern and the Sports Newsreel on NBC. The Seal Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault, wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly, the great book Open. One by one, the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a beautiful young actress who tried the most difficult role of her life when she impersonated death to win a prize of millions of dollars. A tale titled... Death rings down the curtain. the tale, Death Rings Down the Curtain, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. In the darkened bedroom of Martha Richards, a room where the blinds are always shut, young Dr. Smith is listening intently through his stethoscope to the laboring heart of his elderly, crotchety patient. Well, how much longer are you going to keep thumping me with that stethoscope, you old quack? I've finished examining you now. Well, don't just stand there without saying a word. How am I? How much time have I got left? Well, that's difficult to say. If you will avoid all excitement, I think I can say a year, possibly two. Hmm, a year, possibly two. Yes, but only if you do as I say. Now, there's no reason at all why you should insist on remaining in this darkened bedroom month after month. Why, it's been a year since you've been out of this room. Oh, you're going to start on that again. And what's more, Mrs. Richards, this living in utter seclusion is bad for your health. 
You should leave this room and see people. No, Doctor, no. I won't have my maid pushing me around in a wheelchair, the object of everyone's pity. I prefer to remain in this room and have people think of me as I was, not as I am. Ah, very well. Only I can't see why you refuse to have visitors. It would give you some interest in life. It may surprise you to know, Doctor, that I'm expecting two visitors, though it isn't because of anything you've said. I'm sure it isn't. But the way my heart is, I think it's about time I was drawing up a will. Before I do so, I want to get acquainted with my only living relatives, a niece and a nephew from my husband's side of the family. And they're the two visitors you're expecting? Yes. I haven't seen Gerald and Mildred since they were children. I'm very curious to see what they grew up to be like. I understand Mildred's an actress. An actress? You don't mean that Millie Richards is your niece, do you? Yes. Have you heard of her? Of course. Everyone has. She's one of Broadway's leading actresses. I saw her in a play recently and thought she was excellent. Mm, probably drinks and smokes and has been married three or four times. And her brother Gerald is probably an heir to Will who's never worked a day in his life. Aren't you being a bit unfair, judging the two of them before you've even seen them? That remains to be seen, Doctor. Before I draw up my will, I intend to learn everything about them. I'll give them both every opportunity to prove they're worthy of part of the Richards' fortune. When do you expect them? Well, they said they'd be here in time for dinner, which means they should be on their way here now. <laughs> How's the hangover, brother dear? Painful, I hope. Uh, what, the, what am I doing in this car? Where are we going? Have you forgotten, darling? This is the day we were invited to visit Aunt Martha. Uh, you remember dear old Aunt Martha. She's the one with all that lovely money. Oh, save it, will you? I'm in no mood for your witticisms. Considering that I spent half of last night looking for you under nightclub tables, Gerald, you might be a little more grateful. Oh, my head. What a night. Yes, wasn't it, darling? Every place I went looking for you, they gave me IOUs you'd left behind. Exactly how much do you owe around town? $11,000. Millie, you've got to help me. If I don't pay up soon, I'll be in real trouble. <laughs> what exactly am I supposed to do? You've got to lend me enough money to hold off my creditors. Lend you money? <laughs> You may not know it, brother dear, but I'm far deeper in debt than you are. But you were getting a thousand a week as the lead in Let Us Be Merry. How can you possibly be in debt? It's all very simple, darling. I was getting a thousand a week and spending two thousand a week. Well, that makes everything just perfect. Both of us so deeply in debt, we probably don't dare go back to town. Perhaps after our visit to Aunt Martha, we will be able to go back to town. What do you mean by that? Why do you think Aunt Martha sent us an invitation to visit her? Your guess is as good as mine. Aunt Martha's getting on in years. And I, unless I'm very much mistaken, she's decided to draw up a will. Naturally, before doing so, she wants to see what her only living relatives are like. Millie, do you really think she'll leave us some money? If we play our cards right, all we've got to do is convince Aunt Martha that we deserve it. And how are we going to do that? By showing her that we're lovable, simple, and unspoiled. Uh-huh. Gerald, do you remember the ancient role I played in I Dream of Love? Yes, of course. You weren't half bad. Half bad? Why, I was superb. The critics were mad about me. How dare you say I was only oh, half right, bad? All right, all right. You were superb. What about it? I think I should play that role for Aunt Martha. Just a simple, unsophisticated girl, untouched by success. How am I supposed to behave? I'm no actor. You just play the strong, silent type, Gerald, and leave all the talking to me. And when the curtain rings down on my special performance for Aunt Martha, the Richard's fortune will be ours. <laughs> Aunt Martha. It's us, Aunt Martha. Oh, come in, Mildred. Gerald? Well, it's been quite a number of years since we've seen each other, hasn't it? Yes, it has been, Aunt Martha. I, I've been meaning to call on you for ever so long, Aunt Martha, but something always interfered at the last moment. Mm. Well, what finally brought you here? Well, when you mentioned in your letter that you were ill and would like to see us, I simply couldn't stay away. I dropped everything to come here. I'm extremely grateful. 
Of course, the fact that you might possibly get an inheritance had nothing to do with it. Why, Aunt Martha, what a thing to say. Aunt Martha Millie doesn't need money. She's one of the finest actresses on Broadway. So I've heard, so I've heard. What do you do for a living, Gerald? Uh, huh? Uh, what do I do? Yes, Gerald, what do you do? Oh, uh, Gerald works for a Wall Street firm, Aunt Martha. Yes, he works so hard, and they pay him so little. Well, unless I'm very much mistaken, Gerald was left quite a sizable inheritance by his father. Whatever became of that? The inheritance? Oh, that was uh, lost in poor investments, Aunt Martha. I see. Well, I'm afraid there's a good deal about you two that I don't know. I haven't done very much. I haven't gotten very far, Aunt Martha, but Millie has really been a credit to the family name. Everyone's heard of her. Mm. Now, see here. I want you and Millie to be my guests for a week. Frankly, I want to know what you're like before I draw up my will. Of course, Aunt Martha. And I do hope that you'll take care of yourself so that you'll live for years and years. Uh, thank you, Millie. Now, I'm afraid I must ask you two to leave as I'm a bit tired. Why, well, certainly, Aunt Martha. If we can do anything for you, please don't hesitate to ask. Thank you. <sighs> I'm glad we're out of there. The old lady stares at a person as though she can see through him. The room's so dark, it was difficult to see her. But you can tell she won't last much longer. Yes, but the main point is, did she fall for our little act? If you ask me, your performance hardly swept her off her feet. Nonsense. I played my role perfectly. Just give me a week, darling, and you and I will be the sole heirs to the Richard's fortune. <laughs> To continue the story, death rings down the curtain as it is written in the sealed book. For a week, Millie and Gerald have been living with their Aunt Martha, trying to convince her that they are worthy of inheriting her great fortune. And Millie, sure that they have succeeded, is waiting for Gerald to return to tell him the news. Hello, Millie. Gerald, where have you been all night? I've looked everywhere for you. I spent the night in town. Well, you've been drinking. So what? Oh, you fool. What if Aunt Martha were to hear about it, just when everything's working out perfectly? So everything's working out perfectly, is it? Yes. I told you, if you'd leave her to me, it would. Last night, Aunt Martha made a phone call to New York. Gerald, it was her attorney she was calling, and he's coming here tonight to draw up her will. You don't say. Well, well. Well, you don't sound very enthusiastic at being named one of Aunt Martha's heirs. My dear Millie, it may interest you to know that the greatest performance of your career has gone for nothing. What do you mean? You may be able to sweep a Broadway audience off its feet, but not Aunt Martha. Oh, why, I tell you, she believes in me utterly. Oh, does she? Yes, she does. It may come as quite a shock, but while Aunt Martha was listening so devotedly to your every word, she had a private investigator in New York at work investigating. A private investigator? 
You mean Aunt Martha's been checking on our past? That's the general information I received. Why, that double-crossing old hag. Yes, and no doubt you can guess what she'll do when she learns that I haven't a job on Wall Street and that I gambled my inheritance away. And what do you think she'll say when she hears you were named as correspondent in three divorce actions and were involved in the Wainwright scandal? Oh, I'd like to scratch out those staring eyes of hers, playing with me like a cat with a mouse. Well, the game's up. We may as well go up to our rooms and pack. What? Walk out on a four million dollar inheritance? I should say not. There must be something we can do about it. Yes, well, what, for example? Well, I don't know yet. Let me think. I won't go back to the city beaten, deeply in debt. And Martha may think she's clever, but she won't beat me. Before she cuts me out of her will, I'll... Yes. What are you planning, Millie? Gerald... If we play our cards right, you and I will inherit the entire Richard's fortune in spite of anything Aunt Martha can do. Now, listen, this is what I want. As Millie explained her idea, Gerald's face became white. But in spite of his fears, he finally agreed to do exactly as Billy asked. Then in the hours that followed... Millie locked herself in her room and practiced her aunt's signature over and over until she was finally satisfied. And that evening, as the clock struck eight, Millie and Gerald silently stole down the hall to the door of their aunt's room. Millie, let's not go through with this. It's madness. Be quiet, you fool. I tell you, it's the only way out. But what if we're caught? You know what that'd mean. I tell you, we won't be caught if you do exactly as I say. I've everything worked out perfectly to the last detail. Get hold of yourself. I'm going to knock. You know exactly what you're to do. Yes. Come in. Good evening, Aunt Martha. I, uh, I hope you're feeling well, Aunt Martha. Oh, Mildred, Gerald, eh? Come in. Thank you. It's, uh, it's quite dark in here, Aunt Martha. Would you like me to turn on a light? No, no, Gerald, that isn't necessary. I'm quite used to being in the dark. Of course. How are you feeling this evening? Much better, thank you. Gerald, perhaps you ought to fix Aunt Martha's pillows. She doesn't seem very comfortable. No, 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 you needn't bother. I'm quite comfortable, I assure you. Uh, Gerald, fix Aunt Martha's pillows. I can't go through with it, do you hear? I can't. Fool, I should have known better than to come on you. Mildred, what's Gerald talking about? Nothing important, Aunt Martha. Here, uh, let me fix this pillow I for you. I tell you, I don't want Millie, it. don't. Mildred, don't. Oh, Millie, don't. She's suffocating. Quiet, do you hear? You haven't got the nerve to go through with it. I have. There. I think that's enough to bring on a heart attack. Oh, uh, How do you feel, Aunt Martha? You're, you're nothing but a murderess. Oh, my heart attack. Millie, is she... is she dead? Yes, Gerald, and not from suffocation, but from a heart attack. I told you it would work out. I had nothing to do with it, do you hear? You murdered it, I didn't. In the eyes of the law, Gerald, you're my accomplice. Nothing you might say can make it otherwise. We haven't time to discuss that. Aunt Martha's attorney should be here in an hour. Now, will you do as I say, or won't you? I have no choice in the matter. No, you're acting sensibly. Do exactly as I say, and we can't fail. just stopped in front of the house. It must be Mr. Jordan, Aunt Martha's attorney. Hmm, he certainly is punctual. Are you ready? I need a little more shading here under my eyes. Hurry, Millie. He'll be up here in a minute. Gerald, I've never been late for a curtain yet, and I won't be late for this one. There. Now, help me on with Aunt Martha's bedrobe. All right. There. Now, how do I look, Gerald? Are you... You look exactly like Aunt Martha. If I didn't know her body was in that closet, I'd swear you were her. In the dim light of this room, no one can help but take me for Aunt Martha. Yes, but what about your voice and the things you may have to know? Just listen to this. Don't be ridiculous, Gerald. As mistress of this house, I answer only those questions which I wish to answer, and I assure you I shall not be tripped up. Does that convince you? Yes, I'm convinced. Really quick, get in bed. I hear someone coming. All right, Gerald. And please stop shaking. I tell you, we can't fail. I shall give the greatest performance of my career.
to continue the story. Death rings down the curtain, as it is written in the sealed book. Swiftly, Millie, made up to look like her dead Aunt Martha, slips into her aunt's bed, and then, as Gerald lights a cigarette with trembling fingers, someone knocks at the door. Come in. Good evening, Mr. Jordan. Come in, won't you? Well, well, Mrs. Richards, how are you? Why, bless me, it's been over a year since I've seen you. Really, Mr. Jordan? Has it been that long? It certainly has. Uh, how are your eyes? Still traveling you? My eyes? Oh, they're much better, thank you. Well, that's fine, Mrs. Richards. Oh, oh, by the way, this is Mr. Wilson, my secretary. How do you do? I'm happy to meet you, Mrs. Richards. I don't think, Mr. Jordan, you've met my nephew, Gerald Richards. Gerald, this is my attorney, Mr. Jordan. Hello. How do you do, Mr. Richards? Uh, Mr. Jordan, I want to have a will drawn up and signed tonight. Tonight? Mm. Surely you can't be serious, Mrs. Richards. After all, your your vast holdings require a will that will take you days to draw up. No nonsense. I'll have none of your involved 40-page wills. All I want is a simple will dividing my entire estate equally between my nephew Gerald and my niece Mildred. But, Mrs. Richards, there are so many other details that enter into the matter of a will. Uh, for example, we must consider that... Uh, Mr. Jordan, that, uh... will you do as I say? Or must I get another attorney to draw up my will? Very well, Mrs. Richards. Mr. Wilson, please draw up a will dividing the entire estate between Gerald Richards and Mildred... Uh, Mildred Gerald. Richards. He's Gerald's sister. Yes, thank you. I'll take care of it at once, Mr. Jordan. You mean, Mr. Jordan, you've never heard of my niece, Mildred Richards, the Broadway actress? Oh, you mean Millie Richards. Why, well, yes, of course. I've seen her in quite a number of plays. Oh, really? What do you think of her? Well, frankly, Mrs. Richards, I... I think your niece has a tendency to overact. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, yes. Uh, take this last play she was in, um, uh, Let Us Be Merry. Now, I think she played it far too hard for comedy. I'd have preferred to see an actress like, uh, say, Joan Walker play that role. Well, that's only your opinion. I should like you to hear what the critics had to say about her performance. Uh, Gerald, will you please hand me Millie's scrapbook? You'll find it on my desk there. Oh, really, Aunt Martha, don't you uh, think you ought Please, ordered... Gerald... Oh, very well. I can understand criticism, and it's justified, Mr. Jordan, but it seems to me you're going against my niece's huge public. Here's Millie's scrapbook, Aunt Martha. Uh, thank you, Gerald. Ah, uh, just a moment, Mr. Jordan, and I'll read you what the critics had to say about Millie's performance and let us be merry. Yes, I'd like to hear it. Ah, uh, here we are. This is what Martin Walters, dramatic critic of the evening Sentinel, had to say. Hmm. Rarely in 30 years of theatre going has this reviewer seen such a fine flair for comedy as was displayed last night by Millie Richards in her new hit, Let Us Be Merry, and that, Mr. Jordan, is the opinion of one of the finest critics in the country. Well, I, I may be wrong, Mrs. Richards. Uh, naturally, I was only venturing a personal opinion when I said... I have Mrs. Richards' will prepared, Mr. Jordan. I use the standard form. Oh, yes. Let's have a look at it. Hmm... Yes, it seems to be all in order. You're sure that will, Mr. Jordan, will stand up in court? Oh, yes. Uh, only you'll be leaving a good many um, unsettled problems to your ears. Uh, it's quite all right. I'm sure they're capable of taking care of them. Your secretary can be one of the witnesses, can't he? Yes, Mrs. Richards, and uh, your maid can be the other. Uh, very well. Now, I'll sign first. Uh, there you are. That's fine. Now I'll have the two witnesses sign it. Everything will be in order. Good. I'm quite happy now that it's all settled. Uh, you look tired, Aunt Martha. Uh, I am, Gerald. I am. Are you finished, Mr. Jordan? Yes, Miss Richards. Good. Mary will show you and Mr. Wilson to your rooms. I'll see you in the morning. Good night. Good night, Mrs. Richards. Good night. They're gone. Well, Gerald, I told you it would work. We aren't through this yet. Don't be a fool. The money is as good as ours. All we have to do is put Aunt Martha back in this bed. Tomorrow morning, her maid will discover her dead body, and you and I will inherit everything. <laughs> Next morning, things went exactly as Millie had foreseen. The maid found the old woman's body in her bed as if she had died in her sleep. And Dr. Smith was summoned at once. After a brief examination, he was satisfied that Martha Richards' tired heart had simply given out during the night. Oh, oh, I can't believe it somehow, Doctor. And Martha was such a dear. It's impossible to believe she's... Really dead? You mustn't feel too badly, Miss Richards. It was all over quite quickly, I'm sure. Your aunt's heart simply gave up. 
But she seemed so strong and well when we left her last night. Why, when she and I were arguing, it was just like old times. You mean you and Mrs. Richards had an argument last night? Oh, not really an argument, Doctor. They were just debating over my sister's ability as an actress. Yes, that's all it was. I, I hope you won't mind, Miss Richards, but... Uh... Well, I told your aunt I thought that you overplayed your roles. Oh, that's quite all right, Mr. Jordan. What did she say to that? <laughs> she almost hit the ceiling when I criticized you. She claimed that you're the finest actress in the country. Oh, Aunt Martha was always a dear. Strange that she should have said that, considering that she never saw Miss Richard perform. Well, maybe she hadn't, but... She pulled out a book of clippings about Miss Richards and read me what one of the critics had said about her niece. She did what? She read me what one of the critics had said about Miss Richards' ability as an actress. I see. Mr. Jordan, I think your criticism of Miss Richards that she overplays is justified. I beg your pardon. I never over overplayed a role in my life. I'm afraid, Miss Richards, that you overplayed one last night. Last night? What do you mean? Your Aunt Martha was an extremely proud woman. She couldn't stand to be pitied. Exactly a year ago, she became blind. <gasps> and when she did, she refused to leave her room and allow people to know she'd lost her sight. Only two people knew her blindness, her maid and myself. But if Mrs. Richards was blind, how could she have read me that notice last night? She didn't, Mr. Jordan. An egomaniac actress disguised as Mrs. Richards read her own notice to you. Isn't that so, Miss Richards? Go ahead, tell him, Millie. You're so clever. You're the greatest actress in the world. You had everything worked out to the smallest detail. Be quiet, you fool. They can't prove a thing. No jury in the world would believe them. I'm too great an actor to be convicted of murder. Do you hear? I'll give a performance that'll sweep a jury off its feet. They'll never forgive me. They'll never convict me. And that is the story. As it is written in the sealed book of how an actress tried to impersonate death and failed. Millie Richards had one more opportunity to act upon the witness stand at her trial, but again she failed, for the jury found her and her brother Gerald guilty and sentenced them to life imprisonment. Strange are the secrets of the human heart and the ways of fate in trapping men and women in their own evil schemes. Keeper of the book, before you close the great volume, show us the tale we tell next time. This one, yes, a weird and amazing story of a wife who loved her husband too fondly, and of another wife who came from the grave. A tale titled, Till Death Do Us Part. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong perils another strange and exciting tale from The Sealed Book. The Sealed Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Doc McGregor.
No. No, stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free and moves forward swiftly, silently. This is... The Haunting Hour. The Devil's Deep. At the foot of a great cliff, a police launch is being slowly pushed by the ocean currents toward jagged rocks where the water boils and swirls as in a giant cauldron. Searchlights stab the darkness to reveal grappling irons, probing the inky waters of the Devil's Deep. Hey, Inspector Bowman. Captain wants to know if he can turn a launch around now. He says Devil's Deep is no place to be caught when the tide turns. Tell him to hold it a minute, Sergeant. I think we got our corpse. Uh, give me a hand pulling that rope. Uh, okay. Uh, why is it they always seem heavier when they're dead? Never mind the questions. Just get them over the side. Uh, right. Uh, okay? Uh, Take her out, Cap. Uh, we'll stretch him out on deck for you, Inspector Bowman. Ground, eh? Maybe. Fell off the cliff up there. Now swing that searchlight down here. Yeah, he's the one I want, all right. Good gravy. There was another one? Yeah, two of them. Uh, help me unbutton this coat. Well, in that case, you're lucky to have dragged up the one you wanted. You're telling me? I have two suspects back at headquarters. One of them is lying about how this guy was killed. Well, uh, which was it? The fall from the cliff or drowning? Neither, Sergeant. Take a look at this bullet hole. I sent for you, Miss Scott, and you, Mr. Malone, because I have some new evidence. I want the whole story. Everything. But, Inspector Bowman, I, I've told you how it happened. From the beginning this time, Miss Scott. And with no hints from you, Mr. Malone. Oh, I'm sorry, Inspector, but this seems unfair. You've got absolutely nothing on either Miss Scott or myself. I'll decide that, Mr. Malone. If you please, Miss Scott. Well, I came here to the island because of my stepbrother. You see... Duncan and I were closer than many real brothers and sisters. I'd taken care of him ever since our folks died. I guess I decided to come that day in the doctor's office when he said... Ever since I've known you, Peggy Scott, you've been saddled with that young brother of yours. Well, I've almost made up my mind to buy a cottage on the island, Dr. Ramsey. Uh -huh. Oh, it's a lovely cottage. Set back from a high cliff. It's straight out of a storybook. Good. Might get him away from his imagination. He's got too much, Peggy. It's bad. I know. But I understand him, Doctor. And I can give him understanding and kindness. Yeah, well, it sounds like the very thing, Peggy. But take my advice and go down by boat. As long as you avoid people, you and Duncan are avoiding trouble. It was early in the season, and there weren't many passengers on the steamer that crawled along the coast. But even so, there was one too many. For fate sent Mr. Sherman across our path. Events were already closing in on me the first morning when I was trying to make Duncan comfortable in his deck chair. I wish you wouldn't treat me like a baby. I want to go to my stateroom and read. Oh, you promise not to open that trunk full of books until we reach the island, Duncan. Now, here. Let me fix that blanket. Let me alone, will you, Peggy? That old fool is looking at us again. I can wring his neck. That's no way to talk about Mr. Sherman. He was very sweet to us. Helping us with our bags was just an excuse. Been following us ever since we got on board. Haven't you noticed the way he's looking at you? Keep him away from Miss Peggy or say, help me out. You what, Duncan? Nothing, Pedge. Maybe I'm just imagining things at that. Oh, I do wish you'd try to get over it, Duncan. Why, Peggy? Imagination's a handy thing, you know. Lots of times it helps you to look into the future. The future fast became the present. And on a ship, there's very little chance to escape it. Certainly, I never expected the train of events that harmless little Mr. Sherman's attention was to bring. 
I can still remember how apologetic he looked the next day when he finally found me alone. Well, it's, uh, it's a lovely day, Miss Scott, isn't it? You mind if I sit down? Oh, why, no, Mr. Sherman, of course not. Well, I confess I'm relieved your brother isn't on deck today, Miss Scott. I do believe he dislikes me. Oh, Duncan takes a bit of understanding, Mr. Sherman. He's, he's not well. well. That hardly explains it, but... Well, I'll make friends with a boy yet. You'll see. I hear you've bought the place at Devil's Deep. A rather lonely place for just the two of you. You sound as though you've been on the island before, Mr. Sherman. Oh, come up every summer. Miss Scott, do uh, you know that chap over there? The one in the trench coat and the battered brown hat? Yes. This is the second time in the last hour I've caught him staring at me. Well, maybe he thinks he knows you. Well, we'll ignore him. No doubt you'll attract enough handsome young men without adding me to the competition. I must get around that brother of yours, though. Now, I'll drop down to a stateroom and have a chat with him. Oh, no, no. Uh, hmm? That is, I'd wait until he's feeling better. He he might not be very friendly and... No? Well, now, don't you worry about that, young lady. I'll... I'll turn on the famous Sherman charm. That'll do the trick. My friends tell me it's fatal. Absolutely fatal. My stateroom was directly across from Duncan's in one of those passageways that leads onto the deck. When I retired that night, I left my door ajar in case he should call. I don't know how late it was when I awakened, but it was the sound of his door that brought me true with a start. Then after a moment, I heard something heavy being moved on deck. I got to the window in time to see Duncan pushing something through the lifeboats. Without stopping to think, I grabbed my robe and rushed out. I saw him leaning against a lifeboat, looking down into the water. Duncan! Duncan! Duncan, are you all right? Well, hello, Pegs. Of course I'm all right. What are you doing out here? Well, I heard you, Duncan. You were moving something. Yeah. My trunk. Your trunk? With your books in it? That's right. I pushed it overboard. Oh, Duncan. Didn't you notice that man in the trench coat there beyond the lifeboat? Come on, let's go back. He's coming over here. Let him come. It's none of his business. Come along, Duncan. I'm not going to stand here and be made a fool of. Let's walk back to the room. All right, all right. Watch your step, Peggy. I had to lift the trunk over that threshold thing. That's it. Well, good night. Not so fast, young man. You haven't even started for bed. I'm coming in. No, and... Peggy. Leave me alone, will you? I don't want you in my cabin. Nevertheless, I'm coming in. Now, where's the light switch? Oh, now, Duncan, I'm not going to move until I see you take your jacket off and stop. Duncan! Your books are piled up against the wall. They weren't in the... Duncan. What was in that trunk? <laughs> Mr. Sherman had disappeared. When we docked next morning, I looked for him. He didn't get off the boat. The purser hadn't seen him. I was frantic. I couldn't believe Duncan had... had... Anyway, I decided to go to the cottage first and then come back and phone Dr. Ramsey. As you know, there's no road to Devil's Deep. My stepbrother and I walked along the path through the woods. It was almost noon when we reached the house. Well, sis, this place isn't bad at all. Sort of wild and woolly. Hear that surf beating on the rocks down below? Leave the bags out here and... Go on inside, Duncan. Yeah, all right, sure. Say, this is all right, Peggy. Nice and cozy. Fireplace and everything. Oh, Duncan, if only... Duncan, sit down, dear. I've got to talk with you. Peggy, what's the use of questions? You know how I get mixed up sometimes? I forget things I've done. So I simply forgot I'd taken the books out of my trunk, that's all. You don't know how I want to believe you, dear, but Why I... Why don't you forget all about it, huh? I have. I feel better already. You ought to be glad that I've gotten out of the dumps. Oh, I am, Duncan. But after last night, I... What's that you've got there? A note. It was lying on the table. The cleaning woman must have left it. Here, let me see it. It's addressed to me, Peggy. I don't recognize the handwriting, do you? To you? That's strange. Who, who could have gotten here before us? It's easy enough to find out. But we don't know anybody here. I couldn't... Duncan, what's the matter? What does it say? It says... People 
hang for murder. Oh, please, dear, don't look like that. Here, let me have it. If silence is worth $10,000, I'll forget about that trunk. Blackmail? But who? Suddenly I realized. The young man in the trench coat. Then almost as an afterthought, it came over me. Duncan had really killed Mr. Sherman. It was in the open now. It had to be faced. What are we going to do, Peggy? They'll hang me. You know they will. Please, please, Duncan. I've got to think. I couldn't help it, Peggy. I, I didn't know what I was doing. That old fool Sherman, he came to see me. He drove me to it. Oh, I suppose I knew what had happened all the time. But I didn't want to believe it. We'll have to go to the police, Duncan. No. I'll kill myself first. I won't do it. you got to help me, Peggy. You're the only one who can. Oh, I've tried, dear. And maybe I've only hurt you. Don't you see that somebody else knows now, even though the note isn't signed? The guy in the trench coat says we can pay him off. Dad left you plenty. You can get the money. It wouldn't work, Duncan, even if it were right. Blackmail doesn't end anything. But it's my only chance, Pegs. I'll kill myself if you don't. You know what Dad said when he died? you got to take care of me. You'll get the money, won't you? Please, Peggy. All right, dear. I'll get the money. To the Devil's Deep. A police launch has dragged the turbulent waters of the Devil's Deep and found the body of a man. So far, Inspector Bowman has neglected to mention that fact to the two young people who sit beneath the glaring light in his office. The eyes of the young man in the trench coat have never left Peggy Scott as she goes back over her story. So, Miss Scott, this brother of yours, Duncan, takes one of his crazy dislikes to this Sherman guy on the boat, and that night he shoves a trunk overboard. You were the one watching this, Malone? Naturally, Inspector. So when you found that blackmail note waiting for you in your cottage, Miss Scott, you knew right away it was Malone who was on to the murder. Yes, and I was sure of it after I'd gone to the bank that afternoon and arranged for a transfer of my funds. Hey, lady, wait a minute. Mind if I walk you back to Devil's Deep, Miss Scott? I... How did you know my name? What do you want? Oh, just a couple of questions, Miss Scott. Like, uh, are you in the habit of calling on bank presidents the minute you get in town? That is none of your business. I'm afraid it is. Very much my business. Oh, yes, I'd forgotten your note. I suppose that's true. Now, please, if you'll let me by. Not so fast, please. I've got to talk with you and your brother. Mr. Malone, if you're wise, you'll keep very much away from my stepbrother. That's a warning. We'll be ready for the next note when you send it. Goodbye. Suddenly, I knew that Duncan and this Mr. Malone must not meet. Above all else, I had to get my brother back to Dr. Ramsey before there was another tragedy. But next morning, when I returned from the bank where I'd gone to sign the necessary papers... I'm back, Duncan. Want to help me... Duncan, what are you doing with that poker? We've got company, Peggy. Your stepbrother is a very excitable young man, Miss Scott. I was watching when he came sneaking in here. I warned you, Mr. Malone, but I suppose one in your profession doesn't mind a few risks. Tell me, did you know the man you were talking to on shipboard a few days ago? Now listen to me, you better... Duncan, what did Sherman say to your sister that caused you to get so excited? Get out. Get out, I tell you. Okay. Okay, I'm going. Just let me warn you that you're playing with dynamite, Miss Scott. I'll be seeing you. I don't understand, Duncan. Why did he come here? On the table there. The blackmail note, Peggy. The second one. Like Mr. Malone, the note was confident and explicit. Even to the denominations of the money to be tied into a package and brought to the cliff that night. Except for the second trip to the bank, neither Duncan nor I left the cottage all day. Somehow we both had the feeling of being watched. And it grew stronger as evening approached. Finally, it was dark. Peggy, yes. over here to the window. I saw a light moving down there along the shore. I, I guess the time has come, Duncan. Yeah. There it is again, Pace. Mm -hmm. so he's got a flashlight way down at the foot of the path. That means that he'll have to come through the woods to get out onto the cliff above Devil Deep. He picked that spot because it's open ground. He can be sure there's nobody out there except me. Oh, I wish you didn't have to go. We could leave the money there. 
How could we? The note said me alone with the money. I'd better get out there before he does. Where's that package of the money up in? Here it is. I wondered if you were going to forget it. Forget it? Are you kidding, Peggy? You've got to be honest with me, Duncan. You weren't thinking of doing anything. Anything we'd both be sorry for? What do you mean? I... Like Sherman? Yes. Peggy, I tell you, I was crazy that night. All I want to do is get this over with. You'll see. I'll pay him off and I'll get right back here. All right, dear. Go quickly now. I'll be waiting for you. But I knew I wouldn't be, for I never intended to let Duncan meet Bob Malone. The package I'd given him contained torn strips of paper. It would never be opened, because I was going to meet the blackmailer before he reached the cliff. Quickly, I got the money and slipped out the back way. There wasn't a sound except for the roar of the surf in the distance. The woods made the night even blacker. When I reached the path, there was no sign of the flashlight. But pretty soon, I thought I heard footsteps coming up. Suddenly, I heard a sound close behind me. As I turned, the earth opened up with a blinding flash, and everything went flat. Slowly, slowly, I began to whirl back into the light. I, I opened my eyes and saw I was back in the cottage, lying on the couch in the living room. After a moment, the ceiling tilted back into place, and I turned my head and tried to focus on the man sitting beside me. It's Bob Malone, Miss Scott. Don't be frightened. You've got quite a sock on the head, but you're all right now. Why did you hit me? Don't try to talk. Just lie back and be quiet. Oh, but... But the money... It's in my pocket. Don't try to sit up. Take it and go. Go before... Before Duncan comes back. Your brother doesn't even know what's happened yet. He's still waiting out on the cliff. Now, just forget him for a minute, Peggy, because I've got something more important for you right now. Sherman, come around the couch where Miss Scott can see you. Sherman... Mr. Sherman, but he... he he's dead. Oh, not at all, Miss Scott. Your friend Malone brought me back from a watery grave. Very inconsiderate, don't you think? Cut the crack, Sherman. Look, Peggy, if you'd given me half a break, I'd have told you I was a private detective. Sherman's a well-known blackmailer. When I spotted him talking to you on the boat, I figured it was worth looking into. But, Mr. Malone, then there never was any reason for Duncan to be blackmailed. Mr. Sherman tricked him. He... Well, he somehow made Duncan think he'd killed him. I think your brother needs a psychiatrist. Badly. That's not important now. The important thing is that Duncan's not a murderer. Oh, don't you understand? It was his imagination. Sometimes the things in his mind seem real to him. He hated Mr. Sherman enough to... Yes, that's it. Sherman worked on this quirk of his, got Duncan excited, faked the death now, scene... look at him, Malone. I told you but before. All the time I was frightened to death of you, Mr. Malone. That's my fault. When I saw your brother push that trunk overboard, I got kind of worried. I checked the passenger list, and then everyone who got off the boat. And so did I. Then Mr. Sherman didn't get off. Oh, yes, he did. After you were nowhere around. You were a little too anxious to believe the worst of your brother, if I may say so, Miss Scott. I told you to keep out of this, Sherman. You see, Peggy, when I saw our blackmailing friend and knew there wasn't anybody in that trunk, I stopped worrying. Like fun you did, old boy. You've been tailing me ever since you saw me talking to the young lady that morning. But I never figured it was more than your usual blackmail routine till I saw how scared Miss Scott was. Yes, but don't you see? Duncan and I thought he was dead. Yes, I see that now. Lucky I followed him out here tonight. I was right behind him when he came up the path with the flashlight. It's too bad you couldn't have stopped him from hitting me. But Shut up, Sherman. Suppose you and I stroll down to the kid brother and tell him he can relax. Oh, but, but Duncan thinks he's dead. Don't you see the kind of a shock it'll be when he sees him? I can't leave Sherman here. Just you leave this to me. I don't think you should try to get up yet. Oh, but you don't understand. Duncan flies off the handle so easily. I know that only too well. Come along, Sherman. I think Miss Scott's stepbrother will be delighted to find you returned from the dead. Thank you, Miss Scott. I'll admit that up to this point, your story checks in every detail. But what actually happened afterwards out on that cliff? I don't really know, Inspector Bowman. I never saw Duncan or, or Mr. Sherman again. Mr. Malone was the only one to come back alive. I have told you what happened out there, Inspector, just as I told Miss Scott. Mr. Malone, you told me that when Duncan saw Sherman, the man he thought he'd killed, he flew into a rage and attacked him. The chairman had a revolver, and during the struggle, he shot Duncan, and they both went over the cliff. I'm sure that's what happened, Inspector. I should have known that... That's exactly what Duncan would do. I happen to know Sherman's record, Miss Scott. 
Blackmailer, yes. But he never carried a gun. That's what I thought. Why I didn't bother to search him. I'm afraid I can't believe him alone. We dragged the devils deep an hour ago. We recovered Sherman's body. He was the one killed by the bullet. And you think maybe I took things into my own hands? If you didn't, I'm suggesting you tell us differently. Well, you forced me into a corner, Inspector. You asked for it, don't forget. Let's go back to the moment Sherman and I left Miss Scott in the cottage near the cliff. There was a bright moon as the blackmailer and I headed toward the spot where young Duncan sat on a rock, staring down into Devil's Deep. I wonder what Duncan's going to say when he sees me, Malone. I do make a rather healthy corpse, don't you think? That's your worry, Sherman. But I wouldn't like to be in your shoes. You don't go for that poor sick boy line with this kid, do you? I do, Sherman. He's studying to be a manic depressive. He's on the way toward making the grade. Well, in that case, you're going to have a tough time proving anything against me, Malone. The blackmail notes in your handwriting are pretty good evidence, I'd say. Hold it now. Kid's seen us. Now, let me handle this. Everything under control, Duncan? Of course, Mr. Malone. I've been waiting for you. I saw you on the path a while ago. Good. Got anything to say to the ghost of Mr. Sherman? Plenty. Stupid bungling rat. I'll be giving the works. Now, look here, kid. I never did like this deal, but you made it seem harmless enough. You think it was harmless, Duncan? To hire Sherman to make like a corpse so you could blackmail yourself and scare your sister into paying off? I should really have killed him. All he had to do was stay out of your way. All this might have been more harmless, Duncan, if you hadn't sneaked back and slugged your sister just before we came up the path. Was that necessary? I was pretty mad when I opened that package and found the paper she'd given me. I had to get my money without letting her know it was me. You know, I could have worked this blackmail stunt again sometime. Yeah, I suppose you could. Too bad I came along just then and drove you off. You'll never get the money now. I'll get it, don't worry. And all the rest of it, too, it belongs to me. My father should never have left it to her. I'm afraid, Duncan, that sooner or later you might kill Peggy. Well, maybe I will if she gets wise to me. Now look, Malone, I'd never have got mixed up with a kid if I'd known this. Not very pretty, is it? Don't forget that if anything happened to his sister, he had threatening letters in your handwriting. Where do you think that would have put you? He was going to give them back when he paid me my grand here on the cliff tonight. Ah, you're a fool, Sherman. Why do you think I told you to pick Devil's Deep for a meeting place? And those notes I delivered by myself. Get it, Sherman? Noble brother meets nasty blackmailer, shoves him off cliff in self-defense. Meet, huh? I wasn't acting when I said I hated you, Sherman. I never could stand the way you looked at Peggy. Why, you little rat, that's fine coming from you. I ought to Look let... out, he may have a gun. Of course I have. Why do you think I let the two of you come out here after me? After I get rid of you, I'm still going to get that money. Listen, kid, I'm going to take that gun away from you and give you the spanking of your life. Keep away from the edge, Sherman. He'll plug you in short. He hasn't got what it takes. Just a loudmouth brat. Go on, you keep backing up toward the edge, sonny boy, and pretty soon... Take another step, Sherman, and I'll shoot. No, you won't, kid, because I'm going to... That's the story, Inspector. I didn't tell it because I... Well, I hope Miss Scott wouldn't have to know. Sorry it had to come out this way, Miss Scott. Oh, if only I could have helped him. You tried. But Duncan was really dangerous. Maybe it's just as well that fate stepped in and took a hand. As though some evil force had claimed him. Yeah. The devil's deep. <laughs> Shadows and stillness, mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Suspense. 
tonight, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Lee J. Cobb as star of The Bet, a suspense play produced, edited, and directed for Roma Wines by William Spear. Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills, is presented for your enjoyment by Roma Wines. That's R-O-M-A, Roma Wines. Those excellent California wines that can add so much pleasantness to the way you live, to your happiness and entertaining guests, to your enjoyment of everyday meals. Yes, right now a glass full would be very pleasant, as Roma Wines bring you Mr. Lee J. Cobb in a remarkable tale of... Suspense! Haunted? Yes, I'm haunted. It's a year now, and I can't erase the memory of that precipice I very nearly stepped from. That darkness into which I almost plunged. Or maybe I took the plunge and I'm in it now, in the dark. It doesn't usually happen in my business. But what's the use of talking about it? You'd only say I'm too susceptible. And I'd say you're right, I am susceptible. To faces and places. To women's faces. One woman's face. And to lost, dark places on what I call the rim of the world. Places like Sierra Leone, Saigon, Balso. Places like Trinidad. But you won't get it from reading atlases and maps. If you read, for instance, that the seasons of Trinidad are regular, wet from May to January... Dry from the end of January to May, the average annual rainfall, 63 inches. You won't understand how I saw it when I landed at Port of Spain in April, the dry season. I remember it was a day so clear and bright that it was a world under glass. And I liked it. I liked the harbor, cathedrals, the old streets, the dry, spiced air and that little shop I wandered into to get away from the blaze of the sun. I'd heard she went there. Siam Brahmahari shop of Hindu antiquities. Hello? Anybody here? Certainly. Good afternoon. I am Siam Brahmahari. Oh, it's dark. I didn't see. Yes, I live here like a mole. And when the clock rings, it brings me customers. Every time. What can I show you? Well, I... Thought I'd look around. It's a pleasure. Look as you wish. You're a stranger in Port of Spain. I landed today. And you're an artist. Well, how did, how did you... That's a sketch pad you carry. Oh, yes. Yes, I You'll think. find Trinidad charming to paint until the rains come, Mr... Scott Turner. Mr. Scott Turner, yes. It's lovely until next month, then the green rain until the first of the year. Well, that sounds paintable, the rain... By the way, I believe you know... The Mrs. rain? Oh, no. It comes down so there's no... Pardon, please. Mrs. Barton. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, Siam. Did my Shiva get here? Yesterday, Mrs. Barton, I took him out of his straw nest. Yesterday. A beautiful white jade Shiva. I, I'll bring him in. Thank you. Oh, but first, first, this is Mr. Turner, a newcomer and an artist. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? Talk to him till I return, Mrs. Barton. I want him to see our Shiva, too. <laughs> well, we have our orders, Mr. Turner. Yes. Uh, what is it, a statue? A small one. It's my hobby. I collect Hindu gods. Do you know about them? Oh, little. I've been to India. This is one I've wanted a long time. A statuette of Shiva from the dead city of Angkor Wat. It was buried for 3,000 years. Ah, ah, you see? He's small, Mrs. Barton. What? He's perfect. Look, not a blemish. Siam, he's beautiful. Isn't he beautiful, Mr. Turner? The great god Shiva. <laughs> yes, he's quite the boy. Two hundred million people believe he controls lightning, thunder, their very lives. Shiva, beloved of women. Yes, he is, isn't he? And beloved by you, Mrs. Barton. Oh, no, no. I have my own reason for being attracted to Shiva. Yeah? What's your reason? Don't you remember what Shiva is, first of all? He's the god of destruction, Mr. Turner. And I like that. Destruction. That's the kind of woman I am. Shiva. 
which he liked destruction. <laughs> of course, I knew that already about Ada Barton. She must have loved Trinidad, a place where a casual conversation turns suddenly intense, suddenly dangerous, where you never know the whirlpool under your feet until you're in it. I was in that whirlpool in a second, and I'm still there. But I'm getting ahead of myself. I had no difficulty meeting Ada Barton again. You know how colonial cities are. The teeming population that belongs and the handful of English, Americans, French, administrators, speculators, painters, planters, who huddle together socially because, well, they're afraid. And even so ungregarious a man as Paul Barton wasn't above inviting a visiting American to his home. But no matter how we'd met, he and I were bound to disagree. So you're an artist, Mr. Turner. <laughs> well, I envy you. It must be pleasant not to have to work for your living. Well, naturally, I don't look at it that way. Paul, for heaven's sake. Oh, but Ada, my dear, surely neither you nor Mr. Turner contend painting is labor, not productive labor. But that's not the point. Well, I think it's a point. And I think painting is productive. Although I must confess that painting seldom produces for the painter comfort such as you have here. I wish it did. More coffee, Scott. Please, Miss Barton. Well, naturally, millions buy my sugar because it's a necessity. A picture on the wall isn't. It is for me, Paul. It is for the millions who buy your sugar, Mr. Barton. At least it's necessary for me to believe it's a necessity to them. A necessity for which they're starved. But I think your difference with me is more personal, Mr. Barton. Oh, now, no, no, wait a minute. You see, I think you envy me. <laughs> I uh, envy you? Because you're a romantic who never found whatever you came here for. This is a beautiful island, Mr. Barton. In the dry season, yes. You've built a beautiful house, and you're married to an extraordinarily beautiful woman. Thank you, Mr. Turner. But because you've pegged your dream to what the morning stock market has to say on the price of sugar, it's all ashes to you. So you resent me, the itinerant artist, symbol of the freedom you lost. Ashes? I love it. I'm a man who likes organization, utility, and there's plenty of romance in sugar. As much as there is in a Portuguese sloop, Java-bound, or in the ruined streets of Palmyra, gulls flashing in the sun over Sicily, or in the port of, or in the port of Spain tonight, with its smell of fast-growing things, to a man like me who can claim the whole world because no part of it claims him. You are very persuasive, Mr. Turner. You know what I think? I think you're irresponsible, Mr. Turner, because you haven't the necessary courage to take responsibility. Paul, you're insulting. Maybe, but I put years of hard work into developing this business. And you don't think I've worked? No. No, I don't think you have, and I don't think you can. Why, I'd bet $50,000 that you couldn't stick to a, a useful routine job for two years. What you call a useful routine job? Yes, yes. I'll put up $50,000 that you couldn't stick it out to, uh, say, here. Here, where you think it's so beautiful... Working for me. Paul, don't be ridiculous. You can't buy everything with your money. I have an idea that Mr. Turner is the sort know. of man... Oh, Maybe he can. What kind of work, Mr. Barton? You can't be serious, Scott. Oh, it would be work that you can do, say, in my laboratory. I've got some things going on tropical diseases in addition to the necessary laboratory work for the sugar, soil tests, things like that. Well, I'm not a technician. Oh, I'd make it easy for you. I'm the technician. All you'd have to do is keep routine records... For two years. For $50,000. That's right, $50,000. Or if you quit, nothing. It's a bet, Mr. Barton. It's a bet. Th What's that? Hmm? What? That. <laughs> Rain, Mr. Turner. Rain for nine months. Endless, remorseless oceans of romantic rain. <laughs> It'll make it easier for you to... Uh, Stay indoors. Endless, remorseless rain. I liked it at first because it blurred the passage of time. And somehow my job wasn't easy. In the fields around the laboratory, the cane grew up, was cut, grew and was cut. But inside the laboratory where I lived day and night, all sound and life came wrapped in the silken, deadly, hypnotic drumming and hissing of rain. The first two months, only one thing bothered me. The petty needling of Paul Barton. We spent our mornings together, he making his tests while I wrote them up for the files. Scarcely a day went by when he didn't say something sharp or 
bitter. Well, how's the romantic Mr. Turner today, hmm? Can you read any poetry into the smell of aniline dyes? Two years, Scott, two years. You see what you're heading for? A laboratory stoop. And this rain will grow mold in your curly office lock. <laughs> I guarantee it. Yes, my wife Ada fancies art too, Scott. She buys little things, paintings, statues. But she buys them with money from sugarcane, Scott. Or had you forgotten that? I hadn't forgotten that. I hadn't forgotten Ada. A dangerous woman. And I knew how dangerous. I knew things about her he didn't know. That she liked destruction. And every time he lashed out at me, I knew more. That for her own destructive purposes, she was feeding him this hate of me. Nurturing it with intention and care. Well, in the tropics, things grow fast. And Ada Barton's purposes grew fast. To full flower. In the afternoons when Paul was out in the cane fields, she began to visit me in the laboratory. He's right. You are getting a sleep. Close the door. And a squint. It definitely doesn't become you, Scott. I thought you were going into Port of Spain today. Did I say that? Oh, I heard something to that effect. And so did Paul. The road's a swamp, and besides, something's wrong with the car. One of the wires. Oh. You wouldn't know which wire. Well, I don't know what it's for, but if it's broken, the car won't run. I know that. Must you keep working? It isn't very polite of you. This isn't a salon, Ada. And these cultures have to be put away. You know, Scott, this whole business of your bet with Paul shocks me a little. I'm sorry. I mean, it shocks me to see what he's doing to you. I'm shocked to see what you're doing to him, Ada. Don't change the subject. Why do you put up with it? Why do you stay here? Isn't $50,000 an understandable motive? To you? Not for a man like you. You must have another motive. Believe me, I haven't. I'm just that crass. Not even me, Scott. You might have been a motive at first. Now I don't compete with Java, the gulls of Sicily. Look, Ada, why don't you give him a break? You don't mind taking his money? Why don't you take his turns, too? He doesn't ask much. Why don't you kiss me, Scott? Ada. Yes. Whose destruction, Ada? Destruction? Yes. Which of us have you marked to destroy? Paul? Or me? For suspense, Roma Wines are bringing you as star Mr. Lee J. Cobb in The Bet by Donald S. Ryerson. Roma Wines' presentation tonight in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. I knew, if I wouldn't face it then, I knew whom she'd marked for destruction. Because I knew a lot about what kind of woman she was. And it wasn't more than six months before she'd laid her cards on the table. Five hundred thousand dollars, Scott. Half a million. And I'm his beneficiary. But if you'll wait, Ada, let me finish the two years. More than 18 months to go. I won't wait. But we'll have our money then. What? Fifty thousand dollars. Anyway, it can't be done. We, we wouldn't get away with it. You haven't even let me tell you how we can. When a man's insured for so much, his death is sure to be investigated, I know. I know, too. And an insurance investigator is thorough. He won't accept your grief, no matter how well you can act. And he won't accept my being here. He'll find out who and why. He'll find out nothing that isn't on the death certificate. Listen to me. Darling, don't force me into this. Listen. Besides malaria, there are two diseases in Trinidad that kill hundreds every year. Typhoid and amoeba histolytica. My dear, please, all our lives... We... Paul's healthy, so he might recover from either one alone. But if he has both, together... No, either. No matter how simple you make it, I, I won't... Now, you go to the hospital at least once a week for laboratory supplies? You must have seen where they keep specimens, typhoid, microbes, amoebas? No, Ray. The risk... You won't gamble for these stakes. You'll be rich! You'll be with me. Scott, do you know where they keep the specimens? Ada, 
You remind me of something. Why don't you answer me? A spider spins a web. Scott! A male spider comes courting her. But before she'll have him, he has to catch a blue fly and bring it to her wrapped in his silk so that she can eat it alive. Scott! Then she accepts her mate. But the next day, she eats him alive. That's a horrible story. You don't really think that I'm... No. I don't suppose I do. You'll get the microbes then, won't you? Won't you, Scott? Hey, don't... Let me think about it a little while. Let me at least pretend I'm a man with a conscience. Scott? Oh, Paul, I wasn't expecting you this afternoon. Yes, I know, I know. You were expecting Ada. Well, she's here too. Hello, Scott. Hello. I, uh... I just stopped by for a moment to tell you uh, I have to go to Tobago. Tobago? Yes, I have a grinding plant there, and we're installing a new engine. I'll be gone about two days. I told Paul that Tobago in this weather... Oh, yes, is... you're taking chances, Paul. I take enough out of Britain to keep on the right side of malaria. Don't worry, I'll be all right. Yes, but there are other things, typhoid. I've never known you to be so concerned before, Ada. Oh, Paul. Oh, if it weren't for uh, certain other factors, my dear, I'd be touched, believe me. What other factors? I don't want to be sorted, Ada. Surely I don't have to describe a situation you and Scott know better? What do you mean? All right. All right, we'll maintain the cultivated surface, if you wish. Uh, by the way, Scott, how do you feel now about our bet? The same as before, that I'll win it. Yeah, well, perhaps. Lately, I thought the whole thing was a mistake, at least on my part. You want to call it off? I didn't say that exactly. I'll tell you, we'll, we'll talk about it when I get back, the three of us. I may have a counter-proposal. Paul, you wouldn't All dare... All right. Not... We'll talk about it. Fine, fine. I'll be looking forward to it. Well, Ada? I... I think I'll sit here a while, Paul. It, it's so peaceful now that the rain stopped. Huh. It has stopped. I didn't notice. A truce. A false peace. It'll begin soon again. Well, goodbye, then. Goodbye, Paul. Take care. You heard... You heard what he said? He's a little excited, Ada. It didn't mean anything. Don't be a fool. It means you haven't any choice now. There's always a choice. Well, yes, yes. Now you can choose me with half a million dollars or nothing. Not one red cent. But he didn't say he wouldn't pay. That's what he means. He hates us. Both of us. His only weapon is his money. What a triumph for him to hoax you into slaving here for eight months and then throw you out. Oh, no. He wouldn't dare. Don't you think I know him? You have to do what I say. How will you give it to him? The microbes? In his food. It'll only take a drop. Say, in, in caviar, he's a pig for it, like he is about everything else. Caviar, highly seasoned with sauce. You've really planned this. Somebody has to plan. Do you want to? No, no. Well, he'll be home day after tomorrow. He'll ask you to come to the house for tea. I'll give it to him then, so it will look like he caught them in Tobago. Ada... I'm not sure that I can... I'm, I'm not... I am sure. It's the only thing we can do. You love me, Scott. Will you get the specimens from the hospital? Will you? If anyone had told me that I... that I could do... Will you get the specimens, Scott? <sighs> All right. I'll get them this afternoon. <laughs> That afternoon, the rains had stopped. It was no false peace. The season was over, two weeks early. I drove into Port of Spain through a crawling, chalk, white mist, through the strong, heady smell of decaying jungle. And the cessation of sound was enormous in my ears. It was as though the rain had stopped on a shout. I got the specimens, two tiny tubes of dynamically living death. When I stored them away in the laboratory refrigerator, I riveted my mind on Ada's face and her incomparable voice. We can do so much together, Scott. You're a savage like me. Remember how you looked at Shiva that first day? I could tell we're alike. No little stifling moralities. 
We're beyond such things, you and me, beyond pity or shame. Yes, quite beyond shame. Or pity. Be very careful, my darling. Eat only the caviar without the sauce. We'll leave all the rest for him. <laughs> The afternoon Paul Barton came back, I walked to the house he was so proud of. There was a mist, still on the ground, but thinning fast. The dry season had begun. The only sound beside my footsteps was the last rainfall dripping from the giant trees and the hushed, mysterious voice of the jungle itself. Ada met me at the door. You can't possibly understand about her face. Vitality isn't the word. There is no word. Her face was the indestructible essence of life. When I saw her, there were no more doubts. She took me into the room where she kept the Hindu gods, where Paul was already sitting over his tea. Oh, hello, Scott. Come in. Well, you did invite me. Of course, but you surprised me again. You're punctual as well as tenacious. Help yourself to tea, Scott. I'll get the caviar. Thanks, Ada. I'm... I'm sorry I disappoint you so often, Paul. Disappoint me? By not conforming to your preconceived portrait of an artist. Oh, that's not where I misjudged. I had a preconceived portrait of the kind of man my wife thinks she wants. She wants a fool and a weakling. Well, I won't sit here and discuss... Here's the caviar. With sauce and without. And some new crackers over from England. Native pastry for you, Scott. You like sweets. Pull out that little table. Uh, I'll do it. Thanks, dear. Uh, you're right, Scott. You're right. We won't discuss that. That's beside the point. We were going to discuss my uh, counterproposal. Oh, Paul, let's not have unpleasantness right away. You assume it's unpleasant, not for me. I just want to say I'm, I'm closing the laboratory. Push the crackers over, Ada. I'd like to hear your reason. The research is no longer necessary, and I want you to leave Trinidad. You're worried about Ada, aren't you? Oh, we are dropping the cultivated surface, aren't we? Well, yes. Ah, caviar and sauce. My wife prepares us very well, Scott. Yes. I wonder how well you know her. I know her pretty well. Now you're thinking of the 50,000, of course. Oh, really, Scott, try this. Ada puts everything in it. Did, uh, did I say something? Put it down. What? Put the caviar down, Paul. It's deadly. Scott, you fool. Yes, there's everything in it, including death, typhoid, amoebas. She prepared it very well. Ada. Ada, is this... I'm going to kill you, Scott. I hadn't intended to just yet. I know. Oh, of course you'd have a gun. How many men have you killed, Ada? How many helpless, hypnotized men have helped you to kill and then have themselves died? How many husbands, lovers... How did you know? I'm not such a romantic figure, Ada. I came here with some previous knowledge of you. You see, I was sent here for a purpose. I didn't meet you by accident. But I didn't know what you'd be like. How much of a spell you and the rain could cast. But it's over. The rains and everything... Yes, I was sent to investigate because of all the insurance. <laughs> An insurance man, how dismal. You don't deserve even the... You... You killed her. You killed her. Yes. I killed her. <laughs> I'm haunted. I keep away from rain because she flourishes if it rains too long. She comes back like a dank, strong jungle vine, flowered and perfumed, but tough to the core. She winds herself around me. She tries to drag me once more to that precipice above that darkness, an existence beyond shame or pity or morality.
Roma Wines have brought you Lee J. Cobb as star of The Bet. Tonight's study in Suspense. Lee J. Cobb appears through the courtesy of 20th Century Fox and will soon be seen in his first role since leaving the service, Anna and the King of Siam. Next Thursday, Roma Wines bring you Mr. Zachary Scott in Suspense, radio's outstanding theater of thrills. Presented by Roma Wines, R-O-M-A. Made in California for enjoyment throughout the world. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. The road to crime ends in a trap that justice sets. Crime does not pay. Avenger's sworn enemy of evil is actually Jim Brandon, a famous biochemist. Through his numerous scientific experiments, Brandon has perfected two inventions to aid him in his crusade against crime as the Avenger. The telepathic indicator by which he is able to pick up thought flashes, and the secret diffusion capsule, which cloaks him in the black light of invisibility. Brandon's assistant, the beautiful Fern Collier, is the only one who shares his secrets, and knows that he is the man the underworld fears as the Avenger. And now, The Avenger and the Ghost Murder. At the end of a long table in her darkened seance room, Princess Stella, the renowned mystic, sits motionless. Opposite her, a man leans forward, nervous and expectant. Suddenly, out of nowhere, a swirling spiral of white mist appears, takes shape. And from it comes a ghostly voice. I am the spirit of Martha, your wife. Horus do not sell our house. We were so happy there. It holds many memories still dear to me. Keep the house, Horus. Keep it. Now I must leave you, but I will come again. I will return. I will return. Martha! Martha, don't leave me. Come back. Martha! She's gone. <sighs> Princess Stella, call her back. Call Martha back. Princess Stella, wake up. Wake up. Help! Help! What's the matter? What's the matter? What happened? Well, it's the princess. I can't wake her. Don't be alarmed. I'll turn up the lights. 
She uh, must have had a manifestation. It always affects her this way. Yes, yes, she brought my wife back. Princess, wake up. Princess Stella. She'll come out of it in a minute. Princess, wake up. What? Oh, what is it? Oh, it's you, Mr. Jordan. Yes. Are you all right, Princess? You frightened your client. Oh, I'm so sorry. Was the seance a success? Yes. You recalled another spirit for a lonely soul. Uh, Princess, I, I saw my wife. She spoke to me. Mm, I'm glad. I think we'd better leave the princess alone now. She must rest. Oh, of course. This way. Well, how much did he pay you, Jordan? Fifty dollars, Stella. Pennies. No, Stella. Well, I'm getting sick of going through this routine day after day for that kind of money. You promised Have me Have patience, that... Stella. I told you that before long we'd be cleaning up. Well... And I meant it. Well, you'd better pull something out of the hat, or I'll retire. And then where'll you be, Jordan? No, Stella, that's no way to talk. After all I've done for you... After all you've done for me? Ha! <laughs> Shut up. There's a woman in the waiting room. You've got to see her now. Yeah, well, she's in for a disappointment. I've had enough of ghosts today. You've got to see her and talk to her, at least. Ah, well, all right. I'll bring her in. Then I have to leave. I have an appointment uptown with a fellow by the name of, uh, Brandon. Mr. Jordan? What can I do for you? Well, Mr. Brandon, I represent Princess Stella, the mystic. Uh, no doubt you've heard of her? Well, yes, I have. Well, Princess Stella is going to try for that $50,000 prize the Rollins estate is offering for a genuine manifestation. Isn't that rather a waste of the princess time, Mr. Jordan? What do you mean? Well, so far, every medium who has tried for that prize has failed completely. Every so-called manifestation was promptly exposed as a hoax. Oh, Princess Stella is in a class by herself. Those others were, were charlatans. Princess Stella is a true psychic. A genuine, a genuine spirit medium. Mr. Jordan, suppose you come to the point. What brought you here to see me? You may be a scientist, Mr. Brandon. Yet I feel that some of your ideas may be in sympathy with those of the princess. Why? Well, you've written some... Brilliant articles about your experiments in the field of mental telepathy. So I thought you might be interested in endorsing Princess Stella as a medium. Your word would go a long way in helping... Uh, just a minute, Jordan. Let's clarify our terms. My telepathic experiments have to do with the concentrated thought waves of the living. That is a science. Oh, but Princess Stella is... is a uh... very clever actress, no doubt. No sale, Jordan. If we win the Rollins Prize, we're willing to cut you in for 10%. No, thank you. I'm not interested. As a matter of fact, I'm on the other side of the fence completely. You mean you're going to fight us? In a way, yes. You see, I promised Neil Hayden, the Rollins lawyer, to act as a judge when Princess Stella puts in her bid for the prize. You what? <laughs> I'm willing to give your client a fair enough chance. If Princess Stella really can produce a ghost... I'm sure the whole scientific world will sit up and take notice. Well, thanks for being such a sport about it, Brandon. I think you understand my position. Even a true artist needs a little, a little clever exploitation. <laughs> yes, that seems to be a generally accepted idea. Anyway, I feel we'll get a square deal from you, Brandon. I'm merely interested in keeping things in their proper places, Jordan. Mm -hmm. I think Princess Stella's so-called manifestations belong strictly in the field of entertainment. Not to be confused in any way with any branch of science. Well, perhaps the princess can convert you. Well, I won't take up any more of your time. I'll see you at the seance next Thursday. Right. I'm looking forward to it. I can find my way out. Uh, thanks for the interview. Not at all. Goodbye. Well, of all the nerve, trying to offer you a bribe, Jim. That's the limit. I don't see how you kept your temper. Fern, Jordan is playing for big stakes. And he's not the sort to leave any stone unturned. Well, I don't trust a man like that. He's not only too glib, but too well-dressed. <laughs> he's a dandy, all right. Uh, did you notice the spats? How could I miss them? Jim, I didn't know you'd been asked to be a judge at this thing. Yes. Princess Stella is by far the cleverest medium to try for the prize. And Neil Hayden isn't going to take any chances of being duped in carrying out the extraordinary terms of the Rollins will. Who are the other judges, Jim? Oh, you've met them both, Professor Gans and Dr. Strong. <laughs> Princess Stella isn't going to have an easy time of it. No. 
Even though Gans and Strong are constantly at odds, they'll probably agree this once. That Princess Stella is a colossal fake. Jim, can you arrange for me to go to the seance? I don't believe in ghosts, but I would... <laughs> would you like to see one, huh? Well, yes, I'd like to see what passes for a ghost. All right, Fern. But in the meantime, we have a great deal of research to do. What kind of research, Jim? We're going to look into all the tricks that mediums use, all the accoutrements that the earthly ghost is heir to, the blaring horns and trumpets, the moving tables and the tilting chairs, and all known devices that have ever passed for ghosts. Sounds interesting, Jim. We mustn't underestimate Princess Stella, Fern. This seance will be a kind of challenge, and we can't let science take a back seat. You're late, Brandon. Strong and I have finished with that side of the room. Nothing unusual there. You don't mind if Fern and I have a look, Professor Gans? Well, if you're not willing to take our word for it... Go ahead, Brandon. There's plenty of time. Thanks, Strong. This way, Fern. So this is what a seance room looks like. I always thought they were done in black velvet. This one's completely in white. Yes, the princess knows the value of contrast. Uh, she's a showman, all right. Now for the inventory. White painted walls. White rug that completely covers the floor. Eight straight back white chairs. Help me examine them, Fern. Right, Jim. Hmm. They're all metal. No false bottoms. Nothing could be hidden in these chairs. Let's take the table next. It... Hmm. That's all metal, too. Examine the legs, Fern. They're single strips of metal, Jim. Nothing there. Nothing under the rug. Jim, there's no place to hide any ghosts in this room. Certainly doesn't look that way. No windows. In fact, there's only one thing about this entire room that strikes me as a little odd. What's that, Jim? There are four radiators, two at each end. Well, this is a very large room. In cold weather, I imagine all four of them are needed. They're all cold today. Are you ready, Brandon? Uh, yes, Strong, I think so. Oh, just one other thing. Did you and Gans go over the room for hidden wires? Yes, we covered the walls and floor with a detector. Guess that takes care of everything, then. I'll tell Jordan we're ready to begin the seance. Put your flashlight on that corner. There's someone there. Yes. Jim, look. Something white floating there near the wall. It's a ghost. I see it, Fern. Turn on the lights. There's something there, all right. I'll do it. Hurry, Jordan. It's gone. Good heavens, Jim. It must have been a ghost. <sighs> look at the Princess Stella. She's in a trance. Uh, wake up the Princess, Jordan. Wake her up. Of course. Princess Stella. Princess, wake up. Gosh, Jim, this is more than I bargained for. She's coming, too. What, what happened? Brandon, Strong, uh, help me examine this end of the room thoroughly. This sort of thing just isn't possible. That was the strangest thing I ever saw. A truly wonderful performance. There doesn't seem to be a trace of anything to mark the passage of that ghost. Well, fellow scientists, what are we going to do? If we can't explain this manifestation, we have to award the prize to Princess Stella. Not so fast, Strong. Well, what do you suggest, Gans? I don't know. What do you think, Brandon? There's no denying it. We saw the ghost, and it's up to us to explain exactly what it was and where it came from. I think we'd better call for a repeat performance. Right. I'll tell Jordan. Uh, Jordan! Jordan! Come over here. Yes? Yes. What is it, Professor Gatt? Uh, we're not convinced, Jordan. We're calling for another seance. No, no, I cannot. I am exhausted. I cannot. Princess, the judges are within their rights. The terms of the will stipulate that two tests may be demanded. Oh, I am faint. I cannot go through all this again. Now, gentlemen, the princess is nervous and upset. Uh, could we postpone the second seance until tomorrow? Well, I don't see why not. What do you say, Brandon? I think that's an excellent idea. Are you agreed, Gans? Yes. In fact, I prefer that. I've just remembered something that may prove helpful to us. I'll need a little time to check on it. Uh, we'll meet tomorrow, then, hmm? Yes, Jordan. However, I'd like to speak to you privately for a few moments. Now. Oh, certainly. Come into the other room. This way, please. Uh, now, Professor Gans, what is it? Uh, have you and the princess traveled much abroad? Yes, widely. About 20 years ago, did you bill yourselves as the countess and the clown? Why, no. That must have been... Uh, 
someone else. Why do you ask? They were a popular carnival act in Austria when I was teaching there. Something about you two reminded me of them. Well, the princess and I are not exactly a vaudeville team, Professor. I wonder what became of that act. I must find out before the seance tomorrow. Really, Professor, what can that have to do with Princess Stella and the Rollins prize money? It may have everything to do with it, Jordan. I'm rather certain that the Countess and the Clown are fugitives from justice. Avenger and the Ghost Murder. Fern, we can't let Princess Stella get away with this ghost business. There's got to be an answer here in the seance room. Examine that radiator, Fern. I'll take this one. This one's cold, Jim. That's strange. This one is warm. Turn the valve, Fern. Maybe the heat's turned off. Okay. I'll see about the other radiators. Right, Jim. Fern, one of these radiators is warm and one is cold. What do you make of it, Jim? Don't know yet. I turn the heat on. We'll give them a chance to warm up. Even though we never held the same ideas, Gans, I never thought you'd deliberately oppose me in a thing like this. I had it on good authority that your vote was the only one against me. I admit it, Strong. I don't think you're fitted to be head of a research foundation. Such a position requires an older man. Wide experience. Like yourself, I suppose? So that was the reason for it. You want the position yourself. Now listen here, Strong. Mind your tongue. Gentlemen, what's the trouble? Brandon, Professor Gans blackballed me. I'd have been elected head of the Lansdowne Foundation if it hadn't been for him and his petty personal ambition. Now this is a matter between you and me, Strong. Let's keep it that way. I voted in good faith for what I believe to be the good of the Foundation. Your day is coming, Gans. I'll get you for this. Are you gentlemen ready to begin? Everyone is waiting. Well, Jordan, I see you've decided to brazen it out. If you have anything to say to me, Professor Gans, say it in private. I'm afraid that won't be possible. My news will be of interest to the public. But I have decided to let you put your show on first. My news can wait. I'll call everyone in, then. Just a moment, Princess Stella. Will you sit at this end of the table today? Very well, Mr. Brandon. It makes no difference to me. Thank you. Turn out the lights, Jordan. I'll keep my flashlight on you. All right. Now, take your place in the circle, and everyone join hands. Hayden will hold my right wrist so that my hand will be free to turn on this flashlight in an instant. There. Are you ready, Princess? I am ready. I call upon some friendly spirit... Let my voice penetrate these walls and travel on wings of wind. Out there in the vast unknown, I seek a friend, a lonely, unhappy spirit. I would call you back from the dark, lost valley of the beyond. Come, spirit, 
Manifest thyself. The veil is lifting. The boundary between the living and the dead is not a barrier. It is but a frail cloud of mortal man's uncertainty. Come, kind spirit, appear, appear. The spirit approaches. Who calls? Who calls me? There it is, in the corner. A ghost. It's there, all right. Keep your hands joined, everyone. I'll turn on the lights. Hurry, friends, and it's already disappearing. Oh, it's gone. Jim, look, Professor Gans, he must have fainted. Help me, Brandon. We'll get him out of here. Don't touch him, Strong. Why not? Look closely. There's a small dagger below his heart. What? Professor Gans is dead. Well, the police have confirmed my suspicions, Fern. Professor Gans was killed by a poison dagger. Any prints on it? It was too smudged to be of any value. Jim, up until now, I'd never believed in ghosts. But you'll have to admit that no living person in that room could have thrown that dagger. No one broke the circle for a second. So you're willing to pin this murder on a ghost? Well, how do you explain it, then? The ghost is the only one that we can rule out. Because, you see, there wasn't any ghost. There wasn't any. But, Jim, we saw it twice. What we saw was nothing more than a clever mixture of muriatic acid and ammonia vapor released through tiny holes in the dummy radiator. One radiator at each end of the room was a dummy. But how did the ghost disappear so quickly? The gas was operated by an automatic pressure gauge in the basement. It was timed to last for ten seconds. And that spiral whirling effect was due to the intermittent release of air, which circulated about the vapor. At the end of ten seconds, the whole thing was dissolved by a very light spray of ammonia and water, also released from the radiator. Gosh, I almost believed in that ghost. Especially after you placed Princess Stella at the opposite end of the table for the second seance. That's why they had two sets of radiators in that room, just in case a skeptic made a request like that. But what of the voice, Jim? It didn't come from anyone in the room. It came from the ghost. Well, that's easy. Princess Stella is an accomplished ventriloquist. Well, there goes my ghost story right up the chimney, or I should say right down the radiator. Fern, I don't want any of this revealed until we know who murdered Gans. All right, Jim. But I don't see how we're ever going to find that out. At the moment, neither do I. But we'll keep trying. Is the inspector still questioning Jordan, Strong, and the princess? Yes, but we'll have to let them go for lack of evidence. I wonder if Jordan had time to put on his socks before he went to headquarters. His socks? Yes. Our fashion plate disillusioned me. He appeared at that last seance without any socks. Well, Fern, get your coat. We're going to the gymnasium. Whatever for, Jim? I'm interested in seeing a little professional boxing. I've often heard those French savate boxes are something to see. Stella, what are you doing? I'm packing, Jordan. I'm going to pull out. Don't be a fool, Stella. We're under bond. You've got to stay here and stick things out. You suit yourself. I'm leaving. Now listen to me, Stella. We still have a chance to pull through all this and win that $50,000 prize. You've got to go through with that seance today. If we stay here, we'll wind up in jail no matter how the seance turns out. What are you getting at? The police have no evidence against us. Strong was the only one with a motive for killing Gans. We're in the clear. You're wrong, Jordan. Jim Brandon knows we had a motive for killing Gans. Brandon? How could he know anything? I heard the inspector tell Brandon to search Gans' apartment. Since Gans know who, knows who we were and all about the trouble that you got us into in Vienna, he must have had some proof of it. Brandon has that proof now, and he's just waiting for the proper time to use it. That does put us in a spot. We've got to get out of here, Jordan. I'm afraid. What are you afraid of, Stella? Did you kill Gan? How dare you say that? Now, you... take it easy, Stella. Listen, I'll make a deal with you. If you'll stay here and go through with this seance, I promise you have nothing to fear from Brandon. What are you talking about, Jordan? You wouldn't uh, try... don't worry about what Brandon knows, that's all. Is it a deal? I don't know. How do I know I'm not next on the murderer's list? You're being hysterical. Now, come on now. Get things ready for your performance. If you make it a good one, Stella, we'll be on easy street. Uh, 
Well, oh, Mr. Jordan, may I speak with you a moment? Uh, of course, Miss Collier. What is it? Well, Mr. Brandon is busy at police headquarters and won't be able to get here for the seance. But, but he must. This is the final test for the prize. You are to go on with the seance as usual. It is understood that if you convince Strong and Hayden that Princess Stella has brought about a genuine manifestation, the prize is hers. All right. I'll call the princess. We are ready. Close the door, please, Mr. Jordan, and uh, turn out the lights. Yes, Princess. Jordan, wait a moment. What was that noise? I don't know. It seemed to come from just outside the door. But there's no one there. Well, close the door, then, and let's get started. Join the circle, Jordan. Let me warn you all. Do not break the circle, no matter what happens. Let silence reign a moment. Spirit of another world, come to us. Manifest thyself to those who do not believe. Show thyself within this room. Come, spirit, appear, appear and speak. Who calls? Who disturbs this spirit? I am the spirit of Alvin Gans. Something is wrong. Turn on the lights. Stay where you are, all of you, and hear me out. The ghosts of the murdered have a right to speak. Turn your flashlight on him, Dr. Strong. There's no one there. I'm here, but you can't see me. It cannot be a ghost. It cannot be. You admit before witnesses, Princess Stella, that you have no power to produce a ghost? Yes, yes, I but tell me who you are. I am the Avenger, Stella. I am here to accuse Claude Jordan of the murder of Professor Gans. It's a lie. That's a lie. This is some sort of trick you're playing on me, Stella. It's no trick, Jordan. I'll turn on the lights and produce the evidence. It's a frame up. Stella! Strong and Hayden. Search Jordan. Oh, no, Examine his left leg. Out, Jordan. You'll find something interesting there. Let me go. Why, oh, there's a small bow and arrow attached to his leg. And fastened underneath it is a small dagger like the one used to kill Gans. Yes, oh, that's right. This is Strong. Strong. Call Inspector White. Tell him Jordan is ready to give him an exhibition of some amazing footwork. <laughs> Finished the clue that solved this murder case. I did? What, Jim? You noticed that Jordan wasn't wearing socks at the seance when Gans was killed. Well, how was that a clue? The thing that had us stumped until then was the certain knowledge that no one at that seance could have used his hands to drive that dagger into Gans' heart. That's right. But what if a person were just as dexterous with his feet as with his hands? You mean he could have thrown the dagger with his feet? Hardly thrown it, but he could have aimed it with his feet. Oh, I see. That little bow and arrow fastened to Jordan's leg could be set, aimed, and released by his other foot. That's right. After I'd figured that out, I realized 
that the smudge print on the dagger could have been a toe print. Oh, so that's why we went to the gymnasium to see those savat boxes who boxed with their feet. Yes. One of those boxes uh, demonstrated my theory of how the crime was committed without moving the upper part of his body at all. Jim, just what was it that Professor Gans knew about Princess Stella and Jordan? The motive for the murder? Jordan was mixed up in a killing in Vienna about 20 years ago that Gans happened to remember. He intended to expose Jordan after the seance that day, and Jordan knew it. There seems to be no limit to the methods of murder. <laughs> they don't give us detectives a chance to grow complacent. No. This one really had you on your toes. Oh, a pun, Miss Collier, that some would call a very murderous weapon. <laughs> Characters, names, places, and plots used in the Avenger program are fictitious. Any similarity to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. This is a thought. A thought. A thought. Remember, listen for another adventure of... The Avenger. And now, stay tuned for the program that is rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. S-I-T-N-A-L Signal Signal Girl Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. And now for the Signal Oil Company, the Whistler's strange story, Dark Voyage. The crowd gathered quickly at the end of the pier and didn't disperse when the police arrived and took over, urging them back and shouting orders. Jeff Denning, watching from in front of his little waterfront shop, finally hurried forward and pushed his way through. What's the matter? What happened to it? Get back, please. Who is it, officer? Who was it, you mean? Guy named Angelus. Near as we can tell from the stuff in his wallet. Angelus? Not Dave Angelus. That's it. No one did you? I... Yes, I knew him. He used to come into my shop. They think he drowned, Jeff. It doesn't look like it to me. What? If it's foul play, we'll get to the bottom. All right, folks, let's move back. Foul play? With old Dave? No, he didn't have an enemy in the world. He, He was a friend to all of us down here. That's right, Jeff. He had friends everywhere, old Dave. All over the world. Yes, Jeff, it's a terrible tragedy to all of old Dave's friends, isn't it? You turn away, hurry back to your shop at the opposite end of the pier. But once inside, your expression of grief is replaced by an odd smile. A smile that's a mixture of amusement and determination. Operator. Uh, long distance operator. I want Mr. Stephen Curtis, Corbin Hotel, Seattle, Washington. Person to person, please. (laughs) 
Wait a minute, Steve. I tell you, the schooner's there. I've got the maps. I know her exact position. Lots of guys have had maps. Steve, I'll pay your way down here. Split on what we can salvage, and it'll be plenty. I tell you, we can't miss. You in deep water? Well, not too deep. I, I tried myself, but, well, you know, ever since that injury to my chest... I... Okay, I'm between salvage jobs here anyway. Fly down in a few days. Is that all right? Uh, no. M make it tomorrow. Steve, I tell you, this thing is big. It's our chance of a lifetime. Okay, okay, tomorrow. First plane out. Ah, huh, that's better. My shop's on Pier 9. If I'm not there, ask for me at the Red Angel Cafe. Red Angel. Check. Well, Jeff, at last it's underway, isn't it? A venture you've been working on for months. The pieces are beginning to fit together. A map of a certain section of ocean floor off the Pacific coast. A goal. And now Steve Curtis, a man who could easily help you attain it. The following evening, waiting for Steve at the Red Angel Cafe. It's all you can do to keep from telling someone else how rich you're going to be. How the pair of you could share it all. But you reason that there's a time and place. That your months of waiting for an answer from Faye Atkins might soon be over. And for now, you can tense yourself as usual to sit far back in the smoke-shrouded room and listen as Faye finishes a song. My sweet embraceable you. Hello, Jeff. Ah, oh, Faye, the song, it was very nice. Oh, thanks. Mind if I sit down? Mind? There you are. Thanks. Uh, Faye, when are you going to... Going to let you take me out of all this? Ah, oh, Faye, if you just say the word, we could make a go of it, the two of us. I suppose. <laughs> You're not convinced, are you? Still on the same old kick that there's a special guy just for you that he'll walk right into your life. Oh, maybe I'm mixed up like lots of other people, but... Jeff, I... Oh, I got a crazy idea. I had it ever since I was a kid. I suppose it's the kind of stuff you get out of books. What kind of books, Faye? Oh, the kind that tell a girl that somehow, somewhere, she's going to meet him. Him? The guy. The right one for her. Oh, Jeff, I know it sounds dopey, especially coming from me. No, no, it doesn't. I, I was just hoping... Maybe I'm wrong, Jeff. Maybe the guy that's right for me won't happen all of a sudden. Maybe it's like you tell me. It grows on a person. Bloom slowly. I don't know. All I'm sure of is when it happens, I'll know. I'll be sure. Faye, if anybody ever came between us, anybody that wasn't right for you, I... Faye, you're not listening to me, Faye. I, I... Jeff. W what's the matter? What are you staring at? That that man what? by the door. He keeps looking over here. Looking over? What? Well, that's Steve. Steve Curtis. I've been waiting for him. He's going to do a little job for me. Steve Curtis. Hey, you made good time. Hey, Steve. Hey, Steve. Jeff. Hey, over here. I want you to meet him, Faye. He's all right. Hard worker, minds his own business. You'll like him. Yes. Yes, I I think I will. What? Uh, he's a friend of yours, you said. Oh, yeah. Good friend. Well, then I'll, I'll probably like him. Any friend of yours, Jeff, is a friend of mine. Oh, yeah. Sure, Faye. Sure. <laughs> Tonight's $20 signal gasoline book goes to Richard G. Armstrong of Imperial Beach, California for this limerick. Of signal I'd heard such great praise, how a little goes such a long ways. So I bought some to see. Signal proved it to me. Why, the saving is just like a raise. Signal, signal, signal gasoline. Your car will go far with go for the gasoline. <laughs> When tonight's limerick writer said your savings with signal are just like a raise, he was only telling half the story. Because you'll also get a raise in spirit when you touch the throttle and feel signal's swift, sure acceleration. Signal's smooth surges of silent power. Yes, it's definitely more fun driving with a gasoline that helps your engine run more efficiently. And that's what makes today's great signal gasoline go farther.
The meeting is brief, isn't it, Jeff? And you and Faye and Steve only talk for a few minutes. But somehow you have difficulty taking your eyes from Faye's face because of what you see there as she looks across at Steve Curtis. Steve doesn't seem to notice, but you're not sure. To you, there's an unmistakable light in her eyes, something you haven't seen before. You want to leap up and scream at him, but you don't. No. Because soon it's over and you're out of the cafe, walking along the pier with Steve towards your shop. You know, Faye seems like a nice kid, Joe. Yeah. Yeah, she is. But uh, I didn't bring you down here to meet her, Steve. We got a lot ahead of us. What I'm about to show you, the salvage job, there's a fortune in it. Enough for both of us for a lifetime. Sure, you've told me all that. Let's look a deal over. Not until you understand one thing very clearly, Steve. Uh Uh-huh. Faye Atkins. She's not a part of this deal, not in any way. (laughs) She's a little gem, Jeff. A treasure. I'm serious, Steve. Yeah. Yeah, I think you are. Okay, partner. Let's see how inviting your original proposition is to me. If I'm interested, I... Sure we can come to terms? I'm glad you see it that way, Steve. Yeah, come on in. Mm. I got the maps and charts right here on my desk. Uh, sit down. I'll turn on the light. I want you to look them over. <whistles> Say, these look okay. You really think there's almost half a million bucks aboard? At this guy, Van Balen... I tell you, Steve, that schooner was loaded. Van Balen had chartered her out of Malaya trying to make San Francisco. Mm. Happened just at the outbreak of the war. Uh, this, uh, this map, Jeff. Where'd you get it? I, uh, an old friend. Oh, now, wait a minute. That means a three-way cut. I, I thought you the, said it was uh, just... The, friend met with an accident. He's out of it. Oh, I see. Well, shake, partner. We're in business. Uh, your terms. He won't have any trouble reaching the schooner in the diving suit. No, no, not with his layout to go by. I'm uh, surprised you called me in on it, Jeff. You could work this depth yourself. I've never been the same since my chest was crushed in that car crash, Steve. Can't stay under for more than a few minutes. Well, I'm not arguing. When do we get started? I'll talk to Captain Thorpe tomorrow. Captain Thorpe? Yeah, we'll rent his boat and equipment. He won't know exactly what we're after. It'll be all right. Fine. Wake him up bright and early, Jeff, boy. I'm getting anxious. (laughs) I thought you would be. Look, Captain Thorpe, I've hired your boat before, and there weren't any questions. Is it a deal or not? There are other boats, you know, plenty of them. Just asking, Mr. Denning. Like to know how to load supplies and all. You know how it is? Yeah, sure, I know. And I'll tell you all about it in due time. Well... How about it? Yeah. Yeah, I'll take you. Any cost you need. 150 a day. Pay in advance. Wait a minute. Isn't that a little high? Like you said, there's other boats. Plenty of them. All right, Thorpe. 150 a day. In advance. Leaving Captain Thorpe, your heart pounds, doesn't it, Jeff? It's getting closer, your big dream, the money, and eventually Faye Atkins. That night, you hurry back to the Red Angel Cafe to talk to her. When you catch sight of something and stop and stare, it's Steve. Steve and Faye together near the pier railing in back of the cafe. You slip forward cautiously and make your way to a point where you can overhear without being no, seen. No, no, you're wrong. Listen, Faye, I, I do know how you feel. It, it happened to me the same way, like that. But it's no good. Because Jess offered you something else? Something you want more? Money. No. No, that isn't it. Sure, I'm like anybody else where all that dough's concerned. But the guy's crazy about you. Look, you're a grown boy, Steve. You know Jeff and I wouldn't work out. It could. It could if work, Faye, if you only... If sure. If you'd never happened along. I wasn't one kind of woman on the outside, but a a little girl inside who's seen some candy she's got to have. You're talking like a kid. Why did it happen to you? Tell me, Steve, why did it happen to you in the same way, the same instant it happened to me? Like that, you said. Did you mean it? Did you? Sure. Sure, I I meant it. But I'm walking away from this, see? Jeff wants the money, that's all. 
Don't tell me you're the same. He wants you. You, Faye. He's, he's told me oh, many I'm times. I'm sorry. I'm really sorry for, for Jeff, for you, and maybe most of all for myself. I don't get it. Just this, Steve. You better come to your senses. Unless you're kidding me. Because Jeff will never mean anything to me. Faye. Faye, listen to no me. No matter what you do or say, I swear it won't make any difference. There isn't a chance for Jeff. Not as long as I know you're alive. You might as well know it. Faye, you're crazy. Just plain crazy. Oh, that was settled a long time ago. It's the things I'm crazy about that still matter. And as long as you're around, Steve, I'm crazy about you. You've lost her, haven't you, Jeff? And you stand there struggling to control the murderous rage that builds within you. Finally, you turn, hurry away. Faye's words keep boring into your brain. And you know that as long as Steve is around, as long as he lives, that Faye will never marry you. You decide to say nothing to them, but they're on your mind, Faye and Steve, all that following day. And you're making plans. Plans that have nothing to do with your search for the sunken ship. Then on the morning you're to sail. You're with Captain Thorpe in his cabin aboard ship, checking last-minute details. As you leave him, step out on the deck. You see Steve standing near the gang. Faye is with him. Well, good morning, Faye. Oh, Jeff, I... I just thought I'd come down and see you off. I'm glad you did. Good morning, Steve. You all set? Right. You better get your gear below. Skipper's ready to shove off. Uh, it'll be okay. Jeff, when will you be back? Oh, that depends. Week at the most. Uh, you look worried, baby. Do I? Yeah, real concern. You don't have to be. This is going to be a breeze, this trip. Relax. Sure. It's just that I have a strange feeling that... What can happen? I don't know. Woman's intuition? Call it that, Steve. <laughs> Forget it. Any time you say, Mr. Denner. Okay, Captain. Well, so long, Faye. Steve, wait. Yeah, what is it? Uh, nothing. Coming, Jeff. I'll be right with you, Steve. Well, you better get ashore, Faye. All right. Uh, Faye. Yes? I've, uh, never seen you like this before. I've been out a hundred times, but... Well, I... it's just that I... Oh, I don't know. Relax. Nothing's going to happen to me, baby. Not a thing. The dawn of the following day finds you anchored not far from San Miguel Island off the coast of Southern California. The sea is rough, and you hesitate about sending Steve over the side. You don't want anything to happen to him just yet, do you, Jeff? But he insists on going below, and you're anxious to find out if the old man's charts are correct. So you give him his instructions and watch as he's lowered into the choppy sea. You're tense and nervous as you wait for some word from him. And all the while you wonder about old Dave Angel. If the story he told you about the sunken ship, Van Balen's gold, existed only in his imagination. Jeff? Hello? Jeff? Suddenly your thoughts are interrupted by Steve's voice over the telephone, calling to you from the bottom of the sea. Jeff? Yeah, Steve. What is it? You hit it right on the button, pal. She's here. The ship's here. <laughs> As you continue to talk with Steve, you try to remain calm, don't you, Jeff? But inside, you're trembling with excitement. The old man was right all along. You found the ship. There's almost half a million dollars down there. And you intend to have it. Find well, what you're looking for, Mr. Dennis. What? Oh, Captain Thorpe. Yeah, we found what we were looking for. Good. What's the name of this ship? Maybe I know of her. That makes you think it's a ship. What else? Look, Thorpe, we made a deal, remember? 150 bucks a day and no questions asked? Uh, sure. Yeah. Let's just leave it that way, huh? Okay. I was just wondering if it... Jeff? Yeah, Steve? The ship's rocking pretty badly down here. He's on a list. All right. Don't take any chances. Come on up. Okay. Today I found something in one of the cabins. Looks like a strong box. Probably isn't what we're after, but I thought you might want to look it over. Bring it up.
back up on deck, Steve hands you a small box. And as the crew members help him out of the suit, you hurry to your cabin and bolt the door. It doesn't take you long to break the lock on that strong box. And then you open it. it. Contains only papers, correspondence addressed to Von Balen. There's no mistaking now, is there, Jeff? And you smile as you thumb through the sheets of paper. Suddenly something catches your eye. A letter from the National Bank of Mexico. You scan it quickly. Then glance at the date at the top of the letter. You lean back in your chair as the letter slips through your fingers and flutters to the floor. You sit there stunned, refusing to believe what you've read. But it's there, Jeff, in the letter. Van Balen didn't carry the gold with him aboard the sunken schooner. Instead, he'd shipped it to the National Bank of Mexico three days before he sailed. Jeff, open up. It's Steve. I was curious about the box, Jeff. Just wondered. What's the matter? Nothing. Nothing. Oh, I see you got it open. Anything interesting in it? Uh, just some of Van Balen's papers, that's all. Uh, at least we're sure the old guy was aboard, huh? Yeah. Van Balen was aboard. Mm. Look, uh, Jeff, Captain Thorpe thinks the sea will calm down by nightfall. Uh, you want me to try again? No, we'll wait till morning. Why wait if the sea is... We'll wait. Okay. You're the boss. <laughs> Steve stares at you for a moment, the puzzled expression on his face. Then he turns and walks out of the cabin. You find it difficult to cover the bitter disappointment you feel, don't you, Jeff? Only minutes ago, you had a half million dollars within reach. Now, nothing. And your search has ended in failure. But you can't tell Steve that, can you? Because that would mean turning back to port. And you're not just ready to do that. No. No. You're not going back until Steve's been taken care of. With him out of the way, you'll have a clear field with Faye. That night, when the ship is quiet, you hurry down into the hole where Steve has stored the equipment. You find his diving suit and get to work on his phone line. It doesn't take long, does it, Jeff? When Steve checks his outfit, he'll find his phone doesn't work. But you'll handle that when the time comes. Quickly, you hurry back up the companionway. As you step out on the deck... Hello, Joe. What? Oh, Steve. Oh, sort of warm tonight, isn't it? Couldn't sleep. Thought I'd come out for some air. Uh, yeah. It is hot. Mm. What, uh, what were you doing below? Uh, looking over the equipment. I'm going down with you in the morning, Steve. Oh? oh you think that's wise? I mean... I'll be you... okay. I won't stay down long. Well, why take a chance? I can handle it okay. Yeah, I know, but I just want to have a look around below. That's all. I won't stay down there more than a few minutes. Okay. It's your funeral. Dawn the following morning. You're on deck, already in your suit, when Steve shows up. As one of the hands on the skipper assist him, you give instructions. Tell him exactly what he's to do below. And then as his helmet is fastened on... Hey, uh, Jeff, something wrong with my phone. Oh? I can't get a rise out of it. Well, mine's okay. I checked it a few minutes ago. Well, it doesn't make much difference, I suppose, as long as one of the phones is operating. It'll be up to you to keep in touch with the ship. Yeah, sure. Okay, Skipper. Guess we're ready. You can't help smiling, can you, Jeff, as you're lowered into the depths of the sea? A cold, silent world of weird lights. Fantastic shapes swaying slowly back and forth in easy, graceful motion. Finally, your feet strike the deck of the sunken ship. You look around and see Steve being lowered a few yards away. As he settles slowly on the upper deck, he waves to you and turns and disappears into the blackness of the ship. Presently, you see his torch, a slender finger of light moving about inside. You move slowly along the deck, looking around for the weapon, something you can use to slash Steve's diving suit. Finally, you see it, a short, flat iron rod, part of the deck support. You examine the sharp, jagged edges. A perfect weapon, Jeff. 
we tug at it, pry it loose from the rotted plank. Yes, it will be just the thing to rip open his suit. And when that happens, the sudden pressure will crush him to death. You've figured it all out, haven't you? And it'll look like an accident. Now you'll have to hurry, Jeff. You can't stay down here too long. You move along the deck again toward him. Mr. Turner? Yes, Thorpe. You okay? Sure. How about Steve? He's inside the ship. Better stay close to him. I will, Thorpe. I'll stay close. Real close. You never can tell what might happen. That's right, Captain. You never can tell what might happen. Here's a free offer no card player will want to miss. The most asked questions on Canasta have been answered in an attractive folder prepared especially for Signal Oil Company by Robert Lee Johnson, the only Pacific Coast member of the National Canasta Laws Commission. You'll appreciate the easy-to-follow explanations of Mr. Johnson, who has written and lectured widely on Canasta. With this handy folder, you'll be able to put an end to all arguments about melding, taking the discard pile, and other disputed points. And you'll win the arguments, because you'll be quoting not opinion, but the official rulings of the National Canasta Laws Commission. Yes, this folder is something you simply must have if you play Canasta or ever expect to play Canasta. And you can have one free at any signal station. No obligation, no purchase required. That means, of course, that the demand will be great. So I'd suggest that you see your nearest signal dealer soon and ask for your free Canasta folder. Only a few minutes after Captain Thorpe's schooner had returned to its home port, the news of the tragedy off San Miguel Island was sweeping the small fishing village. Men and women of the community stood in tight little groups along the waterfront, talking in low tones, shaking their heads. While in a dressing room at the Red Angel Cafe, the people assembled there heard the story from Captain Thorpe himself. Faye Atkins sat quietly, her face white and drawn. Well, that's about it, Miss Atkins. He was dead when we finally hauled him aboard. I, I was afraid something was going to happen. I tried to tell them, but Steve and Jeff only laughed at me. I know, Faye. Jeff should never have gone down. Only for a few minutes, he said. <laughs> he was trapped down there for over a quarter of an hour. Yeah. When he fell through that rotted deck, a heavy crossbeam dropped across his airline, fouled it up. Nothing I could do. If I'd have known Jeff was in trouble, I could have freed him in a matter of minutes. As it was, I didn't find out what had happened until Captain Thorpe jerked in my lines and I came to the surface. When I got back down to Jeff, it was too late. But, Captain Thorpe, I don't understand. When Jeff called for help, why did you bring Steve to the surface? Why didn't you... There was no other way Captain Thorpe could contact me, Faye. You see, my... My telephone wasn't working. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil Program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine automotive accessories. Remember, friends, this Sunday is the last time limericks will be used on The Whistler, because next Sunday, Signal will announce something big, new, and exciting that you'll all be interested in. <laughs> Featured in tonight's story were Bill Foreman, William Conrad, Doris Singleton, and George Neese. The Whistler was produced and directed by George W. Allen, with story by Joel Malone, music by Wilbur Hatch, and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. 
Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. S-I-G-N-A-L Signal, signal gasoline This is Marvin Miller speaking for the Signal Oil Company. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System. Why don't you start it? Because, Mother, it doesn't seem inclined to start. Well, are we just going to sit here and freeze to death? Well, you've got to get help. How? Well, stop a car. Oh, no, no. I think I'd rather walk. Walk? But you don't know why. Oh, for heaven's sake, Patricia. That man is probably a thousand miles away. The police don't seem to think so. <laughs> Theater 5 presents Said the Spider. Another deer. It's a doe. See the fawn over there? Where? Behind her, Jeannie, in the woods over there. See? Oh, yeah. Gee, I'm glad we didn't take the plane. This way, there's so much to see. If we'd gone the southern route, there'd be more to see. <clears throat> My goodness, aren't you freezing? No, Mother, but shall I turn on the heater for you? No, the heater's so dry. You know, Ralph said we could save two days coming this way. Well, I'd rather have a little comfort myself. Oh, but he sounded so lonesome on the phone, Mother. Me too. I sure am glad we'll see him soon. Do you mean you miss him? She means we miss him, Mother. Well, I certainly wasn't implying anything else. Can I turn on the radio? Sure, honey. Jeannie, get the news, dear. But I wanted to After get... the news. Holy moly, Please, Grandma. Please, Jeannie, let's not argue. Oh, now, Patricia, was I arguing? Uh, no, Mother, I only meant that I simply capital, asked to be informed of what's going on in the world. That's all, all since I'm being whisked off to the far corners of the Northwest. I believe I have at least the right to know what I've left behind. All right, Mother. Well, then, why Jeannie, Jeannie darling, look, look, over there, see? You see the way that rock is arched? That's a natural bridge. Gee, can we get out and look? Why not? The chairman... I'm all right. going to stay in the car. All right, Mother. Come on, honey. Oh, boy. Can I walk across it, Mommy? Oh, no, no, darling. We haven't time, and I'm not sure it's safe. Hmm. Now, be careful. Huh? In the local news, police in Harris oh, County have found the body of an unidentified oh, woman nice. in a culvert beside Highway 45. My goodness. In their investigation, police discovered a photograph and are searching for anyone who may have a clue as to the dead woman's identity. Oh. An abandoned car was discovered east of Harris Junction and led police to believe that she may have accepted a ride when her own car became disabled. Further details will be given as there is... Oh, dear, dear, the things that go on these the days. A cold wave is sweeping over the northeast portion of the nation today. Careful. And low Gee, you can't go to the tops of the mountains for the clouds. The latest will it be like this in Oregon? Oh, honey, there'll be even better views the there. Lakes and forests showers. and mountains. And Here we are. Oh, what a terrible thing I heard on the news, Patricia. Oh? oh? I'll get another station. No, 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 never mind. Just turn that thing off. Oh, here we go. You know, darling, your daddy has found a beautiful house for us. He says it looks down on the Columbia River. I'll bet it's cold in the wintertime. And it's close to his new job, Mother. Oh? Believe me, I know we're just going to love it out in Oregon. Good heavens. What's that? Hmm? What's a police car behind oh, us? What do they want? <clears throat> Have you done something wrong? No, of course not, Mother. They just want to pass us, that's all. 
dear, something terrible must have happened. If there's been an accident, I don't want to look at it. Oh, boy, go faster, Mommy. Let's see. Jeannie, you know, sometimes I think that this child defies me just for the sake of causing friction. Gee, Grandma. All right, all right, Jeannie. Never mind, never mind. So depressing, this whole trip. Moving everybody out to Oregon. I think it was extremely selfish of Ralph. Do you know what I think, Mother? What? I think we're all hungry. I think if we had dinner, we'd feel better. Well, whatever you think, dear. There's a restaurant, Mommy. Mm. Mm. That doesn't look like much, but I guess it'll do. I think it looks just fine. Let's see. Hmm? Just listen to that siren. It sounds like more than one now. Mother, wouldn't you like a glass of sherry before dinner? Oh, yes, Patricia, that would be nice. I won't be long. All right, dear. Holy moly, what's the matter with Grandma? Oh, honey, I guess it's just that it's a long trip. Does she have to be so fussy about everything? Good evening. Table for two? Uh, three, please. Yes, this way, please. Been a nice day, hasn't it? It certainly has. Uh, tell me, do you know what all those sirens are about? Well, I'm uh, sorry, ma'am, I don't. The police have been up and down the highway all afternoon. Oh, it must be something serious. Like a bank robber? Well, we've had those, too. Oh, thank you. Well, now, huh. I'll send you a waiter. Thank you. Hey, here's Grandma already. My goodness. The places you have to put up with when you travel. Oh, now, Mother, sit down right here okay, by the window. Dear. All right. There you go. <sighs> But I suppose it's what you should expect when you gad about like gypsies. Well, you'll feel better when you get some food. Hmm, perhaps. But I don't think I want anything to eat here. Hi. Hi, I saw you coming in. Well, how do you do, young lady? And may I say it's a privilege to meet you at last. Oh, Virginia, I... Oh, uh, I don't wonder you're confused, but the fact is that your daughter and I are old friends. Oh? Uh, correspondents of the highway. We waved to each other three times today in passing. Oh, oh I see. <laughs> I'm sorry, my name is Barnett. Oh. Charles Barnett, ma'am. Well, this is my mother, Mrs. Fields. Oh, how do you do? How do you do? I'm mm-hmm. Patricia Hadley, and of course, this is Jeannie. With the light brown hair. <laughs> <laughs> Mommy wants to cut it. <laughs> Are you driving on tonight, Mrs. Fields? I'm afraid so, Mr. Barnett. You see, my daughter keeps a strict schedule of miles. Oh, I do, too. <laughs> I always seem to be hurrying from one place to another, and at my age. Oh, will you wave to me again? I will if we meet again. Well, good night. (laughs) Good Good night, night, night. Mr. Barnett. Uh Oh, isn't he a charming man? Well, I can only say there are very few gentlemen like that left. (laughs) That Mr. Barnett. There's certainly none among the young people. Yes, Mother. He was very well groomed. Gee, we've been driving four hours and we haven't passed him again. No, we haven't lost those sirens either. My goodness, the state police are everywhere. Oh, don't talk about it. You know, I've been literally sick since that newscast. Oh, Patricia, look out. That truck up ahead is slowing down. I see it, Mother. Well, you're not going to go around it, are you? Well, of course I am. There's not enough room. Oh, dear. I didn't think we'd make it. Now, Patricia, that was a reckless thing to do. There are other people in the car, you know. Mother, I am driving the car. I know what I can do, and I would appreciate your understanding that. Well, you did have that glass of sherry. Oh, Mother, we're going to stop. We are going to stop at that motel up there, and we are going to rest. And we are going to hope that tomorrow will be better. Oh. I'm sorry, Mother. I... I guess I'm just tired. Yes, I guess you are. Jeannie, honey, you come with me to the desk inside. Maybe if we leave her alone, she'll calm down. Okay. Look, Mommy, Hmm? it's that big blue car of Mr. Barnett's. I guess he's staying here, too. Well, how very nice to see you again. 
Now, are you staying here tonight, Mr. Barnett? Yes, I am. Well, would you excuse us? Come on, Jeannie. Well, if this continues across the country, Mrs. Fields, we'll be well acquainted. Yes. <laughs> we seem to have one car too many. Uh, have you heard about the terrible thing on the highway? That woman? Mm. Oh, yes. Isn't it dreadful? Uh, the clerk here says the police have a lead now. Oh, really? Yes. The mm. woman was seen earlier in the day with a middle-aged man. You don't say. Mm. Do they know what he looks like? Well, the... Uh, gas station attendant described him. Ah. Uh, apparently well-dressed, a, a good-looking man in a gray suit. Oh, dear, it's mm. frightening. To think that it might be the man in the car that just passed you. Yes, yes. Well, it's impossible to know who can be trusted these days. Yes, that's the terrible thing about it. Yes, indeed. Mm. Mm. Well, good night, Mrs. Field. Oh, good night, Mr. Barnett. Good night, Mrs. Hadley. Oh, uh, Good night. Mother, I have our keys. Good. <laughs> this seems like such a nice place. Morning, ladies. Good morning. Good morning. We'd like our bill, please. Uh, tell me, have you had anything new about that that uh, awful thing that? Oh yeah, yeah. The early news. You know, they questioned two suspects, but they had to let them go. Let them go? <laughs> yeah. The three people who saw them said he wore a gray suit. Right? The suspects owned one. Well, a gray suit won't help them find him now. Good heavens! If he heard the newscast, he'd certainly change. Yeah. Yeah. I guess he's still at large. You know, nobody's been able to describe his car yet. Of course, the cops are hoping somebody might remember it. You know, it's a statewide search. Hmm. Oh, good morning, Mrs. Fields, Mrs. Hadley. Good, good morning, morning, morning oh, Mr. Barnett. Well? No, not very. I've been rather anxious, you know. Oh, yes, of course. Well, are you off and away this snowy morning? No, not yet. About half an hour. Oh, I do believe I've become crotchety with age. Really? <laughs> I hate to pack an unpressed suit. The tailor is delaying me. <laughs> well, I do hope this won't be our last meeting. I sincerely hope not. Jimmy Crack Corn and I don't care. Must you sing that over and over, Jeannie? Honey, it does get on our nerves. Sing something else. Yes, better yet, nothing at all. Bad enough to be out in this snow. Now, Patricia, I know Ralph wouldn't want you to be out in this. It isn't a question of Ralph, Mother. I'd like to get there, too, you know. So would I. Alive. Well, well, what is it, Patricia? I, I don't know. Oh, dear, I'd better pull over. Oh, come on. Why don't you start it? Because, Mother, it doesn't seem inclined to start. Well, are we just going to sit here and freeze to death? Well, you've got to get help. How? Well, stop a car. Oh, no, no. I think I'd rather walk. Walk? You don't know why. Oh, for heaven's sake, Patricia. That man is probably a thousand miles away. The police don't seem to think so. Oh, dear. Mommy, where are you going? Look, Jeannie, darling, there's a blanket back there. Now, put it around you nice and warm. I'm going to find a phone or a service station or something, and I'll be back just as soon as I can. All right. Oh, look at it. Just look at that snow. Hmm. Not a single car has passed. <laughs> We're the only fools out in this. Grandma, the radio won't go on. Oh, here, darling. I'll turn on the ignition. There. Hey, look, there's a car back there. Oh, Jeannie, lock the doors. Lock them all, dear. Why? It's that big blue car of Mr. Barnett. Oh, Oh, thank heaven, thank heaven. Oh, Mr. Barnett! Oh, Mr. Barnett, please! Mr. Barnett! What is it, Mrs. 
automobiles, trouble with the car. Yes, yes, and my daughter is out there walking in this, trying to find help. Walking? Yes, uh, the news, you know. Oh, please, Mr. Barnett, if you see her, will you drive her to the nearest service station? Why, of course, Mrs. Fields. Oh, thank now, you. Now, don't be alarmed. You and Jeannie just wrap up and keep warm. All right. I'll take care of it. It'll be all right. Oh, you're a godsend, Mr. Barnett. Thank you so much. What's the matter, Grandma? Oh, what is it? Nothing, Jeannie, dear. It's all right now. Mr. Barnett will take care of it. Must you have that radio on all the time? I just wanted to hear... We interrupt this program to bring you the latest bulletin. A motel clerk in Elmsford has described the car of the highway murderer. It is a large blue seven-passenger uh, sedan. Blue? Did you hear that? Certain roads have been blocked blue? off by the state highway patrol. Blue? All motorists oh, are urged to report it oh, if they see a large blue sedan. <laughs> Mrs. Hadley? Mrs. Hadley? Oh, hello, Mr. Burnett. Uh, please let me help you. Get into the car. I'll take you where you're going. Oh, thank you, but it can't be that far. I'll just walk if you don't mind. Oh, now, please, Mrs. Hadley. I know what you're concerned about, but do let me help. This is turning into a blizzard. You could get lost in it. Now, please, do get in. Well, uh, I thank you very much. Oh, why did I let her go? Why did I let her go? I've got to do something. What's I, wrong, Grandma? Oh, it, it's it's nothing, dear. Just keep wrapped up nice and warm, Jeannie. I've got to get to a phone. I, I, I've, got, I've got to call. I've, I've got to call the police. I, what for? Oh, never mind, dear. I just have to. But it's too dark to go out. Oh, now, darling, don't you worry. I I won't be long. You just stay there. Are you going to look for Mommy? Yes, darling, you just keep warm. Uh, uh, Here, let me fix that blanket. There we are. Now, you stay right there and wait till I get back. Now, here, you can listen to the radio. Now I can have the kind of music I want. Not some old news program. All right, darling. You'll be all right, dear. You'll be all... Just you wait. Yes, Grandma. Oh, dear heaven. All the time we were talking about it. He was the one. He killed that woman. Oh, please, Miss Trisha. Don't get into that car. Please, Miss Trisha. Don't get in. Oh, a car. Please stop. Oh, please let it stop. Please. Please. Stop. Stop! Oh, please let it stop! Hi. Anything I can do for you? Oh, oh, thank heaven, yes. Yes. Could you take me to a phone? With the police? Oh, yes, of course. I'd be glad to. Here, get in, ma'am. Get in. There you are. Oh, thank you. something wrong? My daughter. She went for help and I got a terrible thing. Oh, how? The, the news. You heard about the woman who was killed by a driver on the highway? Yes. Well, I didn't know. I, I didn't know who he was. And I asked him to pick her up. <laughs> My own daughter. Please, ma'am, if I can hold yourself. I've got to get help. I've got to tell the police. We interrupt this program for a bulletin on the highway murder. A waitress in Stockton and a motel clerk in Colby have both described the man as extremely tall, middle-aged, and wearing a gray mustache. His suit was a chalk stripe. Well, just a moment, ladies and gentlemen. This has just been handed me. It seems that earlier reports that he drove a blue car are now considered erroneous. 
two parking lot attendants have confirmed that the car was dark green. It was also stated green. that he wore cufflinks bearing the initials J.H. <laughs> it's cozy in a car during a storm, isn't it? I suppose they'll catch me. I understand there's a roadblock up ahead. <laughs> you won't mind if we swing off the highway, will you? presented Fed the Spider, written by Richard McCracken, directed by Ted Bell. In the cast, Vicki Vola, Ralph Camargo, Joyce Gordon, Susan Melvin, Peter Rattray, and Ivor Francis. Script editor, Jack C. Wilson. Original music by Alexander Vlastotsenko. Orchestra under the direction of Glenn Osser. Executive producer for Theater 5, Mr. Lee Bowman. We invite your comments. Write to Theater 5, New York 23, New York. That's Theater 5, New York 23, New York. This is Fred Foy speaking. This has been an ABC Radio Network production. This is Orson Welles, speaking from London. The Black Museum. Here, in a grim stone structure on the Thames, Charles of Scotland Yard, there's a warehouse of homicide where everyday objects, a simple glass, a, a piece of rope, a woman's handkerchief, all, all are touched by murder. You take this, this iron bar, it's a familiar object, the handle of a jack. If you own a car, you have a jack handle. Maybe you've used it, but never, never I trust like this. Gracie, quick, give me the jack handle. Here, let me go. What do you want? No, 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 don't kill me. No, no. Today, you will find that jack handle in the Black Museum. the annals of the Criminal Investigation Department of the London Police, we bring you the dramatic stories of the crimes recorded by the objects in Scotland Yard's Gallery of Death, the Black Museum. Museum. A few yards from here, the Thames laps at the riverside of Scotland Yard. But you never know it in here. Not in this long, dim, stone-arched room. It's a kind of mecca, a goal to be reached by students of crime and criminology the whole world over. Yes, here in this room eyes death and the mementos and souvenirs of death on these shelves in these cabinets under this well-dusted glass 
the weapons, the key clues of every homicide in which Scotland Yard has taken part for almost a hundred years. Now here, in this case, the small white box is from Edinburgh. This death was in this box. Death by poison. The death of a too importunate lover. Now this tiny pistol, it's oiled, it's in working order. A derringer, it's called. The killer wore it up his sleeve. One morning at 8 o'clock in the British tradition, the trap was sprung. The killer walked on thin air. The executioner received the customary 10 pounds. Now, now here's something more familiar, a jack handle. It's intriguing. Once according to the case book, yes, <laughs> that's the story, a day which begins innocently enough when London lived in the blackout. And many American men found their after-dark amusement in tiny hole-in-the-wall cafes. Think of me always, though we're far apart. Keep a tender memory within... Well, look around. Small tables crowded together. Not much light. Pretty stuffy. And the blackout curtains. The double blackout door. Don't help the ventilation much. The girl singing is pretty, you know tawdry sort of way, provocative in the manner of a cheap pin-up, but the two young men in the American uniforms don't seem to mind. How's about it, Tom? Not bad for a dive? Not too bad. Five will get you ten, it's out of bounds. Yeah, not yet, son. Just open. The MPs haven't cased the joint yet. Oh, good deal. Oh, nothing to worry about, kid. Well, who's worried? What can they do? Six months in the stockade, maybe? <laughs> That's okay with me. Apparently, at least one of these gentlemen is over the hill. <laughs> now, their interest has shifted, and quite naturally, of course. You think she has to sing for a living? It can't be much of a living. She's not too bad. Maybe she dates. Ah, uh, you wouldn't know what to do about it if she does. Says who? <laughs> Says me. What were you stateside, anyway? A parson's son or a school teacher? I worked in a bank. So what? I got along. I did all right. Uh, hiding in the army? Hiding in the... Oh, Maybe. Could be. I get it. Still water runs deep and all that stuff. Now, look, Teddy. What you don't know won't hurt you, see? Does that apply to Gracie? Gracie? You mean the babe? Well, who else? Grace Harwell, the London thrush, who don't sing half as good as she looks. You know her? Well, I met her a couple of times. You want a knockdown? Well, why not? Now? Well, sure. Gracie. Let's see your speed, son. You got a ringside seat. Well, Teddy, the Yank who thought he'd take Soho single-handed. Sit down, Gracie. What'll you have? My regular. Who's your friend? Oh, meet Private Tom Bennett, Gracie Harwell. Hi. Hello, soldier. Let me get your drink, Gracie. Faster that way. Hey, what about your ringside seat? I'll be back in time. That fast you can't work. Uh, Grace? Yes? Yeah. How would you like to help me win a bet? <laughs> well, this is a new approach. Good. Now, look, all I need to win is a date with you, see, for tomorrow night. Well, how about it? After the show? Do you want furlough? Maybe. Maybe not. I'll be in town tomorrow night. Got a car with petrol? No, but I will have. You say that like you meant it. I will have a car and gas. When and where? Well, I'm not saying for sure, but be outside at one o'clock in the morning. You may win your bet. <laughs> So, they met. That was the beginning. Next evening, next morning, rather, Tom was at the appointed place, complete with jeep and fuel. Hi, Gracie. Hello, soldier. Come on, climb aboard. Where'd you get it? Let's say I borrowed it. Shall we go? Why not? A boy, a girl, a jeep. In the London blackout without benefit of jerry planes and bombs. A time to relax to make an impression on the girl. The former bank clerk made his play to the girl who sang club dates on the seamy side of London. It's too bad. No moon tonight. The moon means bombers. At this point, that's not too bad. Well, that's silly. Oh, look, bombers mean there's a war on. No war, I wouldn't be here. Well, what's good about that, being here? I could itemize. One, I met you. Let's leave it at that. You start early. That's the States. Don't waste time. You didn't waste time borrowing the Jeep. What's one Jeep, more or less? I worked in the carpool. I know my way around. You must. You went back to get the car. What are you getting at, sister? The car. It's out without a pass. So are you. 
Smart girl. I know my way around. Want to sell the Jeep? I know a fellow will give you a good price. No, I need it. What for? Business. What kind of... Look out! That bike! Gee, thanks. Oh. That's no place for a bike this time of night. <laughs> nor the girl on it. What kind of business? I, uh, I have a small problem. Being out without a pass, I don't get paid. Oh. Money's necessary even in wartime. I had my ways back in L.A. Mm -hmm. Los Angeles to you. But I need a car. You get it, Gracie? Now, if you'd like a small demonstration, we can... Begin. You know, a man boasts to a girl and decides to make good the boast. This very modern variation on that theme consisted of stomping the Jeep to the side of the road, cutting the engine, waiting. Half amused, half interested, the girl sat quietly as the soldier climbed out of the car and stationed himself in the shadows. Along the road came the bicycle, the girl on it pedaling swiftly, her thoughts a thousand miles away. She drew alongside the parked, half-hidden jeep. Okay, sister, I'll take that bike. Hey, what's the idea? I've got to get home. I want that bike, you hear? Oh, I won't give it. Shut up. You want one across the mouth? Oh, no. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. You leave me alone. How was that, Gracie? And she left her bag. There ought to be a lot left in it for a couple of beers. So that's the way you do it in L.A. Yeah. You're all right, Tommy. Only next time, let's crack it for more than the price of a couple of beers. Next time was the next evening, but early before the bars closed. Gracie, the pin-up said... I won't go to work tomorrow night, and I know a spot off by itself. With a jeep, we can get away fast, like you did it in L.A. And they drove up to the spot, a small pub on a side road, and Gracie said... Let's get to it, Tommy. They've got customers. That means money in the till. But Tommy hesitated, and he said... Too many. Scared? Oh, why take chances? There might even be a cop in there. Maybe later. You promised. You said I'd be the lookout while you went in and collected. Maybe later. Not now. Well, let's do something, Tom. We'll find something. You want a thrill? We'll find something. They drove away. A well-lighted, well-populated pub was not to Tom's liking. He preferred the dark roads, the byways, the lone victims. But Gracie wanted her thrill. Tom found it for her. Hop in, miss. Oh, is it really awfully nice of you? But, Tom... I think you wanted a thrill, baby. Well, you'll get it. Where are you headed, miss? Well, out to Kingston, if it's on your way. Yeah, it's on our way. You all set? Let's go. Two girls and a boy racing along the unlighted road toward Kingston. Not much conversation. There never is with a hitchhiker in the car. Tom drove. Gracie waited. River flowed close to the highway. Black glass. Silent in the starlight. What's wrong? I think I have a flat. Oh, I didn't hear it. I said I think I have a flat. Oh. Oh, yes. It, it does feel off a bit. The jeep, I mean. Felt like the left rear. Can I help? But if you'd get out, miss. You can leave your suitcase. The tools are under your seat. Oh, of course. What can I do? I'll need the jack. The handle is on the floor, Gracie. Yeah, I've got it. You, miss. I want your handbag. What? Oh, oh no. No, no, you keep away from me. Give me that bag. Me. Oh, help, somebody. Help. Oh, no, get away from me. Get away. Get away from me. Come on, Tubby. Grab her. Drop her up. No, I won't. I won't. I... Gracie, oh. quick, give me the jack handle. Here. Let me go. What do you want? Fight back, will you? Hit her again, Tommy. Hit her. What for? She's done. We got her stuff. I think she's breathing. So what? Give me a hand. What do we do with her? Into the river. What do you suppose I picked this place for? Get her feet. Stop, then. Now, into the drink she goes. Oh, Tom. Tom. Well, did you get a thrill out of that, baby? That's the way we do it in L.A. Knock them over and dump them someplace where they won't be found. Okay, let's get going, Gracie. We got places to go and things to do tonight. Nice, clean fun. At the end of that night's work was a jack handle. A jack handle. It lies today 
in the Black Museum. In just a moment, we will continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. Continue with the Black Museum starring Orson Welles. It was to be some time before the jack handle came to rest in the Black Museum. A trail of blood and misadventure was yet to be blazed through wartime London. Tom and Grace were amateurs at crime like this. But they knew enough to cover their tracks. They ditched the jeep, parking it in a rubbed street. They took cover during daylight. But night and the blackout with their cloak as they prowl for further victims. I'm sick of walking. Does my lady want her limousine? I want a ride. Do you hear, Tommy boy? I hear. Come on, we'll duck into this vestibule. Something will be along. Give me a kiss. Oh, you never have enough. Haven't kissed a babe in a doorway since L.A. Mmm, good. What's that in your pocket? This. You like it? Shell in the chamber, full clip. Where'd you get it? Army stores, Natch. Pretty? Throw it away. Are you kidding? Do you know what they give you for carrying a pistol in this country? Well, what's the difference? We killed that dame, didn't we? They take us, it's the chair anyway. Well, over here, it's the rope. At eight o'clock in the morning. I'm cold, Tommy. I'm cold. You cold? Baby, you're the warmest thing in London. What's that, a car? Must be. Come on. Throw the pistol away. You want a ride, don't you? Hey, driver, give us a lift. He's stopping for us. Obliging fellow, isn't he? Where to, Yank? Your way, towards Shepherd's Bush. My girl's got kind of tired of walking. This is awfully nice of you. Well, a taxi, you know. Private car with hack license. I'll have to charge you for the ride. Well, we don't mind, do we, honey? We got plenty of money. Hop in. In the back. Private car with hack license. Driver James Carter. Direction east. Through the blackouts. The blue shaded headlights barely glowing in the gloom. After a little distance... Driver, we changed our minds. How much would it cost me to go a little way further? Out as far as Shepherd's Bush. Driver Carter obliged. It was his job to pick up passengers, deliver them through the blackout, wherever they wanted to go for a price. A living of sorts. Driver Carter thought of it as a living. It's plenty deserted out here. The Jerry's did a thorough job out this way. It's near the docks, isn't it? I suppose so. Well, it's a good place. Perfect. You think he's got any money? All right, driver, stop here. Yes, sir. Nothing here but the rubble. You heard me stop. You know what this is? Service pistol. You hold it, Gracie. Got it. Now don't move, driver. She's got an itchy finger. You can have my wallet. Keep him covered, Gracie, while I open the front door. Give me back the gun. Hurry, Tom. All right, you, driver, get out. On this side. You can have a car, too. Just leave me alone. Gracie, did you ever see the hole a forty-five makes in a man? No, Tommy. Never. No, God! <sighs> Big enough to put your fist through in the back where it came out. Let's toss him in the rubble. That'll do it. Now we can ride any way you want to go. It doesn't take much to kill a man. You pull the trigger... The firing pin strikes the cartridge, the powder explodes, and the bit of lead tears into the man, that's all. Nothing left but a few chemicals, which once were living flesh, a few rags of clothing. Toss it into the rubble. Dust to dust.
dawn. Dawn comes to the warring city. The sun touches the rubble. The sun moves warmly over the cold rubble over the dead. The night watchers start home. The fire wardens, weary but relieved after a quiet night, take a shortcut toward their breakfasts and a few hours sleep. Marty! Hey, what's that? Body, seems like. This area was cleared out months ago. He's fresh, that one. Yeah, let's have a look, shall we? They had their look. It wasn't pleasant. Shot! Through the chest. Stay here. I'll find a call box. The fire warden placed his call. He rang straight through to Scotland Yard. A short while later, a man picked up the telephone on his desk. Inside the Greystone building on the Thames. Inspector Mason here. Sergeant Davis, sir. Go ahead, Sergeant. The body found in the East End, sir, shot to death. Large caliber from the size of the wound, probably a service pistol. Uh -huh. Identified as yet? The identity papers are still on him, sir. James Carter, taxi driver, private car registration, tag number RD7445. Uh -huh. The car? No sign of it, sir. Tire marks in the road. To a thoroughly bombed area, sir. Very little traffic. Uh, another one. Very well. Send out the usual teletype. Description of the car. You know, check for relations, friends of the deceased. Well, that's all we can do for now. Routine. The teletype to all police stations. The constables memorize the details where they go on patrol. London is a big, sprawling city. The blackout isn't any help. That's all for now. The wheels had begun to turn. Routine, inexorable, never ending. And so, another telephone call. Constable Gray, Inspector. Yes? Ladbrook Station. I believe I have the car that was posted this morning. Uh huh. RD 7445. Black sedan. It's parked in Bush Mules. Yeah. That's a dead end, sir. It's facing out. Oh, very good, Gray. Stand by. We'll be along shortly. A sharp-eyed constable on the blackout, the park car. Routine. Inexorable. Inevitable. Cut your engine, Sergeant. This will do it. Yes, sir. Usual routine. If there's an attempt to drive out, turn on your headlights. The driver will be blinded. Very good, sir. Gray. Constable Gray. Yes, sir. Inspector Mason, CID. Anything yet? Uh, no, sir. Not yet. There's a pinhole in the blackout curtain second story window of the house behind the car. There was a light up there. Mm -hmm. yeah, nothing now. It went out a moment ago, sir. Right, take post behind the car, Gray. Accost anyone who approaches it. The area's covered. There'll be no escape. Yes, sir. The constable's footsteps fade and stop. Silence. Darkness. The trap is set. They wait. No movement, no sound. Not even the glow of a cigarette. Just darker shadows in the darkness. In the depths of the little muse, a door opens and closes. Footsteps briefly. Two pairs of footsteps. A car door opens. And Constable Gray calls out. Don't start the engine there. You're under arrest. Sergeant, your lights. Tommy, the coppers. They got us boxed. Gray, you won't take me. Hold him, Gray. Got him, son. <laughs> you got nothing on me. Never mind that. It's my duty to inform you that you're under arrest. You'll be charged with murder. And I warn you that anything you say will be taken down in writing and may be used in evidence. You can't prove anything. Run the rule on it, Constable. Yes, sir. Uh, this, sir, service pistol. Oh, good enough. Take them along. All right, you two. Don't touch me. I'll go along. He made me go with him. He threatened me with a pistol. He made me go along. <laughs> That was her cry, all through the trial which followed swiftly. That was the plea of the tawdry little pin-up from the seamy side of London. He made me do it. He hit me, showed me his pistol. He made me do it. What of the robberies, the cheap, shilling-sized robberies? Yes, I took that girl's purse. I went through the driver's wallet before, before we left his body, but he made me do it. You've got to believe me. He made me do it. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> there were other far less hysterical witnesses, men who spoke with a calm certainty of truth. There was the ballistics expert. Uh, there is absolutely no doubt. The bullet which killed James Carter, the driver of that hired car, uh, was found in the flooring of the car. We have compared it with test bullets fired from the pistol found on the accused. The rifling marks are identical. The death bullet was fired from that pistol. Tom Bennett, accused of murder, wanted for desertion by the United States Army, former bank clerk. He played his role defiantly. I tell you, she's framing me. This whole deal was her idea. You should have seen the bang she got when she watched what was going on. Now she's trying to pass the buck to me. And with customary thoroughness, Scotland Yard turned up a surprise witness. Yes, those are the two. She gave him the jack handle and he hit me with it. They threw me in the river. The lorry driver found me. I know them anywhere. He made me go along. He made me. I'll prove it. I'll show you where we left the jeep. The jack handle's still in it. Gentlemen of the jury, have you reached a verdict? We have, my lord. Let the prisoners face the jury. What is your verdict? We find both defendants guilty of murder and add a recommendation of mercy for the female prisoner. Oh, yes, juries behave somewhat strangely at times. This one was impressed with a plea of compulsion, but not quite enough, it seems, to acquit Grace Harwell. Thus, it came about in due course that the judge pronounced the sentence. Thomas Bennett, you have been found guilty of murder. The sentence of the court is that you be hanged by the neck until you are dead. And then may the Lord have mercy on your soul. On Grace Harwell, the judge pronounced the same terrible sentence. But the jury's recommendation for mercy led the Home Secretary to commute this to penal servitude for life. A lifetime for Grace Harwell to remember. He made me go along. He made me go along. No, Jack Handel. It lies today in the Black Museum. So much for the story of Grace and Tom. Tom's life ended on the scaffold. The life of Grace Harwell continues in the drab monotony of Holloway Prison. The service pistol, of course, and the jack handle remain in their places, their special places of honor, on a shelf in that curious room which is known in Scotland Yard as the Black Museum. And now, until next time, till we meet again in the same place, and I tell you another story of the Black Museum, I remain as always obedient for yours. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. There's an old Scottish song that goes... Oh, it's nice to get up in the morning. But it's nicer to lie in bed. 
Of course, when you get up in the morning depends very much on what you have to do during the day ahead. And if what you have to do, for example, is concerned with murder, then you had better get up very early indeed. Or perhaps you'd better not go to bed at all. Mystery drama, Room 418, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Michael Tolan. And the best and the worst of this is that neither of us is to blame. If you have forgotten my kisses... I have forgotten your name. Now, there's a poet who lays it on the line. None of this sloppy sentimentality about love that is eternal, undying, everlasting. No, sir. Like everything else, love comes, love goes. It has its day or its night. And then, well... Forever was yesterday. Of course, there are those people who have better memories than others. They have problems. Where to, pal? Mister, where are we headed? Huh? Uh, the International Hotel. We're off. Yeah, I rejoice to say that you're going to be the last of the Mohicans. The what? <laughs> it's a figure of speech. That was the last plane into the airport. This is going to be my last trip. You're going to be my last fare. <sighs> I want to tell you it's been a day. You don't know what's been going on here all week with this kind of snow and the airport's really jumping. Uh, how are things back in the big city? Uh, I beg your pardon? Nothing, nothing. Just making talk. You don't feel like gabbing? That's okay. Thank you. Hey, uh, didn't you ride with me before... Uh, I beg your pardon? It's just I thought I'd, I'd seen you. Seen me? Yeah. Wasn't you in my cab maybe just the other day? No, that's impossible. I've never been here before. Yeah. Must have been two other guys. Yeah. Oh, hey, let me ask you something. You want the American plan? Excuse me? All the restaurants near the slopes. They're jammed. Best bets to eat at the hotel. Does it say American plan on your reservation? I, uh, I haven't thought about it. I don't have a reservation. What? what did you say? You don't have a reservation? No. Then what do you go to the International Hotel for? I would assume they have some sort of accommodation. <laughs> Why are we stopping? Pal, it's a $10 ride out there, plus the tip. And? You're throwing your money away. Oh, surely they must have something. Take it from me. They got nothing. You want to get a night's sleep? Your best bet is to stretch out in the lounge back at the airport. Let's go on. I'll take a chance. There's always an empty room somewhere. Not this weekend. Well, don't worry about it. Why should I worry? I got a place to sleep. Sorry. Are you sure? Positive. Why, why don't you look again? It doesn't matter how many times I look. Oh, surely you must have some kind of room. Don't have a thing in the house. Uh, Gloria. Gloria Svetic? That's what it says on your name tag? Well, at least you can read. We don't have any rooms. Let me see. Your eyes are blue, but I think they turn green when you're telling a lie. Now, isn't it a fact that hotels always hold a certain percentage of rooms in reserve? It sure is, and we already rented ours. <laughs> Gloria, I hate to say this. Then don't. But I don't believe you. Have it your way. Oh, I'm sorry. I, I, I shouldn't have said that. You're right. You shouldn't have. Ah, it was such a long trip, and now I... I don't know what to do. Well, between you and me, what you should have done was made a reservation before you came up to the most crowded resort in the state at the height of now, the season. Now, teacher, don't wrap my knuckles. The problem is, what do I do now? I don't know. There's not another plane out of here till 8 o'clock in the morning. Oh, well, what do the Eskimos do? Oh, I understand they build a little shelter out of snow. It's supposed to be quite warm. Well, you could do that. 
Or you might try that red couch in the lobby. It isn't too bad. Hi. Huh? Oh, it's you. Uh, were you asleep? Well, uh, not exactly. You want a cup of coffee? Thanks. What, uh, what time is it? A uh, quarter after twelve. Oh, it's gonna be a long night. You know, you look familiar. Do I? I am sure I've seen you before, and, and it was recent. Where? Up here. <laughs> no, that couldn't be. Why not? This is my first trip. Well, I guess I could be wrong, but I like to think I never forget a face. If we'd met before, I'm sure I'd remember. What made you come up to this place just like that? No, it was just one of those spur-of-the-moment things. Are you a spur-of-the-moment person? I suppose you could say that. <laughs> it just about sums me up. Really? Yeah, and I suppose that's one of the things that... That, uh... That what? That she found so, uh... So... That she didn't like? <sighs> yeah. But that's something I really shouldn't talk about. Oh, sure, sure. But between you and me, if you was to walk in here with her, I'm assuming you're referring to your wife or your girlfriend, I would know it. You'd know what? I would know there's something about you that she didn't like. How would you know? Hotel people know. You can tell a lot about a person just by the way they walk across the lobby. Tone of their voice when they ask for the key. A million things. You'd be surprised how people give themselves away. Really? Have I uh, given myself away? Yeah. You gave away certain things. Did I? Definitely. To begin with, you're spoiled. Oh, am I? Mm -hmm. You're spoiled by a lot of women. What makes you say that? Because you're so handsome. Do you think I'm handsome? Sure. Listen, you're the kind of fellow who relies on his good looks to get him through. All your life, people have kind of petted you and coddled you and made things easy. I had no idea what I was getting into. Listen, we live in a world where good-looking people are always being catered to. So, after a while, a fellow like you, he begins to believe maybe he's leading a charmed life. <laughs> yeah, maybe. After a while. You begin to believe nothing really bad could ever happen. Everything will turn out okay in the end. Somebody's going to come along and you can sweep them off their feet. Hey, now you may be pushing it just uh, a little bit. Am I? Isn't that why you came barging in here without a reservation? Didn't you think that would turn out okay in the end also? <laughs> well, I must admit you got me pegged. I thought I could sweet talk my way into a room, especially if there was a girl behind the desk. But it seems I didn't score. Maybe you did score, just a little. Not the bullseye, but somewhere on the target. Really? There might be a room, an empty room. You, uh, you mean it just opened up? No, it's been empty a while. Gloria, do you mean that all this time you've been telling me you have no space, you actually did have a vacant room? I didn't say the room was vacant, I said it was empty. Oh, there's a difference? Well, sure. When you got a vacant room, it means it hasn't been rented out to anybody. When you got an empty room, it means there's nobody in it. Well, I still don't see the difference. Look, last night, this woman, she checked in. And, uh, well, nobody's seen her since. What do you mean? Nobody's seen her. She hasn't been around here all day. Well, where could she have gone? Well, nowhere except the slope. And she'd have to show her hotel pass to get on the lift. Well, maybe nobody remembers seeing her. No, she never went there. She never picked up her pass. It's still at the desk. And she never checked in with the dining room head waiter to get assigned to a table, either. And into the bargain, the maid says the bed hasn't been slept in. Well, what could have happened? Well, I think she skipped. Why? I think she was scared. Oh, how do you know? Well, to start, she gave a phony name when she registered. How could you tell? Experience. You know, by the way they pronounce it, by the way they hesitate while they write it. What, uh, what name did she give you? Elizabeth Faraday. Elizabeth Faraday. Well, you know her? No. Uh, she's one scared cookie, this Elizabeth Faraday, or whatever her name was. Anyway, here's what I'm getting at. She didn't use the room last night, and she hasn't been seen around all day. Here it is past midnight. So? So, do you want to rent me the room? Oh, can't do it. It's legally hers. She paid for it. What I mean is, the room's going to waste, and you need a place to sleep. 
I understand. But if she comes back, which I don't think she ever will, but if she does, you've got to get out of there. <laughs> I know. So what do you got to lose? Here's the spare key. Go ahead. It's room 418. Well, what if she comes back and makes a fuss? Won't the manager hold you responsible? <laughs> don't worry. He can't fire me. I got too much on him. Uh, by the way, what's your name? Uh, George. George Andrews. George Andrews, huh? Yeah. Well, I guess that's as good a name as any. What do you mean? Forget it. What are you... What are you doing up here, George? Well, I came up to go skiing, naturally. Naturally? Where's your luggage? My my luggage? Oh, uh... Yeah. I left it at the airport. I was in such a hurry to get a cab and get oh, here. Oh, sure, sure. No, I mean it. It's probably still at the baggage claim. First thing in the morning, hey, I'll get look, out... look, look. It's, uh, your business. <laughs> I admit, I, uh... I didn't come up here to ski. You did? No, I came here because I'm, uh... I'm looking for someone, and... Well, she... Oh, say no more. You figure you'll run into her in a place like this, huh? Yeah, that's it. I... I'm, uh, I'm hoping to. Well... Good luck. Thanks. And have a good night's sleep. I really appreciate this. Thank you again. Oh, don't thank me. Thank those big blue eyes. Uh, hello. Chester, it's me. Listen, Chester. Where are you? I found her. You what? I know where she is. But you said she wouldn't give you the money. I know, I know. That was yesterday. Well, what, what happened to change the picture? I'm going to change the picture. What do you mean? I'll convince her logically that it's in everybody's best interest for her to give me the money. After all, it is my money. But you said yesterday she turned you down for good. Look, just have faith in me, Chester. Kent, the wolves are closing in on me. Everything's going to be all right. Where are you? Trust me. I'll talk to you in the morning. Good night. But, Kent, I've got... Yeah, in the morning. If it ever comes. Uh... Desk? Uh, hello. I uh, hope I didn't wake you. How could you wake me? I'm on duty. What I really wanted to know... What time is it? You don't want to know what time it is. <laughs> I do, really. It's a quarter after one. Oh. Yeah. Why don't you turn to Channel 8? That's radio music. Very nice. That'll put you to sleep, all right? Well, thanks. Um, <laughs> good night. Good night, George. Who's there? Who? Who's that? All right. Who? Can it be the elusive Elizabeth Faraday? If so, where has she been? Why has she returned? Well, we know why. She still has possession of the room. But why now? And why so late? Of course, we're working on the supposition that this is indeed Elizabeth Faraday. It might be, it might not be. In any event, this development is certain to disturb the sleeping arrangements for our Mr. George Andrews. Or is his name Kent? We need Act Two for these and other answers. a stranger, and ye took me in. Hospitality, one of the oldest of the virtues, 
and one of the earliest signs of civilization. To shelter, to feed, to protect the stranger, to keep him safe from the perils of nature, and to guard him against the dangerous designs of his enemies. Ah, yes. What could be a more noble and generous act? It's too bad you have to be so careful about doing it these days. Who? Who's that? It's me, Kent. Elizabeth. Yes, Elizabeth. What do you want, Kent? Please, Elizabeth, don't... Don't be sharp with me. Don't be sharp with you. After what you did to me? I'm... I'm sorry, Liza. And don't call me Liza. I hate it. I'm, I'm sorry. It makes me sound like a dizzy, flighty little kook. I'm... I'm sorry. And stop saying you're sorry. Liza. Uh... Elizabeth. What do you want? I... I want to tell you that I'm... Well, I have to use that word. I'm sorry. Are you? Yes. That really does me a lot of good, doesn't it? Elizabeth, you have to believe me. No. I'm in a position now where I don't have to do anything. Elizabeth. Why did you come back here? Why? Oh, I, I couldn't believe what had happened. Why is it so hard to believe? Because... Because murder... What about murder, Kent? I'm not the kind of man who would commit murder. You're not? No. No, where do I come to murder? Murder is committed by by those people you read about in the newspapers, not, not people like me. I wish I could feel sorry for you. That's why I came back. I, I couldn't believe that I could... I came up here yesterday and... and I managed to find you. I'd rather we didn't talk about yesterday, Kent. No, please hear me out. I... I couldn't believe that I was able to come up to your room without being seen by anyone and just... just kill you. And hide your body in the closet. It's... it's hard to believe. Do you want to look in the closet, Ken? No, no. Go ahead. Look. No, Elizabeth, please, don't... don't ask me to do that. Nobody's looked in the closet yet? It's a pretty sloppy hotel. A lot of glitter and polish on the outside... But I think they just shove the dirt under the rugs. Elizabeth, I want... The maid just poked her head in the door this morning. She saw the room was still made up. She didn't even bother to come in. Of course, sooner or later, somebody's going to look in that closet. Elizabeth, I'm trying They'll to... You have to. I, I couldn't believe I did it. And nobody heard the shot. You had the noise of the crowd. Friday, it's a mob scene around here. Everywhere. The airport... People pile into the cabs. They swarm all over the hotel. You had the crowd on your side, Kent. All the music and the party. Elizabeth, I don't want to believe it. I don't think that matters anymore. I can't live with it. It's it's too much. Nothing's too much. As long as you're alive, anything at all beats being dead. Elizabeth, I... I want to undo it. You can't undo murder. After I... After I did it, I walked downstairs. I, I lost myself in the crowd in the lobby. There were busloads of people bound for the airport. I crowded in with them. I got there. I was going to take a plane back home, but... I... I couldn't. Poor Kent. You should have gone back to the city. I'm telling you, I couldn't. You should have gotten rid of the gun. I know. You did get rid of it, didn't you? I, uh... No. No, I still have it. <laughs> You're being stupid. Oh, the whole thing is stupid. I didn't mean to kill you. Then why did you have the gun? Oh, what's the use? The thing for you to do is to get out of here. Go back to the city. Oh, and make sure you have an alibi. Your friend Chester will be waiting to lie for you. It's the least he can do. And then, when they find out about me, he'll be in the clear. What are you saying? Do you want me to... to get away with it? Huh. <laughs> I should think you'd want to see me caught and punished. Now, that's the difference between us. You're alive. I'm dead. So many of the things that seem important to you, like revenge, no longer have any meaning for me. 
Don't you want me to pay for what I did to you? I don't even think about those things anymore. Are you going to answer it? I, uh... Yeah. Hello? Good morning, George. Oh, yes, it... It is morning. It finally came. It always does. It's 6.30. 6.30? Well, didn't you tell me you came up here to look for a certain person? Uh... Oh, yes, yes, that's right, I did. Well, everybody gets up early. Breakfast at 7, they're off to the slope by 8 o'clock. Yeah. So, unless you're down here early, you might miss her. Well... Thank you. Thank you very much. What's this uh, little intrigue you have going on with the girl at the desk? I had to tell her something. And I'm sure you told it to her with that certain twinkle in your eye and that soft, caressing tone in your voice. (sighs) That's your trouble. You were always insanely jealous. I wouldn't say insanely. I always had good cause. (laughs) And you're still jealous. No. That's gone now. Along with everything else. Elizabeth, listen to me. You'd better go downstairs. That girl at the desk is waiting for you. I don't care you. about that You'd girl. You'd better. She can hang you. She what? Kent. Oh, poor Kent. You don't realize it yet. When they find out I'm dead... Don't say not that. Not just dead, but murdered, you're going to need an alibi... You'll have to prove you weren't here. But once your picture gets into the paper... I don't care. You'd better. Or they may have to bring you up here to identify what used to be my body. Don't talk like that. If she wants to remember you were here all the time... Elizabeth, you're going to listen to what I have to say. Go down and have breakfast with her. I'm not hungry. You owe it to her, Kent. She's a smart girl. She knows there could never be anything serious. Not with someone like you. But you fascinate her. And she likes to toy with the idea. Elizabeth, I came here so that we could... We could understand something. I understand everything. It's one of the few advantages of my present state. Go downstairs for breakfast. Suppose I do that and I come back... And you'll be gone. I'll still be here. Unless someone looks in the closet. Don't say that. And there's no danger of anyone doing that. Till just about noontime. I told you. The service here leaves a lot to be desired. Elizabeth... Go downstairs, Kent, before she becomes curious and comes up here. You can see how jammed it is, huh? Uh, Yeah. You uh, seen the person you're looking for? Uh, no, no. You're in trouble, aren't you, George? What makes you say that? It's true, isn't it? No. Well, uh, yes, I suppose so. I knew it. I knew it the second you walked in last night. I could tell. How? It was written all over you. How bad is it? Look, come on, I want to help you. Do you? Really? Yes. Why? Why should you want to help me? Because... Because you like me? Yeah, I guess you could say, like. What do you know about me? I know you've got very deep blue eyes. <laughs> That's enough for you? It's enough for most women. I don't care what they tell you. It's enough. You, uh... You're a wonderful person, Gloria. How many times have you looked into a girl's eyes and said that? Well, well I guess... all right. What's the difference? It works. Now, let me help you, George. How? I don't know, but... Whatever it is you need, I'll try. You're running away, aren't you? Why do you say that? Well, you're here without a reservation, without luggage. It looks as if you had to leave wherever you were in a hurry. No, it it wasn't exactly like that. Look, George, I have a place, a nice little place. My folks left it to me. It's on the other side of the lake. No one ever comes around. Nobody could ever find you there. It's yours for as long as you need it. Thank you, Gloria, but... But uh... nothing... And I could do the cooking. I'm really a great cook. I'm sure you are. So? What do you say? I, um... Oh, come on, George. You look so serious. How bad can it be? How bad? It's money, isn't it? Yes, it's money. Well, then it can't be too serious. <laughs> it's serious enough. Ah, oh, yeah, but you get yourself a good lawyer, then once you're in the courtroom, you turn on the charm. You know what I mean. Yeah, I know. You'll see. It'll all work out eventually. 
You think so? And I'll help you all I can. I'm really not good enough for you. That's true. But you can't help being what you are, and I can't help being the way I am, and that's the way it goes. But you'll help me. Yeah. I'll help you. Thank you. <laughs> Seems to me that all I've been doing since we met is, is thanking you. I... I'm going to need you. I'll be with you all the way. No matter what I did? Sure. That is, unless maybe you murdered somebody. <laughs> but there's no danger of that. I can look in your eyes and I can see you're no killer. So much for woman's intuition. What do you think of our hero, or more accurately, our central character now? Well, leaving morality and ethics out of it, you always have to have at least grudging admiration for a master in any field. Obviously, our boy has written the book on how to attract women. Yes, indeed. It seems he can always bring them around, even after they're dead. The late wife... The new girlfriend. Do we have here what the French would call a menage à trois? You can never tell what we have until you've lived through Act Three. a triangle. Triangles in geometry are usually neat in shape with properties that follow strict mathematical rules. On the other hand, there are those triangles which exist among human beings, in which case there are no holes barred. We have a pretty good triangle going for us here, and while it might completely mystify Mr. Euclid, it would pose no problem at all to Mr. Freud. Look, you didn't kill someone, did you, George? <laughs> no, of course not. Good. So, do you want to come out to my place? It's, it's wonderful of you to offer, Glory. Look, I know that you're in a jam, and you're kind of upset. And maybe you can't think too clearly. No, I... I'm, I'm all right. Which is another reason why you should get away. In the condition you're in, you might say or do something that, uh, well... Maybe, maybe you're right. Then you come? Yes. Ah, I'm finished here now, so come with me. We'll get in my car. What, now? Like they say, there's no time like the present. No, no, wait. Why? There's, uh, there's something I have to do. What? It's important. It, it's very important. Well, okay. No, I, I just have to do this... This one thing. Hurry back, honey. I'll be waiting. Elizabeth? Yes. Huh. There's... There's something we have to straighten out. It's... It, it's important. It must be. You're letting it delay your little romantic rendezvous. What rendezvous? A little cabin on the lake with Gloria. Oh, oh, that. I I didn't even know what I was saying. You know something? I think you're telling the truth. I've always told you the truth. No. This is just one of those rare occasions. You see a pretty girl or even one who isn't so pretty. And you have to show off your technique. That isn't fair. But it's true. All those affairs of yours can't. I don't believe you really enjoyed them. They were just reflex actions. This girl, Gloria, you don't even like her. Elizabeth, I didn't come here to discuss... She doesn't have the kind of regular features you go for, the classical profile. She's not as beautiful as you are, Elizabeth. That we know. But as I say, you can't help yourself. Will you forget about that girl? Why not? I've forgotten about all the others. It's just that you always have to have a little affair going. Yes, even at a time like this. Even when you've come back here to ask me such an important question. Then you... then you know what I want you to do. Oh, yes. 
But it can't be done. Don't say that. If it were possible for me to feel sorry, I would say I'm sorry. But it has to be done. Why? Because handsome Kent Faraday wants it that way. Because Kent Faraday always gets what he wants. Elizabeth, if you only she knew... said she'd stay with you no matter what you did. Unless it was murder. But if you play her right, she'll hold still even for that. Elizabeth, I don't want to talk about her. Go with her. Be with her. Make love to her. The way only Kent Faraday knows how. Then she'll never want to give you up. Then she'll protect you. She'll lie. She'll cheat. She'll steal. <laughs> Ask me. I know. Go to her now. Before it's too late. I, I want to talk about you and me. There is no more you and me. If they discover the murder now, she'll drop you. You see, she won't have a chance to find out what she'd be missing. That's her now. Answer it. I want to talk to you. You're keeping her waiting. Uh, yeah, hello? Honey, you okay? Uh, yeah, yeah. You sure? I'm fine, just fine. What's keeping you up there? Um, I'll be down soon. Just between you and me, it's such a great day. And are we going to enjoy it? <laughs> you bet. Honey? What? What is it? Did anyone ever tell you how blue your eyes are? Uh, yeah. Yeah, I'll see you right away. Blue eyes, you're just wasting your time here with me. Elizabeth. And you're also risking your life. Listen to me, will you? We... We have to undo it. Why do you persist in such a ridiculous... It has to be. I, I didn't want to kill you. You did. I'm dead. And I'm gone. No, no, it isn't true. Isn't it? Just open the closet door. You'll see me. I'm still propped up against the wall, just as you left me. Elizabeth. I have two bullet holes in my breast. Please. Did you have to shoot me twice? I... I didn't know what I was doing. Yes, you did. But you don't believe I'm dead. If you're dead, how... How can I talk to you? How is it I can see you? My being dead doesn't mean you can no longer see me or that you can't talk to me. Not at all. Elizabeth, after I... After I pulled the trigger, I... I prayed. No. After you pulled the trigger, you pulled it again. Remember? I prayed on my knees. I, I prayed with all my heart. Poor Ken. I prayed, give me another chance, a second chance. Did you? Just give me a chance to come here and see her again, talk to her again. Why should she die? Because I was greedy and stupid. There is no second chance. There has to be. You would do it again, the same way. Oh, no. No, that isn't true. You still need the money, don't you? Well, yes. You'd still have to come to me for it. And I'd still refuse. You see, you'd have to kill me. That's why you're not getting a second chance. I wouldn't kill you. You mean you'd go back? You'd face the music? Maybe even spend a year or two in jail? I wouldn't have to. The case against you is pretty strong. I know, but I'd... I'd have the money to pay off. Where would you get it? Where, Kent? You'd give it to me. Oh, no. I refused. That's why you killed me, remember? This time I wouldn't have to kill you. I still would refuse. No, you wouldn't. You see, Elizabeth, I... I would convince you. No, Kent. Never. I would. Believe me, I would. That won't work. You see... The way I am now, that sort of thing doesn't exist for me anymore. Elizabeth, you fell in love with me once. You can't deny it. No. Think back. Remember how it was the first few years? Just you and me. How much in love we were. We were, weren't we? Are you afraid to answer? No. No, I'm not afraid. Look in my eyes. And tell me. Tell me we were in love. It's the truth, isn't it? Yes. Then say it. Why are you afraid to say it? We... We were in love. Yes. 
Maybe I forgot to grow up. Maybe I remained a child too long. But you enjoyed the fun, too, didn't you? Yes. The nights we had? All over the world? Everything I've done up till now was the action of a spoiled, immature kid. But I've... I've grown up suddenly. Have you? When I fired those two shots, it was as if something had exploded in my brain. There was a great flash, and I saw everything. Everything I've ever done wrong in my entire lifetime. It was a long list. I'm different now. I'm the man you always wanted me to be. Are you? Yes, darling. Yes. How do you account for Gloria downstairs? Oh, you said it yourself. It was a... It was a reflex action. She means absolutely nothing to me. None of them ever meant anything to me. You know that, darling. From now on, everything's going to be wonderful. Is it? I love you so much. And you love me. You do. Oh, you're angry. You have every right to be. I deserve every bit of that anger, but, dearest, that's in the past. It's gone. The bad things are gone. Are oh, they, Kent? Really? Yes. And I'll tell you something. Our love will be better, greater, stronger, because it will have weathered this, this awful storm. And that's why I've come to ask you for money. Money? I, I've come to you for money before, Elizabeth. I've, I've squandered your inheritance. And I know you're down to the last of it. I wouldn't ask if it were just another get-rich-quick scheme. No, it's, it's different this time. Different? I want to wipe the slate clean. Start all over. I'll take a teaching job. Will you? Yes. It's really all I ever wanted to do. It was the happiest time of our life. Wasn't it? Yes, it was. Those days will come back again. We can bring them back. Can we, Kent? We'll not only bring them back, but we'll... We'll keep them for ourselves, always. Hello? Uh, yeah. I'm waiting. You're going to be much longer? Uh, no, no. Well, hurry up. The day's getting away. Yeah, sure thing. Look, darling. If you write out a check, I can take it downstairs to the desk and have it go out in the morning mail. Kent? And that way Chester can pay everyone off. Uh, Kent, uh, who was on the phone? Uh, that was the airport. The, uh, airport? Yeah, they wanted to tell me they had space available for this afternoon if I needed it. Look, I sent Chester the check. Special delivery, and he... Oh. Uh, does Gloria work at the airport now? What? Oh, Kent. For a moment, just for a split second, I believed you. Elizabeth. I'm dead. I should know better. You're not dead. You're, you're standing here. You're talking to me. Despite it all, I believed you. It's a line I heard before, yet I... I believed you. Look, don't you understand? If I don't get that money, I'll go to jail. I understand. I understood it the first time. When you shot me. I have to have the money. Even if I wanted to give it to you, I couldn't. I don't have any more. What? You said it yourself. You said you squandered by inheritance. Something has to be left. Nothing. I won't go to jail. I would die there. I'm sorry. Wait. Wait. The the insurance. You're insured. Kent. Who would know I did it? When they find your body, I'll be gone. Kent, you asked for a second chance. Don't you see what you're doing? You've got the insurance, and it's on your life. And I'm the beneficiary. Don't do that, Kent. I have to do it. Don't you understand? Don't shoot. You can't kill me again. I don't have any choice. No. Oh, I... I've got to get out of here. Those were shots! Somebody fired a gun! Hey, open up in there! Somebody call the cops! What? What happened in here? George, what happened? Go ahead, Kent. Tell her what happened. What are you doing with that gun? Why don't you tell her? Look. Look in the closet. Oh. 
You. Murderer. Murderer. Gloria. Oh, yes. Gloria. Let's see you talk your way out of this one. Blue eyes. Well, he tried to. And he was very sincere and earnest. And he was really speaking from the bottom of his heart. But I don't think the jury was really listening. I suppose it all goes back to that old saying, while there's life, there's hope. Which, in this case, would mean that while a woman's alive, you always have a chance to fool her. But once she's dead, well... She's just too smart for you. I'll be back shortly. Once again, we are confronted by the eternal questions to which there never seem to be any answers. Where do we come from? Where do we go? Well, it's been said by some that the journey is planned, the course has been charted, and the path has been marked. And there cannot even be the slightest deviation in our fate. Of course, there are also those who insist that there is no plan, no chart. Indeed, there isn't even any fate. Who to believe? Well, we make out a pretty good case for both sides each time we meet. Our cast included Michael Tolan, Terry Keene, Carol Titel, and Nat Polin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Cows bedded down for the night. Yeah. Oh, Hank, come over here a minute, would you? Sure. Something wrong? Yeah. The cow here seems to have hurt herself. It's like a barbed wire cut. Let's have a look. Yeah, you're right. It does look like barbed wire. There's no barbed wire where this animal's been. Only wire like that on your property, Mr. Fuller, is over south of the road. Yeah, that's right. This animal hasn't been in the south pastures for months. She's one of the animals I'm keeping up near the barn, grooming for the stock show next month. Yeah, I I know she is. You haven't let her get out accidentally, have you, Hank? Me? Well, I know, Mr. Fuller. You sure, Hank? Yes, sir. You said you want all animals you brought in off the range kept inside the wooden fences. <laughs> You're the boss. I wouldn't let any of them near any barbed wire. It's mighty funny. Can't figure out no other way she could have hurt her leg like that. Me neither. They're pretty bad, too. Deep. Yeah, it is. And I'll never be able to show her with a leg like this. Well, sure too bad, Mr. Fuller. She's a nice animal, too. Yeah, one of the best. 
was counting on her boosting my score at the show. Say, you don't suppose McCarg could have done it, do you? McCarg? Sure. He's pretty hard hit for good show animals this year. Had to sell off quite a few to pay his mortgage and meet the taxes. I know, but McCarg's always been a good friend of mine. He wouldn't do a thing like that. Well, he might. He thought it might help him at the stock show. Needs that prize money pretty bad. But McCarg's a stock raiser from way back. He couldn't hurt a prize animal if he had to. Funny thing, what some men will do for money, Mr. Fuller. Look, Hank. I won't have you talking like that. Well, I was just saying that... McCarg's a good friend of mine. I've done him several favors lately. He wouldn't repay me by injuring one of my animals. Well, all I know is she couldn't have cut her leg like that around the corral. Looks to me like it was done purposely. Here, better clean out that cut and wrap it up. Yeah. Fetch me that disinfectant and some of those clean rags from the chest, Hank. Sure. Here's some right over here. Hmm? In the stall? Yeah, here on this shelf. What are they doing here? Well, I, I don't know. Well, this bottle's always kept in the chest at the end of the barn. Marsh, have you been treating this animal? No, I... I mean, uh, I didn't know she was hurt till you told me. Some other animal then? No, of course not. Didn't you inspect them all tonight? Yeah, I did. This is the only cow that's hurt. But what's this disinfectant and these clean rags doing here? Well, I... I just don't know, Mr. Fuller. I put that bottle away myself last week. I treated a horse. I haven't used it since. I haven't used it more than a month, I guess. Somebody did injure this animal. Then tried to treat it here in its stall. He must have been frightened away before he could use the medicine. But who'd purposely cut its leg and then try to treat it? I don't know. No. Neither do I. Wait a minute. Huh? What's this? Look. Look here. What? It's a short link of barbed wire. With blood on it. I Ned, you're right. It was hidden under the straw. I just happened to pick it up with my foot. Must have been in that last load of straw we brought in. She must have laid down on it and cut her leg. Uh, not that deep. Hank, there's been dirty work around here. Here, hold these rags. Fix up this leg. Yeah, sure. Yeah. Easy now, girl. Yeah, just take it easy. You better stand back, Hank. She's about to get a little excited when... Hank. What's the idea? Don't move, Mr. Fuller. A gun. Put it away, Hank. Not on your life. Lucky for me, your foot didn't kick it up from the straw, too. You. You did this. I don't deny it. Yes, I injured the animal. I hid the barbed wire beneath the straw and this gun, too, to make it handy. Hank. And I put the disinfectant here in the stall so you'd work on the cut. And I'd have you right here where I want you. Hank, why? 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 You mean you don't know? I certainly don't. Because you won't give Martha what she wants. Martha? Your wife, Mrs. Fuller. Won't give her what she wants. Divorce. Divorce? Now, stop your pretending. Why, she's never asked me for a divorce. She has a dozen times. What makes you think so? She told me. Told you? I told you to stop pretending. You know she wants to marry me. What? Don't act so amazed. I am amazed. I'm glad to know about this. You've known about it for a long time. And I assure you that I haven't. It's no good acting that way, Mr. Fuller. You've had a lot of fun, haven't you? Letting me go on like this, working for you for peanuts, calling you mister, doing all your dirty work around the farm. You've been well paid. I've never asked you to do anything that I wouldn't do myself. Well, I'm putting an end to all of it right now. Hey, give me that gun. Not on your life. You can't shoot me in cold blood. They'll get you. Not me. They'll never know. When they find me with a bullet in me, Hank... They'll never find a bullet in you. They'll never bother to look for one. Don't you remember this cow? Take a good look at her. You remember last fall when McCard's shotgun accidentally went off near her? How she almost trampled him to death? Hank, no. One shot, fella, through your heart. By the time that animal's hoofs have done their work... No, Marsh, no. They'll never recognize you when they pull you out of her stall. You can't do that. They'll never bother to look for a bullet. Listen to me, Hank. They'll think your gun went off accidentally and the animal trampled you to death. Give me that gun, Hank. And the farm will be Martha's and mine. Give it to me, Hank. Keep back. Give it to me. Keep back, I say. Take this. Oh! Ah! 
my eyes. You blinded me. Take it easy, you yellow pup. Your eyes will be all right. Water. Water, get me some water. My eyes are stinging. They'll be all right. Come on with me. I can't see. Here, this way. What are you going to do? I'm going to take you to the well and bathe your eyes. You're not going to kill me. Careful. Here's the barn door. I... I didn't know what I was doing, Mr. Fuller. Easy now. I... I didn't know what I was doing. I didn't want to kill you. You only missed killing me by a hair's breadth. Oh. I was out of my head. Oh. My eyes. We'll talk about that later. Where are we? Where are you taking me? Over to the well. Mr. Fuller. What in the name of heaven are you going to do to me? I'm going to wash out your eyes. Come on now. Yes. Water. Easy now. No, don't rub them. Keep your hands away from your filthy face. But I can't stand this pain. You'll be all right in a minute. I can't stand it. I tell you, I can't stand it. Marsh. Let go of me. You're taking me off to leave me someplace to die. Stop it. Stop it. Now you're trying to kill me. No, I'm not trying to kill you. You are. I know you are. Don't be a fool. I'm blind. Sure. Sure, this is your chance. Chance to get rid of me. Well, you're not going to do it. Hank, for the love of heaven, listen to me. No! I'm only taking you to the well. Throw me in, huh? You want to throw me in? I want to wash out those eyes. No. You don't care about me. All you want is a chance to do away with me. No, you rat. I'm only trying to help you. Let go go my arm. Let go my arm. No, you're staying with me. I won't do it. Be led like an animal to the slaughter. Let go of me. Stop it. Let go of my arm. We're almost to the well now. Oh. 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 My eyes. No, water will fix them up. I'm not going near that well. That disinfectant will burn those eye tissues if you don't get it washed out of them. I won't. You're going to throw me in. I won't go near that well. Hank. I don't. I won't go near it. I don't go near it. Hey, no. <laughs> Oh, oh, I... Now, oh. get up on your feet. Come over to the well and get your eyes washed out. Oh. Now keep your head. Oh, my eyes. Here now. You bend over this water trough. Come on, bend lower. Mr. Fuller. Come on now. Get oh. plenty of this cold water into your eyes. That's like it. Oh. A little more. Uh, here. Use this cloth. Soak it with water. Uh, yeah. All right. Yeah. Lucky that was just a mild disinfectant. Oh. Won't bother you any. I'll put that up to your eyes. Oh. That's it. Now, can you open your eyes? Uh, I don't know. Well, try. Yeah. Feel better? Uh-huh. Burns easing up. Yeah, let's see him. Yeah. Just inflamed a little. That'll be all right. I go into the house and bathe him in warm water now. You... You didn't have to help me. Skip it. Come on. Wait a minute. What's that noise? The New York plane. What's she so low for? I don't know. She's too low. What's wrong with her? Good Lord, she's on fire. On fire? Yes, a mass of flames. What a... Falling. 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 Stephen. Falling. Stephen, wake falling. up. Wake up. Falling. She exploded in midair and now she's falling. Stephen. <laughs> Martha. Oh, heaven, Stephen, you've been having a nightmare. I'm going to sleep. You were screaming at the top of your lungs about something falling. The plane. Plane? The night plane to New York. What about it? She was low. Too low. She was in flames. Exploded in midair. Oh, you were dreaming. The plane did go over just as you began to scream in your sleep. Oh, let's see the clock. Yes. She goes over at the same time each night. And she was extra low tonight. The motors were awfully loud. Close. Yes. But there was no explosion. A dream. 
Yet so real. Oh, you better go back to sleep, dear. But that wasn't all of the dream. Oh, you can tell me all about it in the morning, oh, dear. that wasn't all. Stephen, where are you going? The Hank's room. Why? Oh, where's that other slipper? Here. Stephen, what's wrong, dear? That's what I want to know. Stephen! Hank! Hank, open up! Hank! He's not in here. The bed's not slept in. Stephen, what in the world's wrong with you? Hank's gone. Gone? Well, he hadn't been in his bed. No. Did he tell you he was going anyplace? No. That dream. It couldn't be true. Was it... Was it about him? Yeah. About him. We were together in the prize stock barn, bedding down the animals. One of the prize cows had cut her leg. We couldn't understand it. Because she hadn't been near any of the pastures with barbed wire. I was bringing Hank up here to bathe his eyes. Just as the plane was flying over. She was too low. And she caught fire. There was that awful explosion. Oh, but it was all a dream. Come on, we'll see. Stephen. I'm going out to the barn. Come along if you wish. Something tells me that it was more than just a dream. <laughs> Stephen, this is so foolish. I, I tell you, it was just a dream. Here. Do you hold this lantern? Oh, but you need your sleep, dear. Get this door. I'll take it now. All right. Come on. Uh, here's the stall. You bring the flashlight? Here. Here, take the lantern. Tom found it. What's wrong? The battery burned out? Oh. There. Martha, look. Stephen. There on her leg. A deep cut. Fresh cut. It needs attention. Martha. It's identical to the injury in my dream. Oh, Stephen, surely. It is, Martha. Oh, she just cut herself yesterday and you didn't know. Oh. Well, I always examine the prize stock in their stalls every night. Martha, this animal was in perfect condition when we went to bed. Oh, but Stephen. Wait a minute. What in the world are you doing? I'm looking through this straw, but... By heavens, look! A short length of barbed wire. Bloody barbed wire. Stephen. Just like the dream. The very same. There should be something else. Yes, here. Look! A gun! Hidden here in the straw. Here where he put it. Who? Hank Marsh, of course. Who else? Oh, no, Stephen. Yes. And look. There, on the top of the feed box. A bottle of disinfectant. Some clean rags. Oh, but Stephen, you... Just like the dream. Every bit of it is just like the dream. But you couldn't have dreamed all that. A hidden barbed wire. A cut on the cow's leg. The hidden gun. The medicine. All the same. Stephen. And this cow... She's the one that almost trampled McHarg to death last fall when his shotgun accidentally went off. But surely you don't think Henry Marsh planned to kill you. Yes, he planned it. He worked it out carefully. Very carefully. But now his plan's no good because of that dream. No, Stephen, he couldn't have. Yes. And in my dream, I saw how it was all going to work out. It was shown how I could save myself by throwing the disinfectant into his eyes. I tell you, there's some other explanation. Then a plane. It did fly over low tonight, you said? Yes. And it must have caught on fire. It must have exploded. But it couldn't have. I didn't hear a thing except the motors. You heard me screaming about it in my dream. Yes, but you... Well, you must have been so intent upon what I was saying that you didn't hear the noise of the explosion. Oh, no, that's impossible. It was over south of the road. Here, give me that lantern. Stephen, you... You go back to the house. I'm going to look for that wreckage. Stephen. 
Stephen? Not a sign of anything out there in the field. I called the airport. They checked the plane. It passed over Sheldon some time ago. That's miles from here toward New York. Safe? Yes. There couldn't be a mistake? No. The plane that passed over here while you were dreaming is almost in New York now. I can't understand it. All the rest of the dream was true. All but the part about the plane. Oh, just a dream. The other things. The injury to the cow, the wire, the gun. Didn't you say you lost your gun several months ago? Yes, yes, I did. Well, you must have dropped it in the straw when you stored it in the barn. It and the wire were thrown into the cow's stall purely by accident. But the injury... Stephen, both of us know how easily and mysteriously cows can injure their legs. And the disinfectant. Oh, you simply left it in there in the stall and forgot about it. No, I couldn't have... Well, are you going to open it, Stephen? It's unlocked. Come in. Hank. Holly. Holly, I'm glad you're up, Mr. Fuller. Henry. It's late. You you haven't been in your bed tonight. I forgot to tell you I was going to town. Now, Mr. Fuller, well, that cow in stall 13, she's cut her leg. Henry, I... Well, I just happened to look at it. Looked in, found the barn door open, and... Why? What's the matter, Mr. Fuller? Say, why do you look at me like that? Stephen. You want me to come out to the barn, Hank? Why? Why, yes. That cow's leg's pretty bad. A barbed wire cut? You... You know about it? And isn't the wire lying beneath the straw in the stall right now? Mr. Fuller, I... And isn't this the gun you hid under the straw? How'd you find that? Oh, Stephen. So, it is true. You plan to kill me. No. Plan for the animal to trample me and mutilate no, me. No, no, Plan to marry Martha and get my farm. Oh, no, Stephen, no, you're wrong. No, I'm not wrong. You planned it together. Only my dreams spoiled your plans. Well, now you can be together. Stephen, no. Put that gun down. Well, I'm going to send you. You can burn together. No, Stephen, no, no. <laughs> Taking off. Why don't they get this thing into the air? I've been hiding all day, waiting for darkness. Waiting here to take this plane to New York. (laughs) New York. They won't find me there. (laughs) No. They're not going to find me there. I've been waiting. Waiting. Ah. Taking off. Yeah. I'll be in New York soon. You can unfasten your safety belt now, Mr. Fuller. Huh? You know me? Yes. We always have a list of all the passengers. Let's see. Um, you're going to New York. Huh? New York? Yes. Taking a little weekend trip. Just up and left the farm for a weekend. Decided I needed a vacation. Vacations are good for a person. Yeah. I decided I needed a little rest. Oh, here I am. (laughs) Funny thing. I dreamed about this plane last night. Yeah. He always passes over my farm about midnight. Dreamed last night that she was flying exceptionally low. (laughs) 
funny, too, because she generally gained uh, quite a bit of altitude by the time she gets over my place. Yeah, it was a queer dream. Thought I was standing out back of my house, and she went over just a little before the barn tops, and then she caught on fire and exploded. Exploded right there in midair, right over my farm. <laughs> yeah, I guess we all have funny dreams sometimes. Uh, this one was sure real. Look, look, there's my farm down there now. See? Had a red light put on my windmill so it could be seen at night. And look how close it seemed. How close? Too close. We're flying too low. I said we're flying too low. Look, just above the barn tops, just like the dream. Just like the dream. No, it can't be that. Look out the window. Flames. What if the motor's on fire? What if the motor's on fire? We're flying too low. You have heard The Edge of the Shadow, tonight's original tale of dark fantasy by Scott Bishop, originating in the studios of WKY. Ben Morris was heard as Stephen Fuller, Eleanor Corrin was Martha Fuller, Muir Height played Hank Marsh, and Georgiana Cook was the stewardess. Next Friday at this time, listen to the 22nd in this series of dark fantasy adventures created for you by Scott Bishop, a weird and pulse-pounding tale of terror. Harari, which relates how an angered witch doctor of the Ecuador jungle brews a bitter, deadly poison to use against a strange and heartless enemy. This program came to you from Oklahoma City. This is the National Broadcasting Company. Stay where you are. Do not break the stillness of this moment. For this is a time of mystery. A time when imagination is free. And moves forward swiftly. Silently. This is... The Haunting Hour. In the dark. Midnight. Midnight in the metropolis. Town of a thousand moods and contrasts. Of wealth and lightness and laughter of poverty, heartbreak, and tears, of shadowy people and dark, dark things. Big city, hard-boiled and tender, weak and mean and cheap without dignity, and great and proud and powerful. And the metropolis at midnight, filled with the high spirits of joy-seekers, Revelers who give way to the goodness of living or try to forget the badness of living. Midnight that is brooding, sinister. The sounds of the big city at midnight, the squeaks and roars of taxi cabs, the rumble of trucks, the moan of river boats, and underground, the subway, and under and above, the sounds of the people shrill, ribald, futile. But there is quiet, too, in the teeming city at midnight. The quiet that is broken by the wail of a child, 
the rattle of a snore, or, as in the home of Earl Breton, a par- private detective, and his partner, Owen Bailey, called the professor, the telephone rings, and the professor answers it. Hello? Earl Breton? No, this is Mr. Bailey, Breton's partner. Who's calling? This is Bill Henderson. Is Earl there? Uh, just a moment. It's Bill Henderson, Earl. Do you want to talk to him? Bill Henderson? What does that crooked politician want? Sounds very anxious. Well, that's too bad. Tell him I'm very busy. I got to go to sleep. Hello, Mr. Henderson. Yeah? I'm sorry, but Mr. Breton is not in... Bailey. If Earl doesn't talk to me, he may be responsible for my death. I can't possibly see how that... Let me have the phone, Professor. Hello, Henderson. Is you, Earl? Yeah, what's on your mind? I got to see you right away, Earl. Can you meet me down at your office? Office hours are from 10 to 2, Henderson. You know that. I'll see you tomorrow. No, wait, Earl, wait. I tell you, you got to see me tonight. Now, look, I can't wait until tomorrow. Because I may never get there tomorrow. How do you figure? I can't explain it on the phone. But I know what I'm talking about. I got to see you tonight. Got it. Uh, where are you now? I'm at my house. Okay. Give me a few minutes to get a cup of something warm. I'll meet you down at the office. Oh, thanks a million, Earl. Never mind the thanks. Bring some money with you. Don't worry about that, Earl. This is worth anything to me. Goodbye. What seems to be his trouble, Earl? Well, he's probably swindled one guy too many. Good. What do you mean, good? I mean, he picked a good time for it. We can very well use the money, you know. Well, you can start drawing the bill now, Professor. And remember, after office hours, it's triple usual. Here comes the elevator now, Earl. If we ever make enough dough, Professor, remind me to move out of this broken-down building. All buildings are pretty much alike at this hour of night. How do they expect one old guy to take care of this whole thing by himself? He manages if you don't rush him. Yeah. The devil has got his finger on it. Oh, it's you, Mr. Britton. Faith, you'll never be known as a patient man. I hate waiting for elevators, old-timer. Good evening, Mr. Bailey. Good evening. You've got lots to do around here, haven't you? Sure, sure. I've got to make the rounds, you know. How's business? Oh, very slow, Mr. Britton. You're the only two people I've seen all night. Hey, it's pitch black out here, isn't it? You want me to put the hall lights on? Don't bother, old timer. We'll make it. It might help if you throw your flashlight beam down the hall. Oh, sure thing. Yeah. Yeah, how's this? That's fine. Here. I've got the key, Earl. Right. Ah, uh, thanks, old timer. We're okay now. Uh, I'll be seeing you on the way down. Now, if I can just find the switch. Uh, oh, here. What's the matter with the light? Looks like the switch don't work. It's working all right when I left this evening. Where to find the desk lamp? Find it, Earl? Yeah, yeah. You didn't take the bulb out of this lamp, did you, Professor? Of course not. I've got an idea, Professor, that we have company. You're a very smart chap, Breton. Who's that? Just stay where you are, both of you, and don't ask any questions. Mr. Breton knows that those lights are not out by accident, but if either of you makes a false move, there could be one. What are you looking for? Information. And why keep us in the dark? There's enough light for me from that street lamp shining in your window. I can see you both. What do you want to know? I understand, Breton, that you got some new dope on the Kennedy murder. Am I right? Kennedy murder? Why, the police gave Kennedy up as a suicide five years ago. But would I be... Stay where you are, Breton. I told you I can see. Yeah, yeah, sure. Seems kind of... Yeah, I guess our visit is a little touchy, Professor. You didn't believe that I could see you. Next time, I won't miss. Now, give it to me straight. I told you I don't like the smell of a body that's been buried five years, and I ain't digging it up. Now, what else do you Mr. want? Mr. Breton, are you in there? Don't make a move. Mr. Breton, Mr. Bailey, whatever happened to you... <laughs> okay, I hope you get a big kick out of beating up a helpless old guy. That was very tough. Very. Duck, Professor, I've got... What happened, 
Bill, where are you? Right over here where that voice was coming from, and he's not here. Maybe he moved over to another corner of the room. Duck my light something, Professor. I'm going to light a match. <laughs> Careful now, Earl. Well, I'll be there's nobody here. Who? Who's that lying in the doorway? Wait a minute. Looks like the old timer. Here's his flashlight. I'll turn it on. <laughs> Put him in this chair, Earl. Ah, uh, now it's too late, Professor. He's dead. Dead? That dirty rat killing a sweet, harmless old man. Hmm. Wait, well, what's this here on the floor? Let me see. Hotel it. key. Ah, Hotel Markham, room 517. Think that fell out of the old man's pocket? No, no, that's a mobster's hotel. It's full of gamblers and racket men. Then that means if we go to room 517, we ought to be able to find out the man who did this. You don't find anybody in that hotel. You smoke them out. Besides, that key might have been stolen just so somebody could plant it here. Don't you see that? Then how are we going to know? The voice, Professor. I'll never forget that voice. I'm promising the old man now that I'll find it. Well, what do we do, Oil? You go find Henderson and tell him we won't be able to see him tonight. I'm going to the hotel Markham. Meet me there as soon as you're through. In front of the hotel. And what about the old man? On our way out, we'll ring the night alarm. That'll bring the police. But aren't we going to tell them what happened? Right now, Professor, we don't know any more than they do. Come on, let's go. Anything I can do? Oh, hello, Breton. How's the hotel business? Oh, we don't complain. Uh huh. And who's up in room 517? I want to know. I understand there's a game going on. So? So, I'd like to get in. Well, there's a gentleman by the name of Sparrow ran to the room. Maybe you know him. That's all I wanted to hear. You can tell my good friend, Mr. Sparrow, I'm coming right up. Don't worry. I will. Oh. Now, by the way, I hear there's a shortage of keys. Do you still lose many of them? Certainly we do. Every day. That's very interesting. Very interesting. Well, look who's here, fellas. My old pal, Earl Breton. How are you, Sparrow? Fine, fine. Come on in. How's the game? Pretty good. You want to take a hand? Yeah, maybe. How long have you been playing? Oh, about 12 hours. Now, meet the boys. All right, fellas. This is Dan Huber. He's new in this town. Yeah? Didn't take you long to find this place, did it, Dan? Me? I got a nose for this stuff. <laughs> yes. And you know Harry Jackson, Earl, don't you? Sure, I know Harry. How are you, Harry? Hey. What did you say, Harry? I said I'm fine. That's what I said. Uh-huh, sure. Now, this is Willie Garvin, and over oh, here... Oh, that's we... a funny name, Willie. What's funny about it? How do you spell it? G-A-R-B-I-N. Why? Does it sound familiar? Uh, no, uh, Willie, no. And I don't have to introduce you to my partner, Joe Murray, huh? Hello, Joe. Hello. Funny to find you and Sparrow in the same game, Joe. What's funny about that? <laughs> Well, after all, you and Sparrow are partners, aren't you? Now, what he said for you, Breton, and if you don't like what goes on here, you can shove off. Come Get on, it? Earl. When are you going to stop burning up Joe? <laughs> Anyhow, he just came in a few minutes ago. So we really just started playing together. Oh, just came in a few minutes ago. Where were you, Joe? Since when do I report to you? <laughs> well, I'm just curious, that's all. I told you before, Breton, I don't like coppers, and that still goes. Now, let's get the game going. Well, Earl, you taking a hand? Sure, sure, but... Uh... First, I gotta get the professor. He's got my dough. I'll be back in a few Wait minutes. a minute, Breton. What are you trying to pull? Why didn't you bring your dough in the first place? I just wanted to see who was in the game. Oh, sure, Joe. He's got a right to know. Go ahead, Earl. Get your dough. Oh, but uh, don't forget to come back, huh? Otherwise, it wouldn't look so good, huh? Sure, don't worry. I'll be back. <laughs> You've been waiting, Professor. I just got here. Did you find out anything? No, not a thing. I listened to every voice up there. Not one of them was the right one. How about you? Did you see Henderson? Yeah, that is, I didn't see him, but I found out about him. What do you mean, found out about him? Well, when I got there, Earl, there were a lot of people outside the house, and the police were there. Police? What happened? Henderson was murdered. <laughs> midnight when the
the phone rang in the home of Earl Breton, a private detective. A man named Henderson was calling. Henderson, a crooked politician who insisted he was in danger of being killed and that he had to see Breton immediately. Earl agreed to meet him in his office. But when he and his partner, the professor, arrived a few minutes later, they were faced with a peculiar situation. The lights in the office wouldn't work. And before they could investigate, a voice challenged them from the darkness. Their unknown visitor fired at them, purposely missing, in order to warn them that he meant business. The sound of the gun attracted the attention of the night watchman. He came to investigate and was killed by the intruder, who disappeared, leaving Earl with the old man's body and a clue. The key to room 517 at the Hotel Markham. They rang the police alarm and Earl sent the professor to intercept Henderson to break the appointment they had with him. Then he went to the hotel to room 517, where he expected to find the killer. He interrupted a card game, but Sparrow, the gangster who was registered in 517, invited Earl to sit in, much to the displeasure of his partner, Joe Murray. Breton accepted, promising to return soon. He went down to the street where the professor was waiting. The professor had news for him. Henderson had been murdered. How did you find out he was murdered, Professor? I overheard two policemen talking to one another. Did the cops know you were there? Oh, no. We wouldn't want them to know we was interested, would we? Good for you, Professor. But now that I think of it, Earl, shouldn't we tell the police what we know? Well, that's a good idea, except that we don't know anything. They can't find out for themselves. But they don't know that Henderson called us to meet him at the office. And then when we got there, we met somebody else. And it was that somebody else who killed the night watchman. I know there's some connection between those two things, Professor. In fact, if I didn't know Henderson's voice so well... You'd say that it was the man at the office who imitated it? Sure, that's an old trick. A man disguises his voice to sound like... Hey... Just a minute, Professor. Why couldn't it be... You mean you actually think that the man we met in the office was the one who called us earlier and he imitated Henderson's voice? No, no, no. That'd be too obvious. The killer's much cleverer than that. But you do think he had something to do with both of the murders? Certainly. If he didn't, how would he know that we were coming down to the office at midnight? He was expecting us. So he must have been with Henderson at the time Henderson called us. If you don't mind my saying so, Earl, it doesn't make sense. Why should this man have bothered to come down to our office just to ask us about some murder case that was over and forgotten five years ago? That's just it, Professor. He didn't want that information at all. That was just to throw us off the track. That was why he left the key there when he slugged the old man and disappeared. You mean he actually wanted us to follow him here to the Hotel Markham? Don't you see he was trying to establish the alibi that he was playing cards in this hotel at the time of the murder? And he could force us to testify as police witnesses that we saw him here. Then why don't we tell that to the police? Oh, Professor, you're slipping. You know the police don't want ideas. They've got their own. Besides, if we don't know whose voice we heard, what can we tell them? Well, at least we can tell them that it was somebody who's up in that hotel room now. Sure, sure. But can we prove it? Mm, I guess not. Well, then what can we do? we got to go upstairs and find out who that phony voice belongs to. But our life can be very short in a place like this. I mean, I'm not thinking about me. I know, Professor, I know. But I made a promise to that old watchman that I'd find the guy who killed him, and I like to keep a promise. But, Earl, we ain't got enough money to play cards with those people. They don't know that. Well, I don't think it should take them more than one hand to find out. All right, then you'll have to stall. Now, one of those guys up there has a phony... British voice. So? Uh, listen. Stay where you are, Breton. I told you, I can see. How's that? If I wasn't looking at you, I'd swear it was the guy in the room. Good, good. That's all I wanted to know. I knew you'd keep your promise to come back, Earl. Oh, why not? This is my night, Sparrow. Well, come on, take a chair. I think I'll let the professor play for me. I do much better when I'm looking over his shoulder. Suit yourself. Let's get going. You're holding up the game. How many chips, Professor? Oh, well, uh, uh, that's up to Earl. Chips? Why, um, uh, what do you say we start off with $10 worth, Professor? I got a hunch. I, um, I guess that's all right. Wait a minute. Who are you kidding, Breton? Since when do you figure you can get in on this game for 10 bucks? That's just a starter, Joe. I always like to play hunches. But you've got more than that, haven't you, Earl? <laughs> you know better than to ask me that, Sparrow. Yeah? Let's see. 
Okay, deal him out. Joe, if I didn't know that you just came into this game a little while ago, I'd figure that you were losing plenty. Why? Ah, oh, you're so touchy. I open. Five bucks. Uh, raise your ten. I'm out. Well, playing it safe, Professor. I'd rather not explain my game. Maybe if Joe played it safer, he wouldn't be so worried all the time. Oh, Joe. Joe's got lots on his mind. I don't know, Sparrow. You're Joe's partner. You never seem to worry like he does. What do you mean, worry? Who says I'm worried? I'm just careful, it's all. I don't trust nobody, see? Nobody? You mean not even Sparrow, your own partner? I said nobody. Oh, Joe thinks maybe I talk too much. That's right. I didn't hear you say anything out of place, Sparrow. <laughs> he thinks I made a mistake telling you he, he just came into the game a little while ago. I told you to shut up, Sparrow. Oh, come on, Joe. You don't have to be afraid of Earl Breton. He's a cop, and I told you don't have to know nothing. He wouldn't repeat anything he heard up here, would you, Earl? I always play it safe. <laughs> I think you're all right, Earl. Ah, uh, mind if I stand up? Where are you going? I just want to walk around a little bit, stretch my legs. Uh, just don't go looking at any hands. Okay. I'll stand over here by the wall. You're going to let the professor play by himself? Sure. Hey, this is a very interesting electric light switch. You guys don't cut the chatter, I'll blow this game off. Hey, hey wait a minute. Who put those lights out? Put the lights on. What are you getting so crazy about, Joe? You act as if you just murdered someone. Put up the lights, I said quick. I'm sorry, Joe. That was my mistake. I didn't know the light switched off this way. Shut up. And you, Sparrow. What was the idea saying I murdered someone? What are you talking about, Joe? I didn't say anything. Don't give me that stuff. I heard you. You can't fool me with that phony voice you put on. I told you I didn't say anything. Oh, yeah? Well, I happen to know that nobody else but you talks that way. Why did you dope? Did you know that wasn't my voice? Sparrow, if you're trying to pull anything... Okay, okay, Joe. Sparrow's right. Now, don't get sore. It was my fault. I didn't know. That ain't the point, Breton. I want to know what he's trying to pull. And it ain't none of your business, copper. I just wanted to tell you I'm sorry. It was my voice you heard, Joe. What? Are you? All right, what's the game, Brett? No game, Joe. Just a joke, that's all. Sure, Joe, just a joke. Very funny, too. Can't you take a joke, Joe? Ah, uh, nuts. All right, Breton. If you want to stay in this game, get up some real dough or beat it. Okay, okay, I'll come clean with you. That's all the dough we got with us right now. If you let me go in the next room and make a call, I'll get some sent up here right away. Why, sure, sure. You want to use the phone, huh? Yes, it's right in the next room. Thanks, Sparrow. This is the desk. Hello. Get me Spring 73100. Spring 73100? Right. Who are you kidding? That's police headquarters. Say, have you got any complaints to make? Hold on there. Hey, hey, wait a minute. What goes on here? Which one of your keys? Oh, hello, Sparrow. I, um, uh, I can't say much for your phone service. No? What's the matter with it? They, um, they wouldn't get a number for me. I see. Who you're calling is so important. The police. I, I, uh, I guess I can wait. Well... Yeah. Say, I'm glad you came in here, Breton. I uh, wanted to have a little talk with you. Alone. You wouldn't use that revolver right here in this room, would you? Wouldn't I? You know, I can do pretty much as I want to in this hotel. You know that, don't you? Yeah, yeah. But if you killed me now, wouldn't you have to tell Joe why you did it? Well, what do you mean? I mean, wouldn't you have to tell him that you were tired of being partners with him and Henderson? That you wanted the whole racket for yourself? So that you killed Henderson, trying to make it look as though Joe did it so he could take the rap? <laughs> uh, if you're trying to talk loud so Joe will hear you, I might as well tell you, he just left. Ah. Well, at least I found out it was you who slugged the night watchman in my building tonight. So what? Just that you killed him, that's all. Mm, you shouldn't have gotten away. Then you're admitting that you killed Henderson and the watchman. Only to you, Breton. And I'll tell you why. Because I'm going to make sure that you'll never be able to tell it to the cops. See? I don't have to tell him, Sparrow. They know about it already. Oh, sure, sure. <laughs> you gave them all this information before you came up here. No, I didn't tell them. You did. You know something, Breton? I'm beginning to think you're a little bit nuts. I suppose you wouldn't believe me if I told you the police are listening to you right now? They heard you admit all this to me? Oh, now, wait a minute. Don't tell me you hid them in my closet. No, no. 
But they're right outside in that room where we were just playing cards. You're crazy. Why don't you take a look? Because I ain't dumb enough to turn my back on you. Then that makes it easy for them to come in. Drop the gun, Sparrow. Give it here. But it is the cops. But we heard the whole thing outside, Benton. Pretty smart. But how did you get the cops up here? I didn't get them, Sparrow. You did. Cut it out, Breton. It's true. You know the best way to bring the police is to leave a hotel key next to a dead man, and that's what you did. Yeah, but you picked it up. Not me. I just made a mental note of it, that's all. What puzzles me, Earl, is how you know the police were out here when you made Sparrow talk. Ah, that was easy. When I tried to put through a call before, I heard a voice at the switchboard asking about a key. And I just played a hunch. Now, I'm glad we got here in time. Come along, Sparrow. Well, Professor... Let's go home. Yes, sir. Oh, and look, if our phone rings again tonight, mm -hmm. don't answer it. From shadows and stillness, Mystery weaves a spell of strangest fascination, charging the mind with doubts and fears. For mystery is a strange companion, a living memory in the haunting hour. Soup present Inner Sanctum Mysteries. Good evening, friends. This is your host of the Inner Sanctum inviting you in through the creaking door. Come on in and enter into the spirit of things. <laughs> oh, uh, don't pay any attention to those gurgling sounds you hear. They're the unfortunate ones. The midnight spirits who are caught haunting before midnight. Poor things. All they can do now is gurgle. Because they've evaporated into distilled spirits. <laughs> what a horrifying thought, Mr. Host. Can't we ever talk about the brighter side of life? Well, don't forget, Mary, murder is my business. Well, thank goodness it isn't mine. <laughs> and right now, I'd much prefer to talk with our Lipton listeners about something more conducive to happy spirits. I mean, a cup of hearty, piping hot Lipton tea. You know, it's really wonderful, the extra delight you get from this superb tea, friends. And the reason is simply this, Lipton's grand brisk flavor. Brisk, you know, is the tea expert's own word for the fresh, full-bodied, lively flavor of Lipton tea. Because unlike ordinary teas, Lipton's is never flat-tasting or lifeless. Lipton tea is always spirited, full-flavored, truly satisfying. Why, I'd even go so far as to say that once you've tried it, I think you'll enjoy Lipton tea more than any other tea you've ever tasted. And I'll go even further, Mary, and introduce our listeners to tonight's story. It's an original radio play written especially for Inner Sanctum by Emil Tepperman. And starring Richard Widmark in the role of Alex Gregory. It's about a man who became master of a secret so fearful that it could never be revealed to any mortal, living or dead. But let him tell you the story himself. How he learned the most terrible secret in all the universe. And what he did with it. It was an evening in September. The 15th to be exact when I first learned of the existence of Elixir Number 4. It happened at Professor Jarman's house just off the college campus. 
You've heard of Jarman, of course. He was to chemistry what Einstein is to physics. But it was his daughter, Elaine, that I was interested in that evening in September when I rang their bell. Oh, hello, Alex. Oh, gosh, is it that late? I'm not even dressed. Hi, sweet. Snap it up, will you? The last show starts at 8.30. Oh, it won't take me long. Wait for me in the library. I'll be ready in a jiffy. I knew my way around the house. I went into the library, and the first thing I noticed was that the door to Professor Jarman's private study was ajar. It had never happened before. The private study and the laboratory beyond were forbidden territory in the Jarman home. Not even Elaine was allowed in there. And now the door was open. I'd heard stories of Jarman's experiments with new and secret formulae. So here was a chance... A possible chance to find out what the old codger was working on. I couldn't resist. I pushed open the door and I stepped into the private study. I could hear Jarman in the lab talking to himself. Elaine had told me once that he always talked to himself in the lab. I stood quietly in the study. But I couldn't make out what he was saying in there. I looked around. The study was just a small cubby hole with a chair, a bookcase, and a desk. And on the desk, I saw the open diary. A single sentence was written on the open page. I stepped closer. And then, I got the first shock. For that sentence was written in Latin. My Latin was rusty, but I was able to decipher the words, We tie secretum in elixir quartum perpetus habeo. In elixir number four, I have the secret of perpetus life. Perpetus. That was the one word I couldn't seem to place. In elixir number four, I have the secret of Something. Life. I was puzzling over that word perpetus when suddenly the laboratory door was flung open. What are you doing at my desk? Oh, uh, hello, Professor Charman. I asked you, what are you doing at my desk? Well, the, the study door was open. I, I thought I'd see if you were in here. You were reading my diary. Oh, no, no, Professor. You saw the entry in my diary. Oh, really, Professor, I assure you. You I... read Latin. Latin? Well, I, I don't understand. You're sure you don't understand Latin? No, no, I, I don't. I am, Alex. Ready? And... Well, well, is anything wrong? Elaine, I've told you time and again, no one is to be admitted to my study. Oh, I'm sorry, Dad. You must have left the door open. Oh, Alex, you shouldn't I'm have terribly come. sorry, Elaine. I, I found the door open and I thought Professor Jarman was in here. I, I just wanted to say hello. All right, all right. No harm done as long as you can't read Latin. Now, get along, you two. I'm busy, but keep out of my study hereafter. I took Elaine to the movies, but I haven't the faintest recollection of what the picture was about. Through my mind kept running that Latin sentence. We tie secretum in elixir quartum perpetus habeo. When I said goodnight to Elaine at her door after the show, I hurried home to my room and I got out an old Latin dictionary. I looked up the word, perpetus. And then, I got a strange, cold feeling down my spine. For the word perpetus meant perpetual. The Latin sentence which Jarman had written in his diary meant, in elixir number four... I have the secret of perpetual life. Professor Jarman had discovered the secret of immortality. All the next day, I conducted my chemistry classes purely by instinct. I couldn't take my thoughts from elixir number four. Every voice in the classroom seemed to sing the same refrain. Accomplished by adding to a dilute solution of H2SO4 a quantity of... Immortality. Never to know the fear of death. To live on serenely. To watch the world change through the centuries. Never to die. It grew on me like a festering tumor, this terrific dream of immortality, everlasting life. I had to have elixir number four.
In the afternoon, the first free period I had, I went down the hall to Jarman's office. Come in. May I come in for a moment, Professor? Oh, it's you. Yes, come in, but I haven't much time. Professor, uh... I want to apologize for last mm, night. Let's forget about it. No harm done. Well, whatever it was you had written in your diary, it uh, it must have been pretty important. Oh, no, no, not at all. Only some chemistry notes. Nothing of any importance. Just something I've been experimenting well, with. Well, I'd be very glad to assist you, Professor. Anything I could do, That's I'd That's very be... kind of you, young man, but I don't need any assistance, thank you. Uh, as a matter of fact, the experiment is completed. You mean you're all finished? All but the practical application. Oh, well, couldn't I help you on that? It won't be necessary. Tonight, I'm taking the last step. Tonight? I knew what that meant. Tonight, he was going to use elixir number four. He was going to administer it to himself. I had to act tonight or never. Jarman's keys were on his desk. I distracted his attention and I managed to pick them up without his noticing. Then I hurried across town to a locksmith and had him make duplicates of Jarman's house key, his study key, and his laboratory key. Then I returned to the college and I managed to replace the keys on Jarman's desk while he was out. Now, I was ready for an adventure into immortality. At 8.30 that evening, I let myself into Charman's house, opened the study door, and stepped quietly over to the laboratory. I knew Elaine was at a sorority meeting. The professor and I were the only ones in the house. Charman was standing at the lab table with his back to me, talking away to himself. There was a small vial on the table and a hypodermic syringe alongside it. The quantity administered yesterday will be sufficient. At my age, since my blood is too thin, I require the additional dose. But a younger man would need only one injection to cause the necessary type change in his blood. Who's that? Good evening, Professor Charman. I hope I'm not interrupting. What are you doing here? How did you get in? So elixir number four changes the bloodstream, huh? What do you want in here? Quit stalling, Professor. I know what elixir number four is. Ah. So this is it. Elixir number four. Be careful. Don't spill it. How much of this stuff have you got? Hey, that's all there is. Five cc's. You mean you haven't got any more? It took me five years to distill ten cc's. Before that, I experimented for ten years. I failed three times. And this is your fourth try, huh? Elixir number four. And there isn't any more of it? It will take me five years more to make up another bat. Please be careful. Don't drop it. <laughs> Don't worry, I won't. You, uh... You said this is enough to make the average man immortal. Me, for instance? It's not for you. You hear me? Not for you. Oh, yes, it is, Professor. It's for me. I won't let you... What are you doing with that mallet? What do you think? No. I'm so sorry, Professor. Wait, I, I'll let you have it. Don't kill me. I've got to kill you. When I take this dose of elixir number four, I'll be immortal. And I don't want anyone to know it. Away, you fool! You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you. Back to remind you. I didn't hit him hard enough to kill him. That wasn't part of my plan. But when he lay unconscious on the floor, I searched among the chemicals until I found what I wanted. I mixed some chemicals in a test tube and I watched the fumes forming. Then I held the test tube against Jarman's mouth, forcing the deadly gas into his lungs. When I was sure he was dead, I wiped the tube clean of my fingerprints and put it back in the rack. Then I picked up the vial of elixir number four, the hypodermic syringe, and I hurried away, locking all the doors behind me. As soon as I got home, I filled the hypo with elixir number four. 
And I gave myself the injection. Almost immediately, I felt a strange radiance pervading my body. A new strength was flowing in my blood. I was immortal. I couldn't die. I would go on living and living and living forever. What's going on here? What's all this about living forever? If you ask me, it would be more of a curse than a blessing. Now, just suppose we all took a shot of this elixir number four. I think of all the people who'd lose their jobs. Grave diggers and stone cutters and shroud makers and hearse drivers and... Oh, I go on. You see what I mean. Why, everybody would be out of a job. We'd all practically starve to death. Well, then, Mr. Host, maybe we can be glad that nobody has ever found the fountain of youth. And now let's get back to our story. We're all anxious to see what this fellow Alex does with his secret of perpetual life. Just imagine. A man with all that time on his hands. Time to kill. And kill. And kill. Immortality. I had it in my blood. I could feel it pulsing in my veins. The vitality, the power. I had to establish an alibi. Not that I expected to need an alibi. Jarman's death would surely look like an accident or suicide when his body was found in the laboratory in the morning. But I wasn't taking any chances on a murder charge. I had so much more to lose now. Wouldn't it be ironic if they were to execute me for murder? <laughs> me, an immortal. Next morning, I stopped at Jarman's house and rang the bell. I knew Elaine must have gone right to bed when she returned from the sorority meeting last night because she never disturbed her father when he was in the lab. But now, when she discovered that he hadn't been to bed all night, she'd want to investigate. And I wanted to be there when the body was found. Oh, good morning, Alex. Hello, sweet. What's wrong? You look worried. <laughs> Come on in. Alex, I am worried. Dad's still in the lab. He didn't go to bed last night. Well, what of it? He must be working on something big. No, no, I'm afraid something's happened. I, I knocked at the door just now and there was no answer. The door was locked? Well, yes, but I have a pass key. I, I wonder if I ought to use it. Well, of course you should. Well, please, Alex. You come with me. Of course, darling. Together we opened the laboratory door. I was all set to act horrified when we discovered the body on the floor. But there was no need to act. I was horrified. For the... The lab was empty. There was nothing on the floor. The body of Professor Jarman was gone. I don't know for how many hours after that that I walked the street. Confused and frightened and uncomprehending. I tried to reason it out. How Jarman's body had walked out of that lab. There was only one solution. Jarman had already taken one dose of elixir number four. It must have counteracted the poison that I'd forced into him. He must have gotten up and then walked away. But where? And why? I recalled what he'd said before I hit him with the mallet. Yes, I could hear his voice faintly strumming at my brain. You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you. The next day, I went to Elaine's house, and I saw that she was taking her father's disappearance pretty hard. Oh, Alex, I, I don't know what to make of it. Do you think that... the dad... Oh, now, now, take it easy, baby. Maybe he's just uh, suffering from amnesia. Maybe he just walked out of the house. He might turn up tomorrow. I have a terrible feeling, Alex, that, that he's dead. What makes you think so? 
Oh, I don't know. Now, now, please, a little. That won't do you any good. Oh, but it's the uncertainty. If, if I only knew for sure. Alex. Hmm? Do you believe in mediums? Communicating with the dead? Do you believe a medium can put you in touch with the dead? Oh, is that what you're thinking of, darling? Going to a medium? But don't you see, Alex? It, if Dad... Oh, if Dad is dead, maybe... Maybe... I was worried, too. I had to know if Jarman was dead or alive. I had to know before I could start enjoying life. Yes, yes, that might be a good idea, Elaine. Can't hurt to try. There's a medium in town. Oh, I... I don't know what I want to do. Let me think about it. Well, sure, sure, darling. In the days that followed, I began to doubt whether I really was immortal. Was elixir number four really the elixir of life? Was I really going to live forever? If there was only some way to prove it. Then I remembered what Jarman had said, that the elixir caused a change of blood type. Well, that'd be easy enough to check. Elaine was taking a medical course, so I asked her to test my blood on the pretext that I thought I had anemia. It won't hurt, Alex. Just the needle. Ouch. <laughs> There, now I've got all the blood I need. Just sit here a minute while I make the test. Well, uh, does it take long? Mm, only a minute. Alex. She was excited. There was something different about my blood then. Alex. Alex, come here quick. What? Look. Oh, look, Alex. I, I can't be mistaken. Uh, your blood. It's a new type. <laughs> Elaine couldn't get over the discovery that my blood was a new type. I'd asked her not to tell anyone about my new blood type, but I knew she wouldn't be able to keep the secret for long. And once it got out, people might begin to suspect what I already knew for sure, that I was immortal. Oh, I couldn't afford to have that known, because then everybody in the world would be envious of me. They'd hate me, too, because they'd know I could go on living long after they were dead. Oh, no. No, it had to be a secret forever. No one in the whole world must know. Except myself. And the only person who could spill the secret now... was Elaine. So... there was only one thing to do. Elaine furnished the opportunity herself the next day. Alex, I've been thinking about that medium... I've got to know if... if Dad is alive or... or dead. All right, whatever you say, darling, if it'll make you feel any better. I'll go with you, of course. Just the two of us, huh? We made a date to go to the seance that evening. And I made my plans accordingly. I didn't intend that Elaine should leave the seance... alive. We arrived at the medium's house promptly at nine o'clock. The medium asked Elaine and me to sit close to each other. And then she put out the lights. Alex. It's all right, sweet. I'm right here. I'm right next to you. Oh, I'm frightened. Now, there's nothing to be frightened about, darling. I'm right here with you. But it's so dark. I, I can't see anything. I, I don't hear anything. Where's the medium? She's still here. She's right across the table. <laughs> She's gone into her trance. Do you think she'll contact that spirit? I don't know, darling. Wait and see. I timed myself carefully, waiting for the moment when the medium should be well into her trance. Then I took out of my pocket the hypodermic syringe. I held the plunger in my left hand while I gripped Elaine's arm with my right, my thumb over the artery. Alex, my arm, your fingers hurt. It's all right, sweet. Slowly, I brought the hypodermic needle up close to the artery. One bite of the needle, a single plunge of the plunger, and death would come almost instantaneously. And no one in the world could say that it hadn't been heart failure. But suddenly, just as I had the plunger ready, I heard... I 
heard something strange. A sound. In the room where there should have been no sound. You'll never enjoy your immortality. You'll wish you were dead a thousand times. I'll come back to remind you. Back the to remind you. Back the voice of the dead. You, back to remind you. Charmin, where are you? Jarman, stop. Back you're dead. Remind. You're dead, Jarman. You can't be back talking. You're dead. Back to remind. I saw back your to dead remind. body. I killed you myself. Back to remind. Suddenly, the lights flashed up. The room was full of police. Arrest him, officer. He killed my father. You heard his confession. That voice. That was Dad's voice, Alex. A recording. What? A recording? That's why he always talked to himself in the lab. He had a wire recording machine. He talked while he carried on his experiments so that there'd be a permanent record. The wire recorder picked up everything that was said in the lab the night you killed him. But we could never have proved it was your voice in court if you hadn't confessed just now. Yes, but the body. I found Dad dead that night when I got back from the meeting. And I hid the body until I could find his murderer. And now, Alex, I found him. <laughs> All through the trial, Elaine sat and watched me. All the time the jury was out, she sat and watched me. And she watched me while they read the verdict of guilty. Her eyes never left me when I stood up to be sentenced and heard the judge say... Alex Gregory, it is the judgment of this court that you be confined to the penitentiary... For the rest of your natural life. <laughs> me. Me of all people. Me sentenced to imprisonment for life. Me in whose veins runs the precious elixir number four. Imprisonment for the rest of my natural life. Which means forever. <laughs> You know, I feel kind of sorry for Alex. Has he really got a tough break? Locked up in a cell for all eternity and no way out. Yes, looks like they'll have to build a new jail around him every thousand years or so. Of course, there's one way out for him. He could let his beard grow for a couple of centuries, and when it gets long enough, he could hang himself. Oh, imagine <laughs> such a thing, Mr. Host. Yes, it would be sort of... Breathtaking, wouldn't it, Mary? <laughs> Poor Alex. He probably had many good impulses in his lifetime. As the trouble is, he didn't follow them. Well, Mr. Host, I'm afraid that's something we all do every now and then. For instance, perhaps some of you Inner Sanctum fans have promised yourselves the pleasure of trying Lipton tea, but somehow just haven't gotten around to it. Or maybe you've just forgotten it when you're writing out your grocery list. Well, this time, make sure. Add Lipton tea to your grocery list right now. For until you do try it, you're missing a real treat. Why not start enjoying lively, full-bodied Lipton tea beginning tomorrow? And now, friends, before I say goodnight, here's a pleasant bit of philosophy. Biologists tell us that all life starts in a little cell. And for convicted murderers, it ends there, too. <laughs> oh, by the way, this month's Inner Sanctum mystery novel is Death in the Limelight by A.E. Martin. And next week's Inner Sanctum story brought to you by the makers of Lipton Tea and Lipton Soup and directed by Hyman Brown. Next week's story is called You'll never escape. So, if you feel in a capturing mood, join us next Tuesday. Until then, good night. Pleasant dreams? Hmm? <laughs> For a wonderful soup. Be sure to try Lipton's Noodle Soup. And tune in next week for another Inner Sanctum Mystery. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.
The Sealed Book. Once again, the keeper of the book has opened the ponderous door to the secret vault wherein is kept the great sealed book in which is recorded all the secrets and mysteries of mankind through the ages. Here are tales of every kind, tales of murder, of madness, of dark deeds, strange and terrible beyond all belief. Keeper of the book, I would know what tale we tell this time. Open the great book and let us read. Slowly the great book opens. One by one the keeper of the book turns the pages and stops. Ah, the strange story of a scientist who delved into the unknown with frightening results. A tale titled Beware of Tomorrow. the tale, Beware of Tomorrow, as it is written in the pages of the sealed book. Our story begins as Sheriff Ramsey brings his car to a stop in front of an old mansion in a desolate section of New England. A young man gets out of the car and speaks to the sheriff. Thanks very much, Sheriff, for bringing me out here. That's quite all right, young fellow. Uh, say, um, do you know Professor Clark? The man that lives in this old mansion? Why, yes. I was Professor Clark's laboratory assistant back in college. Why? Well, there's been some talk in town of running him and that man of his, that Barton fellow, right out of the county. But what has anybody got against the professor? There isn't a milder man in the world. Well, maybe so. But folks has got wind of what happened at the state penitentiary over in Hillvale last year. Sure, if you're talking in riddles. What did happen? The professor went over there when they hanged Richards, that hold-up killer. And the warden gave the professor the murderer's brain. So what? Folks think he's keeping that brain in a big glass jar and making it grow. (laughs) Oh, that's perfectly ridiculous. Oh, I'm not saying I ever believed it. But it'd be a good idea if the professor would give folks a notion of what he's really doing in that laboratory of his with that Barton fellow to help him. Then maybe the talk would die down. I understand. All right, Sheriff, I'll mention it to him. Well, then I'll be getting on. Good night, young fellow. Good night. A few moments after Dr. Richard Dale had knocked on the door of the ancient mansion, a frail, white-haired old man answered the door. An old man who could hardly speak in his joy as he gripped Richard Dale's hand. He led the way down a long hall to a great room where strange equipment took up almost every inch of space. Retorts and electric furnaces, generators, batteries, great glass vats. 
Dr. Dale stared around him in intense curiosity as Professor Clark helped him off with his hat and coat. There. Now sit down, Dick. Sit down and let me get a look at you. I got your letter and it made me so curious I took the first train. You promised me a surprise. Is this it? This amazing laboratory? (laughs) No, no, my boy. We'll come to that in a moment. After you've met Barton, my assistant. Oh, uh, Barton! Yes, Professor? Dr. Dale has arrived. I want you to meet him. Why, of course. How do you do, Dr. Dale? How do you do? We've both of us been looking forward to your visit. Yes, the professor's letter made me so curious I couldn't stay away. Uh, Barton, is Alpha making some coffee? Yes, he started it when we heard the car. Alpha? Who's he? Our general man of all work. A truly amazing fellow. Ah, here he comes now. What in the world? Shall Alpha serve coffee? Good heavens. I said you'd be surprised, Dick. He's not human. He's a machine, a robot. Yes, my boy. An artificial man made from metal and synthetic brain tissue. A machine man. But walking and then talking. He's not very pretty, but then the professor was mostly interested in making sure he'd work. Well, he must weigh a ton. No, only about 300 pounds. You see, Alpha is mostly aluminum and other light alloys. Inside his aluminum plates are some new batteries I've devised, together with miles of fine silver wire and a dozen electric motors. To give you only the highlights. Shall Alpha serve coffee now? Yes, Alpha. Put it on this table here and pour a cup for Dr. Dale. Alpha, do so. I still can't make myself believe it. Alpha port coffee. Go on, Dick. Take it. Oh, oh yes, of course. Thank you. Well, he looks clumsy, but he poured the coffee as well as a man could. Yes, my boy. Alpha has capabilities you'd never suspect to look at him. Uh, we won't need you any more tonight, Alpha. You can go back to your room now. Alpha go. Be sure to switch off your batteries. They're going to need recharging tomorrow. Alpha, understand. Boy, that's the most incredible thing I ever saw. You see, Dick, like any machine, he's completely inactive when his batteries have been switched off. But his brain continues to function. It's an artificial protoplasm that I spent eight years creating. It's the only thing that makes him different from any other machine. But it means that Alpha can think. Think like a man. A machine that can walk and talk and and think. But Alpha isn't the only surprise I have for you, Dick. He's not? No. I have another one, even more astonishing. But you'll have to wait until morning to learn what that is. Uh, Barton will show you to your room, Dick. Of course, Professor. I'll see you in the morning, then. Yes. We'll have a long talk tomorrow. Good night. Good night, Professor Clark. Oh, Dr. Dale... Yes, Barton? Could we talk for a minute before I show you to your room? Why, yes, of course. It occurs to me that the professor forgot to tell you why he asked you here. It was his hope that you'd stay indefinitely and help us carry forward the work we've been doing here. Stay indefinitely? Why, oh, I have my own work. Now, don't say no yet. Just think, Dr. Dale. Alpha is stronger and more rugged than a man. He needs no rest, no food. Yet he can do the work of three men. He can plow, reap, run machinery. Think how much drudgery a million like him could lift from mankind's shoulders. Yes. Yes, that's true. And already Alpha is technically old-fashioned. Professor Clark has blueprints for a new machine man, as superior to Alpha as an aeroplane is to a bicycle. We want you to help us build them. Well, I'm certainly tempted to stay... Perhaps I could arrange it. Good. Then I'll show you to your room now, if you wish. Yes, I... I am sleepy. If you'll just come this way. His mind in a whirl of amazement, Dr. Dale retired and finally fell into an uneasy sleep. 
How long he had slept, he did not know, when abruptly he woke with a scream ringing in his ears. The cry came from downstairs. Dr. Dale leaped from his bed and raced down to the lower hall. In the lower hall, he found Barton hammering on the heavy door of the laboratory. Professor Clark. Professor Clark, what's wrong? Barton, what's happened? Professor Clark, I heard him call for help. The door is locked. We've got to break it down. Yes, come, put your shoulder beside mine. Right. Are you ready? Ready. Then shove. Oh, once again. All right, once more. Uh, Professor Clark, where are you? Professor Clark, he's not here. Yes, yes, he's here, lying on the floor beside the window. He's been murdered. It was Alpha. It must have been. No one else could have done it. Where is Alpha? The window, it's open. He went out that way. We've got to go after him. I'm afraid it's hopeless. At night in these woods, we couldn't possibly find him. No. No, you're right, of course. It'll be morning soon. Then I think he'll come back. He knows that he can only go for a few more hours before his batteries must be recharged. But, Barton, why did he kill the man who created him? The professor has been thinking of destroying Alpha because he's now technically out of date. Perhaps that's the reason Alpha killed him. Poor Professor Clark. We'll have to notify the police. That is only the sheriff. In any case, I think we should wait until morning and then report the professor's death as an accident. An accident? Yes. If the authorities learn the truth, our research may be stopped. And when Professor Clark has achieved so much, can we let it go for nothing? Why, no. No, of course not. Dr. Hale, we must carry on his work for him. Yes, that's what he would want. Then you will help me to continue it? You'll stay? Yes. Yes, I'll stay. To continue the story, beware of tomorrow, as it is written in the sealed book. Greatly upset by Professor Clark's tragic death, Dr. Dale returned to bed, and at last fell again into an uneasy sleep, a sleep in which he was haunted by dreams of Alpha, the metal monster Professor Clark had created. When he awoke, the sun was shining, and he could hear Barton moving about downstairs, he dressed and went down to find Barton getting breakfast ready. Ah, good morning, Dr. Dale. Good morning, Barton. Any sign of Alpha? Not yet. I thought that while you ate, I might outline some of the problems facing us. Yes, that's a good idea. You see, though Alpha's brain is of synthetic protoplasm, it is not completely artificial. I was wondering about that. Sheriff Ramsey mentioned that the professor had secured a human brain from... From an executed killer, yes. The professor found that to give life to his artificial brain tissue, it was necessary to add a small amount of tissue from a real brain. I see. The real tissue gave life to the rest, of course. Yes, but in this instance, 
It may have tainted Alpha's brain with the murderous impulse of a killer. Mm, that sounds perfectly plausible. So our first problem will be to obtain untainted brain tissues to blend with the artificial tissues we will make according to the professor's formula. Mm, well, that should give us no trouble. I can get what we need through the research laboratories with which I'm connected. Then that solves our worst problem. The rest will be matters of detail. Fortunately, there is enough equipment here to build a dozen or so robots. Like Alpha, you mean? No, indeed. The far more advanced type Professor Clark was perfecting. Oh, uh, if you've finished your breakfast, I have something to show you. Yes, I'm through. I don't feel much like eating after last night. Then come with me to the laboratory and I'll show you the second surprise that Professor Clark had in store for you. Now, what I'm going to show you is in this box. Not a second mechanical man the professor built a few months ago. This one, though, was a failure. You mean it wouldn't work? It worked too well. Oh, I don't follow you. It was too intelligent. Professor Clark called it Beta, and Beta's brain power was greater than that of any human scientist who ever lived. But Beta was insane. Good heavens. He represented, however, a tremendous technical advance. Look. Well, it looks exactly like a human being. Yes. Professor Clark used me for a model when he built Beta. It's an excellent likeness. Touch the face, Doctor. All right. It feels smooth and rubbery with a hard surface underneath. The surface is a new plastic Professor Clark developed with which he could imitate exactly the appearance of human skin. Underneath is an aluminum body on which the plastic was baked. I see. Beta's hair, eyes, and teeth are all artificial too, but he walked and talked and acted so much like a human being that no man alive would have guessed his secret. No, he would have fooled me completely. Did you say he was insane? From the human viewpoint, yes. He considered himself superior to the human race. With his enormous brain power, he intended to make himself ruler of the world. Oh, you're joking. Not in the least. That was why Professor Clark destroyed him just in time. He had made plans to take over this laboratory and construct dozens of mechanical men like himself. And then, with their help, he was going to enslave all mankind. But if that could happen once, it might happen again. I don't believe we should continue Professor Clark's work after all. Oh, there's no danger now, Doctor. You see, Beta also had a brain which contained tissues taken from that of the condemned murderer. But we will select the brain tissues we use from the highest types that are available. Well, in any case, we must proceed with the utmost caution. Of course, Doctor. Listen. Someone's come into the house. It's Alpha. He's come back. Alpha. We may need a watch, Bart. No, I can control him. Alpha. Alpha, come here. Alpha, come. Alpha, you killed Professor Clark. Why did you do it? Professor said he would destroy Alpha. And you killed him because of that? Alpha not want to be destroyed. But you... You're just a machine. What difference does it make to you? Alpha is a machine that lives. Alpha stronger than you. Alpha better than you. Alpha, be quiet. We want to know where you've been. Did anyone see you? Two men saw Alpha. What do you mean? Two men driving automobiles saw him. And what did they do? They tried hit Alpha with automobile. And then what happened? Alpha stopped automobile. Alpha killed one man. Killed him? Other man ran into woods. Alpha not find him. Alpha come back. We can't keep this a secret. No matter what happens, we must notify the authorities at once. Wait, let me think. We can't... Uh, the bell. You stay here. But what about Alpha? I'll switch off his batteries and then he can't move. There. And now I'll see who's at the door. Thank you.
And now to continue the story, Beware of Tomorrow, as it is written in the sealed book. Dr. Dale waited tensely as Barton went to answer the doorbell. He heard the door open and recognized the excited voice of Sheriff Ramsey speaking. Then a moment later, Barton came back into the laboratory, followed by the sheriff, who held a revolver in his hand. But, Sheriff, if you'd only let me explain... Never mind that. You're coming with me, both of you. The professor, too. Where is he? Professor Clark is dead, Sheriff. Dead? He was killed last night when an experiment he was engaged in went wrong. An experiment, eh? I suppose it was an experiment that crushed the life out of Jed Thompson an hour ago down the road and scared Fred Jennings so bad all he can do is jabber about monsters. It's true. The thing that killed both the professor and Thompson is an experiment. It's standing there behind you. Behind me? Go! Yeah. Man made out of machinery. Don't be alarmed, Sheriff. It's perfectly harmless now. It is a machine man which Professor Clark built. Unfortunately, it got out of control. I don't believe it. I don't blame you, Sheriff, but that's the truth. I think I can convince you. What are you doing? Stand still or I'll shoot. I'm simply going to switch out on. There. Now he can move and speak as well as you or me. That thing talk? You're lying. You're up to something. Alpha. Will you tell the sheriff that it was you who killed Mr. Thompson? Alpha killed man. What? Man tried hit Alpha with car. Why? Uh, so, so that's what the professor was doing all this time. Building that thing. Now, sheriff, surely you realize that we are not murderers. Well, maybe not. But you're coming to jail just the same. You're partly responsible anyhow. But, Sheriff... Anyway, it's for your own protection. There's a mob on the way out here, and they're going to burn this place down. i got to put you in jail for your own safety. That mob's ready to lynch you right now. Burn the place down. That's what I said. So turn that machine thing off and come along. We ain't got much time. No. All this equipment, machinery, the professor's notes, they must not be destroyed. We must stop them. Yes, Sheriff. The loss to science. Never mind science. You got your own skins to worry about. That mob means business, so let's get started. I'm afraid we can't do that, Sheriff. I've got a stick shooter here that says different. We have no choice, Boyd. Oh, yes, we have. Alpha, take the gun away from this man. Alpha will do. What are you doing? Stop him. You stop him or I'll... No. No. Let go of me! Stop him! Stop him! Too late, Dr. Dale. Oh, I just crushed him. Yes, Dr. Dale. The sheriff is dead. Now you are a murderer. In a good cause. The life of one man or of a dozen men cannot stand in my way. You don't expect me to keep silent about this, do you? I think you will. Alpha? Alpha! He doesn't answer. His batteries have gone dead. The last burst of energy must have drained them dry. But it makes no difference. I think it does. A big difference. There. See this? Sheriff Ramsey's revolver. With three bullets still in it. Put your hands up. I must explain something to you, Doctor. You can talk. But if you move, I shall shoot. I only want to say that nothing is going to interfere with my plan to build more of the improved form of robot that Professor Clark perfected before his death. Robots who look and act so much like men, no one can detect them. They'll never be built. I intend to destroy all of Professor Clark's notes. They will be built. By me. I shall build ten, a hundred, a thousand. Then I shall lead them with their superior intelligence to the mastery of the world. You're mad. Of course I should have guessed it. No, Doctor, that's not the answer. I shall tell you the truth. And then you must die. Stand still or I'll tell you. You remember last night when the professor said he had another surprise for you? An even greater surprise than Alpha? Yes. That surprise, Doctor, was Beta, the second robot. So perfect it looked like a man, but so intelligent that human beings were his children in comparison. But Beta was destroyed. No, Doctor. Beta was not destroyed. But you must be destroyed. Stand back. Stand back, I say. All right, then, I shall shoot. And now, Doctor, your bullets are gone. You... 
You won't even hurt. Bullets cannot harm me. That's what I'm trying to tell you. Beta, the second robot, was not destroyed. But I saw him. What you saw was only an initial attempt that failed. The real Beta still exists. You see, Doctor, I am Beta. You? Yes. I, too, am what you would call a mechanical man. And now, you must die. No. No. Stay away from me. Stay away. No! And so ends the tale. Beware of tomorrow. As it is written in the sealed book. Shortly after Dr. Dale's murder, a fire swept through the old mansion, burning it to the ground. To this day, the ruins are avoided by the natives. For cursed is the ground where evil has dwelt. for a murder he committed, only to find that justice has a strange way of working itself out. The tale is titled, Murder Must Be Paid For. Be sure to be with us again next time when the sound of the great gong heralds another strange and exciting tale from The Steel Book. The Steel Book, written by Bob Arthur and David Cogan, is produced and directed by Jock McGregor. And now, stay tuned for the program that has rated tops in popularity for a longer period of time than any other West Coast program in radio history. The Signal Oil program, The Whistler. Signal, the famous go-farther gasoline, invites you to sit back and enjoy another strange story by The Whistler. For extra driving pleasure, the signal to look for is the yellow and black circle sign that identifies signal service stations from Canada to Mexico. And for Sunday evening listening pleasure, the signal to listen for is this whistle that identifies the signal oil program, The Whistler. Whistler, and I know many things, for I walk by night. I know many strange tales hidden in the hearts of men and women who have stepped into the shadows. Yes, I know the nameless terrors of which they dare not speak. 
And now, the Whistler's strange story, Confession. The group around Dr. Rourke's bed moved away as he beckoned with his last remaining strength, indicated that he wanted to be alone with his son. It was all right, the nurse decided, because his boy, James Rourke, was a doctor himself. She directed the others out, moved silently after them, and closed the door. James sat on the edge of the bed and listened at what his father had to say. It was an amazing story, something the dying man had to clear up. It wasn't really his own story, but that of one Tony Delgano, former public enemy number one. It was late. The steamer dock almost deserted when the big car pulled up near the gangplank. And Tony Delgano stepped out and turned to the driver. Solidi. Yeah, Tony? Not Tony, you fool. You want me picked up before this tub even sails? Okay, okay, not Tony. What do you got on your passport? Tony Delgano is no more. The boss is now David Delmas. Delmas? It's kind of close, isn't it, Mikhail? Should be close, Chief, so you don't slip. I'm not slipping. Just see that you guys don't. You do any singing, Salidi, one little Why bit Why do you now... always think I'm going to be the opera star? I don't sing to nobody. See that you don't. Uh, you better go aboard, Chief. Yeah. <laughs> nice trip, uh, Mr. Delmar. Go on, get back uh... in the car. Here, Chief, here's your passport. Thanks, Mikhail. You're okay. I'll keep an eye on Salidi for you, don't worry. You'll make it, Chief. Sure. Sure, I always have. Well, so long, Mikhail. Don't take any lead slugs. You watch from the rail as the lights from the Golden Gate fade into the distance. And you feel safe, secure, don't you, Tony? It's like the beginning of a new life. One that's free of the police. A new life under another name, David Delmas. You enjoy it even more only a few hours later at a cocktail party on board, when you manage a meeting with a very exciting girl, Sharon Phillips. You feel a sense of amusement inside as you introduce yourself in the ship's lounge. No, not at all. Uh, Delmas. David Delmas. Oh, it's a pleasure, Mr. Delmas. <laughs> well, they say that shipboard friendships sometimes lead to all kinds of things. Oh, <laughs> Uh, may I get you another cocktail? If you like. Manhattan, please. Sure. Oh, just hmm? a moment. I want you to meet someone. An old friend. Oh? A doctor. A Dr. Rourke. Rourke. <laughs> Over here, doctor. Oh, hello, Sharon. So you decided to take the trip after uh-huh. all. Uh, uh, Dr. Rourke, Mr. Delman. Hi. How do you do? I, uh, I'll get that drink for you, Sharon. Oh, and hurry back, won't you? Yeah, Sure. <laughs> It's a shock, isn't it, Tony? Seeing Dr. Rourke. And you know that it surprised him, too. It's been a long time, hasn't it? And you know that you must talk to him alone and soon. He's gone when you return with Sharon Phillips' drink. But later, out on the deck, you see him standing by the aft rail, quietly smoking his pipe, and you saunter over. Well, we meet again, Dr. Rourke. Oh, yes. I wondered when you'd be cornering me alone, Mr. Delgano. Delmas. David Delmas. I don't suppose I have to ask you why you're traveling under an assumed name. The police again. Yeah. Yeah, the police again. But, uh, Doc... Yeah? You're going to keep my secret. Not say anything. Am I? You haven't said anything yet. No. No, I haven't. Uh, You're wise, Doc. Very wise. I could mess up your life, too, you know. In what way? (laughs) There's your memory, Doc. The time you fixed up my shoulder. After that hunting accident. I remember. Sure, sure. And you remember it 
wasn't a hunting accident at all. I learned that later, Tony. Make it Dave. David Delmas. Don't tell me what to make it. I'll say what I please. When and to whom. You can't threaten me, Delgano. Sure, sure, I know. Your son, uh, he's a doctor too, isn't he? Yes, he is. Hmm. I wonder how his associates would feel if they heard his old man, Dr. Rock Sr., had helped a criminal and never said anything about it. My son, you wouldn't... I would. So just forget Tony Delgano. Or your son, young Dr. Rourke, will have his life messed up, but good. I see. You're running away, I suppose? Yeah, you suppose good, Doc. What are you doing? One of your own prescriptions, maybe? A little sea voyage? I'm doing a favor for a friend. Oh? Uh-huh. Is he on board? Yes. Don't go getting any ideas you can tell him about me. I want no one to know, Doc, till I'm free and clear. Then it doesn't make any difference. I understand. Just skip mentioning anything to your friend. Understand that, too. It would scarcely matter if I did. My friend is making his last voyage. Oh? Uh-huh. His body is in a casket in the hold. I'm escorting him to... to his final resting place. His last request. Oh. Uh-huh. Okay, Doc. I guess you won't do any talking. I'll see you around. Not if I can avoid it. (laughs) Did I hurt your feelings, old man? Well, forget it, see. I'll call on you any time for anything, and you'll do whatever Tony Delgano says. I'm sorry. I forgot my new name. Delmas. David Delmas. He speaks a little differently from Delgano. Now, Delmas is going to be a real gent. But he's the same guy, Doc. The same guy. H.F. Hansen of San Diego is the Whistler fan to whom we are sending a $20 signal gasoline book this week as a token of our appreciation for writing this limerick. There was a young man from Del Mar who traded his horse for a car. After many a test, he found Signal gas best because it made his new car go so far. Signal, Signal, Signal gasoline Your car will go far with go farther gasoline (laughs) We're glad that our friend from Del Mar found signal gas best. But he really wouldn't have had to make all those tests if he had just followed the lead of that increasing number of drivers who each year are switching to signal. In fact, so many drivers have switched to signal that the number of independent signal stations has grown and grown from a modest beginning in Southern California into an organization serving six Western states from Canada to Mexico. Wouldn't you like to discover what has made so many folks prefer signal gasoline above all others? Then next time your gas tank gets thirsty, just remember the advice on those signal billboards you've seen. Next time, fill up with signal, the famous go-farther gasoline. It's clear sailing again, isn't it, Tony? As David Delmas, you're safe on the ship. Not a worry. And Dr. Rourke will say nothing. Because he's afraid that his son, a young doctor with a bright future, will be hurt by the knowledge that his father once helped a criminal. He took a bullet out of your shoulder, didn't he, Tony? After a bank job. He didn't know. But it's the same now after all these years. He'd never be believed. And you'll take any advantage to be safe. You think very little about it the next few days. You're too busy with that girl, Sharon Phillips. She's exciting, isn't she, Tony? And seemingly very interested in you. (laughs) Oh, you won again. (laughs) David, I'm afraid I'm no shuffleboard player. Oh, David. I... I like you to call me that, Sharon. Mm. David, what do you do? Your work, I mean. Why do you ask that? Oh, No reason, except that, well, we have been seeing a good deal of one another. 
I asked Dr. Rourke if he knew anything Rourke, about... what did he say? Why, nothing. Nothing at all. That's why I asked you. Oh. Sharon, I, I'm just a, a guy moving about, seeking... Seeking? Yeah. Something, someone like you. David, the steward's coming in. I don't think... Oh, the fool. What is it, steward? Uh, Mr. Delmas, could I see you alone, sir? Sure, sure. We'll dance twice around the main funnel. What do you want? Later then, sir. Alone. Look, what is this? I don't mind, David. I'll join you later. In the salon. Well, not much later. Ten minutes, Sharon. Now, boy. Easy, Tony. What? I might not like that. Tony, where did you... I've seen your picture. So what? This, Mr. Delgano. This radiogram from San Francisco. From Mr. David Delmas. Let me see. The lady singing received well here. Anticipate big reception for you in Australia, Mikhail. So, lady, that double crossing little squealer, if I. Tipped off the cops, huh? If I ever get my head. Save your breath, Mr. Delgano. You can still lick him from here. You got a Sunday punch. Yeah? Yeah. Your friend, Dr. Rourke. What about Rourke? He's escorting a stiff, isn't he? So? So, what's to prevent us from uh, disposing of his quiet friend? You take his place in the casket, go ashore as nice as you please. Nobody's the wiser. Hey, you're a bright boy, boy. And your end of it? Just give me a little help, that's all. Help? Yeah. Maybe you could get a little package ashore for me. What's in it? A million dollars in diamonds. You just take it in with you, deliver it to me later. We both get a break. I'll pick it up after you're safe on shore. What do you say? I'll have to think it over. I'll get in touch with you. Okay. But remember, it's your only chance. <laughs> It's a way out, isn't it, Tony? But you're not certain you want to take it. You tell yourself there must be another way you can escape the police. We'll be waiting for you when your boat docks at Sydney. In the days that follow, you search for the answer. Find yourself thinking more and more of the steward's plan. Then one evening, as you stroll along the half-deserted deck... Evening, Mr. Delmas. Beautiful night, isn't it? Yes, yes, it is, Stuart. Uh, oh, do you have a light? Righto. Here you are, sir. Thanks. Oh, been a pleasant voyage, wouldn't you say, sir? Too bad it'll all be over soon. Dark day after tomorrow, you know. Yeah. Yeah, I know. By the way, uh, Mr. Delmas, Miss uh, Phillips has been inquiring about you. What? Asked if I'd seen you. She's in the lounge. Oh, thanks. Nice young lady, that Miss Phillips. Seems, uh, quite taken by you. Yeah. If I may say so, sir. That's so? I got eyes, you know. Yes, sir. Very attractive woman. Lots of money, too, I hear. Too bad if anything happened to spoil your beautiful friendship. Like the police... Hey, Mr. Delmas? Yeah, it would be too bad. Been thinking any more about my proposition? Sure, I've been thinking about it. It's, uh... It's a deal? It's a deal. Bring the package to my stateroom in ten minutes. Here's the package. All wrapped up nice and proper. Mm, it's not a very big one, is it? Well, not very, but it's worth a million dollars. What's your cut? 20000 on delivery. All right, beat it. I'll take care of things from now on. Oh, uh, is Dr. Rourke in it? Not yet, but I'll handle him. You understand that part's between you and the doc. Sure, sure. Well, got to get topside. All right, I... just a minute. Yeah? How do I get this package to you when I'm ashore? Don't worry, Tony. I'll be close by. 
all the time. After he's left your cabin, your gaze wanders back to the small package lying on the desk. You stare at it for a moment. Then quickly you walk over to it and rip it open. You're examining the contents of the package when... Quickly you close the box. Slip it into the desk drawer. You come in? Hello, David. Oh, Sharon. Come in, come in. I was beginning to wonder where you disappeared to. Oh, I was just on my way up to the lounge. Oh. The Fenways have asked a few people to their stateroom. Want to go along? Oh, have I been invited? Oh, have you? Mrs. Fenway won't take no for an answer. What's the occasion? Oh, nothing special. There'll be drinks and cards, I suppose. <laughs> Mrs. Fenway has suddenly discovered the game of blackjack. She's crazy about it. Wait till she starts losing. <laughs> oh, come on, David. The Fenways are waiting. Uh... I have to go up on deck for a minute, Sharon. Oh. Why don't you run along? I'll join you later. Oh, all right. Go on, honey. It's important I take care of this matter right away. Very important. Oh, Stewart. Huh? Oh, oh, Mr. Delmas. I didn't see you. Rather dark here. Uh... Yeah. Yeah, nice and dark. Out for a bit of a stroll? I am. Join me? Well, I... Come on, it's, uh, it's business. You'd like to make ten grand easily, wouldn't you, Stuart? Ten grand? When I left the States, there was a reward out on me. Ten grand. Uh, is that so? Yeah, that's so. You knew about that, didn't you? Why, no. No, I didn't. You figured you'd like to collect, didn't you? Why... I don't know what you're talking about. You wanted to hide me out where the cops couldn't find me, then you'd lead them to me. How am I doing? Oh, that's crazy. Why would I turn you in for ten grand when you're holding a package for me that's worth twenty? Uh Uh-uh. I opened it, Buster. You you opened it? Yeah. All I found was a handful of dime store glass. How about it? No, wait a minute. You got me all wrong. No, I don't think so. What what are you going to do? You're a smart punk. You can figure it out, can't you? It was easy, wasn't it, Tony? The steward won't bother you anymore. Sharon and the rest of the passengers will think he's fallen overboard. When you retire for the night, you're confident you're in the clear, that your plan can't fail. Then the following morning, there's a knock on your stateroom door. Come in. Your breakfast, sir. Oh, thank you. Uh, Set it down here, will you? Yes, sir. You're new, aren't you? Where's the other steward I had? Well, uh, it's rather odd, sir. He's disappeared. What? The ship has been searched. He isn't aboard. Are you sure? Yes, sir. Uh, one of the passengers on the deck last night thought he heard a splash. You mean the steward might have fallen overboard? That's exactly what might have happened, Mr. Delmar. Oh, Dr. Rock. Uh, good morning. Good morning. That'll be all, steward. Yes, sir. Too bad about the steward falling overboard, wasn't it? Yeah, tough. Well, accidents will happen. I don't think it was an accident. You uh, join me, Doctor? Thanks. I've already had breakfast. Mm, the eggs look good. You sure you won't? No. Have... You were, uh, you were saying, Doctor? It wasn't an accident, was it? Accident? Oh, you you mean the steward? How does it feel to be a murderer? I've often wondered. Have some coffee, Doc. He knew too much about you, didn't he? I noticed from the first day when he saw us talking together, he was rather inquisitive in a guarded sort of way. Probably recognized you. He was a smart little operator, Doc, but not smart enough. I hated to do it, especially after he'd given me that bright idea. What bright idea? Way of getting off his boat. You see, the police are going to be waiting for me when the boat docks in Sydney. What? Mm -hmm. Sit down, Doc. Sit down. You know, it's going to be tough for both of us if they grab me. Tough on your son, too. What are you going to do? Well, there's a way I can slip past them, if you'll help. And I'm pretty certain you will, Doc. How? You told me you're accompanying an old friend to his final resting place. Yes, that's right. Sure, sure. And that's how I'm going to slip off this boat. 
<laughs> They'll never think of looking there for me. You... You're not suggesting that... Right that... again. We make a switch. No, no, I can't do that. I won't. Relax, Doc, relax. You can't ask me to do such a I'm thing. I'm not asking, I'm telling. What's more, you'll keep your mouth shut or you know what happens to your son. Now, now beat it, huh? Now listen to me. We'll be talking tomorrow night. I'll let you know in plenty of time. Plenty of time. You watch Dr. Rourke as he backs out of your stateroom. A stunned, horrified look on his face. You're not worried, are you, Tony? You know he'll go through with it for his son's sake. You spend the rest of the day with Sharon, enjoying the deck games, chatting pleasantly with the other passengers. And then early that evening, when you've just finished dressing for dinner, you pour yourself a drink. A knock on your stateroom door interrupts your first sip. One of the ship's officers steps into the room. Yes, what is it? I'll have to ask you to come with me, sir. Oh? Captain wants to see you. What about You'll come quietly, Mr. Delgano. Delgano? We've just received a radiogram from the San Francisco police. Oh, I see. I, uh, mind if I finish my drink? Would you care for one? If you'll come with me, sir. Oh, come on. Have a drink. An instant after you throw the drink in his face, your fist connects with his chin, and he slumps to the floor. Quickly, you close the door, stand for a moment with your back to it, your mind spinning wildly. They've discovered you now, haven't they, Tony? And you've got to move fast. Leaving the unconscious officer sprawled out on the floor, you hurry to Dr. Rourke's stateroom. That's what I said now. It's got to be now. But we don't dock until tomorrow. Sure, but as soon as that officer wakes up, they'll be tearing this boat inside out looking for Please, me. Please, Delgado, don't ask me. Look, to I this. haven't got time to argue. Get going. I'll wait here for you. <laughs> The minutes drag by and you wait for Dr. Rock to return. Pace his stateroom floor, stopping occasionally to pour yourself a drink from the decanter on the nightstand. An hour goes by and then finally... Where have you been? I... I had to be careful. Is everything all set? Yes, I... I just had a talk with the captain. What? Are you double-crossing? No, 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 wait. I... I told him I thought I saw you trying to hide in one of the lifeboats. Huh? Saw you... Lose your footing. Oh, I see. The boat is circling the area now. Hey, pretty smart. Pretty smart, Doc. Yeah, that calls for a drink. I... I could use one. I see you've helped yourself. Yeah, I've had a few. It'll make me feel better while I'm resting in that box down below. Tony, there's something I've got to Look, tell Look, we've talked enough. But this is important. I know all I need to know. Now, come on, finish your drink. We're going down into the hole where you can make me nice and comfortable. I, told I said, come on. I don't want to talk about it anymore. Very well. You seem to be giving the orders. Here's some hot weather mathematics for drivers. Take the temperature of the day. Add 2,800 degrees, the temperature inside the cylinder head of the average motor. That adds up to a lot of heat. Good reason why your motor needs the protection of the improved type signal oil that's engineered to stand up under heat. Signal premium compounded motor oil. You see, in addition to 100% pure paraffin base, Signal Premium contains scientific compounds that do things which oil alone cannot do. One of these compounds, for instance, keeps Signal Premium from breaking down at high temperatures and forming harmful gum or varnish. Another compound prevents bearing corrosion. And still another compound actually removes carbon. That's why we call Signal Premium the oil that does so much more than just lubricate. So if you want your motor to stay young, get your next oil change at a signal station. Change to the improved type signal oil that stands up under heat. Signal premium compounded motor oil. In stunned silence, young Dr. Rourke sat on the edge of his father's bed, listening to the dying man as he told his story in a voice that had now faded to a bare whisper. 
The end was near for the elder Dr. Rourke, and as his son James leaned forward to catch the last few remaining words, an expression of horror across his face. Dad. Dad, you, you let Tony Delgano get away? No. No, son. He didn't get away. But you let him take another man's place in the casket. Your friend. Yes. He took my friend's place in the casket. The body I was accompanying to its final resting place. But, you see, there was something Tony Delgano didn't know. Oh, what was that, Dad? That my friend had chosen as his final resting place a burial at sea somewhere near Australia. Let that whistle be your signal for the Signal Oil program, The Whistler, each Sunday night at this same time. Brought to you by the Signal Oil Company, marketers of Signal gasoline and motor oil, and fine quality automotive accessories. Remember, if you would like the fun of having your friends hear a limerick of yours on The Whistler, the address to which to send it is Signal Oil Company, Los Angeles, California. All limericks become the property of Signal Oil Company. Those selected for use on the Whistler will be chosen by our advertising representatives on the basis of humor, suitability, and originality. So, of course, they must be your own composition. Featured in tonight's story were Ira Grossell and Herb Butterfield. The Whistler was produced by George W. Allen, directed by Sterling Tracy, with story by Joel Malone and Adrian Jean Doe. Music by Wilbur Hatch and was transmitted to our troops overseas by the Armed Forces Radio Service. The Whistler is entirely fictional, and all characters portrayed on The Whistler are also fictional. Any similarity of names or resemblance to persons living or dead is purely coincidental. Remember, at this same time next Sunday, another strange tale by The Whistler. Marvin Miller speaking. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.